Good evening and welcome to the BBC Election Centre. Tonight is the third time in just over two years that we've come here to discover the result of a major UK-wide poll. In 2015, David Cameron's election victory led, of course, to the 2016 referendum that he'd promised. That resulted in the vote for Brexit and Cameron's resignation. And then this election called by Theresa May, in her words, to guarantee certainty and stability for the years ahead. A three-act drama. First indications of whether she's got what she wanted or whether Jeremy Corbyn has dashed her hopes will come with the exit poll at 10. Who gets to number 10? To Jeremy Vine's finishing line. Welcome to our virtual Downing Street, where we watched in 2015 as Conservative constituencies paved a path to number 10 and Labour were left a long way behind. What will happen tonight? Will the Conservatives get the 326 seats they need to win outright, or will Labour close the gap? Earlier today, the party leaders, as ever, were film casting their votes, just as nearly 47 million of us had the right to do. And the first actual result will help confirm or cast doubt on this exit poll. In the race to be first to deliver, it's Newcastle and Sunderland going head to head. And Sophie Rayworth is in Sunderland. These are some of the 86 formers who are poised to grab the ballot boxes the minute they're brought in here and they will run them here so the votes can be counted. Houghton and Sunderland South has been the first to declare since 1992. But this year they have competition. Newcastle is after their crown. Can they do it? We should know in about 45 minutes' time. Our team here in the election centre are going to be gathering, of course, all the results as they come in, analysing individual contests, updating our prediction. And Emily Maitlis is able to look at each of the 650 individual constituencies and delve deep into their political makeup. Never before have we gone into an election with such diverse predictions. Well, this is where we finally discover what the real numbers are. My giant touchscreen is being loaded with data, the result of talking to some 20,000 voters around the country. In a moment, I should be able to predict which seats could be changing hands. And on the balcony up there, Michel Hussein will be joined by politicians and commentators to assess why what happened happened and what the likely consequences are. Yes, I'll be here throughout the night getting thoughts, views and verdicts on what the message delivered by the people means for the parties, their policies and some political careers. And with me down here, our political editor, Laura Kunzberg, waiting to talk about this exit poll with only a few moments to go. There are just over 20 seconds to go till Big Ben strikes 10. Then I'll be able to reveal the results of the BBC, ITV and Sky joint poll. Over 30,000 people, 144 polling stations were questioned today and by the magic of sophology we're able to predict what we think has happened tonight. And what we're saying is the Conservatives are the largest party. Note they don't have an overall majority at this stage. 314 for the Conservatives, that's down 17. 266 for Labour, that's up 34. The SNP, the Scottish National Party, 34, down 22. Treat that figure with a bit of caution for technical reasons about the exit poll, which I don't need to explain right now. The Liberal Democrats on 14, up 6. And the smaller parties, Plaid Cymru stays on 3, the Greens on 1, none for UKIP, and the others 18. Well, the... Prime Minister called this election because she wanted, as she put it, certainty and stability. And this doesn't seem, at this stage, to look like certainty and stability. It could still be that the Conservatives, at the end of the day, have an overall majority. They need another 12 seats to get that overall majority, 326, as Jeremy was saying a moment ago. But that's just the exit poll. The reality... As Sophie Rayworth was saying, we get the first result in three quarters of an hour. That'll be the first test of the poll. But that's how things look at this stage of the evening. Laura, what do you make of it? Well, David, if these numbers are correct, then Theresa May has played a high-risk political game and she appears she may have lost her gamble. She didn't have to call this election. She only did so to give herself her own mandate and some breathing space during the bumpy ride of Brexit. Just a few weeks ago, at the start of the campaign, she seemed almost unassailable. 
But a very shaky few weeks and an insurgent Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn may well have dashed the Conservatives' hopes. Now, this exit poll result, it's worth saying, is not what either of the main parties have been predicting privately. This would be another political surprise, with both the British public again defying the expectations of the two largest political parties. Now, the Tories do still look like they'll be the largest party. They may yet see themselves with a majority. But Theresa May's promise throughout this campaign was to offer strong and stable leadership. That was her catchphrase. She may well end the night diminished with the situation even more uncertain. But only, of course, your votes, the real results as they come in through the night, will actually dictate what happens next. And uh, maybe at this stage, given that we are in this territory of, of uh, waiting to see whether our exit poll is correct, but let's just assume for a moment it is and have a look at what the new House of Commons would be like, Jeremy. Can we do that? Yes, David. Well, this does feel quite sensational, doesn't it? The key figure is 326. Just over half the MPs in the House of Commons gives you a majority. David Cameron got just there in the last election. And the exit poll has the Conservatives falling short. So down 17 seats. 314. They can't, with their MPs, outvote all the other MPs in the House of Commons. That's what an overall majority means. Now, as has been said, it wouldn't take a little bit of error in the exit poll to actually push the Conservatives over the line. So it may yet happen. It's going to be a fascinating night. Let's have a look at the other parties. So, Labour, first of all, 266, up more than 30 seats. The SNP, we have going down to 34. There are a lot of 50-50 calls there, though, so that figure may change. The Liberal Democrats have added six seats, we think, to their tally. 14 they would have, so that's an improvement for them. The same for Plaid Cymru, three as last time. The Greens also the same, having one. And the others, the Northern Ireland parties, in 18. So, 18 others. So, let's go back here to the government benches and, and stress that this gap here is very small. It's possible that it closes during the night. But at the moment, under our exit poll, the Conservative Party have lost their overall majority and would be short by 12 votes. 12 MPs short of an outright majority in the House of Commons. David. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Well, I'm joined here by two senior politicians from the two main parties. Uh, John McDonnell, who's shadow... Chancellor for Labour and Michael Fallon, the Defence Secretary. Mr Fallon, if this is right, it was a terrible error to call this election in the first place, wasn't it? Well, let's see some actual results to see if this is borne out. This is a projection. I think you made that clear. It's not a result. Uh, these exit polls have been uh, wrong in the past. I think in 2015 they underestimated our uh, vote. I think uh, in a couple of elections before that they overestimated our, our vote. So I think we do need to see some actual results before we can uh, interpret this one way or the other. Well, put it like this, if this were to be close to the result, in other words, that you maybe just had a, a majority, you certainly wouldn't have what you were all looking for, which was a big, safe majority in the House of Commons. People were talking about a majority of 30 or 40 or 50 only well, a few weeks ago. Well, we didn't. I never believed the original poll showing us 20 points uh, ahead. In an election, you get a tightening uh, between the major parties. Uh, that was clearly happening uh, this time. But I, as I said, I think it's very early to start uh, on the basis, you know, of what is a projection before we've had a single actual result. Let's uh, wait and see the seeds coming through. All right, John McDonnell, what about you? You're encouraged, obviously, by the prediction of, of uh, 34. Uh, if that happens, you and Jeremy Corbyn remain in charge of the Labour Party, presumably. I'm going to surprise you. I'm going to agree with Michael the first time possibly ever, ever. but there you are. <laughs> I, we, have to, we have to have some scepticism about all polls at the moment. All right. we, we've got it wrong in the past in terms of polling. So I, let's, see, I would agree, let's see some results before we come to some OK, so what do you have to say about the election campaign from your point well, of view? I, we, tried, we tried to have an extremely positive campaign. Uh, we modelled it around Jeremy's character. So, uh, if you remember when he stood for the leadership, his slogan at the time was honest politics, straight talk, and that's what we've tried to do, a positive campaign throughout. And if it is reflected in this sort of levels of support, I think it does change the nature of political discourse to a large extent in our country now. So I think people have got fed up with the, the Yabu politics and some of the, the nasty tactics that have gone on in recent years. And I think a positive campaign, if it comes out like this, I think it will, I think it will improve politics in this country overall. What did you think about their campaign? I thought it was pretty nasty. I thought it was very nasty. I thought it, at times it, it dragged us into the gutter and I didn't like that, but let's put that to one side. If the result is anywhere near like this, it means positive politics has actually succeeded. 
nasty campaign. No, I don't agree with that. Uh, our campaign focus was on leadership. Do you know what you're thinking of? I don't know what well, you're thinking of. No, I don't know what you're thinking of. What were you thinking you know, of? Our campaign focus was on strong leadership. It was on uh, getting the Brexit uh, negotiations right. It was on setting out some of the big social and economic challenges that face this country, which, frankly, you know, leave, leaving aside any of the personal stuff, uh, Labour ducked. Um, they pretended there was some you, magic money right. tree, and they never really answered <laughs> but, Michael, you know, how that's they were it. going to spend billions that on this. Right. Well, let's not refight the campaign. Okay, You've that, got Brexit talks okay. starting in 11 days' time from now, yes. really serious talks about the future of this country. Absolutely. That was hardly discussed in the campaign. There wasn't a, a stall laid out on Brexit, and now, if this is right, um, Theresa May hasn't got the sort of massive support from the country that she was hoping to get to allow her to do whatever it is she wanted to do, which she never told us. No, we did bring the campaign back to Brexit and we you set never out... said what kind of Brexit you were going to have. Oh, we did. We set out that. We set out the 12 negotiating objectives. We set out that we want a deep and special partnership with Europe based on economic cooperation, being careful about the trade we already do with Europe while looking for new markets. We never but based really... Also Michael, we on never really security. got into the... We, well, honestly, based also be, on security cooperation. Let's, Mike, we let's be honest to about this. Share we, intelligence. we never really got into the debate on Brexit that we should have had. But also, what is that your fault as much? Well, as I think it? I think just generally we didn't. Did you I, have a policy on? Well, yes, we did, and I think you we could have. Another we, referendum? Well, no, not at all. You know that. See, that's the sort of politics that people are rejecting. You've got to be straightforward and honest with people now, and you should not parody other parties' political positions. People are rejecting that now. And I think what was interesting is that Theresa May went with one question about Brexit to the electorate, and that was going to be the central question to the, uh, of the whole election. And people said, well, actually, there are other issues we want to discuss. OK. I remember the 1974 general election, if you remember, when the government then, Ted Heath, went to the country and said, oh, with the question, who rules Britain? It was the miners at the strike at the time. And people said, well, that isn't what the question is. The question is about our living standards, about our public services, the future of the country. Just briefly, David, I think it's fair to say neither main party really got into the weeds on Brexit. There's no question about that, really. But just looking at these numbers again, if they are proven to be right, then what was called during the campaign the progressive coalition would tot up to 318 seats, as opposed to the Tory seats of 314. Now, they might be able to rely on Northern Irish seats, the DUP, in order to rule, but we could be in a position where the combined forces of the SNP, the Labour Party, Greens and Plaid would be equal to the Conservatives, and that could make for some very interesting days ahead. Let's just have a reminder of where this exit poll is, in case you've just come in. This is what the exit poll is showing, and we've projected it on the front of New Broadcasting House. And I hope we can show that to you. Um, in, the, in the dusk, there we are. 2017 election. Conservatives, the largest party. Note, not Conservatives at this stage on the exit poll with the majority. Labour on 266, that's up 34. The SNP on 34, that's down 22 from dissolution. Liberal Democrats on 14. And the other parties, Plaid Cymru on three. The Greens on one. And uh, UKIP, none. And others, 18. But the Conservatives on 314, which is 17 short of an overall majority. Let's go to Sunderland, because I said earlier on, the first result we get from you, Sophie, will give us a clue whether these two gentlemen are feeling more cheerful or less. It certainly will, and the ballot boxes are being run in right now. The first one was in here at three minutes past ten. We've got a whole lot of sixth form students, 80 of them in total, who are bringing them in and giving them to the counters. Houghton and Sunderland South has been the fastest to declare. Their record is 45 minutes in 2015. They did it in... 48 minutes, but uh, they've got Newcastle snapping on their heels, so we will have to wait and see who gets their first tonight. The, it's a really well-oiled machine here. They've got lighter ballot papers. They only fold the ballot papers in half. And they've even checked out the routes to get to this sports centre to make sure that the vans take the fastest Which route one you possible. You can see how hard they are all working there, just to make sure that they do get in here and they retain their crown. No. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's great. Let's go down. Uh, let's go and join Andrew Marr. Uh, he's at Maidenhead, where Theresa May is waiting for her count. Andrew, good evening. You've heard the exit poll down there. What's the reaction been? 
Well, the reaction from senior Conservatives, and I've talked to a few, is they flatly don't believe it. They say that's not the reaction they've got up and down the country. They've been talking to candidates. It cannot be true. Um, one of the reasons they're saying that, of course, is this would be a huge disaster for Theresa May and the Conservative Party if it was accurate. If you look at the numbers, this whole election was about ensuring that Theresa May had the leeway to do a proper deal on Brexit afterwards. She needed a bigger majority to do that. She hasn't got that, it appears. Now, she can bring in a small platoon of Democratic Unionists from Ireland to help her. They agree with her on Brexit. But she can't really do what David Cameron did in similar circumstances when he brought in the Liberal Democrats. Because, of course, on the great issue of the day, Brexit, the two sides are on completely opposite opinions. So she's in real, real trouble. At the moment, we don't believe it is the best they can do. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Let's join uh, the other party leader, Nick Robinson, is in Islington North, Jeremy Corbyn's seat, uh, in the dark. Uh, good evening, Nick. Uh, have you had a reaction to this uh, opinion poll? I'm not We're an exit the... poll, I should call it, not an opinion poll. We're in the dark. When Jeremy Corbyn arrived here, David, just minutes before the election uh, exit poll, he was in the dark too. But I have to say, he looked pretty cheerful, as did his chief advisor, his spin doctor, Seamus Mill. Uh, everybody is going to be extremely cautious about this exit poll because it comes as such a surprise, in line, of course, with some of those polls that showed just a 1% or 2% uh, Tory lead. Uh, it will give enormous power to Jeremy Corbyn, not just within Parliament, but within his party too. There were very few people around Mr Corbyn who ever believed he was going to win this election. Quite frankly, two years ago, they never believed he'd fight this election. But what they now believe is that they have shifted British politics and they've shifted it for good. They believe that they have put ideas that were previously seen as extreme or on the margins, nationalisation, big public spending, borrowing and taxing as well, ideas of investment in the NHS and the rest, back firmly in the centre of British politics. He will be strengthened. What he didn't anticipate, I think, is that he might have a rather powerful role to play in the future of this country when it comes to Brexit. Because if the exit poll is right, if Theresa May effectively has to do deals in order to get her way, that gives Labour potentially enormous power in terms of the deals they are willing to do and whether they will work with Tory rebels and others when it comes to those crucial votes on Brexit in 2018 and 2019. Thank you very much, Nick. Of course, we live at this stage in the evening on rumours from places, and we have just heard a rumour, I put it no stronger than that, uh, that the Tories may be in trouble in Hastings, that it's a tight race there. Amber Rudd, the Home Secretary, who stood in, you remember, for Theresa May in that debate and is generally thought to have done a good job, a formidable job, uh, it, we're told that in Hastings she may be in difficulty. But let's have a look at some other seats with Emily. Can we, Emily? David, yes, it's impossible to predict uh, at this stage anything too closely. It is impossible to stress too much how delicately we are treading, given that the exit poll, as things stand, is untested. We have not had a single result in. But if it is right or if it is on track, then these are some of the seats Tory held at the moment that have a 90% chance of turning red, being taken by Labour tonight. Some of them are incredibly tight marginals, Croydon Central, Derby North, for example. Some of them are much higher up the target list, Bedford, uh, around 11 or 12 on that target list. But let me take you into some, and I'll just show you what we're able to do now. This is Croydon Central, a very tight marginal. You might recognise the face of Gavin Barwell, the housing minister and the current administration, the government. And you can see what is being projected on the forecast a likely Labour gain. You can see uh, the Leave vote here split pretty evenly. We don't know if that will come into play, but some of the others that we're going to show you, Bolton West, you'll remember that Theresa May launched her campaign in this neck of the woods, not this exact seat. Very tightly fought here. Uh, they only need a 0.8% swing to take it from the Conservatives. But the sort of figures that the forecast is coming up with suggests Labour would be on a nine-point a nine lead in pretty much all of these seats. That's why we're saying they have a very good chance of taking them. This would go red as well. And I mentioned some of the other ones. Bedford, for example, 13 on the Labour target list. It looks pretty tight at the moment. Tony Blair took it three times for Labour here. It's not very often you'll hear Jeremy Corbyn and Tony Blair uh, in the same sentence, but we could be looking at uh, some interesting changes of seats. That's all we're going to say here. Bedford then projected to be at least 10 points between uh, Labour and the Conservatives. One more, Brighton, 
Kemp Town, right next to the uh, green seat Brighton Pavilion at the moment. Simon Kirby on this forecast could be out for the Conservatives. And we are projecting here a Labour gain with a lead of another 10 percentage points. All these we tread carefully. We'll know when we get the first result and whether that exit poll is even vaguely on track. Absolutely. We're on eggshells at the moment, being very cautious, what we say, for perfectly obvious reasons. But if you've just joined us, we're not saying that the Conservatives have an overall majority. We're simply saying they're the largest party. And a lot of the discussion that we've started having, if the exit poll is true, what are the implications of that? And no one better, perhaps, than some of the senior politicians who've been involved in this sort of thing before. Michelle Hussein has one with her. David, uh, with me up here is Ming Campbell, Lord Campbell, former leader of the Liberal Democrats. Good evening. Good evening. Your reaction to the exit poll? Well, <clears throat> David Dimbleby took the world's eggshells right over my mouth because with the history of these polls in the past, then I think it's very, very dangerous to seek to draw conclusions which are totally unchallengeable. But one thing is certain, that Mrs May's effort to get a large majority in order to enhance her ability to drive a hard deal in the European Union has simply been exploded. If these results if are... These results, are if, if the exit poll is borne yeah, out by yeah. the results. The, the exit poll shows your party adding seats in the House of Commons, going up to, to 14 Liberal Democrat MPs. Could you imagine the Liberal Democrats being part of some sort of progressive alliance in the Commons? Well, <clears throat> Tim Farron made it very clear. He said, no pact, no deal, no coalition. And we've had our fingers burned by coalition. I don't need to tell you that. And so I find it very, very difficult to see how Tim Farron would be able to go back on what he's previously said and indeed to persuade the membership of the Liberal Democrats that a coalition was a good idea from our point of view. Right. But a progressive alliance would be something rather different, wouldn't it? Progressive alliance implies, though, uh, a commitment to support the government which happens to be in power. And the notion of a progressive alliance is that it would supplant the Conservatives. But, for example, on the issue of Brexit, the Liberal Democrat position is very clear as compared to Jeremy Corbyn's position, which, frankly, almost defies definition. I can't possibly see an arrangement of the kind between Labour and the Liberal Democrats uh, which would in any way overcome that quite significant but, difference of opinion. But as far as Tim Farron is, is concerned, however difficult it might be to put to the, to the members and with the, the memories of, of the 2010 to 2015 um, experience, nevertheless, this is a campaign which for the Liberal Democrats was fought on Brexit and, and wanting to fight against a hard Brexit. Should Tim Farron consider some kind of arrangement with the Conservatives? Well, that's equally impossible because, of course, Mrs May made it clear both before and after calling the election. She said, no deal is better than a poor deal. Uh, she's willing to accept the hardest possible Brexit. How could Tim Farron possibly ally himself with that? Nor could he take the party with him, nor indeed any of the what, over 100,000 people doubled our membership since 2015. Even in the interest of having the sort of influence over the Brexit negotiations that he'd hoped for? Well... We know about coalitions and we know about the extent that getting influence is very, very difficult indeed. And our experience is, after the last coalition, the major party gets the credit for everything that's done and the junior party takes the blame for the things that people don't like. And therefore, I've, it, it, it'll be down to him. He'll have to make his own decision. But I should be astonished if he would countenance any kind of coalition, either with the Labour or the Conservatives. What he can say is we will deal with these, every issue on a vote-by-vote -vote basis. We will not have, if you like, opposition for opposition's sake, but we will consider everything on its merits. That, I think, is something he can sell to his own party, and it's something which will preserve his and, indeed, the party's integrity. Lord Campbell, thank you. David. Well, there are fascinating scenes up in Sunderland where, being <laughs> further north than London, there's still a bit of daylight as the students, look at them with these boxes, bringing the ballot boxes to the central count and white-gloved, handling them carefully, all trained to do this. Both Sunderland and Newcastle have been competing and indeed the man who organised Sunderland last time round has been giving advice to Slough as well in Buckinghamshire uh, because they wanted to get in their result as fast as possible. So, the boxes have to be opened. There is a slight problem here this time round, which is that if people go 
who have uh, postal ballots and put them in these boxes, they then have to be individually verified, and that takes a bit of time. But they're saying now, uh, I think Newcastle says they'll have theirs by uh, 11 o'clock, Sunderland, I hope, a bit before. Let's talk to our reporter down there. Hello, can you hear us in Newcastle? Babita, Babita Sharma in Newcastle. David, hello, yes. Hello. It's looking a great race, uh, this. How are you gasping. doing? Yeah. Everyone was gasping when you said you think Sunderland might be a few minutes before Newcastle, because that's definitely not what they want to hear here tonight, because they are definitely clock watching here. Frantic activity behind me, because the first ballot box came in about seven minutes past ten. 128 in total are going to be making their way through to the sports arena. We think we've probably got about 50 of those boxes in so far. And what Newcastle are hoping to do is get a declaration result announced here by as early as roughly maybe quarter to 11. Now, if they do that, they will become the first to declare a result on general election night. And crucially, of course, they want to beat Sunderland. They've got a very healthy rivalry that's been going on for many elections in the past. And they keep reminding us here tonight that they, of course, beat Sunderland last year in the EU referendum result. I was here that night, and tonight is no exception when it comes down the, to the precise process of the boxes coming into the hall here and the counting getting underway. So if they are on track and they're looking pretty optimistic, maybe before 11 o'clock and before Sunderland. <laughs> Babita, thank you very much indeed. And of course, this is, I mean, it's great to have the race, but it's important too because that those first results will give us a clue through our cephologists, really. I wouldn't understand it. But will give us a clue of whether the exit poll is accurate or not, and we'll be hearing from them. But I'm joined now by Stuart Hosey, who was the MP for Dundee East, indeed is standing for Dundee East. Uh, Mr Hosey, you're in Glasgow tonight, I think, but thank you for joining us. What do you make of this exit poll, which looks, if it's right, rather damaging for the SNP? Down 22 is what the exit poll is saying. Well, first of all, it is only an exit poll, and so all of the usual caveats and pinches of salt should apply. The main story from it, if it's accurate, is that Theresa May has given up a majority, and we now have, again, if the numbers are correct, 314 Tories versus 314 others and 22 from the Northern Irish parties. Uh, 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 that's an extraordinary thing. For Theresa May to call this election for narrow party advantage, and then, if these numbers are correct, to blow it incredibly. If, uh, if she has blown it in the sense that she doesn't have an overall majority, would you allow her to go through with a Queen's speech in the House of Commons as the SNP, assuming you have at least a, a, a substantial wedge in the new House? Well, again, if this poll is correct, it would still point to the SNP winning the election in Scotland, which is what we set out to achieve. Uh, I don't recall us ever voting for significant Tory policy in the past, and it would be hard to see in the current climate, uh, with an austerity, cuts, hard Brexit party, that we'd want to support them in any way in this future Parliament. We've heard... Uh, uh, well, let, let me put it like this. The, the reason that we were... I said at the beginning we were a bit cautious about SNP on 34, down 22, mm. is we're told that a lot of these are very tight... Uh, the, the, the polling is suggesting 50-50, so you don't quite know which way to call them. But uh, two people in particular, Angus Robertson, your leader in, the, in Westminster, and Alex Salmon, the former leader of the SNP, are both said to be under threat if this exit poll is correct. Have you got any information from them about how they think they've done? Uh, no, I, I don't have any specific information from those seats at all, but, I mean, common sense would tell us that, uh, you know, a big beast like Alex Salmon... Uh, you know, a fantastic parliamentary performer like Angus Robertson with their track records in the constituencies uh, would have an edge over uh, any insurgent Tory campaign. But as I say, it will take some hours before this all comes out in the wash. Mr Hosey, thank you very much. When, when it does come out in the wash, perhaps you'll be very kind and come back and, um, in the light of reality rather than speculation, tell us what your position is. Indeed, I'll, I'll, I'll be delighted to as long as it's stopped raining by then. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. A last word from you two about this then. You heard Ming Campbell talking about what would happen and everybody is 
dumping on the Tories at the moment for having called this election in the first place. I mean, dumping on you in the sense saying it was a misjudgment. Uh, no, come it, on. It, I, think, it, I think it was the right thing to do, to have a clear and strong mandate as we go in to the Brexit negotiations. Theresa May didn't have that mandate last year when she took over for David, from David Cameron. And it was clear that other opposition parties were in the business of frustrating a successful Brexit. So I think it was the right thing to do, to, to ask the British people for a mandate. And we don't yet know, with not a single result in, we don't yet know what the result is. It was the right thing to do, but if it goes wrong, you'll be sitting there saying it was the wrong well, thing to do. We haven't got a result. No, 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 but I mean, you can't sit there saying it was the right thing to do. You know, if it turns out wrong, you'll be hanging your head in shame, or at least you'll be blaming Theresa May for having called in the first place. Well, I think it was right to ask the British people for their support, for, for a strong mandate to negotiate this very complex Brexit. And I think that was the right thing to do because she inherited from David Cameron um, a, a previous manifesto, which of course was designed before the Brexit referendum. Your, um, your uh, defence, uh, Shadow Defence Secretary, uh, Emma, Emily Thornberry, uh, Shadow France, Foreign Secretary, Emily Thornberry, is yeah. France, his Defence Secretary changes a bit. Um, um, was defense, yes. yes. Um, she's just said that she thinks that uh, Theresa May, on the basis of this exit poll, should resign. So would that be a call? I you think... I, well, look, it's an don't, exit... Don't say again, we don't know the exit poll. Just okay. assume for a moment the exit <laughs> poll is a, right. I'm so cautious on these occasions because of where we've been just the Just assume past. it's right. But if it, is, if it is right, I think her position is becoming increasingly untenable. And I'll tell you why. And it's, Michael, you need to listen to what the people were saying. Here's Theresa May promised us on seven different occasions that she wouldn't go for a snap general election, and she went for it. And she went for it on the basis of wanting to secure a mandate that she already had, and people just saw through that. And they saw this as a, an election which was for party advantage rather than the interest of the country. And it looks as though they've rejected her as a result of that. Well, Michael? she didn't uh, have a mandate. She oh, came into the Please, we after voted David for Cameron. Article 50. Yes, she did not, we just voted for it. She did not it. have a mandate from, from people. Indeed, many argued she should well, call an election much look, earlier. People I think saw this as pure opportunism and it looks as though they've rejected it and they thought that she's putting party advantage above that of the country when actually what we need to do now is addressing the real issue of the economy is about our economy, our public services You've been and yes, the party negotiations. party advantage over the last six or seven weeks. Uh, all right, look, Laura, what's, what's your judgment on this? Well, my phone at the moment is filling up with messages of scepticism, not of outright denial, but of scepticism from both parties. One senior Labour figure has just said to me, this doesn't feel believable from where they sit. Somebody on the Conservative side has said to them that it feels wrong. But, of course, this is an extremely extensive exit poll. And Theresa May, having looked unassailable at the start of this campaign, had a very bumpy time. Whether that was over social care, her manifesto promise that she was forced to tweak and forced to change, or whether it was over the issue of police cuts that became a huge pressure for her in the closing moments of the campaign. And I think also, and we heard this from voters on the doorstep when we were out around the country, some people were perhaps not resentful, but a bit, a bit peeved about having another election. And I just wonder, Michael Fallon, until April the 18th, you were also sitting there saying it was not the right thing to have an election. You were saying it would be the wrong thing to have an election. And people around the country saw that. They were skeptical about Theresa May going to the country. I think they understood the central argument that there were other parties determined to frustrate the Brexit <laughs> post process, to vote against it. We heard the Liberal Democrats were going to have a one, you know, campaign for a second referendum using their uh, but if the, the Conservatives go backwards, surely it will end up having seen to be an enormous political mistake to have called an election that she didn't need to do. Well, well, no, no, to even, to that even if the result is anywhere near this, it's a catastrophic error, well, and people have seen through it. We haven't well, had a result. Let's, <laughs> let's wait, exactly, let's <laughs> wait till we've had a result, because uh, the, 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 the exit well, poll... I just said, if it, even if it's near no, this... Yeah, yeah. The, the, getting carried away now. The, the, <laughs> I'm not the, at all, I'm the, very sceptical. The exit poll may <laughs> have egg on its face, in which case <laughs> Sky, ITV and the BBC <laughs> will all have egg on their faces, because it was a joint poll, I'm glad to say. We're not out here on our own, for once. Get, getting but, your excuses in earlier. Yeah, getting my excuses in earlier. You were getting your excuses in earlier, too. So let's, uh, let's look at the battleground, then, assuming this... Uh, well, I'll assume nothing. Jeremy Vine, let's yeah, have a look at that. <laughs> Listening to your conversation, I think we really shouldn't assume very much at all here. But the, we have the exit poll, and here's what I'm going to show you. Uh, we're looking here at Conservative seats that are the most marginal, the most vulnerable, because they were so tight last time. So starting up here with Gower, won by only 27 votes in 2015 by the Conservatives. 
Derby North, Amanda Soloway is the MP there, Croydon Central, the Minister Gavin Barwell, and so on. Down we go, down this first page of 32 seats, the Conservatives' most vulnerable seats. Now, we've fed the exit poll into this, and let's see what we think has happened here. Let's see how much of a, a land grab Labour have made here. So we have, amazingly, Gower staying Conservative under the poll, Derby North, Croydon Central going to Labour, Berry North, quite a lot of damage. Morley and Outward, Ed Bulls' old seat going back to Labour, we've got quite a lot of damage here in the first two columns and then interestingly you see as the board goes on actually the Conservatives start to defend themselves better not in Warrington South not in Keithley but generally speaking the Conservatives look at it so it looks as if that's the extent of the Labour advance but it isn't it's a very patchy patchy prediction this because actually you see here here's the second board 32 more seats bigger majorities Tor Bay, for example, a 3,000 majority, and they go up as we go down the board. What do we think has happened here? Let's have a look. So I ask it to change, and you can see that some of these Labour gains are uh, not in places you might expect. So Broxtow, for example, Calder Valley, Pudsey, we have as Labour gains. Exit poll, I have to stress. Colne Valley and so on. So Labour gaining here. Enfield Southgate, you remember the Michael Portello moment in 1997, we have going back to Labour. So on that board, Labour have done some more damage to the Conservatives, and it doesn't stop there. We go to even better defended Conservative seats now. Now, these are ones that you would not have thought could go to any other party when Theresa May started the election campaign. Let's see what the exit poll says. And here we have Labour reaching into seats where there may be a five or 6,000 majority. Warwick and Leamington, Elmerton, Rothwell, Milton Keynes South, Reading West. Under the exit poll, we have going Labour. We'll have to see what happens when we actually come to the actual results, which surely won't be too long. Let me just change the board. Let's turn it around now and let's look at targets. So when Mrs May called the election, she's thinking, OK, we're going to gain some Conservative seats, some Labour seats and, and from the other parties. Have they managed to make any gains in this extraordinary result where they seem to have reversed? Well, the seat that's most vulnerable to the Conservatives is Chester, because Labour won it with only a 93-vote margin. And then you go to Ealing Central and Acton, Rupert Hook in London, Berwickshire and Roxburgh, a very tight win for the SNP, and so on. So these are the seats that the Conservatives would, you would think, advance into first. Again, let's see what we think has happened. And you can see it's very, very poor performance. There's nothing, very little going on. They've taken, according to the exit poll, Berwickshire and Roxburgh, which was very marginal, Scottish seat, and we think as well Wrexham there. Ian Lucas was the MP there, so that seat would have gone Conservative. Seems to be a bit better story in Wales and in Scotland for the Conservatives than in England. Let's go to the second board here. Let's just keep doing these targets. So these are safer seats, but still, maybe the Conservatives would have had their eyes on them at the start of the election campaign before things started to go wrong. Let's see if they've won any seats here. Have the Conservatives won any seats? Yes, they have. But what have they got in common? Clwyd South Wales, Dale in Wales, Allen and Deeside in Scotland, Clacton, obviously special case because it was UKIP, and Dumfries and Galloway, a Scottish seat, Aberdeenshire West, Scotland, and Newport East was Jessica Morden was the MP there. That was Labour. That was Wales. So in England, the gains for the Conservatives seem to be few and far between. One more board for you. Here we go. These are seats which would have been hard for the Conservatives to gain. Anything happening here? Let's see. Very, very little. Perth and North Persia, a Murray in Scotland, nothing in England. Extraordinary. Labour have done some serious damage to Conservative seats in England, mm. and they may have offset it with gains in Wales and in Scotland, but all from the exit poll, we'll have to see. David. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, are we going to be hung, drawn and quartered if this is all wrong? <laughs> which it still might well be, but we have to go on with what we've got from the exit poll. And indeed, there's reaction already to this exit poll. I'm joined by two people who'll be sitting here during the evening. Um, Amol Rajan, who's the BBC's media editor, and Kamal Ahmed, who's our economics editor. Uh, you start. Has there been a, an immediate reaction? Well, I think it's safe to say there has been a huge reaction. Uh, this is a massive uh, shock. There's obviously huge caveats, David. Lots of people saying that um, there, as you said, lots of close seats, so it's too early to say. But astonishment in um, across the Twitter sphere. Caroline Lucas, uh, the Green Party leader, has just uh, tweeted saying, hardly dare hope this is right. To be clear, the Greens will never support a Tory government. Hashtag hope over hate. Jason Groves, who's the political editor of the Daily Mail, a paper that's been uh, very 
uh, supportive of Theresa May, um, says that Brenda from Bristol, a famous uh, quote from Brenda from Bristol, who said that, um, yeah, why do we need to have another election, said is going to have to cope with yet another election if this exit poll is right. And already, although it's very early, we haven't got results, there is some big themes emerging on social media, David. One is that this is a disaster for Theresa May, as Laura has pointed out. Another is that there may well be another election. And the third one that uh, people like Lord Ashcroft are unanimous on is that it's going to be a very long night. The, and Brenda from Bristol, I remember, she's not another bloody election. Not another one. Why yeah. does she have to do it? Right. In a Bristolian accent, I think, that I will never get close to emulating. OK. Uh, Kamal, has there been a reaction? There has, David. We, we, were, here, we were here together on referendum night yes. uh, when voted Brexit, yes, and there's a indeed. similar feel. Of course, as Amal says, as we've all said, you have to be careful. This is a poll, and we haven't actually seen any real results, but the pound is down about 2% already against the dollar. It's also down against the euro. I think that's not, that's not as much um, uh, about Jeremy Corbyn could be the prime minister, depending on how things may uh, turn out if this exit poll is correct. But it is about uncertainty. And that word we always use when the markets are looking at a situation. Because for the markets, the big economic challenge for the UK was Brexit. If we are in a position where neither of the parties have a solid majority, and have to go through tough negotiations, are in weak positions, there could be another election, this could have a situation where the Scot a Scottish referendum could become back into play, depending on those negotiations. The markets look at that and would much prefer a 70 majority for Theresa May or a 70 majority for Jeremy Corbyn, whatever their policies may be, because at least then they can make a judgment on what the likelihood trajectory of those negotiations are. So, so you're are. saying it's uncertainty not thinking that there's going to be possibly a softer Brexit if Theresa May doesn't have the majority? That... There is some argument, which I must admit I don't have a huge amount of sympathy for, which is the notion that there could be a softer Brexit if um, there is either a Jeremy Corbyn-led government or a hung parliament mm. and Theresa May having to put together a coalition. And the reason I say that is because I think on the uncertainty of would this government last for five years or four years? Would it last the whole of the Brexit process? Would the Brexit process be put back to Parliament in any substantive way? I think those um, concerns would outweigh any notion that there could be a slightly better deal yeah. with Europe, yeah. because I think those things are... The uncertainty is just going to loom much larger. And I think that's the reaction you are getting with the currencies. But, of mm. course, and we've been here before. Mm. We've been here before mm. with Brexit. The currency plunged to 120. Mm. We're well mm. above that. It has already, on that 2%, just slightly... We have to wait for those first marginals to really and the, see... And the currency, currency traders are making a fortune. Some will be on the right side of this bet, David. Sitting there, and some will be on the wrong making a million side. here and a million there and a billion here and a billion there. And some will be losing as well. They're all gamblers, really. <laughs> yes. All right. No, they make no. They, it's more than that, David. They are making they're making a judgment on the the possible strength of yes. the UK economy yeah. in the future. Okay. Well, like racehorses, <laughs> they may be right, they may be wrong, but I call it gambling. But anyway, let's let's go to uh, let's go to Scotland. And just a reminder of the figures in Scotland. The exit poll gave the SNP down 22 at 34. Emily, and I don't know which ones you've got up there, but let's see what the story is in Scotland. We're going to need a new word for caveat soon. I feel like I'm in the front line and we're talking about extreme caveat because the SNP is even uh, harder than some of the other places to read. We know at the moment, according to the forecast, the SNP are on 34 seats, that is. That means that they would lose 12 if the poll is on target. And these are some of the ones that we are hearing there is a 90% chance of them losing. Let me go into the first one, which comes out on our forecast as a gain for the Conservatives. Aberdeenshire West and Kincardine, they call this Aberdeenshire West life because all the candidates there are under 30. Uh, you'll see there Stuart Donaldson, the current uh, MP here. But the forecast is suggesting that even with that massive majority of 7,000 and the Conservatives needing a 6.4% swing, on the forecast, they would take it, OK? That's the first possible gain for the Conservatives, looking quite likely, according to the poll. Perth and North Perthshire. Uh, now, this was the Conservative target 88, if you can get your head around that. It would seem as if the Conservative chances in Scotland may be much better than uh, in England, but, of course, we haven't had a result in yet. This is what the forecast here is showing. It's what we call a Tory long shot. They'd need nearly 9% swing here, but that would put the Conservatives on 50% share of the vote 
if the poll is accurate. A couple of others that the SNP would lose, this time not to the Conservatives, but to the Lib Dems. This one much more tightly fought. John Nicholson, a former TV presenter, and under the forecast, the former TV presenter goes out, and in comes Jo Swinson, who you might remember from last time. She lost her seat, uh, the uh, Lib Dem business minister, in 2015, and she would take it back on a pretty decent uh, share of the vote, 43%, a big gap there, much bigger than the swing she would need if we're on track. And one more, Edinburgh West, which was number nine on the Lib Dem targets. And you can see how the 2015 share has those two top parties, SNP in first place and Lib Dems in second. On the forecast then, and this is often a four-way uh, contest, you could see the Lib Dems taking 40% share of the vote. Now, these are all tentative, but why I'm showing you those is they are the most likely ones uh, to actually change colour tonight. There are a lot more in Scotland that we would call 50-50. They're on the yeah. cusp. We wouldn't go further than that at this stage, but that's why uh, the exit poll is in such a sort of caveated mode at present. And these are, and these are, uh, these parties that are eroding the SNP are all pro the union, don't want another referendum on the union. Well, there you go. That might have something uh, to do with it, certainly, if we're seeing that step backwards from the SNP. But what's interesting is, for example, in Aberdeenshire West, I was looking at the Leave vote as well. Yeah. Uh, Aberdeenshire West, you can see 39%, which looks like quite a, a low Leave vote, although, mm. to put it in context, it's quite a high Leave vote uh, for Scotland. Maybe that has given the Conservatives a, a bit of a chance here. Some of them in Scotland we know are in the sort of 70 to 30 uh, model. Thanks very much, Emily. Well, let's go up to Scotland, uh, to Edinburgh, and join Sarah Smith, the Scotland editor. Uh, what do you make of this poll? And, of course, you'll be entering the same caveats everybody else has, but if it's true... Uh, absolutely, and the SNP themselves look a little anxious about this, but I wouldn't say that they think they're on target to lose that many seats. They were braced for some losses, because remember, they had such an amazing result two years ago, where they won 56 out of the 59 seats that are in Scotland. It seemed inevitable that they were going to lose some of them. This would be really, really remarkable if the exit poll is in any way correct about that. Um, and as you were alluding to with Emily there, the dynamic of this campaign in Scotland has been completely different. You have the SNP as the incumbents, essentially, because they had so many of the seats, and the Tories as the insurgents, the ones who thought that they could take a few seats off the SNP. They were optimistic about something between six and ten, maybe even a dozen seats. They would be very happy with that in Scotland. And the campaign narrative here has been different because it's been all about independence. Because it was just three months ago that Nicola Sturgeon said she wanted another referendum on Scottish independence. And the Tories have cast themselves as the one party who say they can stop another independence referendum. The most staunch defenders of the United Kingdom, although of course Labour and the Lib Dems also say they don't want another Scottish referendum. But the Tories have really taken on that mantle mm -hmm. of the union. And that's what they hope could propel them to take a good few seats off the SNP tonight. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's go to Cardiff and join Sean Lloyd. Uh, the Plaid Cymru figure was that it remains at three. Uh, what, other, what other things have been gone in Wales? We expect any other changes? Well, I'm in, in Cardiff where three of the four Cardiff constituencies are counting. We're not expecting any results from here for quite some time. Uh, Cadwyn Jones, the First Minister of Wales, has just been alongside me here on the balcony. He's just arrived at this count and was just trying to get a sense of his reaction to this exit poll because earlier polls were saying that perhaps the Conservatives could gain nine <coughs> seats here in Wales. Of course, Wales has traditionally been a Labour stronghold for the past uh, 100 years. It was only back in 1983 uh, that the Conservatives had their high watermark here when they gained 14 seats at the uh, height of Margaret Thatcher's popularity. But Theresa May was hoping to make inroads here. She came to Wales three times during well, this campaign uh, to four different constituencies. She went to Cloyd South, to Wrexham. Uh, she was hoping Wales had voted to leave 
believe that in some of these Welsh marginal constituencies that had voted to leave, that she would be gaining support in. She was really targeting them. Of course, we've got to see what the results are now. Caroline Jones, the First Minister of Wales, really led Labour's campaign here in Wales. Jeremy Corbyn did visit, but he wasn't particularly visible here. And Labour were campaigning under the brand of Welsh Labour, which they say has been successful for them in the past. What he's just been saying now is that uh, he doesn't want to comment on, on it too much on this exit poll. Of course, it, it, it's very early days. But he did make the point that uh, he didn't feel that Theresa May had engaged with people when she had come on these visits. And uh, he made the point that she hadn't entered into the debates. Plaid Cymru, as you said, expected to uh, remain on three. Uh, they have been working very hard on Ernest Moore. That was a target seat for them. And therefore, former leader Ye Yanwin Jones coming out of retirement uh, to stand as an MP there. So they're going to be looking very closely at that. And also the Honda, where they've been working very hard. It's their leader Leanne's Wood's backyard, and they've been campaigning very hard there on the streets. And it's where Leanne Wood chose to launch the Plaid Cymru Manifesto. Sean Lloyd there in, uh, down in Cardiff. Clive Murray is in uh, South London, uh, tooting, he's in tooting, covering... Battersea and Putney as well. Uh, what's the story there tonight? I should just say, Clive, before you start, we're keeping an eye, obviously, on yeah, our David, first result be... from Sunderland or wherever. Over to you, anyway. Yes, uh, could be very interesting here in the Wandsworth area. Three constituencies, as you say, David. Putney, Justin Greening, Conservative Cabinet Minister, big figure in the party. Uh, pretty unassailable, it seems, according to the polls. Uh, 10,000 majority, so highly likely to retain that seat for the Conservatives. It's the Tooting and Battersea seats that could be very interesting indeed. Tooting, of course, Sadiq Khan's old seat, now the Mayor of London. In the by-election, once he stood down in 2016, it was held by the uh, Labour Party, Rosie Alin Khan, but her majority was just over 6,000, and the Conservatives have coveted tooting for the last two election cycles at least. They've poured money in here, they've poured campaigners in here, and they really felt, certainly up until the last four or five days of the campaign, that they were making inroads. But I've talked to some of the Labour activists here. They're pretty confident that they will hang on to tooting. Uh, they've been putting out mail shots to all their activists in the area to come to the to tooting, Thank to you. campaign, and their feeling is that they've done pretty well on the doorstep. The final seat here, Battersea, held by the Conservatives, Jane Ellison, a majority of 8,000, but that tonight is being described as on a knife edge. And if the overall uh, uh, exit poll that you've been talking about throughout the evening is anything to go by, then it could well be that the Labour Party have taken that seat. So very interesting times here in, uh, at uh, the Wandsworth count. We're waiting for Houghton and Sunderland South. Uh, before we get it, and there they are counting, Emily, tell us what we should look out for in terms of verifying the exit poll, yep. if you can do that. This is the first real test of the exit poll and whether it's on target. This is the 2015 share of the vote. It's solid Labour. We don't expect that to change. Labour then on 55% share of the vote at the moment. UKIP in second place on 22 and the Conservatives in third place on 18. Now, if our forecast is on track, then Labour share of the vote will go up to 68%. Keep that figure in your mind. And when the real result comes in, if it's on or around there, we know that the exit poll is correct in this seat, in this part of the world, at least. This is what our forecast is suggesting. There could be uh, a big drop for UKIP there, down 15%. Some gains, even for the Conservatives here, and large gains of 13% for Labour. So those are the sorts of figures that we'll be putting side by side the exit poll to see if it all makes sense. John Curtis was... Uh... Our man in charge of the exit poll, which was done by these three broadcasting companies. John, were you... Well, what would you like to say about it? Are you surprised by it? The well, politicians I think, seem very surprised. I think we should always start with exit polls by suggesting what we can rule out. It seems to me that unless the exit poll is incredibly wrong, that the Prime Minister has failed to achieve her principal objective, which was that she was going to achieve a landslide, or at least a very big majority for her party, in the next House of Commons and thereby provide her with potentially rather more wiggle room over Brexit. 
I think the second thing that we can probably rule out is that the Labour Party is going to end up with more seats for the Conservatives and that indeed we are still probably talking about Theresa May or at least somebody from the Conservative Party heading the next administration. So those are, I think, probably two things we can rule out. Thereafter, while our exit poll at the moment is saying that its central forecast is 314 Conservative seats, which is short of an overall majority, I will remind you that two years ago we said it was going to be 316 Conservative seats. In the end, it ended up being 331. So we certainly, certainly cannot rule out the possibility that the Conservatives will still have an overall majority, but maybe one that isn't much bigger than the one that they had before the election was called. John, thanks very much. A reminder of how it would look in the House of Commons. Jer oh, Jeremy, are you ready? Yeah, Good. Yeah. Yeah, let's see. OK. Let's just take a look at uh, the House of Commons. We've got a, a device here. David, which we were just looking at, our coalition builder. So uh, w when the election campaign began, we thought, well, this is not going to be, surely, how it's ending up. But we are looking now at who and how you put together the 326 MPs you need for an overall majority in the House of Commons. So what we have here are the numbers. We have the Conservatives 314, Labour 266 from the exit poll. We keep having to say without having a result yet. And what we're going to do is pull them out one at a time. So. Let's bring the Conservatives first, uh, 314. And, and we can, as you see here, we have the 326 line just here. Can they find some alliances that will give them a majority in the House of Commons to maybe not a coalition, maybe just a working arrangement, something at least to get the Queen's speech through to start off with? So 314 for the Conservatives, if that is the result, leaves them as they were in 2010 looking for friends. In 2010, they went to the Liberal Democrats. This time, it's not going to work. The Lib Dems seem to have been burned by that, so they are not playing ball with the Conservatives. So we will put in, shall we, let's see, which we'll put in the Democratic Unionists in Northern Ireland who've been happy in the past to cooperate with the Conservatives, maybe not as an official coalition, but at least to work with them vote by vote. The trouble here is they need 326. Under the exit poll, they're so far short of that that they can only make 322 with the DUP. And then you're left. There are no, there's no UKIP MP under the exit poll to bring in. You're left with a situation where they've fallen short. So for the Conservatives, that, this really is very awkward. I'll put it into the House of Commons and I'll just show you. The, worth saying, again, that, of course, the exit poll wouldn't need to be... Oh, it's gone on the other side. Well, there we are. It's, uh, they've, they've actually put all the parties into the other side of the House of Commons. Worth saying, though, the exit poll could be only slightly wrong and it could change those figures drastically so the Conservatives then don't need very many alliances to get their 326 in the House of Commons. Shall we just try this quickly with Labour? Let's just see what the numbers can do for Labour. Now, again, it's tricky because the Lib Dems have said similar things about Labour that they've said about the Conservatives. So, but we'll, let's, just, let's just try this, just so we could visualise it. 266 Labour seats. Now we say, OK, maybe there's something, some way of getting the SNP to work with Labour. Maybe the two of them could agree vote by vote, bill by bill, maybe just to agree a Queen's speech. Maybe at this point, if the Conservatives haven't got any means of getting a Queen's speech through, they're off the pitch. So it's Labour and the SNP, and that makes 300. They're still a way short. I, I, won't, I won't put in the... Well, let's put in the Lib Dem just for, just, for, just for the sake of it. But even then, you're still nowhere near 326. So it looks... You'd put in Plaid Cymru, probably, the SDLP in Northern Ireland, um, the, the one Green MP under the exit poll. It's all very theoretical, because we're dealing with numbers which we haven't had confirmed at all yet. But it's, it's no easier for Labour to put a team together to get to 326 under these numbers. I mean, this exit poll is, is so extraordinary, David, because it leaves a, all the parties a bit stuck. It really does leave the Conservatives in difficulty getting to 326. Let's just look at one of the um, building blocks of uh, that, Jeremy. Geoffrey Donaldson of the DUP, Democratic Unionist Party, in Northern Ireland. Uh, last time round, Mr Donaldson, you had eight MPs. If that happened again, what's your view of what you do and what do you make of this election that was called to give the Prime Minister an overall sweeping grand majority? Well, David, good evening from Lisburn in Northern Ireland. Um, this is uh, perfect territory for the DUP, obviously, because if the Conservatives are just short of an overall majority, it puts us in a very, very strong negotiating position. And certainly that is one that we will take up with relish. And what would your negotiating position be, just for viewers who don't know what it is? Well, um, I'm not going to spell that out in detail at this stage, obviously. Um, as in 2015, we had a lot of speculation um, at the early stages of the evening. The Conservatives, in the end, 
managed an overall majority at that stage. Uh, so I'm not going to preempt the outcome. But what I will say is that uh, you know we will be serious players. If there is a hung parliament, we will go in um, and we will talk to whoever uh, it is. It looks like the Conservative Party will be the largest party. We will talk to them. We have a lot in common. Uh, we uh, want to see Brexit work for the United Kingdom and, of course, for Northern Ireland. We want to see uh, the union strengthened and the Conservatives are committed to that. Um, so I think there is a lot of common ground on which we can work. And obviously, we will want to get the best deal for Northern Ireland itself. So you're keeping something up your sleeve from our viewers tonight, Mr Donaldson, because we know you were in favour of Brexit and presumably you'll put your, uh, change the analogy, shoulder to the wheel on that. But what else is it you're thinking of? Just give us a clue. Well, David, I've been a negotiator in Northern Ireland now for quite a number of years, and I know that uh, any serious negotiator doesn't reveal their hand in advance, and we're not going to do that. Um, in the past, uh, and I can give you some clues, in the past what we have done um, is uh, operate uh, on a vote-by-vote -vote basis with whoever is the government um, and looked at issues... Um, as they arose in the House of Commons. Thank you very uh, we much. We may be into a different scenario this time. Well, when we're, when we're into our, maybe we could talk again. Thank you very much. Laura, you had a point. It's just worth saying, you know, in this previous Parliament, where the Tories have already been dealing with a small majority, you know, working majority of 17, they've already, on some issues, been very dependent on the DUP. They are well used to dealing with them behind the scenes. And I have to say, the DUP, who tend to take a stronger line on Brexit than the Tory party, are very used to pressing the levers to get things they want out of the Conservatives. Also worth saying, just to remember, in terms of that number of 326, of course, Sinn Féin MPs don't tend to take their seats. So when we're thinking about if these numbers are right, the Tories trying to build some kind of deal, maybe with the DUP, the actual number that they're looking at is 323. Mm. If it's going to be so finely balanced, don't that tend does to. They never have taken their seats, have <laughs> well, they, Sinn Féin? No. Um, we think we've got about two minutes... Michelle, let's just go over to you for a moment uh, but, um, we'll keep an eye on Sunderland in case it comes through, or Newcastle. David, uh, with me is John Lansman, the chair of Momentum, the organisation that was set up to support the leadership of Jeremy Corbyn. Um, John Lansman, what would a result in line with this exit poll mean for Mr Corbyn personally? Well, it would put him in a, in a, in a, in a clear uh, position of having you know, fought a very successful campaign. Um, which has uh, you know, resulted in uh, Theresa May failing to get the, uh, the, the, the overwhelming majority that she was seeking. You know, she, she sought uh, to an election that she had uh, several times said she wasn't going to call in order to get that uh, overwhelming majority, and she's utterly failed. Jeremy's fought a fantastic campaign. Nevertheless, it, it looks, according to this, as if the Conservatives will be the largest party. And knowing Mr Corbyn as you do, will he be trying to have those conversations, difficult as they are for all the reasons that uh, Jeremy just outlined, with the SNP, with the Liberal Democrats, with others, to try and find a route to number 10? I really think it's much too early to start talking about those things. You know, this is just an exit poll. Um, you know, as, as it was said, very small changes in these results could completely change the arithmetic of that kind of thing if that's where we are. And I'm not, you know, it's not clear that that's where we are. I think that really is premature. John Lansman, thank you. One of the reasons that uh, it's taking a bit longer to count tonight is that the turnout in Sunderland is up by about five percentage points, up to about 61%. Still quite a low turnout, actually. The average was in the mid-60s last time round, but that's one of the reasons. But just remember, when we do come to it, we mark the card. Peter Kellner, our election analyst, is here. You've got the raw figures of what you well, think well, Sunderland it, would deliver. On those turn-up figures, if our exit poll is right, then Jill Phillips and the Labour candidate, who got 21,000 votes last time, we get 27 to 28,000 Newcastle votes. has won, and we'll go there, yeah. and I'll come back to you in a moment. Let's have the Newcastle result. They're the winners. Hang on. Uh, can you ring that the news desk or the... Well, they have to read it out fast. Can I... <laughs> can I have your attention, the please? Labour MP. I'm ready to declare the result for Newcastle upon last time of 12,500, over 12,500. I, Pat Ritchie, returning officer, hereby give notice that the total number of votes for each candidate for Newcastle upon Tyne Central constituency is as follows. Nick Cott, Liberal Democrats, 1,812.
Steve Kite, Conservative Party candidate, 9,134. David Mowat, UK Independence Party, UKIP, 1,482. Chi Onwura, Labour Party, 24,071. Peter John Stewart Thompson, Green Party candidate, 595. And that Chi Unwura has been duly elected to serve as member for the said constituency. So here for the first time is uh, the way we'll be showing the results tonight. Newcastle, no surprise that Chi, uh, surprise that Chi Unwura has held the seat. Majority of 14,900 and so, up 2,200 from last time. The first victor of the night, let's just hear a word from her. The um, terrible murder of Joe Cox just a year ago and following the atrocious attacks uh. in Manchester and London. It is thanks to our police and our emergency services that the democratic process can come to such a successful conclusion. And I'd also like to thank the returning officer and all the staff here. Um, it is that for an efficient and extremely quick count. And I'm also really glad to see that the National Youth Council... So the, the counters in Sunderland, Council, looking very pleased with themselves, so at Newcastle rather, having beaten Sunderland, Pip them to the post. Now, the interesting thing about this is, let's just see the share, and uh, this tells you the story. Labour on 65%, the Conservatives on 25 Liberal Democrats on 5 UKIP on 4 The change since last time, Labour up 10 and the Conservatives up 10 percentage points, UKIP down 11 And the swing from Conservative to Labour, 2%. Now, Peter Kellner, in your view, that is better for the Conservatives and worse for Labour Substantially than, the, than the opinion, than the, the exit poll was suggesting. The projection from the exit poll to this seat was suggesting a split, Labour Conservatives 74% 14, we've got 65 25. So the exit poll was projecting a 7% swing to Labour, we've got a 2% swing to Labour. Now, you know, this is a safe seat. It's not a battleground seat. The exit polls are not going to be that reliable in these kinds of seats. Well, OK, but let me ask... it's straw, it's better for the Tories. Let me ask John Curtis mm. that. Um, Peter Kellner mm. says it's not as accurate in this seat. Is that right, or oh, do you accept the analysis? Absolutely right, and I can explain why we were forecasting a big swing to Labour in this mm. seat. One of the things that the exit poll looks as though it found is that Labour would do better in the seats that it was defending where there was a substantial Remain vote in 2016, as opposed to those places where there's substantial leave vote. So, for example, we don't expect Labour to do as well in Sunderland as we thought they would do in Newcastle. But I think what we should note at this point is simply the direction of travel. It is a 2% swing to Labour. Yep, it is a safe seat, but it is the first sign of the night that maybe the country is going to drift from uh, the Conservatives to the Labour Party. Drift from the Conservatives to Labour? Yes, we've got a 2% swing to Labour in this poll. Uh, in the, in dr dr drift, but not, not for Labour to overtake the Conservatives. You're just saying no, absolutely. I mean, if, if we were to and do... Newcastle, of course, was 50-50 on Brexit pretty well. Wasn't sure, it? yeah, but yes. it's a much more pro-Remain Labour seat than yes. Yes, I take uh, that. Is, is the Sunderland I don't seat. know what's happened to Sunderland, John. They were beavering away, but no, nothing seems to have happened. Uh, well, All yeah, those white gloves and that running around. But one of, one of the things to say, David, that, that increase in the turnout in... Newcastle is something that it is thought has occurred fairly broadly across the country. And given that one of the question marks about this election was, would people turn out, would young people in particular turn out, I would guess that the Labour Party would regard the evidence that turnout is up as relatively encouraging from their point of view. And do, have you, do you have any evidence about young people? Because we know that... No. I can't... No, we, 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 we don't. All I can tell... Well, well, yes and no. What I can tell you is that, in general, we are finding that in constituencies where there are a large number of graduates who are, of course, disproportionately younger, we expect Labour to do better than in places where there are fewer graduates. Indeed, in general, 
it looks as though from the exit poll that that part of Britain which was predominantly remained is going to be relatively good territory for Labour and that part of Britain that was predominantly leave is going to be relatively good territory for the Conservatives and that therefore this may indeed end up of having been a Brexit election even though the issue of Brexit disappeared off the campaign agenda. Thanks, John. I think we have the Sunderland result. Irene Lucas, acting returning officer, hereby give notice of the total number of votes for each candidate for the Houghton and Sunderland South constituency is as follows. I hope you can hear this. Richard Peter it's, uh, Bradley, Green Party, a bit difficult. 725. Paul, Paul John Edgeworth, Liberal Democrat, 908. Paul Havel, Conservative Party, 12,324. Michael Anthony Joyce, UK Independence Party, 2,379. Bridget Lave Philipson, Labour Party, 24,000. Well, they met. That Bridget May Phillipson has been duly elected to serve as member for the said constituency. They, may, they may, be, may be able to count in a hurry. They certainly need to take control of their sound system. Labour won. It was a safe Labour seat. But the Conservatives are up more than Labour in that seat. UKIP uh, went down to 2,300 from 8,000 last time round. And if I heard it right, the Conservatives are on 12,300, up from 7,000. We don't seem to have all the figures in because I think we may have missed the Labour figure. We're trying to find it out. Um, and when we do, we'll be able to explain what's happened. But again, it's another seat where it looks as though... It, we'd like say Newcastle, that, yes. in Sunderland, the Conservatives have done substantially better than the exit poll projection. Uh, Labour has done substantially worse. Now, these are two constituencies, what, 20 miles apart. So there may be something going on in safe Labour seats in that region that the exit poll hasn't quite picked up. Or it might be that the exit poll is wrong. We'll have to wait two or three hours to find out, David. Nora. Interesting, though, in both of those seats, we've seen a significant fall away in the UKIP vote. Okay. Now, for the Conservatives, from the start of this election, the central part of their strategy was UKIP voters who might have been previously Labour voters in this election they hope would go straight across to the Conservatives. And there are 71 seats across the country where the Labour majority was smaller than the UKIP vote in 2015. Now, early, early, early days, but a pattern, even in these safe Labour seats, that the UKIP vote is crashing and the Conservatives need that to happen right across the country I, I, if they are to end up in any kind of position to form a, 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 a decent majority. And it looks as if the UKIP vote is not crashing as completely to the Conservatives <laughs> as some of the projections in advance suggested. <laughs> and that may be one of the reasons why Labour is doing a bit better uh, than it's, yeah. uh, the, the pre-election polls. Indeed. I'm still trying to discover what happened in Houghton and Sunderland South because we haven't been able to produce the figures or the share or the change because of apparently a microphone failure at the count, which seems rather weird. Is it not, have anybody got it on Twitter? Have you got it on... No, you haven't got it on Twitter. Have you got no, it? Let me try no? find it. Nobody's got it. <laughs> well, we'll try and get it in due course. Let's, in the meantime, uh, go to Tim Farron's seat, or what was his seat, uh, in Westmoreland and Lonsdale. Join Lucy Manning. Lucy, good evening. Uh, good evening. We're outside uh, Tim Farron's house. We're expecting him back here fairly soon. If the exit poll is right, and that, of course, is a big if. This will be seen as a pretty good night for the Liberal Democrats. Even if they only gain a handful of seats, the expectations, I think, were so low because there was such criticism of the campaign, the Liberal Democrats offering this second vote on a Brexit deal that the voters didn't really seem to want, and questions about Tim Farron's leadership. But now, with this exit poll suggesting they could get 14 seats, it leaves him potentially in the position of a kingmaker. And yesterday, when I spent some time with him on the bus. I 
talked over the idea of there was going to be a hung parliament, what the Liberal Democrats would do. He was absolutely clear that there would be no deals, no pact, no coalition, no confidence and supply where they voted for the budget. Of course, you remember, everyone remembers the Liberal Democrats got burnt when they went into coalition. They lost all those seats at the last election. And he is mindful of that and doesn't want to repeat that. And Lib Dem sources tonight being very clear that that position stays the same. No deals, no coalitions, no pact. So if there is a hung parliament situation, I think the Liberal Democrats will be in a situation where both sides might want them, but they will only offer support on a vote-by-vote -vote basis. I should add that they are not sure this exit poll is right. They are being cautious. In previous years, the exit polls had them on more seats than they ended up getting. They say that some of their key battles are too close to call. They're seeing a hardening up of the vote in lab in, uh, for Labour in some of the university seats that they hope to get. But I think at the moment they are more optimistic than I think they thought they would be at this stage. Well, whether they, whether they have that traction, we'll discover as we get a few more results in. We now do have the Houghton and Sunderland South result, uh, a safe Labour seat. There is the raw figures, 24,665 for Labour. UKIP in third place, Conservatives going up into second place. And the change since last time, let's just see that, or rather, yes, there's the change. Conservatives up 11 percentage points, UKIP down 16 percentage points. Mm -hmm. The swing here from Labour to Conservatives of 3.5%. Mm -hmm. So, Peter Kellner, what do you make of that one? Well, the exit poll expectation was almost the exact swing in the opposite direction, around a 3% swing to Labour. So these first two results unquestionably will be chewing the Conservatives up after a pretty grim <laughs> hour following the exit poll. Mm -hmm. But whether that chew will carry on through the seats that really matter, the battleground seats where the majorities last time were very much narrower, that we'll have to wait and see. What would you be looking for next as a test? Because these are both seats in the North East and um, where, where, would you, where would you want to... Well, Get your spread if Some you of the, to make it clearer. It may be an hour or two before we get because these seats rush to declare and there may not be many uh, uh, in the red eastern places. The slough, we were told but, the slough but, was going to be very quick. But, but, I don't know whether they are. Well, well slough would be interesting, Swindon North would be interesting, Battersea and Putney, two of the relatively early London declarations where the Conservatives mm -hmm. might be vulnerable if Labour doing a really well in, in London. Uh, Putney, of course, Justine Greening, the Education Secretary. Um, Tooting. A Labour seat, Sadiq Khan won two years ago. Um, these are the kind of seats, but I think a lot of these will be waiting until one to two o'clock in the morning uh, to get these very, very early declarations where they rush with all those kids to get the uh, counts done within an hour. That, that's, that's the exception. Right. More or less everywhere else, it'll take a lot longer. We're joined by um, a familiar figure from politics, one party or another, Neil Hamilton, <laughs> who's now the leader of UKIP in the Welsh Assembly. Mr Hamilton, good evening. Good evening. Uh, it does look like a bit of a wipeout for UKIP, then. You've done your job, you've got your Brexit, and that's it. Game's up. Well, we've been, we've been squeezed. I mean, Theresa May intended this to be a sort of binary competition between Labour and the Tories, although it hasn't quite worked out as she expected after her disastrous campaign. But uh, you know, UKIP has an endearing place in Welsh politics, certainly. You know, we have our members in the Welsh Assembly for the next four years. And I believe that after this disastrous election for the Conservatives, I th we'll be able to carve out a permanent niche for ourselves in UK politics as well, because we put forward a lot of policies in this election campaign, which none of the other parties uh, can copy us on, like slashing the non-humanitarian aid budget, significantly to put money into the health service, scrapping green taxes, to cut people's electricity bills. None of that really came out in this campaign, which was focused, I think, for UKIP supporters, purely on the Brexit issue, and a lot of them have clearly gone to the Tories, without which Theresa May's position would have been very, very bleak indeed. Uh, UKIP, it looks as though UKIP won't have any seats in Westminster. You presumably would go along with that. You don't expect to oh, gain yes. a seat. Yeah. No, 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 no. So your strength will be in Wales, really, you mean? Well, it is, in, as a matter of fact, <laughs> no, That yes. was meant to be a tease. I wasn't actually <laughs> saying uh, that you could, uh, you could re rebound from Wales. Well, in Wales, of course, we have a proportional representation system, which means that we get fair representation, unlike in the uh, first-past-the-post system uh, at Westminster. 
Um, Neil Hamilton, thank you very much. Let's just hear what uh, reaction has been uh, for these two results, if you've got any, that we've had in. Well, there's uh, the initial shock, I think, David, uh, in Conservative circles has subsided to some thoughts about the longer-term implications. Tim Montgomery, who's a, a very influential Conservative writer, just tweeted, Theresa May has been most disastrous Tory leader since... Question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. Eden, Anthony Eden, so there's some talk about how long... She will last as Prime Minister. Tom Newton Dunn, who's the political editor of The Sun, again, another paper that was very supportive of Theresa May, um, has been in touch with senior Tories who said that they've now crunched their own numbers and this supports what Peter Kellner has been saying. Are convinced the exit poll is wrong. The quote he's uh, got off the record there is, it simply just doesn't add up. Um, more broadly, there's obviously a lot of talk about um, what this means for Brexit. And Alistair Campbell, who's been one of the most vigorous opponents of Theresa May uh, and the Conservatives' uh, plans for what he describes as a hard Brexit, says, this election is a rejection of May and hard Brexit, a vote for one to go uh, and the other to be revisited. Um, that's obviously going to be a big part of the uh, post-election discussion. And we've got some of the initial um, foreign reaction, because Carl Bildt, the former Swedish Prime Minister, uh, has also uh, put up a message saying, this could be messy, this could be messy for the United Kingdom in the years ahead. One mess risks following another, price to be paid for the lack of true leadership. So there's obviously huge international implications and uh, opponents of Theresa May in Europe are, uh, are looking at this with some glee, I think. Laura, let's just go back for a moment to this exit poll. Mm -hmm. uh, what would uh, Theresa May need to get to quell uh, anxiety, mm -hmm. fury, plotting mm -hmm. against her in the Conservative Party? What do you think she's now... She's obviously heard the exit poll. What would she be thinking to herself? How much do I need to remain well, I think Prime Minister? If the exit poll turns to be anything like right, then it is very, very dicey for her indeed. Why do I say that? Don't worry. Because even after the campaign, one conservative, senior conservative said to me today, after the mistakes that she's made in the campaign, she will not be allowed to fight the next general election campaign. Now, that was one view but from a senior member of the party that said even the experience of seeing her exposed in some ways on the campaign trail, not seeming politically nimble, not seeming able to run a resounding campaign, that her time was limited in terms of staying on fully till the next general election. Now, of course, this could be wrong. A significant majority, a safe majority, could blow her out of the water. But I think for people in the last couple of weeks have been saying if it is sort of 30 or below, then she's very damaged by that. I think most Tories would have been happy with a majority of 50 or 60, but if the poll's anything like right, she's miles away from that. So if she ends up with no overall majority, she's very, very damaged, but I think if the result, if she, even if she climbs up to a majority of sort of 15, 20, 25, 30, she's still very, very tarnished by this whole experience. Of course, she had a, a, a working majority of 17 Indeed, at dissolution. Indeed, she did, which was uncomfortable. It was difficult. Yeah. She had to give up on some things. She had to change her mind. She had to drop policies that she was not going to be able to get through. She made her chancellor ditch the central part of his budget because the party wouldn't wear it. But she did have a majority. She was actually still able to get things done. She had. She didn't have to call this election. Do you think she'd and be able to change her chancellor, which everybody said before this election? Well, he, he, Hammond was on the way out. It was widely of... expected that if she ends up with a, if she ended up with a majority, she was going to sack Philip Hammond. Now you never know until the reshuffle actually comes. But that was a very wide. But I mean, she won't be in a very strong position she... to do things that that offend other parts of the party to Indeed which she not. Is not close. But in terms of the current balance of the Conservative Party, I think cheerleaders for Mr Hammond would not necessarily be in great enough numbers to be able to force her to keep him. That said, if the political situation seems extremely rocky, extremely uncertain, certainly in terms of the economic reaction, changing a Chancellor who's respected by the city is not something that would be seen as a wise move. Uh, don't think that it's just us sitting here in the studio talking all over the country, 650 places. Well, actually, since we've had two, 648 <laughs> places. A busy counting. Let's just see where they are. Islington, for instance, at the moment, where Jeremy Corbyn's seat is counted and Emily Thornberry's old seat is counted. Uh, Huddersfield, where there are a whole clutch of marginal constituencies in West Yorkshire, which the Conservatives were hoping to make grounds in. Um, Two seats in Derby, one Conservative seat and Labour's Margaret Beckett. And then Westmoreland and Lonsdale, where we were a moment ago, where Tim Farron's constituency. All these people either brought in 
uh, as volunteers, paid, sometimes bank clerks paid overtime to do this work, and you see it's responsible work and tiring. You've got to get open each one, verify it, make sure you've made no mistake. Uh, not electronic at all, all done by hand in the old-fashioned way. That's why it's taking a bit of time. And if it's true that the turnout everywhere is up, then the slower pace of uh, results is what we can expect. Michelle. David, uh, with me is the former Labour Home Secretary and former Foreign Secretary, Jack Straw. Welcome. When Jeremy Corbyn was first elected, you said he would lead Labour into political oblivion. This is a night where the exit poll, at least, suggests that Labour has made gains under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. Yes, and if that's the case, I'm delighted, uh, because I've been on the Labour Party actually slightly longer than Jeremy Corbyn. Um, and I've been working in this election, as everybody has, for a Labour victory. One of the really interesting things about this election is not... It's, no, it's perfectly public that uh, quite a lot of people, particularly in the parliamentary party or just left, had reservations about Jeremy. But one of the really interesting things about the election is that the party, the Labour Party as a whole, has been very disciplined in this election. It's got behind Jeremy Corbyn, it's got behind the manifesto, and if this exit poll is anything to go by, it suggests we've done better than most people right. thought. And that's suggesting that it's more about the party and the party machine than a, a personal vindication. No, for no, no I mean, listen, I, I, uh, it's also a, a great personal credit to Jeremy Corbyn, if, if this is correct, and to John MacDonald, and no one can take it away from them, because what you've seen in the election, I didn't expect it, I'll be perfectly honest, is great vigour and consistency by uh, the Labour Party, including on the ground by Labour candidates. And again, the thing I didn't expect was that in place of a strong and stable leader, to coin a phrase, you've had a weak and wobbly leader. Uh, and this is a, a sort of disaster for both the Conservative Party and for Theresa May. The only perhaps silver lining out of it, uh, from their point of view, from the country's point of view, if it ends up with a hung parliament, with a the Conservatives being the largest party, we may get a more sensible uh, set of negotiations for Brexit than would otherwise be the case. Well, not necessarily. I mean, it depends where, where, where she looks for, for support. If it's the DUP, for example, with the obvious people that she'll turn to in the first instance. But if, if you're in a... I mean, I've, I worked in a minority government. I worked, worked in the 1974-79 uh, uh, Labour government. And if you're in that situation then you have to compromise not only with your own side, but also with the other side as well. It's just the way the alchemy and the chemistry of Parliament works. Jack Straw, thank you very much. David. Thanks. Uh, John, we just had a query, it's coming through on Twitter, where, about the exit poll. People saying that 20, maybe 25% mm -hmm. of people have cast postal ballots. Yep. You stand your people yep. at secret, I know, because yep. I've asked you to tell me where they are, you yep. won't tell me, secret polling stations yep. around the country, 144 yep. of them. Yep. What happens about the postal ballots, a quarter of the votes? Well, basically what we're doing with the exit poll is comparing how people uh, who went to the polling station voted this time with how, they've, how those people who went to the, po the same polling station two years ago voted. So the assumption we are essentially making is not necessarily that postal voters will vote the same way as those who went to the polling station, but that the movement in whatever direction will be roughly similar amongst those who voted by post okay. and those who voted uh, direct. Uh, that now, makes it clear. So it's a, it's a sample, really. That's uh, a, obviously, it may be true they behave differently. The one thing I can tell you is that one of the things we looked at our data was to, our polling stations vary in the proportion of people who are registered to vote by post but there isn't any relationship between the swing to the Conservatives or Labour or whatever and the proportion of people in a polling station that were registered to okay. vote by post. And one other thing, is it possible under your exit poll that there could nevertheless, at the end of the night, be a big, a substantial Conservative majority? Well, it depends on how you define substantial or big. But it was I mean, Peter Kellner's point. How would you define it, Peter? I would have said a majority... He's of on toast now. Right. What I'm saying is if the, if the exit poll... <laughs> is as wrong everywhere else as has been in these first two results,
then you could have a, a, a 80, 100 conservative majority. Okay, 80 it, or 100. But, but, he says. but even if you dial that down, you could still yeah. have a majority of 30 or 40. Okay, John? Oh, a majority of 30 or 40, I think we still have to regard as potentially possible. No, he said 80 or 100. Uh, well, 80 or 100, shall we say, then I think, you know, we clearly will be seriously astray. I mean, I won't want to bore you, but one of the things that often happens... You're never, ever boring. Well, <laughs> one of the things that often happens but. with exit polls is that they exaggerate mm. the forecast in terms of the differences between constituencies, mm. OK? So because we are looking at two Labour constituencies, in both of which we're expecting quite a substantial swing to Labour, actually a bigger swing to Labour than across the country as a whole, it may be that we've simply exaggerated the extent to which that's going on. Who all right. David, let, OK, let, 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 uh, we're, going, we're going to join... I'll come back to you all in a moment, but Katya Adler is standing by in Brussels, uh, Europe editor, and let's just join her. Katya, what, have, you had a, have you had a reaction to the surprising exit poll, let me put it no stronger than that, uh, uh, that we've had this evening? I mean, no official reaction so far because, of course, we are talking about exit polls. But I would love to see uh, the thought bubbles um, in, uh, here in Brussels in political uh, e and EU circles in Berlin and in Paris tonight because it's in all of these places across Europe that people, politicians, leaders are glued uh, to their television and radio sets tonight. It's not just in the U United Kingdom because, of course, this will have a huge impact impact on Brexit. Now, the, the EU didn't really care how these elections turned out, you know, what flavour of government would come out of this in the UK. But nearly a year on after uh, the, the EU referendum, they really want to get down to business. They were hoping to start those face-to-face -face negotiations with the UK for the first time in about 10 days' time. And now all of this, there's a big question mark hanging over it. They wanted what they said was a, a, a strong prime minister, a secure prime minister, somebody who would be in place for the duration of the negotiations, somebody who knew their mind and were confident in it and wouldn't be beholden to uh, smaller groups, whether within their party or outside their party, because what the EU doesn't want once negotiations start is someone who wavers and U-turns and doesn't really know their mind. And, of course, this is most important of all for the UK because that clock is ticking. Article 50 was triggered. The formal countdown to Brexit has started under EU rules. The UK only has until March. 2019 to get that divorce deal signed, sealed and delivered by the EU, never mind a future trade deal. So any hesitation, that is costly for the UK. So in other words, they did want uh, Theresa May to get a hefty majority because they, I, I, you said at the beginning they didn't care, but from what you're saying subsequently, if they want clarity, if they want a leader who knows exactly what she's doing and doesn't have to look over her shoulder all the time, a big majority for... Theresa May would have helped them. They, they didn't want Theresa May more than Jeremy Corbyn or anybody else. They said that they just wanted to have a prime minister who would be secure enough in their position uh, to be able to know their mind and push it forward in the negotiations to uh, appoint a chief Brexit negotiator. For the EU, that's the most important figure. That's the person who will be sitting opposite them at the table with the, the chief EU negotiator who comes uh, from the European Commission, and they will be discussing or battling it out week by week, month by month, um, right Right up until uh, the last minute, probably, you know, by, by all Brussels deals, you know, in, in the past. So what they need is a government that is stable, but not particularly for EU taste, Theresa May or Jeremy Corbyn or anybody else, but just yeah. somebody who will remain in that seat for the duration of the negotiations. Uh, uh, it's interesting, this, because, as you know, there was some criticism of the campaign. Uh, we had um, John McDonald here, John McDonald, a moment, complaining that Brexit never surfaced and he never talked about Brexit and how it will be conducted. The Conservatives never really talked about it. Um, is, there, is there a feeling that uh, in, in Brussels that they, they have ideas, they know the way they want Brexit to go, but the British government doesn't know the way it wants it to go? That, that is so much the feeling here. I mean, from the Brussels perspective, or the EU perspective, if, if you like, uh, the UK seemed to tear itself apart after the EU referendum with recriminations between uh, leavers and remainers, and, and then it then dived into preparations for a general election. And, and in the meantime, you know, almost 12 months have gone by. And during that time, the EU has been quietly getting its Brexit ducks in the row. It has its chief Brexit negotiator in place. 
place. He has his team in place and they've been dotting the I's and crossing the T's. They have issued very, very detailed draft negotiating papers already on specific points like uh, the amount of money it wants the UK to pay before uh, it leaves the EU, like EU citizens' rights, the rights of citizens who stay uh, in the UK after Brexit and the rights of UK citizens who stay in the rest of the EU. So this is very, very detailed. Now, Theresa May said that uh, they also had a very clear Brexit plan, but they didn't want to divulge it. But as far as the public was concerned, uh, there were a lot of platitudes uh, uh, that, that were spread around. Brexit means Brexit and so on, and no more details than that. And the, the EU is a big, big, big contrast. I mean, they can't keep anything a secret because there are so many players involved, 27 countries plus the European Commission and the European Parliament. And so they are being transparent. They're publishing all of this and there are a lot of details prepared already. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Cambridge. Let's go to Cambridge now. Um, Cambridge, the Labour Party is ho holds the seat. Liberal Democrats were hoping to take it. Um, and Mo Bakshi joins us from there. Is your impression that the Liberal Democrats think they may have taken Cambridge or the other way around, that the Labour's kept it? I think the feeling very much in the hall, on the ground, is that actually Labour is going to squeak it here and hold on. It's, it's one of the tightest battlegrounds in the country and it has been a bitter, bitter battle between Labour and the Lib Dems. In Cambridge, as they have done nationally, the Lib Dems have fought on offering a second EU referendum. In Cambridge, if, if they can't take Cambridge, one of the cities with the highest Remain votes in the country, the feeling is that that so-called Lib Dem surge won't happen, despite what those exit polls are saying. The student vote is absolutely key here. There are about 12, 13,000 registered voters. We don't know, of course, where they're going to vote, whether they're going to vote in Cambridge or at their home address. But the sense is they have come out for Daniel Sysher. So it does mean a Labour hold here. But I have to tell you, in this hall already, thoughts of a recount aren't being ruled out. But we do think, at the moment, a hold for Labour and Daniel Sysher. We've been seeing various counting centres. Yours is particularly beautiful. Where is it in Cambridge that you are? It's a lot better than the sort of school it's... gymnasiums that are in use around the rest of the country. No, it's not. It's not those hangar-type buildings. No, it's in the Guildhall, slap bang in the Market Square, actually only a few hundred yards away from where that leaders' debate took place in Senate House. We are very much in the, in the centre of Cambridge. Actually, we talk about the EU referendum and the Remain vote. Only about 200, 300 yards away from this boundary is the constituency ward that had the highest Remain vote in the entire United Kingdom. So that is where we are, the Guildhall in Cambridge. Thanks. Um, well, let's go to Hastings because there's, uh, there are s s smiles on the face, apparently, uh, according to John Hunt and Hastings, of Labour. John. That's right, yes. Uh, Labour seemed pretty ecstatic, and that's uh, a big contrast from both the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats. The Conservatives are looking very tense and nervous tonight. Um, just talking to the Conservative Party chairman here, he says that... Uh, uh, they've had a positive campaign, but uh, a strong vote in the, in the county areas, but they weren't really very keen to talk very much beyond that. Of course, this is the seat held by the current Home Secretary, uh, Amber Rudd. No sign of her yet here today, and we've been told that she will not give any media interviews at all today, but we re that remains to be seen. Labour say that they've had a fantastic campaign, despite this being a snap election that they weren't prepared for. They say they mobilised 2,000 volunteers and have canvassed more homes than they ever have done before. They say that's because of Jeremy Corbyn. Mm -hmm. The Liberal Democrats say their vote have, has been completely squeezed and they're worried about losing their deposit here. John, thanks very much indeed. Sophie Rayworth is still up there in the northeast. Um, Sophie, you've got two more declarations to come. What's the timetable? Well, Sunderland Central is the one that we are expecting next. But I have to say, it is taking an awfully lot longer than uh, it usually does. They are still counting the votes for Sunderland Central over there. And one of the main reasons that it's taking longer is because the turnout, turnout is up again in this seat. I've been told it's 62.1%. That, again, around 5% higher than it was in 2015. It's a, a funny atmosphere here in this uh, vast sports hall. People are 
genuinely baffled. They're really not quite sure what to make of it all. When that exit poll came out at 10 o'clock, there was real surprise among some Labour supporters. They said they didn't really expect to see anything like that, although others did say that it had been reflected. It was something that they had seen reflected on the doorsteps when they went out campaigning. Something else that we're hearing as well is some of the uh, campaign officials here saying they believe that the, the rise, the, the bigger turnout, is down to more young people engaging. That's what they are sensing um, about this campaign. So the next result we are going to get will be the Sunderland Central seat that's held or was held by Julie Elliott, and she had again a huge, um, a huge majority, 50% of the share in 2015. And again, there was a very big UKIP surge in 2015. They had 19% uh, of the vote, so it will be interesting to see what happens to that and where it goes, how much of that vote Labour get, how much of it the Conservatives get. But the uh, count, the declaration, is expected probably in about 10, 15 minutes' time, I'd say. Wales, Emily. Let's just have a look at Wales, shall we? Yeah, it's not just Sunderland where they're baffled. I think we're all uh, acknowledging things are quite up in the air at the moment and we may be recalibrating some of our forecasts, but I started the night by pointing out the seats that Labour have a 90% chance of taking from the Conservatives. And I'm now going to pull up some seats that the Conservatives could take from Labour. And they're mostly around this part in North Wales here, just uh, at the top. And I'm going to show you one as well that's on uh, the Wales-England border, which we could get in quite early, Wrexham. Now, this has been Labour since 1935, not always safely. The Conservatives need about a 3% swing here. Labour majority of just short of 2,000. On our forecast, and that was the 2015 old vote, it suggests that the Conservatives could take up to 50% share of the vote. That's Wrexham. And we'll be able to compare that with the real result when we get that in. Dellin is another one, North Wales. This is the 2015 vote. You can see Labour on 41% to the Conservatives on 33%. It's been uh, Labour since, what, 1992? A majority here of uh, just short of 3,000. Again, the forecast would suggest uh, that the Conservatives can take it on 51% share of the vote. Conservatives need a 4% swing here. You can see all the Leave votes are pretty much uh, in the mid-50s in these seats. We'll be able to tell later if that uh, plays a significant part. Allen and Deeside, the same part of the world. This is the 2015 uh, share of the vote. Labour, obviously, in the lead. They hold this seat. But on our current forecast, there could be a move to the Conservatives of more than 10%. Uh, putting the Conservatives into this seat. She's and the dead. last one, uh, Cluid South. An old majority of 2,500. You can see Labour holds at the moment, Susan Ellen Jones, and it's suggesting the Conservatives could take Cluid South. These are all quite interesting ones, very different uh, to the ones that we've been looking at in England, uh, where I showed you yeah. some of the movement that Labour is expected to be making according to the exit polls. But that's what we're now going to compare when we get the first Wales one in. I mean, it'd be interesting if throughout the country we see Conservatives doing better in leave areas, gaining traction in leave areas, uh, uh, which in North Wales suggests... I, I like... think that was, that was sort of what we were expecting, but I would yeah. suggest at the beginning of the night we thought we would see Labour possibly doing better in Wales, in London, and the Conservatives doing better in other parts of the UK. I, I think, you know, as, as a lot of things are up in the air now. We're just waiting for any indication of what's actually going on on the ground. Laura, what news have you got? Well, I think that's right, from certainly. From the front. <laughs> from the front. OK, so from around the front, just some tips coming to me as we sit here. Um, for the Tories are looking very hopeful in Gordon in Scotland. Now, we know that the Tories are expecting probably around eight or so seats in terms of taking from the SNP in Scotland. Gordon matters particularly because it is the constituency, of course, of none other than Alex Salmon, Alex Salmon yes. the former SNP leader and sometimes called the Grand Poobah of Scottish nationalism. He's a major figure in Scottish politics. The Tories have been targeting that seat very aggressively. Soundings from there that they have taken suggest that they are doing very well. Labour are very hopeful in Edinburgh South of taking that seat from the SNP. But perhaps more importantly for the national picture, I've been told Labour's quietly confident in Croydon Central. Now, that is the kind of seat, it was around number 40 or so in their English targets, that it, it would give us a flavour of the kind of places where they think they could take. And Labour are quietly confident in Croydon Central. We heard through the day 
given the response on the doorstep that they were flooding it with activists to try to get the vote out. And that could be the kind of seat that tells us rather a lot about the general direction. We should, we should explain the, the expression quietly confident, because it sounds like kind of code. <laughs> uh, I think quietly it's... confident at the count, because they've seen the number of... Uh, ballot papers that are lining up or these are sounding from the, the doorstep these are soundings from this evening so these are soundings from a variety of people at counts who are seeing how things are starting to sack up on the tables and also at uh, parties operation who are hearing their information coming in from counts around the country because from the days when i used mm. to go to counts you can actually see there's Labour, there's the Conservative, you and you can tell you can who's, who's physically won. see it stacking even up in, not in, in front it, of you, think, even though you can't say. But yeah. I think, quite clearly, everybody seems now to be accepting that turnout is well up, and it seems at this early stage that is because of younger people. Now, that was, of course, what Jeremy Corbyn was hoping for. And one cabinet minister has just said to me, this is the election where young people started voting. And perhaps tomorrow it may seem for all the political parties that the demographics of who they have to try to please might be shifting. Michelle, yours. David, uh, with me is the Cabinet Minister Preeti Patel, the International Development Secretary. Welcome. I know you'll Thank leave you. here and you'll get to your own count in Essex. But let's talk about the exit poll, because mm -hmm. that is what we have at the moment, along with two results declared uh, so far. If this exit poll is correct, then it was the wrong decision for Theresa May to call this election. Well, look, I mean, the exit poll, you know, is only an illustration. It's a projection. It's not the actual result. And there's a long way to go, as we're seeing um, already. But I think the point about calling the election, as the Prime Minister said when she announced it, you know, the country has a choice in leadership. Look at the big decisions that are up and coming around Brexit. Look at the big choices as well that we will be having to make as a country. And that, of course, is what this election campaign campaign has been about for the Conservative Party. The Prime Minister's I'm campaign was very, about that, very but there was very little uh, that, that the Conservative Party actually put forward about Brexit. Actually, I disagree with campaign. that completely. Really? You know, I've, I've been out every day on the campaign, and the Prime Minister herself... What has detail been... did you put but, forward well, about Brexit during well, the campaign? Well, she has been clear in her speeches, but also the 12 points around the negotiation about taking back control of money, borders, safeguarding workers' rights, strengthening the union. These are key areas that she herself and other ministers and campaigners have spoken about throughout this election campaign. So I don't think it's right to say that we have not focused on Brexit. We've been very clear. And she's spoken about her plan, which, of course, is a complete contrast to other parties that have wanted to frustrate Brexit. And when it came to the Labour Party, they themselves don't have a coherent plan on Brexit. If, if your party ends up with uh, either a reduced majority or, indeed, no overall majority in the House of Commons, what will that mean for her personally? Well, I mean, first of all, I don't accept, and I'm not going to go down the road of speculating what will happen. Um, you know, what we will what we will see, obviously, results coming together um, throughout the night. But I think, you know, we have a Prime Minister, and Theresa May in particular, she's been very strong in terms of the points, the challenges, tackling the real challenges, and being quite frank with the public about the future of the country, the direction of the country. We have very significant negotiations that we'll be going into in 11 days' time. That is the real focus. And Obviously, we want to make sure, and she's been clear, that she goes out there, battles for Britain, gets the right deal for Britain, basically, as we go forward and negotiate Britain's future. But she could well, in the next few days, be in the position where Brexit negotiations are going to start next week, one way or another, and she is still in the position of, of looking around and trying to see where she can find the support from other parties to shore up her position. Well, I think, importantly, she has been clear, and actually the Conservative Party, the Conservative government have been clear, post the referendum, that... Brexit means Brexit. We are going to deliver Brexit. We need to get on and do that and safeguard yes, the but right deal. The point deal. I'm making too is she might be in, in a, a very. She's in a very. If this is borne out, she's in a very different position to that, isn't she? Well, I wouldn't. I don't think so because nothing changes in terms of the fact that negotiations will be happening. And she is clear. She's a woman of great conviction, as we've heard throughout the campaign, in getting the best deal for Britain. She's going to put our national interests first, front and centre of this of this negotiation. And that is exactly where the preoccupation and all her energies will be. Did she herself? want to call this election or was she talked into it? No, I think, you know, it's her choice. She made that difficult decision and yes, it but, is. But was, it's it, a was it her call. initiative or was she talked into no, it? No, you know, she is the she was the Prime Minister, she's made that call and she was very clear as to why she called that election, um, to look to the future, to strengthen her hand, to negotiate the best deal for Britain. And I have to say, I think she's fought the campaign 
very strongly, you know, travelling the country endlessly, day in, day out, as all colleagues have been as well, fighting to make that for the Sunderland very Central clear. constituency is as follows. Sean Christopher Coburn, Independent, 305 votes. <laughs> Julie Elliott, Labour Party, 25,056 votes. Mm. Rachel Sarah Featherston, Green Party candidate, 705 votes. <laughs> Niall Dane Hodgson, Liberal Democrat, 1,777 votes. <laughs> Gary James Layton, UK Independence Party, 2,209 votes. Robert Jeffrey Oliver, Conservative Party, 15,059 votes. And I therefore declare that Julie Elliott has been duly elected to serve as member for the said constituency. And I'd like to invite the candidate to say a few words. OK, so once again, Sunderland Central, this is the third result we've had in. I have to say immediately, better for the Conservatives than the exit poll suggested, worse for Labour than the exit poll suggested. Labour hold it, of course, you can see with a majority of 9,000, overnight nearly 10,000. The share of the vote, though, 56% for Labour, 33 for the Conservatives, UKIP down at 5. The change, Labour up 5, the Conservatives up 10, UKIP down 14, and this is the one to look at, a swing from Labour to the Conservatives of... 2.3%. There's a quote from uh, Theresa May. Has this just come in, I think? No, no, this no, is... She's she's this is David, this is... Um, oh, right, I don't this know why is on the... Uh, OK, don't worry about it. On the 20th of May. Don't, yeah. wor don't worry about it. Uh, that result? Yeah, well, this is, in, in sense, in a line with the other Sunderland seat in Newcastle. Same those story. North East, those northeastern seats are yep. all... The Conservatives are doing substantially better and Labour substantially yep. worse than the exit poll. But David, could I broaden it out to the postal vote? Yes, if you're quick, because I want yeah. to go over and have a look at the North East yeah. ones. With because my sources inside the Labour Party say they're very worried that outside London there's a huge swing to the Conservatives mm -hmm. amongst people who voted by post and therefore are not being picked up by the exit poll. Yeah. If they're right, then that suggests the Conservatives will end the night rather better. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, if Amber Rudd is in trouble in Hastings, well, then Labour are doing better there than the exit poll suggests. We're getting really conflicting signals. And all I would say is, at this stage, I, I wouldn't put any money on any results between the Conservatives getting 310 and the Conservatives getting 350 or 360 seats. Telford, apparently, is also proving very close. Labour trying, hoping to oust the Tories from there. Let's just see the North East uh, result a moment, and then we'll go around... Well, let's just go around first, just to prove that things are still happening. Cardiff... Aberdeen, Leeds. Let's just see those three places where counts are going on. And then we'll join Emily for a look at the North East. The three results we've had in so far, a reminder, are all from there. So everything we're extrapolating comes from the North East. Emily. Yeah, what I've done is I've put up uh, three swings now of the seats that we've had in declared already. And what you can see is uh, a sort of pattern emerging. In Sunderland South and Sunderland Centre, we've got a swing to the Conservatives away from Labour. Here in uh, Sunderland South of 3.5%, slightly smaller in Sunderland Central. And in Newcastle Central, it's a swing towards Labour, smaller one of 2.1%. Uh, what difference would we say? Well, Leave vote was 48% in Newcastle Central, much higher in the Sunderlands, around the 60. So it does tend to suggest, on this scant evidence uh, so far, that the Conservatives might be doing better in places, as we'd expect, where the Leave vote was higher, and Newcastle uh, tends to be uh, pushing towards Labour there on a higher Remain vote. We go down to Brighton on the south coast, where Julian Warwicker is, where the Conservatives... Uh, hold Brighton Kemp Town and Labour was hoping to challenge them there and where of course there is the only Green MP in the in the last House of Commons uh, 
Julian, what's the story there? Uh, yes, David, good evening from the uh, Amex Stadium here in Brighton. As you say, three seats uh, being counted here. It won't, uh, it won't be declaring for a good few hours yet. You mentioned Brighton, Kemp Town, and in the light of that exit poll, there is undoubtedly anxiety. I wouldn't put it any more strongly than that. But anxiety among the uh, Conservative camp here because uh, Simon Kirby is defending that seat for the Conservatives. He won it by fewer than 700 votes uh, two years ago. Labour ran him very close there. And there's no Green candidate standing in Brighton, Kemp Town, because there's been a little bit of a hint of the Progressive Alliance going on here. Because in Brighton Pavilion, which is the seat that Caroline Lucas is defending for the Green Party, she won by nearly 8,000 uh, two years ago. There's no Liberal Democrat uh, standing there. Uh, Hove is the other seat that's being counted here in Brighton. Now, that was Labour by about 1,200 uh, last time. Um, and obviously, in the light of that exit poll, Labour perhaps reasonably hopeful that they'll be able to hold on to that. The other interesting aspect of, of Brighton and the three seats is the UKIP vote. UKIP only standing in one of those three seats. This is not natural UKIP territory because this was a very strong Remain area. More than 68% of people in Brighton and Hove voted Remain in the EU referendum. But in the two seats where they're not standing this time, their vote still two years ago was sufficient to have a bearing on the outcome uh, when those results were very close. So a lot to consider here. One thing you won't get as a speedy result, we're talking of a declaration maybe 5 a.m maybe 6am, so it's, it's coffees all round here for the next few hours. Julian, thank you very much. Kirsty Walk joins us from Glasgow with news of the SNP reaction to the news of the exit poll, if I could put it like that, Kirsty. Yes, good evening here from Glasgow. I've just spoken to John Mason, one MSP, uh, SNP MSP, saying, you know, we're very much understatement. I think we're doing a little worse than I thought we were going to do. But the story in Scotland is really, really interesting because, yes, if the exit poll is right, if the SNP do drop 22 seats, they're still obviously the largest party on roughly 60% of the vote. But the interesting thing is it'll be a real triumph for Ruth Davidson. There has only been one Tory MP in Scotland since 1997. So whatever happens to Theresa May, this will be seen as a very good night for Ruth Davidson. She wants to pick up 10 seats. She may pick up eight. We've just heard Laura say there that the totemic seats of Gordon, Alex Salmon's seat may go, and indeed the SNP leader at Westminster may lose his seat in uh, Murray, Angus Robertson. So Ruth Davidson played a fantastic campaign in her own terms by banging on about Indy referen uh, referendum two, the very thing the nationalists didn't want her to talk about and I think that has paid off but interestingly if indeed the exit poll is right it may be that the SNP is still in position to make a progressive alliance and indeed to influence the Brexit negotiations so I think once again Scotland proves to be a very different country uh, what, what about the Lib Dems and Labour what, what's the what, what, what drift do you get about their feeling the way they've done the, the Liberal Democrat the Liberal Democrats uh, the Liberal Democrats are interesting for two reasons. They may well take Dumbartonshire, which is Jo Swinson's seat. She was the Equalities Minister in the coalition. She's been nursing that seat assiduously since she lost it to John Nicholson of the SNP. Also, uh, Fife, where Nicola Sturgeon was last week, pr trying to shore up Stephen Gethin's vote. If they use, lose North East Fife, the Liberal Democrats, that shows that the Liberal Democrats are again on their way back in Scotland. What is not clear from the Glasgow vote here is that Labour may take one Glasgow seat. We don't know yet. But there's no sign of a Labour return in Scotland. It will definitely be the fact that Ruth Davidson is her own woman, the Liberal Democrats are not dead in the water, and the chances that this has been the SNP high watermark may come true. And, Kirsty, how long, how long, how long until we get a result? How long, how long? How long, how long? Well, you know, it may be that the Glasgow East result is at 2 o'clock, and in fact, not long after that, we understand, we hope, that Nicola Sturgeon will arrive about 3 o'clock. So there'll be lots of activity in the Glasgow count at about 3 o'clock. We'll rejoin you. Well, I expect we'll join you before then, but we'll rejoin you then anyway, uh, Kirsty. Thanks. Liberal Democrats, so. you're saying, have a 
problem? Well, some of the Liberal Democrats, I gather, are worried that Nick Clegg might lose his seat, the former leader, former Deputy Prime Minister, in, in Sheffield Telling. He had a majority of only just over 2,000 over Labour, so it wasn't a particularly safe seat, but I think the Liberal Democrats are beginning to get a bit worried that he might not be in the Lib Dem contingent in the new really? House of Commons. Mm -hmm. Because some people think that he fought a better campaign than uh, Tim Farron. <laughs> I mean, that when he appeared, he was rather... I mean, I know he's got a lot of... Uh, history hanging on him of, you know, the coalition and the um, tuition fees and all that. That's right. But actually, when he spoke, he was quite strong and about Brexit yeah, particularly. You're assuming there's a correlation between personal performance in the campaign and the actual result. We, were, we weren't clear whether uh, Sheffield students were still in residence or whether they've all gone home at the end of the term. Do you know the answer to that? Because that, his constituency is very much a student constituency. Ah. Ah, Good question. I'll leave you I, with I that one. All right, well, you go home. and work that one out while we go. You do know the well, answer. Uh, I was kidding. Well, students have the confusing thing of being able to register in two different places, so it's always very hard to work out. But just on the Lib Dems nationally, whatever the exit poll says, Lib Dem HQ right now are saying that they would be pretty content with holding their ground, which, of course, last time right. round was eight MPs in the mm. House of Commons. So it's what I suspect um, might happen um, is a change in terms of which the seats the they are, but they send the right candidate. candidate. Newcastle the East result. Is as follows Nicholas Hugh Brown, Labour Party, twenty eight thousand one hundred and twenty seven. <laughs> Alistair Christian Ford, Green Party candidate, seven hundred and fifty five. Simon John Kitchen, the Conservative Party candidate, 8,866. Tony Sanderson, UK Independence Party, UKIP, 1,315. Wendy Barbara Taylor, Liberal Democrats, 2,574. And that Nicholas Hugh Brown has been duly elected to serve as member for the said constituency. Nick Brown, the victor there, the opposition chief whip, close to Gordon Brown, who say share the same surname but no relation. Uh, he holds that seat, but once again better for the Conservatives than for Labour when compared with the exit poll. A good result for the Conservatives in Newcastle East. So let's go to Swindon, where we have a count, I hope, coming. Swindon. Is as follows. Andrew Headley John Bentley, Green Party, 858. Mark Edward Kempsey, Labour Party, 21,096. Stephen Frank Holden, UK Independent Party, 1,000. 564. Justin Paul Tomlinson, the Conservative Party candidate, 29,400. Yeah. And Elizabeth Margaret Webster, Liberal Democrat, 1,962. And there were 104 rejected ballot papers. And I do hereby declare that Justin Paul Tomlinson is duly elected as Member of Parliament for North Swindon. Thank you. And I'd like to pay my tribute and thanks to the returning officer. Well, once again, the sound the quality is abysmal from these places. It's meant to be in 2017, not 1917. It's absurd. But anyway, there are the figures. Let me show you. We have managed to extract them. I don't know how, but here they are. The Conservative on 29,431 and Labour on 21,000. The share, 5438, 43... There's a fly in the studio, which is rather irritating me. We've been trying to get rid of it for the last three days, but it's still <laughs> coming around. <laughs> and it applies to what, yes. Um, and uh, and here, is the, here is the change. Conservatives up three, Labour up 11, UKIP down 12, a 3.7% swing from Conservative to Labour. John, is this... How does this... 
ally itself with your exit poll. I mustn't it's... call it your exit poll, with the exit poll. The exit poll, this is actually a slightly better result for Labour than we expected from the exit poll. Um, the Conservatives have won. We expected the Conservatives to hold the seat. Um, but we've had a, a better an expected result here. Also, the last Newcastle result was also, in fact, better than we expected from the exit poll. So, just bear in mind, in this early point of the night, you will indeed get lots of variation around the broad story. But so far, at least, I think we should all just be holding our nerve in terms of whether or not, indeed, the Conservatives are going to get simply a modestly bad night and disappointing night, or whether, indeed, it's going to be worse than that. So, to use the old cliché, it's all to play for, which I refuse to say, but that's what it is, really, at the moment. Yeah, sure. I mean, the truth is we don't have enough in these results. We've okay. had a couple of swings to the Conservatives. We've had a few, uh, two or three swings to Labour. I mean, that said, the fact that we're beginning to get swings to Labour, including, for example, in the south of England, clearly does raise questions mm. about the Conservatives' chances of getting the landslide the Prime Minister originally had in mind. If she's going to get a landslide, frankly, virtually every constituency in the country should be swinging to the Conservatives. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's midnight. We've never, I've never known an election with so few results in at midnight, but it is midnight. I'll come to you in a moment with uh, other, other stuff. Uh, Amal's got um, res results from the newspapers who seem to be speculating just as we're speculating on the exit poll. But as it's midnight, let's have the news. Here's Rita Chakrabarti. Hello. Counting is underway in the 2017 general election amid widespread surprise at the results of an exit poll published by the BBC, ITV and Sky. It indicates that the Conservatives will be the largest party but will lose 17 seats, leaving them with 314. Labour, it suggests, will get 266 seats, a rise of 34. The early results have seen Labour retaining seats in North East England. Tom Bateman has the very latest. <laughs> The exit poll is out. It's watched closely by all the politicians, but it's still just a prediction. It has the Conservatives as the largest party, but short of an overall majority. The poll suggests the Tories would have 314 seats, down 17 on two years ago. It puts Labour on 266 seats, up 34. The SNP would get 34 seats and the Lib Dems 14. This is a projection. I think you made that clear. It's not a result. Uh, these exit polls have been uh, wrong in the past. I think in 2015 they underestimated our uh, vote. I think uh, in a couple of elections before that they overestimated our, our votes. So Theresa May promised us on seven different occasions that she wouldn't go for a snap general election and she went for it. And she went for it on the basis of wanting to secure a mandate that she already had and people just saw through that. It's the real votes that count though and there's the traditional race to see which constituency could declare first. I will stand up for Newcastle Central. Labour have held Newcastle Central, a safe seat for them, increasing their majority by more than 2,000. Good evening, Mr Corbyn. How are you feeling? Jeremy Corbyn arrived home in his North London constituency tonight. If the exit poll is correct, a big if, he will have confounded the expectations of even his own MPs, while Theresa May's gamble to win big in a snap election will have failed. But the night is young. And the truth inside those ballot boxes is yet to be revealed. Tom Bateman, BBC News. Well, with the news of the exit poll, the pound has been falling against other currencies, including the dollar and the euro. Let's get the latest reaction now from Sharanjit Lael, who's in Singapore for us. Sharanjit, tell us more about what's going on. Well, that's right. As you say, uh, the most immediate reaction in the markets has been from the British pound. Sterling falling nearly 2% against the US dollar after that exit poll suggested the Conservative Party could lose its parliamentary majority. But it's since scaled back some of those uh, losses. It's down just about 1% now against most of the major currencies. And that's as the first results come in and show that the swings in the exit poll have not been reflected. That's given uh, the Conservative Party some hope that the poll might not be as bad as suggested. And, of course, investors have also been closely watching other developments away from the UK elections. There's the testimony from the former FBI chief, James Comey, in the US, and there was also the uh, European Central Bank. Sharanjit, thank you. Now back to David.
And here in our election studio, we're still waiting for more results to come in. We've had three so far, four so far, five so far, I think now. One, two, three, four, yes, five. Not very many at midnight, but anyway. Uh, we last saw Jeremy Vine in the House of Commons. He's now moved to Downing Street. Jeremy. Yeah, thank you, David. Here in our virtual Downing Street here, which gives us a chance to see the progress of the parties. Let's just pave the path to the door of number 10, <laughs> shall we? Using as paving stones the seats the exit poll says the parties have won. So Conservatives short of the finishing line of 326 and Labour some way back like that. We can do this a few more times uh, as the night goes on. We can see whether the Conservatives possibly cross this line, but at the moment the exit poll has them falling short. 326 seats needed for an overall majority in the House of Commons and the Conservatives on 314. And if you just focus on the seats at the end here, these are the ones that the exit poll have very much as 50-50. So if you're a Conservative MP, if you're Johnny Mercer in Plymouth Moorview or Carl McCartney in Lincoln. Don't yet jump off the sofa in celebration because we can't be certain you are back in Parliament. These are very, very nip and tuck, these constituencies towards the end. And all of them are predictions, which is why they are coloured in dark blue. But 314 at the moment is what the exit poll says, short of the overall majority. Take a look at Labour. Come down Downing Street with me now. And let's have a look at the Labour line and see where they end up. So they've made a substantial advance, more than 30 seats in the exit poll. And again, these are, we don't have, at the end of the line, we don't have the ones, the actual results we've seen in, which will be in solid red. So we're still dealing very much with, with forecasting here. And you can see these are the ones for Labour that are very, very, very nip and tuck, very close in the exit poll, 50-50. So Thurrock would be a gain. Jackie Dole Price was the MP there. Gain, that would be from the Conservatives. Newport West is now pretty marginal under the exit poll. That's been Labour's for a while. High Peak was a constituency that Labour held in the Blair years. Plymouth Sutton would be a gain. Morley, Morley and Outwood, of course, was Ed Balls's seat. So he lost it just two years ago. It may well be it's back in the red column. So it's very interesting, but of course, it is still exit poll territory. And here's the fascinating thing. If you go back to 2010, when the Conservatives fell short of an overall majority, they had 306 seats. So the, the line, when we did Downing Street then, their line of seats ended up about here. If we go back to 2015, the last general election, despite the predictions that they were maybe going to undershoot, actually they crossed the line and David Cameron in his second general election went across and had 331 seats. So this result here, if this is the result, puts them absolutely midway between 2010 when they needed to be in coalition and 2015 when they had an overall majority. And of course, as has been said, it makes the calling of the election look like a very, very bad idea indeed. David. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll be back and watching the uh, road to Downing Street from time to time, but we've had a result in number six. In Sunderland West, uh, David, and it, a slightly mixed picture in the seats we've had in so far. This is a safe Labour seat. Sharon Hodgson was sitting on a majority of uh, over 13,000 before she has been returned. Of course, that was never really in any doubt, but it is slightly lower. It is a swing this time round to the Conservatives. You can see Labour on a 61% share of the vote, Conservatives on 29%. But if you look at what that shows you in terms of the change, the Conservatives have done better. They're up 10 percentage points to Labour's six, uh, both of them gaining, it would seem, from a big drop in the UKIP vote. And as I said, this swing quite similar to the one in Newcastle Central towards the Conservatives yes, away from Labour of around 2%. So nothing's become any clearer, really, about the direction of travel of either party uh, mm. more widely in the UK from these. Mm. So um, Emily Thornbury joins us now, uh, Shadow Foreign Secretary. Emily, good evening. Thank you for coming in. Now, you made the call at the very beginning of uh, this evening, once the exit poll came out, that Theresa May should resign. Why, why should she resign? Well, think about it. She called this election when, when she thought that she was 20 points ahead in the polls. She said that she wanted to have a mandate for Brexit. She basically wanted to stamp out the opposition. She wanted to be able to have a blank cheque, a free hand, to do whatever she wanted with the country in terms of Brexit negotiations, in terms of what she was doing to the National Health Service. And the country has said no. And the country has looked to the Labour Party and we have put forward a positive alternative. The star of our show was our manifesto, which shows that we have another vision for where we want to take the country. And we have turned it around and we have, we have fought a very positive campaign. And if she wanted to get a mandate out of this election, she hasn't got it.
But you're so no, she's failed. You're nowhere near catching her. You're 50 seats behind if the exit poll is broadly right. But I think, I mean, if I'm honest, obviously we're disappointed that if we're not able to form a majority government, because every time you go into an election, that's what you go in hoping to do. But, but you know, think of all those who were saying six, seven weeks ago that it was just a question of how big Theresa, crown, Theresa May's crown was going to be, how big her majority was going to be. And for us to have come from such a long way back, supposedly, to now be in a position where it looks tonight like we, we, could, we could form the next government is, a, is an extraordinary performance on behalf of the Labour Party and shows what we can do when we unite. How would, you, we how would you form the next government? Well, we would put forward a Queen's speech and a budget. We, our Labour MPs would vote for it and we would call on the other parties to vote for it as well. And you think you get the support of enough of the other parties, of the Liberal Democrats, Scottish National Party, some of the, some of the, well, uh, some of the National Party in Wales, some of the parties, some of one or two MPs in Northern Ireland? Have you done the sums or are you just speculating? Look, it would then be up to them, wouldn't it, to explain to their constituents how it was that when given the choice, they let the Tories back in again. You have absolutely no vision for Britain, no plan at all, they say they're going to. They say they're going to spend more money on the national health service. They have been found out. They have no manifesto promise in terms of money. They they can't say where they would get any money from for the national health service. Whereas we, as the alternative, put forward a costed manifesto because we meant it. So let me get this absolutely straight. At ten past twelve on this Friday morning, you're saying that Jeremy Corbyn may go to number ten, make his hands with the Queen, uh, or whatever he agrees to do with the Queen, um, and, and, and form a government? Look, we've got, a, we've got an exit poll. We've had very few results. But the exit poll seems to indicate that no party will have an overall majority. So it's possible that we will form the next government, and if we do, there's no deals. How we've would been you, clear about that. How would you avoid that being the coalition of chaos uh, that the Tories said it would be if... Theresa May wasn't re-elected with the majority. Coalition of chaos. There's no coalition. There's no deals. Either the Conservatives will be the minority government on the, if this exit poll is right, or Labour will be the minority government. We're not having a coalition. We're not doing any deals. We would put forward our alternative uh, uh, manifesto, our alternative vision for Britain, which has been very popular with the public, and we would call on MPs from other parties to vote for it. So not a coalition of chaos, just chaos? Uh, have you been asking any Tory MPs whether, given the situation they're now in, that they may be in the position whereby they're ha heading for a coalition of chaos? Well, no, they all say they're going to have a majority. Well, there we are. <laughs> <laughs> They've been saying that all the time, haven't they? I remember, well, how many, what was their majority going to be? It was going to be 100, wasn't it? Or 120, 150 seats? That clearly is wrong, isn't it? Let's well, see if, what happens. if you stick with us, Emily, for a moment, because um, Ken Clark well. is joining us from Rushcliffe, the father of the house, if he wins his seat back. Um, Mr. Clark, what do you make of this result? And what do you think uh, of what Emily Thornberry, I hope you heard what she was saying, that they may be able to form a government and look to the smaller parties to support a Queen's speech? Well, David, I heard you say uh, about an hour or two ago that you'd be hanged, drawn and quartered if your exit poll was wrong uh, and we'll be hanged, drawn and quartered if we start making silly guesses now because it's quite entertaining to have these elections and referendums nowadays. We always reach this stage of total uncertainty. Uh, my guess, for what it's worth, is the Conservatives look as though, to me, we're going to have a small overall majority. Uh, your opinion polls, very complicated methodology, it might be wrong, I, I've been told, I haven't been up there, that the Labour Party was still doing worse uh, than national polls in the north and the northeast. The big uh, Brexit votes in the Rust Belt areas weren't doing them much good. The Labour Party is doing better than the national polls, I was told, in London. But I have no first-hand experience of campaigning in either to see whether that theory proves to be right. But it might as the evening goes on. But uh, we're obviously... Uh, going to have a very interesting 
uh, Parliament. And I don't think there's any point in my carrying on the election debate with Emily Thornbury, with great respect to Emily. Uh, I think we, will, we won't be able to judge really where we are till at least four o'clock this morning, perhaps sometime tomorrow. Your, your, um, your party leader went into this election on the grounds she didn't have but needed certainty and stability. Uh, you're a wise enough old bird uh, to be able to say whether you think certainty and stability is going to be the outcome. Well, the worst possible outcome would be a hung parliament. I mean, from the national point of view, that is. I think the worst outcome for the United Kingdom would be a weak government and a hung parliament of any party. Uh, and we just have to see where we get. Uh, if we have a continue with another parliament with a small majority, uh, then firstly we'll, we'll have to have some deeper debate than we had in the public debate during this general election on a lot of issues, most particularly Brexit. Uh, and actually, as we face some appalling difficulties, in my th opinion, this is a, a critical stage for us. Our politics is changing, there are huge problems. Uh, perhaps a little more cross-party discussion, uh, particularly on things like Brexit, and uh, a little less of exchanging slogans and trying to score points off each other. If we could get a parliament for five years, and if we could get the negotiations, the key part, uh, the actual leaving, open in the first two or three, uh, then time for our politics to change a little, which I think the public would appreciate. But that's, that's simply my hope. And we'll just see after the first excited comments when all the results are in, uh, exactly how the politicians respond when we all get back to Westminster. Of course, you were a, you were a staunch Remainer uh, and remained a Remainer. Uh, yep. right through. Um, do you think yep. it was uh, uh, hubristic of the Prime Minister to call an election to endorse her version of Brexit? Well, we don't really know in any detail what Brexit policy we're proposing to pursue. There's been a lot of idiot talk about hard Brexits and soft Brexits, and most people using the phrases have not done the courtesy of really explaining quite what they mean uh, by either. Uh, I, I, I think I was amazed, like everybody else, when she suddenly calls an election. There were, there were two good reasons, I think, for it. One was our small majority was proving very, very difficult, and that the budget vote showed that another four years of this could be chaotic. Not to be able to carry your budget is quite a serious crisis, so it was worthwhile trying to get a better majority. And the other reason, which she gave several times, was to have these Brexit negotiations finishing in end of 2019, early 2020, and coinciding with the beginning of another election campaign, which would undoubtedly be full of hysterical nonsense if the negotiations were ending, it could be very difficult. So getting the key, the big negotiations over, and then having another couple of years before a general election, that's how I persuaded myself that they were too very good reasons for holding an election. And the second one, she used quite a lot herself. Uh, I don't think it makes any difference, the position of the government to the Nexit negotiations. Uh, we hope, I hope in the new parliament, we'll have some slightly fuller debate about what exactly the position is that the British government, whichever government it is, uh, is going to adopt. Can Brexit be stopped? Well, I've come to the conclusion, no. I, mean, I thought it was a parliamentary thing. I never liked the idea of having a referendum. I hope we never hold any more referendums on anything again. Uh, and, uh, but when we got to Parliament, uh, I stuck to my principles. I voted against invoking Article 50, and the government had a huge majority, uh, despite the fact that the vast majority of ministers and the vast majority of MPs agreed with me. And they all agreed it wasn't in the national interest to leave, but they'd all promised themselves that they would be bound by the referendum because the promise to the public because they thought they were going to win it. And now we are where we are. And I've come into this election on the basis that I don't think we're going to, we are going to leave. I just don't think it's sensible for me to spend the next five years, if this parliament lasts five years, continuing to argue that, you know, we shouldn't be leaving. All uh, right. What matters enormously, and we all agree in broad terms, is we get the best deal for Britain, and that needs to be considered seriously. I hope on a slightly more cross-party basis, because both the parties are hopelessly divided on Europe. They have been for 20 years. Ken Clark, thank you very much for joining us. We may hear from you later when you get your result, or we have a bit more in. We've just got one new result in, Emily. This is Newcastle-upon-Tyne North. Kath McKinnell uh, holds on here on a very healthy majority of 10,300 also, not much change here. Labour, you can see on a substantial 55% share of the vote. 
if I show you what's happened, it's all in that fall in the UKIP vote, down 13%, going to both the Conservatives and uh, to Labour as well. The swing is very, very marginal indeed. 0.6% swing. It is from Labour to the Conservatives. But on those seven results we've had in so far, overall, there has been more of a swing to Labour, well, a swing in more of them. This is how the exit poll that you saw at the beginning of the night compares the results we've had in so far. This is a seat-by-seat -seat comparison, so it takes into account those seven results we've had in. And as you can see, the UKIP uh, one, the UKIP column is pretty much bang on there. We said down 14% and the results show down 13 What it looks as if, though, is if we might be starting to recalibrate in our future forecast some of that Conservative vote, which is much higher on the ones we've had in than we had predicted. Labour vote, we had up 15% and it's actually come up 9%. You won't see anything in the SNP column for the simple reason that the SNP don't stand in any of the seats. So this is very specific, very localised to what we've had in so far. But you can start to see different shapes emerging there to the ones we've had. Thank you very much. Now, we've been joined by Andrew Marr. Well, that... Now, don't, don't speak. I just said we've been joined by Andrew Marr, but Andrew, just before... Uh, <laughs> and you're bursting to us. Um, I'm always got the newspaper headlines. They've been speculating just like we have on the result. Let's just hear that, and then we, I'd like to hear your take on the whole thing. We have indeed. We've got the first editions. I mean, Andrew will know from his uh, time editing a newspaper, and indeed uh, when I was editor of a newspaper, but these evenings can be a nightmare for newspapers because they have to produce multiple editions. And the first editions are in. They have dropped, and they're pretty brutal for the Prime Minister. This is the Daily Mirror. No friend of Theresa May necessarily, but it says, hanging by a thread. The Guardian says, exit poll, shock for May. Um, uh, uh, pretty negative for me as well. And in fact, I'm sure all tomorrow's headlines the will be. Daily Mirror's uh, getting, Daily Mirror's getting a, hell of a lot of promotion here. here. But rest assured, they're all pretty negative. The Sun says mayhem, uh, and the Daily Telegraph says shock for May as exit polls uh, point to a hung parliament. We've also got some interesting reaction from uh, Lord Ashdown. Lord Ashdown uh, achieved a certain degree of notoriety for his response to the, um, the last uh, exit poll in 2015. He says that basically this shows um, if the exit polls are right, Britain is more polarised than ever in my lifetime. Really now time for the centre to get its act together. So I was saying, David, that one of the themes uh, emerging in the uh, online conversation about this result is that this is about a divided country, a country not just divided between Labour and the Tories, but between the young and the old, between Leave and Remain, which is a theme I know we'll be coming back to. And Nigel Farage has spoken, uh, former UKIP leader, uh, he has said, whatever the true result, the Conservative Party needs a leader that believes in Brexit. Of course, Paddy Ashton said he'd eat his hat mm. last election, didn't he? Because he did. He, he hasn't mentioned his hat this time, as far as we're aware. But I, He's I'm already sure eaten it. He's he probably it already eaten it. Yeah, exactly. Well, he ate it last time, so yeah, he did. he's got no hat left. Um, all right. Andrew Marr, you'll go at this. Where, where do you think things stand? What do you read into what's... We, well, we've above all, so we just need a lot more data at this point. What appears to be happening is... Uh, I was talking to a minister who said, every mile further north I go, it gets better for the Tories. And you're beginning to see that reflected in the polls. The difference between the exit poll and those actual results we've had does suggest that those Tories who said, I don't believe this exit poll may be right, they may do a little bit better. But it's a very, very patchy picture. And I think for two reasons. One is the division over Brexit and what happens to UKIP, how that UKIP vote collapses. There are some places UKIP aren't standing, some places UKIP have done a deal with the sitting Tory candidate, um, and other places they are standing. And the other thing is a differential in turnout, because we've seen a most extraordinary, I all know about this, a most extraordinary campaign online, particularly by the left, and momentum, very, very funny, very pointed memes and films and, and harangues to try and get young voters out, plus the huge offer to, to young voters by Jeremy Corbyn, have they actually come out in, in numbers that we never dreamed possible? And at the other end of the scale, have the older voters, uh, seeing the decline of the triple lock promise mm -hmm. and the winter fuel payments issue, and of course the so-called dementia tax, turned away from the Tories in ways they have never done before? That would suggest very, very spotty results, but it is looking terrible for Theresa May at the moment. The, the older turning away and not voting at they, all, we, we, we or, don't know. Or, or switching their vote, we don't know. We, no. we don't know, but that would explain perhaps why the exit poll is so different from the polls ahead of the, ahead but, of the election. All right, itself. let's just, uh, for the moment, a little bit of history. If we assume, let's just for the sake of the argument, assume the exit poll is right okay. and the Conservatives are short of an overall majority, but they're the largest party, what happens? 
fistful of salt in one hand as I say this, but it brings us back to 1974, the last time we had a, a genuine hung parliament, and that, of course, led after the February election to an October election, 1974. So all of those people watching this and thinking, I love elections, I want more elections, I want, <laughs> I want more David Dimbleby again and again and again, this may be your year. A warning. But much more seriously, Ken Clark was saying to you... Just you can't now, get more serious than that, I can tell you. Get, get, well, you can, because Ken Clark was saying a moment ago, he said, uh, Brexit can't be stopped, the negotiations must go on. But remember, these are supposed to start mm -hmm. properly mm -hmm. in about ten days' time. Mm -hmm. What happens if there is no Prime Minister who commands the majority of the House of Commons to have those negotiations with? There may be no choice but to delay that, and it may be a very long time before we ha again have a Prime Minister who has a Brexit plan and enough MPs to support him or her in right. that... Pro so it's, it's, everything is up for grabs. Well, in a three or four hours' time, we'll know how close we are to that yeah. result. We Laura. will, and there are some more just tips reaching us here about potential results. Um, straws in the wind, but pretty good straws in the wind. Labour are now confident of taking Ipswich. Now, why does that matter? Not just because it would be a Labour gain from a Tory seat, but currently it's held by Ben Gummer, who is not just a Conservative minister, but was also the minister who was responsible for putting together the manifesto. <laughs> now, if these results all transpire, if that does happen, how much of a metaphor would that be for a bad night for the Conservatives? Also, Jane Ellison, a minister at the Treasury, sounds like she's in deep trouble in Battersea in London. And the Tories are extremely worried about Hastings, Amber Rudd, the Home Secretary's seat. I understand there's a possibility of a recount there. Now, none of those results, of course, are anything like official yet, but potentially three Tory ministerial scalps, including the manifesto coordinator. Also, fascinatingly, Labour sources telling me they are very confident of taking seats in Scotland, at least four, potentially as many as six, again defying the expectations of what we all thought a few hours ago, not what the party themselves thought. And, you know, if these polls are anything like accurate, they're very serious questions for all of our main political parties about how they got it so wrong, of course, for the, for the pundit class, but, you know, all of the Labour MPs, the vast majority of Labour MPs, the vast majority of Tory MPs, most Lib Dem MPs, most um, SNP sources, were all broadly in the same place of expecting that the Tories would gain, Labour would fall back. The question was of how much. The SNP might have a bit of the shine coming off, but nothing too dramatic. But it may be, again, as this transpires, that the public have defied the political establishment absolutely well and truly. We've got another result. What do we want? Kettering. Morley and Outwood you've got. Yeah, I'm going to bring you Kettering first Kettering, of all. Yes, this is the result that. we've just had in. It's a Conservative hold, never really in doubt. A solid uh, majority for Philip Hollibone of 10,562. You can see a very solid 58% share of the vote there. The change overnight uh, shows Labour making gains of 11% to the Tories, 6 There is no UKIP uh, candidate this time round. They had 16% share of the vote. So that might explain why both of these main parties are up. The swing this time round then has gone from the Conservatives to Labour of about 2.6%. So not in doubt, but showing a direction of travel, certainly, towards the Labour Party here. The Kettering one. Really uh, just hold, really, hold it for a second, yes. Really interesting and unusual seat because... Mr Hollowbone, the Conservative candidate, had done a formal deal with UKIP. He's done almost everything he can, to, short of joining UKIP. He's going to meet them regularly every few weeks in return for their support. He's in favour of banning the burqa and he agrees with a lot of UKIP policies and UKIP not standing. And that shows you what happens around the country to the right of the, the political spectrum when UKIP doesn't stand. The Tories do very well indeed. You've got another one for us, Emily, have you? We haven't at the moment. What we're doing is we're looking at some of the predictions. Uh, we might be able to show you some of the interesting ones, like Morley and Outward, in a okay. few moments. All right, which well, are I'll come back to you. Knife edge, but I'll bring you that one. All right, let's go. Let's go. Right. Let's go around the country. Let's go to Aberdeen and uh, join Stephen Duff. Bit of an update here on Gordon, which is Alex Salmon's constituency, the former First Minister of Scotland and former SNP leader. It's got interesting. I'm told the Conservatives are very happy with the early returns from the ballot papers. But a proviso to that, the Lib Dems are seeing support there as well. So that could mean two things. It could mean a split in the opposition vote and Mr Salmon coming through yeah, the middle. Yeah. Or it could be really, really interesting and a shock. Yeah. Might, just might, 
being the Cards and Gordon. To put that into context, the northeast of Scotland was a part of the country, but the Conservatives were hoping to do well. They are confident of taking two other seats here in Aberdeen South and Aberdeenshire West and Kincardine. So as far as you can tell, the Conservatives think these things are going their way. How many seats do you think in Scotland as a whole? <clears throat> Well, the, uh, the Conservatives were hoping maybe six or seven seats in Scotland and North East. Uh, both those seats I mentioned, Aberdeen South and Aberdeen to West and Kincardine, had Conservative mm -hmm. MPs as recently as 19, uh, 1997. So it is fertile territory. There are Conservative voters there, but they've went to other parties in recent years. So the Conservative, as I say, quite confident about South, Aberdeen South, Aberdeen to West and Kincardine, and now maybe... Alex Salmon's seat of Gordon. In Darlington, Steph McGovern is watching things, and again, the Conservatives appear to think, is that right, that they're sneaking up on Labour? Well, yeah, this is one of the seats which the Conservative Party have targeted. Well, they're very close now to actually being able to give us a result. They're excited here because they're ahead of schedule at the moment. But this seat was won in 2015 by Jennifer Chapman, who is, of course, the Shadow Minister for exiting the EU. She won the seat with a 43% share of the vote. Uh, not far behind with 35% was Peter Cuthbertson, who is the Conservative candidate standing here. Uh, not sure yet whether it is going in the way of the Tories or not but certainly it's, it's a very interesting area, this one, because, of course, it's heavily made up with public sector jobs. There's around 27% of the people who work in this constituency work in the public sector. So, of course, the Labour manifesto plans to uh, increase and get rid of that cap on pay rises for public sector might have been something that plays into how uh, I think people have voted here. But, of course, being the North East and being overwhelmingly voting to leave the EU, you don't know which party that might have gone to. But certainly it's not very far off now us finding out which way that vote has gone. Steph, thank you very much. And Boston, I think we can go to John Sweeney is there. John, uh, what's the story there? This is, of course, where the UKIP leader is hoping to take the seat. I don't suppose he's going to, but what's your view? Well, uh, the story um, here is we don't know. You don't know, we don't know. Uh, the, the prediction is most people are saying that, that, that um, Paul Nuttall is not going to win. It, the Conservatives are going to hold the seat here. Uh, we won't know. The, the, the result is expected around 5 o'clock. But um, what we're looking at is how much, how well will Paul Nuttall do here? Will he do well? This is the most, uh, this is the seat in the country which voted for Brexit more than any other seat. So he, he ought to have a good chance, or will he do embarrassingly badly? That's the question we're all interested in. And um, as you can see behind me, um, the magic of democracy is still happening. Um, so we, we won't know till uh, a fair bit later in the evening, I'm afraid, in the night. Uh, we'll come back and hear later on, but I'm joined now by the Secretary of State for International Trade, Liam Fox. Mr. Fox, good evening. Or Dr. Fox, I should say. Um, good evening, you're allowed back on television, then. <laughs> Yes, well, it's going to be an interesting and very long night, I think, for, for all of us. And, uh, no, I didn't say that. I said you've been in hiding all this campaign. It's good to see you. Well, that's very kind of you. And, uh, what happened to you? I've been doing a lot of uh, regional visits and a lot of regional TV, and I have to totally concur with what Andrew Marr was saying. Uh, there is a very different picture emerging across the country. Uh, it's entirely possible that we will still get an overall majority. But what Andrew was saying about the difference in the vote across... Uh, as we went from south to north in the country, has certainly been a very real feature. Uh, and I was across a lot of seats in the north of England where the Labour vote was very much softer than it was, for example, in London. So I think that we will be seeing a lot of very different results tonight. It may be very, very well into the night, maybe even into tomorrow, before we've got an absolutely clear picture. But I think that, that we're getting very differential results across the country. And I'm afraid that we'll have to just be very patient. What would you count as a good result for Theresa May in well, light of what she asked for, which was strong, stable government and, you know, a proper majority in the House of Commons? 
Well, if we win the general election, if we've got an overall majority, uh, that clearly is a win. I think that we're seeing a number of different things happening tonight. I think we're seeing a return to two-party politics. Looking at what I've seen so far of the total vote, we're seeing an increase in both the Labour and Conservative votes as the minority parties uh, tend to crumble away. How that uh, affects individual seats, how that will work in Scotland and Wales, for example, I think remains to be seen. So I don't think that... We, I think the one thing we can be sure of is that a lot of the pollsters will have got the result wrong. But I think we'll also not see a, a, a single national swing uh, across the country in this election. It's going to be quite different in different regions. But uh, coming back to the House of Commons, I mean, if, you, if you're either the largest party but don't have an overall majority or you have a very small overall majority, given that one of the reasons people say she wanted this election was that people like you who are rather hold her feet to the fire on Brexit. I don't know how many trade deals you've done in the last few weeks, but hold her feet to the fire uh, would have an overdue, um, overdue uh, power, influence. Um, if that happens, I mean, if it is a very small majority, do you owe absolute loyalty to anything that she wants to do, any deal she wants to cut with anybody, supposing she, you know, is in a position where she relies on others to remain at number 10? Would you be supportive of anything? Or do you have a red line as far as the Prime Minister is concerned? I don't know quite how many ifs there were in Lots. that particular sentence, but far, far too many, as you well know. Uh, uh, we will give our support to the Prime Minister. I think she was right to call the election, not just in terms of what she might get for a majority, and I think it was there for a very brave decision, but because we will actually therefore have a parliament that runs to 2022 and be able to give us extra time for those Brexit negotiations. Previously, we would have been very much up against it with a, a decision to leave at the, in March 2019 and an election following that in the spring of 2020. Um, I think to get that extra time could be extremely important. As Ken Clark says, Brexit is going to happen. Uh, to give ourselves the best possible deal, we need that bit of extra time. So I think the Prime Minister's decision was the right decision. But, you know, we'll have to wait and see. And, you know, I hate to disappoint you that we're not going to give uh, uh, our, our conditions for how the next Parliament will operate until we know what the next Parliament looks like. Laura, Laura. Koonsberg, sitting beside me, has got a question for you. Dr Fox, if Theresa May ends up having lost her gamble so spectacularly badly and does not have an overall majority, can you guarantee that she won't be forced to resign? Well, it's very early in the evening and I think that we have to wait and see. I've sat through these programmes, Laura, before when we've been told that uh, we'll be in a hung parliament or we'll get a Conservative minority government. And as the results have come in, as you well know, we've seen Conservatives outperforming some of the predictions. So I would be pretty happy that tonight we might do the same and I'll be spending the rest of the night like you watching those results and not making too many assumptions about what might or might not happen until we actually hear the verdict from the voters. But if, if you do not, if she has so badly managed expectation, do you accept that she will be damaged? Her authority will at least be diminished, surely? Well, we'll see what happens in terms of the number of seats we get and what happens in terms of the vote share that we get uh, before we make any uh, assumptions. And as I said, you, know, you can try as often as you like, but sentences that begin with if at this time of the night <laughs> are likely to be met with a response okay. that says we have to have strategic patience. We'll have you back when we can say now that we know. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Dr Fox. We've got a very important result in from a very significant constituency. Laura. Emily, Nuneaton Emily. Uh, was quite a moment last time round. You'll remember in 2015, it was the moment Ed Miliband knew the dream was over when we start to see the emergence of the Conservative majority. That's why all eyes have been on it again. Labour target 54, so it would have been a very steep one for them to take. It's a Conservative hold Marcus Jones back in on a 52% share of the vote. This is what happened overnight. Again, we're looking at that UKIP vote uh, quite substantially down here and seems to be divided out between Conservatives and Labour, both up 6%. Tories have done just slightly better here than they were doing in Kettering, but it is a swing from Conservative to Labour of 0.2%. So very little movement here. Not much has happened to the majority. Overall, what are we understanding? A very mixed picture. None eaten, Kettering, similar parts of the world, different directions, but of course they're both... Uh, Conservative holds, and we just had Brock's born in in the last couple of seconds. Uh, this one, Charles Walker returned on a majority of nearly 16,000. UKIP was in second place uh, last time round, and I can show you what that looks like in terms of uh, what's happened there. Down 16%, and you can see how those gains from UKIP seem to be divvied out. 
Labour up by 10, Conservatives up by, by 6. Let's just have a look at uh, the swing in a safe seat. It is Conservative to Labour of 2.2%. So some of these swings emerging are going from Conservative to Labour, some from Labour Conservative, but all pretty small. So the movement is, is hard to detect in terms of a direction of travel for one party or another at this point. What do you read into this? Just a few things that do suggest the direction of travel. I understand from Tory sources, Jane Ellison, Treasury Minister, has lost in London's Battersea seat. It's been very closely fought. No official right. confirmation, but Tory sources saying she has lost. Labour sources very confident of taking Northampton North in the kind of parts of the country where marginals are extremely important. That's currently been held by the deputy leader of the House of Commons, Michael Ellis, so another prominent Tory potentially losing his seat. Labour also confident of taking Thurrock, a very important marginal in the southeast, where UKIP had been extremely strong in that part of the world. You might have expected it to go the other way. North-South, divide. Yeah. Absolutely, evidence of that emerging. And one minister suggested to me earlier today that may be what we see. Generational divides, young, old, north-south, urban, and versus the kind of wider, not just the shires, but, you know, normal Middle Britain. And Very a, different divides all a, over the place. A completely new landscape. Is a new Maybe a new post-referendum mm. map. You know, we always said in last year at the referendum, sitting in this stu studio, it was going to throw everything up in the air this is the first big chance that we've got to see where the pieces are going to land. And it must be very disconcerting for the politicians to see the pattern breaking like this. It's no longer binary. Politics suddenly become this, that and the other. Indeed, but it's a strange thing because what we've so seen in the last few elections, what we always described as a splintering of the two-tribe system, here it seems at this early stage yes. we're returning to the two tribes but their members are in different places. But we should, we, what we shouldn't forget is that this is also affected by the campaign that we've just had. Mm. I don't think anybody expected the Tory campaign to be so faltering no. and so many Absolutely. missteps um, and the Prime Minister to look, to look, frankly, so unhappy. And nobody really expected Jeremy Corbyn to be such a cracking campaigner. Mm -hmm. Just a quick word on, word, the, on um, the reaction. Just on, 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 on what Laura was Social just saying about the generational, about it the generational so divide. So yes. Lily Allen, the, uh, the, uh, the singer and artist, has just uh, sent a tweet saying, if May wins, young Labour supporters need to rally round Corbyn and protect him from another Blairite coup. And it's absolutely one of the emerging uh, ideas of this evening, uh, David, that lots and lots of Corbynists, part of people who uh, belong to Momentum, feel that if they have pulled off this shock result, they need to get their due. It's young people who feel that they've swung it for Corbyn, they've responded to his campaign, and they'll be a very active part of the, uh, the or a very active lobby group uh, trying to pull Jeremy Corbyn towards him. They feel, as Andrew said, that he made a very bold and open offer, especially with the cancellation of tuition fees, and I think one of the things they're talking about tonight is the fact that they feel that they might have pulled the rug from under Theresa May. We're doing this for the benefit of people who aren't following social media, though, of course, the people you're talking about presumably know everything you, you're saying already. But <laughs> some, people, media. some people might not actually be on Twitter, David. No. You know oh. our whole programme's live on Twitter now, these days. This is on Twitter. Indeed. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> <Don't>. <laughs> David, we have a chance to take stock now with uh, two seasoned election watchers and political journalists, Daniel Finkenstein, a uh, Conservative peer and Times journalist, Andrew Rawnsley, chief political commentator of The Observer. Patchy so far, but what does what we're seeing suggest to you at this point in the night, Andrew? Well, one odd thing uh, is suggesting to me, as you say, based on only a few results so far, is that we might be seeing some revenge of the Remainers. I mean, during the campaign, a lot of people said... That we thought Remain voters might be a factor in this, being cross with the Conservatives, cross with Theresa May for heading for a hard Brexit, but where, they, where are they? And the Lib Dems appear to be struggling. But funnily enough, I live next door to the Battersea seat where the Treasury Minister, Jane Ellison, is defending, and we were her hearing earlier from Laura, has probably, or Laura was hearing, has probably lost that seat, and quite a large majority. And, of course, Battersea is within Wandsworth, which, where three out of four people voted to remain. So I wonder whether that's going on. And I think that might be part of a broader story which explains why the Tories have done so much worse than everybody expected. 
this north-south thing. The Tories were so fixed on going after Labour in its sort of working-class heartland areas in the Midlands and the north that they've rather neglected the south-east of England and London, which are also crucial parts of the country when you're fighting an election. Danny, from Liam Fox a moment ago, we heard the official line that the Conservatives were taking at this point, but what will they really be thinking, well, the, the, the party, the leadership at this well, point? Obviously, Theresa May fought the election because she thought she could... She needed a bigger majority than the one she had, and now looks like she'll get a less big majority. And, obviously, that puts a... If, if a majority at all, and that puts in question, of course, the plan that she had. I think, I think what Andrew said and what Laura said is correct. What we've seen is... A re, what we're seeing is a realignment. The Conservatives have gone after poorer voters, less well-educated people who voted leave. Labour is moving upscale. It's getting more graduates, uh, younger people who may have voted remain. This changes the map, and so it's not entirely surprising at the moment we've seen a few bigger swings to the Conservatives in the north and then Labour doing better in the south. If she ends up with a reduced majority or no majority, what does that mean for her position? Well, I think that the position of the entire party and her will be weak. Actually, I think if you get no majority at all, the leader can't really be moved in those circumstances. You need to have... You're, you're, uh, you're well, you let, need let's be honest. I mean, you're a Conservative peer, so you, I can say it more bluntly than you. I mean, if it's a hung parliament, her authority is utterly shredded. She went to an... Uh, for an early election, yeah, no, which she sorry. didn't have to call, and threw away the majority she already had. Now, whether that makes it actually... Agree, even if she no. could struggle on, the Conservatives could put together some sort of arrangement with Ulster Unionists, obviously, in that situation, the leader's authority is shredded. Though it doesn't oh, make it an easy solution I, as do you remove her or not. Correct. Now, I, was Ken, oh, okay. I was talking about her position. All right. Yeah. If Ken Clark was uh, right earlier that actually the Conservatives somehow managed to creep to... Uh, some sort of majority by the time the, the night's over or we're in tomorrow morning. Well, that's a bit better. At least you've got a majority. But it's not what Conservatives were expecting when she took them to the country. And I think her problem's compounded by this, that she fought such a presidential campaign. It was all about was her. It, it's it, going to be it, difficult it, to blame her campaign, colleagues. Danny? You had to fight a presidential campaign if you wanted to fight northern seats, which had no tradition of voting Conservative. So that was a tip-off of the sort of campaign that they were fighting. And it was always a danger with that campaign. You would end up doing much better in those seats, but not actually winning them, and meanwhile losing some of your it's heartland seats. It's not just the tone of the campaign, wasn't it? It was the mistake. I mean, particularly having to, well, they say clarify, well, others say you turn a, the, the social care cap. Yes, I mean, look, obviously that was a big moment in the campaign, and if you're fighting a campaign that's dependent on you being seen as strong and stable, and then you have to U-turn on something in the middle of the campaign, that is going to damage you. But actually, I think we've got to look at deeper things. One of the things Jeremy Corbyn said, uh, they would in excite young people with this move to the left. Everyone disagreed with it. I was one of those people who thought it wouldn't yeah. work. We've got to look much deeper at the sort of realignments that happen, not just choose social care. This is more profound. If Jeremy Corbyn... I think you might be right. I mean, many, many people were... Many people were sceptical among turnout from the young, and we haven't had a, a lot of results yet, but there does seem to be some suggestion in them that young voters uh, have come out and probably favoured Labour in... Uh, largely, uh, and maybe that's the revenge of the young as well. I mean, they felt a bit cheated by the 2015 general election result, many of them, and they felt even more cheated in the referendum of 2016, yeah. and that may well have motivated a lot of young voters to say, this time, we are going to vote but and make our the, voices But look heard. at the bigger narrative. Don't just concentrate on one or two campaign points. Think about what Jeremy Corbyn may have achieved in increasing the seats and this realignment in the north and south. OK, we will be talking to you more uh, through the night. Mm -hmm. Thank you both for now, Danny Finkelstein yeah. and Andrew Ornsley. David. Sean Lay is in Leeds and has news of how the election is progressing there, Sean. Yes, one of the biggest counts in the country taking place here. Eight constituencies, so after Birmingham, this is the biggest council area in England. They go well out into the countryside, which is why this is a city which managed for 30-odd years to simultaneously elect both Dennis Healy from the Labour Party and Sir Keith Joseph, later Margaret Thatcher's guru from the Conservatives. At the moment, it's a three-party city. I say at the moment because in Leeds North West, the university seat held by the Lib Dem, Greg Mulholland, uh, by the skin of his teeth, really, at the last election, when lots of other university seats fell and the Lib Dems obviously had their Annas Horribles, that has seen a significant increase in the number of new registrations, 13,000 additional voters. Now, you remember, the majority was only 2,500 last time. If those are new young voters inspired by Jeremy Corbyn, then that would be trouble for Greg Mulholland. 
The other seat of real interest, of course, here is Morley and Outwood. You were up for Ed Balls in what breakfast time when that vote finally came through just two years ago. He was ousted by the Conservative Andrew Jenkins by just 422 votes. Now, a Labour source here said to me tonight, if we have fallen short in Morley and Outwood, it's because of the UKIP vote. UKIP not standing, giving the Tories potentially a free run there and an extra potential 7,000 votes. Having said all of that, Andrea Jenkins' sport has arrived here in the last 45 minutes or so. We haven't seen the NPSF yet. They're not exactly looking bouncy and chipper. I think it really could be at this stage one of those really tight results that are going to be, make for us a very interesting night. Thanks, uh, Sean. Let's go to Katie Razzle in Huddersfield. Katie. Hello, David. Well, counting proper hasn't yet started here, but we've got four seats up for grabs, three Labour, one Conservative. And of those Labour seats, two of them, in 2015, the UKIP vote was larger than the Labour majority. So the question is, where will those UKIP voters go? Now, I have to say, um, the most interesting thing, or one of the very interesting things, is there's no purple down there on the floor. UKIP didn't put up any candidates in these seats. So where will those votes go? I'm picking up a very mixed picture. If you take Dewsbury, for example, it's a Labour seat, number 14 on the Tory target list. I spoke to the Conservative agent just a little while ago. He said he absolutely does not recognise the exit poll. He said that's not what they've been finding on the doorstep, and they are very bullish that they can win Dewsbury. But then there's Cone Valley, which uh, at the moment is a Tory seat. Now, I've just been speaking to senior Labour figures here. They believe they have won Cone Valley, which would be a big surprise. Uh, I spoke to the candidate herself, the Labour candidate, and she said she watched young people queuing at the polling stations today, queuing up to vote, and she said it will be the young round here who win it for her. Well, thanks very much. This, this issue of the young is fascinating because it was what, mm -hmm. uh, all the way through, one was picking up, I mean, from social media, from yep. um, young people that I knew who yes. were enthused you know, well, from, and, and from real life. about a kind of energy that nobody had noticed. Absolutely. From, well, from real life, seeing Jeremy Corbyn at rallies, he was going round the country, attracting huge numbers of young people to his events. One of the curiosities about it is that time after time he was holding those events in safe Labour seats. Now, that led to a lot of head-scratching. He wasn't doing the sort of micro-targeting marginals. You were thinking, well, why is he going here? Why is he wasting his time? Because leaders should only turn up to places where votes should be on a knife edge. But what it did do, and I think what those images did do in real life and online and on TV, is give a sense of excitement. For every party, though, there was a giant big fat question mark over whether or not young people were actually going to turn up at the ballot box. Because history tells us that there can be this kind of excitement generated if we think about Nick Clegg in 2010 or in the Scottish independence referendum, for example. Huge enthusiasm for particular um, politics. But it may be this time has transpired. We've got a result from Darlington coming in. Held on the 8th of May 2017 to elect an MP for the Darlington parliamentary constituency to hereby declare and give notice that the total number of votes given to each candidate was as followed. Follows Brack, Kevin John, UK Independence Party, 1,180. Chapman, Jennifer, commonly known as Jenny Chapman, Labour Party, 22,681. <laughs> Liberal Democrat, 1,031. Cuthbertson, Peter Malcolm, the Conservative Party, 19,401. <laughs> Snedker, Matthew Charles, Green Party candidate, 524. Therefore, I hereby give public notice that Jenny Chapman is duly elected as Member of Parliament for the Darlington constituency. Bad for the Conservatives, that one. Labour hold the seat. Well, and Darlington was a crucial seat for the Tories, trying to make inroads into the North East. If they had a hope of a chunky majority, 
Darling Winton was going to be the first sign of the night that they were on course to get there. Jenny Chapman holding on is crucial, therefore, and that will be a disappointment in the Conservative Central Office. Two other snippets reaching me. Labour think that they have gained Aberconway in Wales and also Gower in Wales. Let's see the result in Darlington, the share of the vote and the change since last time. We'll just have a word with John Curtis about what this says for the outcome of the election. There we are. Up 8% for Labour, up 8% for the Conservatives, down 10% for UKIP and a swing from Labour to Conservatives, just 0.2%. John? Well, I, just to re-emphasise what Laura's just said, Darlington was meant to be the seat that told us that Theresa May was heading for a landslide and instead Labour have held it. We, in the exit poll, were expecting a very small swing to Labour of no more than around one percentage point. In the end, it's kind of very slightly to the Conservatives. Uh, so there, uh, I, but there is clearly one broader part, and it does look as though the exit poll has underestimated the Conservative performance in many, though not all, seats in the north of east of England, and that probably is one area where, in the end, the Conservatives are going to do better than expected. But I think everything we've heard so far, both in terms of results and also in terms of the, uh, the information that's coming out of counts, doesn't give any reason to believe that this is the exit poll is necessarily going to be wrong across England as a whole. What... Um evidence do you have about UKIP voters? Because UKIP voters have had the chance to vote UKIP in some constituencies. In others, there isn't a UKIP candidate now, so anybody who voted UKIP two years ago has to go somewhere else. What's your view of, of, well, of what it, they're doing? It's early to talk very clearly about that, but one thing to say, even on the early results, it looks as though the Conservative vote has advanced most in places that voted Leave, which, of course, tend to be places with a high UKIP vote, and Labour are advancing most in places that voted Remain, which, of course, tend to be places with a low UKIP vote. So I think we will discover at the end of the night, as we saw in the local elections, UKIP stroke leave places are the places where the Conservatives make most progress, but that is counterbalanced by Labour doing relatively well in the more Remain parts of the country. And that, as I said earlier, this is probably going to be an election where Brexit has played a crucial role in shaping the character of the vote. Mm -hmm. We should go, um, thanks very much, we should go north of the border again uh, to Scotland to see what is happening in Scotland. I uh, remember the SNP at the dissolution had 56 seats and they're okay. under threat, it seems, from the Liberal Democrats and from the Conservatives and from Labour to some extent. Mm -hmm. Jeremy. Yes, we will do. We'll look at those uh, Scottish seats in, in a moment. But first, let's just have a look at the whole map of the UK here, because it's just worth us saying we had a lot of conversation about a lot of seats, but much of it is exit poll based. So here you can see the actual results that we've got. You see the spots of blue are the holes for the Conservatives in Kettering and Swindon and Nuneaton, Broxbourne and so on. Then you've got these seats in the northeast, Newcastle, uh, Sunderland, Workington in the northwest. But most of the map here that I'm standing on is grey. So the results, the actual results are not yet in. So there's still a lot of exciting hours to come of those counts up and down the country. But let's, as David said, just take a look at Scotland here. So we move the map on, we focus on the result last time. An extraordinary result when you think in lots of elections the, the Scottish National Party were getting maybe six seats, seven seats, suddenly they get 56 out of 59. So they get all but three of the seats in Scotland and the other main parties get, get one each. So it's extraordinary. And this is their battleground. It's, it's ordered like this because the most marginal one is right on the top right. Callum Kerr, Berwickshire and Roxburgh, very, very tight for the SNP two years ago in 2015. Dumbartonshire East, which was Joe Swinson for the Liberal Democrats, again, very tight there. Now, as we go down the board, the seats, the majorities of these seats get bigger, they get safer. So I'm going to ask the board to now input the exit poll and see what we're expecting to happen in Scotland. And what you see, first of all, is that the first two columns, 16 seats here, have been cut away through by the Liberal Democrats and Labour and the Conservatives, all working against the SNP. So the first seat, the most marginal, we have under the exit poll going Conservative. We then have, and if, if the colours are difficult here, just look at the party icons along the left. If they're white, by the way, it means it is just a forecast. Dumbartonshire East Liberal Democrat, as does Edinburgh West, and then Labour taking Renfrewshire East, and so on down the line we go. There are some very good results here for the Liberal Democrats in Scotland. They're getting MPs back in the House of Commons through Scotland, through the SNP's 
retreat here. We go all the way down the second column and we get to Argyle and Butte and that is the first SNP hold in our exit poll. So up until that point, they've lost, for example, to the Liberal Democrats, Gordon, the seat of Alex Salmond, their former leader. They've also then, as you, it doesn't stop there, because as you go on, you see them losing Murray, which is Angus Robertson, the leader of the House of Commons for the SNP. He would be out under the exit poll. Perth and North Perthshire going Conservative. And then Glasgow Central, quite a big majority there, going Labour. Stirling going Conservative. And if we just have a look, if you have a look down to the end of the graphic here, you'll see that completes the set of 56 uh, SNP seats from last time. Angus, where the majority, I think, is over 10,000, maybe 11,000, going to the Conservatives. So this is still just the exit poll. For now, the map is, is coloured in, or it was coloured in all yellow. Now we've coloured it in according to the exit poll. And you see how that result from two years ago now looks absolutely extraordinary. As Kirsty Walk was saying earlier, peak SNP, was it, two years ago? Is this going to be more but like the situation down. in the map of Scotland? So we wait to see what happens. We don't have that many real results, but Scotland is changing, it seems, David. Thank you very much. Well, now uh, we're going to Scotland. We join Douglas Alexander. Uh, and Douglas Alexander, of course, you were the election coordinator for a kind of Blairite view of the Labour Party, Ed Miliband, and before that with Gordon Brown and Tony Blair. What do you make of the success of Jeremy Corbyn? It's a new kind of Labour Party that's emerging, it seems. I think people, young people in particular, are hardwired for hope. And I can't honestly remember as hopeless a campaign from a government, a Conservative government, as we witnessed from Theresa May. So south of the border, it seems to me the Conservatives are being badly punished for the kind of campaign that they've run. And north of the border, the SNP tide is flooding out. How far that tide falls, we'll see in the course of the coming hours. But there's absolutely no doubt that both the parties of government, the Conservatives in England and the Scottish National Party here in Scotland, appear to have been decisively rejected when they were anticipating much, much stronger results. Do you think uh, Ed Miliband was too cautious in the sort of Labour uh, policy that he presented two years ago? Listen, I always think there's a whole range of factors that make up any election defeat or any election victory. Uh, some people say that this manifesto is very similar to Ed Miliband's, others say it's very different. Some people say Jeremy's very similar to Ed Miliband, some people say he's very different. The truth is I'm more interested in what lies ahead for the Labour Party and it looks like we are making gains, not just here in Scotland, against many people's expectations, but also right across England. Are you, uh, are you going to see your old seat, which Mary Black took from you for the SNP? Is that going to go back to Labour tonight? My sense is it's too close to call, but it's just one of a number of seats across west-central Scotland where people were writing us off, but the indications are that Labour is very much back in the game, and in every part of Scotland we're seeing that very high tide that we saw for the SNP just two years ago falling backwards, and it looks like a very difficult night for a party that couldn't really decide, was this an election about Brexit or an election about a second independence referendum? It's certainly done huge damage to those people arguing for a second independence referendum because politics, as you know, is about momentum. And here, the SNP are falling backwards as surely as the Conservatives have not moved forward south of the border. And, and, and uh, are, you, are you surprised at the Corbyn effect? Are you surprised at the crowds? You talk about idealism among the young. When you saw, I mean, yesterday evening, I think it was, in London, he had crowds, not of a thousand, but of thousands, we're told. Well, there's a couple of points. I'd probably be the last person you need to convince not to believe opinion polls during election campaigns, given what I experienced and lived through a couple of years ago. So in that sense, I think I was willing to wait and see, in all sincerity, what would happen. And there is no doubt that Jeremy Corbyn has campaigned with spirit and with a sense of authenticity that was wholly lacking from the Conservative campaign. If you like, the contrast suited Labour, Jeremy arguing for a politics that he clearly believes in, and on the other hand, Theresa May apparently unable to ask the most, answer the most basic and straightforward questions when she was asked. So I think in that sense, this particular context has emphasised not just a fundamentally different vision of the country, but also a different way of doing politics. And of course, like in every election, there are going to be lessons to be learned. Douglas Alexander, thank you very much for joining us. Quick and comment. And uh, what that shows us is even at this point in the evening when we've had so few results, one thing we can say for sure is that Jeremy Corbyn is safe as leader of the Labour Party so long as he wants to be. He's had a great campaign. And when people like Douglas Alexander 
are, are giving the benefit of the doubt he's safe. We've had 15 results in. It's just after one o'clock, so time for us to have a bulletin of the news. Let's just see the new broadcasting house, the old broadcasting house on the left, the new one curling round there on the right, and it's still just showing our exit poll as it was. We haven't adjusted that yet, but we will start to show when we get more than 15 results in what's happening. So let's now have the latest news. Here's Rita Chakrabarti. Hello. The first results have been declared in the general election. Labour has held the party's safe seats of Newcastle Central, Houghton and Sunderland South and Sunderland Central. But the Conservatives took more votes in all three constituencies than at the 2015 election. An exit poll for the BBC, ITV and Sky has predicted the Tories will be the biggest party but that they won't win a Commons majority. It says they'll have lost 17 seats while Labour will have made gains. The poll also predicts losses for the Scottish National. Party. Tom Bateman has the very latest. The night began with a big projection, the exit poll, studied closely by all the politicians, but remember, it's still just a forecast. It has the Conservatives as the largest party, but short of an overall majority. The poll suggests the Tories would have 314 seats, down 17 on two years ago. It puts Labour on 266 seats, up 34. The SNP would get 34 seats and the Lib Dems 14. This is a projection. I think you made that clear. It's not a result. Uh, these exit polls have been uh, wrong in the past. I think in 2015 they underestimated our uh, vote. I think uh, in a couple of elections before that they overestimated our, our votes. Theresa May promised us on seven different occasions that she wouldn't go for a snap general election and she went for it. And she went for it on the basis of wanting to secure a mandate that she already had. And people just saw through that. It's the real votes that count, though. And there's the traditional race to see which constituency could declare first. For the Darlington constituency. <laughs> Labour have just held Darlington. There was a marginal swing to the Tories, but nowhere near the kind of success they would have needed in the north of England for any kind of landslide. Therefore, declare... The two other seats won by Labour in North East England show the Tories have done better than the exit poll might have suggested. The Festival of Democracy has been on full show. Watch out for some upsets through the night. At least one minister's seat could be in question and UKIP's vote appears to be collapsing in places. Good evening, Mr Corbyn. How are you feeling? Jeremy Corbyn arrived home in his North London constituency tonight. If the exit poll is correct, a big if, he will have confounded the expectations of even his own MPs, while Theresa May's gamble to win big in a snap election will have failed. But the night is young, and the truth inside those ballot boxes is yet to be revealed. Tom Bateman, BBC News. Well, with the news of that exit poll, the pound has been falling against other currencies, including the dollar and the euro. Well, let's get reaction now from Sharonjit Lail, who's in Singapore for us. Sharonjit, what's going on? Well, that's right. As you say, the immediate reaction in the markets has been from the British pound. Sterling falling nearly 2% against the US dollar after that exit poll suggested Conservative Party uh, could lose its parliamentary majority. But it's in scale back some of those losses. That's as the first results came in and show that the Conservatives may be doing slightly better than that exit poll suggested. So uh, actually the pound is down about uh, just over 1.5% against the US dollar and most of the other major currencies at the moment. Though analysts have been saying that it's likely the pound will continue falling as Asian markets open. Uh, hung Parliament, of course, is the worst-case scenario for the pound, given the political uncertainty it brings, because it could complicate Brexit talks further, something, of course, markets and investors don't like. Though I should add, Asian markets have just opened in the last few minutes, and they are higher at the moment, only just. Sharonjit, thank you. In other news now, the former director of the FBI, James Comey, has told a Senate committee he felt he'd been ordered by Donald Trump to drop an inquiry into links between the president's former national security adviser and Russia. We'll have more for you throughout the night, but now back to David. It's interesting how this election is proving very exciting. We've had, though, 15 declarations and no change of control of any of the 15 seats. 
But nevertheless, what's happening under that is uh, proving quite riveting in terms of Labour's advance, the Conservatives' retreat in some places, advances in the others. Anyway, we're about to go to Swindon South. Let's go over to Swindon South. Laura, I was going to come to you, but let's just see Swindon South. the result of the poll for the election of a Member of Parliament for South Swindon. I, Stephen Peter Taylor, being the acting returning officer at this election, do hereby give notice that the number of votes recorded for each candidate at this election is as follows. Robert James Buckland, the Conservative Party candidate, 24,809. Sarah Church, Labour and Cooperative Party, 22,340. Independent Party 1291. Talis Kimberly Fairburn, the Green Party 747. And Stanley Jane Pajak, Liberal Democrat 2079. And there were 87 ballot papers rejected. And, uh, and I do hereby declare that Robert Jane Buckland is duly elected as a Member of Parliament for South Swindon. So it's a, a, a close result in Swindon South, but the Conservatives hold on to the seat, 24,800. Labour on 22,347. We were expecting this one to be close, Laura, weren't we? We were, and it, it, this is the kind of thing that will make CCHQ nervous, which will be jangling extremely loudly at the moment. Um, First Welsh result is coming walk. in from Wrexham. Let's go there. Andrew Mark, Welsh Conservative Party, 15,000... 321. again. Harper Carey, the Party of Wales, 1,753. Plaid Cymru, Emil Saith Gant, Pimpteg, a three. Shht. Lucas Ian Collin, Welsh Labour, 17,153. <laughs> Llafur Cymru, Indeg Saith Mil, Ian Cant, Pimpteg, a three. O'Toole, Carol Georgina Tetley, <laughs> Welsh Liberal Democrats, 865. Hmm. Well, there we are. We have the result there. Labour hold Wrexham. The Conservatives were hoping they to were, and, take Wrexham. And it's they? a part of the country. Theresa May went there several times during the campaign. She spent a lot of time in Wales. They were hopeful of taking quite a number of seats. Labour, in contrast, is now hopeful not just of holding seats in Wales, but actually of adding seats in Wales. I've been told in the last few minutes they expect to take Cardiff North. Labour sources also telling me that they have won Rutherglen in Scotland and confident of gaining East Lothian. So against expectation, against the party's private expectation, again, we are seeing in Wales and Scotland, Labour taking rather than just holding their own or even falling back. Interesting that they had, there were 5,000 UKIP votes uh, yeah. last time round, two years ago, Indeed. in cast in Wrexham. And, and again, no UKIP candidate this time. So where did those 5,000 votes? Well, again, it comes down to what John Curtis and what Peter Cowner were discussing before. Where does the UKIP vote split? Now, the expectation at the beginning of this campaign, what the local election results suggested, was that UKIP vote would go primarily and potentially quite dramatically to the Tories. From the actual results that we're seeing tonight, that is not happening. And it may well be that the Tories made a strategic mistake by assuming that U UKIP voters were basically Tories in disguise who'd been a bit more grumpy than everybody else about Europe over the years. But actually, many UKIP voters, of course, were former Labour voters. And that may be part of the problem here with the design of their campaign. Blanethly, Emily. 
This is Nia Griffith's seat, the shadow defence secretary. It's been held by Labour. It was a Plaid Cymru There's target, but you can see how well they've done here. Uh, they start off with a majority of 7,095, and they've just returned Nia Griffith on a majority of 12,000. 53% share of the vote for Labour, and I can show you what that looks like in terms of the gains. Labour up 12%, the Conservatives also making gains, we assume, at the expense of UKIP and also Plaid down here. And that swing then, if I can just show you, uh, very much towards Labour, 1.4%. It's not huge. Conservatives would have needed a swing of, what, 9% to take this seat, but it establishes uh, Labour quite firmly again in this seat in Wales. How important is, is Wales going to be, John, on these results? Well, I mean, we had a limited number of sampling points in the exit poll in Wales, but such as we had suggested that maybe the Conservatives would do rather better in Wales uh, than in some other parts of England. First two results don't corroborate that expectation. Um, we've got virtually no swing in Wrexham. We've actually got a small swing to Labour in Clonethley. So it looks as though the Conservatives aren't going to get particular solace in the Principality in the way that perhaps we might have anticipated at the beginning of the night. Mm. I've never... Oh, we've got another one coming, an, a an change. An extraordinary yeah. one. Yes. Laura was saying a little That's earlier Sorry, on... John. She ..heard that the uh, Labour Party had taken seats from the SNP in Scotland. I don't know whether this is a shoring up yeah. of that unionist vote that we were talking about earlier, but Ged Killen takes it for Labour then from the SNP. You can see how incredibly tight that is, 38% mm. to 37%. That's why it wasn't coming up in a list of things we could easily predict because it was on a knife edge. But if I show you the change, and you can see now the drop very clearly of 16% for the SNP. Conservatives making gains here at the expense of the SNP, but that puts Labour, who is in second place uh, in pole position there, to take it. They've also had a slight rise, and that swing then towards Labour of 8.9%. That's huge. Now, not huge when we compare it to some of those extraordinary swings we saw in Scotland towards the SNP two years ago, but those were unprecedented. This is something that Labour will be... Getting the bunting out for, I would have thought. This Quick, is an extraordinary uh, result for them in Scotland. Quick comment on that one. Well, here, of course, is the first evidence that suggests that actually the exit polls and expectation that the SNP are going to suffer quite substantial That's losses north of the border looks as though it's be right. You remember right at the beginning of the night, this was something about which we were least certain. Well, here's a piece of hard evidence that the SNP are losing ground quite substantially north of the border. Mm. Let's join Michelle, who's got... Two guests who can comment on both these things. Michelle. Indeed. Um, David, with me are Hamza Youssef of the SNP and Peter Hain, Lord Hain, uh, who served for Labour under both Gordon Brown and uh, Tony Blair. Uh, Hamza Youssef, let's talk first ab ab about, about the, the picture that is painted by the exit poll in Scotland and also we've had the first uh, Scottish result in. It's not looking like a good night for the SNP, far from it. Let's try to put this in some context. I have to start with the all caveats that all your guests have in terms of the exit poll and whether it's correct or not correct, the early days and the voting is still very much going on. But what I would say is to put this in some sort of context, which I think has been missing, is that if the exit poll is correct, and I think that's a big, big if, I have to say, from hearing results on the ground, but if it is correct, then 34 seats, of course, would still mean that the SNP wins the election, wins the majority of seats, and that's after being 10 years in government. So I don't think anybody expected the SNP to reach that high but watermark. It's only, it's only two years, isn't it, since the 2015 ele election and all those seats that you took, you know, nearly all the Scottish seats. Well, what is your own party data suggesting about how many you are likely to lose? Well, like you say, an exceptional result in 2015, a once-in-a-century result, frankly, 95% of the seats coming towards the SNP. I don't think anybody expected that to happen again. I think, you know, there's going to be a difficult uh, night for some of our colleagues and it's always Why? sad when you lose colleagues. I think there's a number of factors that have to be looked at. It's too tight to call in a number of races here, but it seems very clear that where there is, uh, where in previous elections, the unionist vote, the pro, uh, I should say the anti-independence vote has split between three parties. It seems perhaps it's coalescing around the candidate that's most likely to defeat the SNP, but it is early days and, as I say, I'm not quite convinced that 34 uh, is, is, is as low as we'll go. I think we'll go higher than that, actually, when it comes to the actual result. Peter Hayne, you're a former Welsh Secretary, and we've now had those two results in um, from Wales. Seats that the Conservatives were really hoping to get. Yes, Theresa May put enormous effort into seats like Wrexham. We haven't heard Bridgend yet, but she went there. I think we'll hold Bridgend well. I think we're going to have a very good night in Wales. I hear we're going to take Gower back from the Conservatives. I hear also that we're going to take the Vale of Cloyd with its excellent 
uh, Labour, former Labour MP Chris Ryan back from the Conservatives. So it's looking like Welsh Labour is doing very well. Overall, I think this is a positive result for Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, I didn't support him for the leadership, but he's harnessed an enormous protest movement about what's going on in this country. Is it that he's harnessed the youth vote or more than that? He's harnessed the youth vote, but I think also you know, people are really angry about what's happening to the health service, what's happening to elderly provision, the lack of housing, the, the student debt. The fact that the economy is just more and more austerity when it's totally unnecessary. We're a richer society than we've ever been in our history and we can't provide houses for people and secure jobs. I think there's a popular revolt against that and I think it's part of a wider that he was able to harness. Now, uh, I don't think people saw him as a prime minister, but they did see him as somebody speaking for their values against a political class that had not been listening to them for a long time. Hamza Yusuf, when Emily Thornbury uh, was speaking earlier, she was saying very clearly that uh, Labour is now going to look to form a government and that it will be looking to other parties for support of one kind or another because otherwise they would be letting the Tories back in. Well, First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has said that we would talk to Labour in terms of a progressive alliance along with Plaid Cymru, along with the Green Party. It wouldn't be a formal coalition, but could we look at seeing on an issue by issue whether we could support uh, a Labour minority government, for example, and we would do that because we want to keep the Tories out. I think adding to what Peter has said, I'm not taking away from uh, Jeremy Corbyn's campaigning uh, skills or, or otherwise, but we have to accept that Theresa May has run probably the worst campaign that any of us have seen yes. from a Prime Minister in modern British political and there history. Was, you could feel a reaction against that on the ground. People didn't like the idea of an arrogant, evasive yeah. Tory Prime Minister wanting a landslide. And I think there was a kickback against that. But the issue for Labour now going forward is are we yet seen as a party of power? Do we have a leader who could be seen stepping into number 10? And do we have a party that is trusted by and people in the And you don't sound like you're ground? sure. Well, can, I'm just can, listening can to I the make vote. A point onto in, that, in Huneaton, I think... for example, we, that's the sort of seat we need to take to be in government. Having said that, you know, Jeremy Corbyn deserves an enormous amount of credit for harnessing this great surge of young people, and not just of young people, but a lot of people who haven't voted Labour out of much enthusiasm but have been voting against the Tories. Now people are saying, actually, we like his policies. We may not see him as a prime minister, but we really liked a lot of these policies. I mean, just, just to add to that, because I wouldn't take away from it, uh, that many of the policies that were in Labour man Labour's manifesto, for example, are being implemented north of the border, such as abolition of tuition fees. And I think here there's a question for many people in England and the political class, there was the idea that you had to be centre or centre right to win an election. Clearly, you can present a manifesto on the left, as we have done in Scotland for over 10 years, and be successful, but it sounds like people in England and the political class are waking up to that fact. Do you think too. the prospect of a second independence referendum rattled some of uh, the people who would have otherwise supported you? Well, the point is that if we win the election, according to your exit poll of 34 seats, then the party that wins the election generally gets the mandate. So we would have a mandate, of course, uh, not just to ensure that a hard Brexit isn't imposed upon Scotland, but that no UK government would block the second independence referendum. Hamza, yeah, you the other thing, the SNP, Peter, I'm sorry to, to Brexit, stop you, I think, but it's now up for grabs in terms of its battle in Parliament. I think it's going to be mm. very difficult for Theresa May to get a hard right Brexit that she was wanting. Peter, Hayne, the thank you, mm. David. Uh, thanks so much. Now we said earlier on that Amber Rudd, the Home Secretary, was in some difficulty or seemed to be in Hastings. This is what she said, it's just her words, when she arrived at her count a moment ago. How do you think it's going? John, I'm not going to um, engage much until we're a little clearer where it is at the moment, so I'm just quietly waiting and making, we keep an eye on everybody and everything in the normal way. How confident are you? John, I'm, no, I'm just hopeful, but not complacent. OK. Thank you. Oh, well, Thank you. that doesn't get you very far, but anyway. Um, it does. Her words don't, but the look on her the face, on I her suggest, face rather does, did. Yes. I know they're very worried about it, even if we don't have the final result. But you've yet. got you've got uh, news on other seats. I do. There. Some more straws in the wind. Ian Murray, who until tonight was the Labour Party's only Scottish MP for Edinburgh South, apparently has achieved an enormous increase in his majority to well over ten thousand. But even better news for Labour from that, I understand that they have taken Pudsey in Yorkshire from the Tory MP uh, Stuart Andrew. I understand that they're also expecting to beat Anna Subri, the former minister, who, of course, was a very prominent Remainer. She has held the seat of Broxo. 
And the biggest scalp, that, scalp so far that Labour are ready to say they believe they've taken, according to sources, is beating Nick Clegg in Sheffield, Hallam. We touched on it briefly earlier, mm. but it appears that the Labour Party's effort there have won out. So perhaps the Sheffield, Hallam students were still around after and, all. And to clarify this, you said Anna Subri... Anna has, Subri has expecting to... Sources tell me that, that Labour okay. has taken Brockstone. Not officially confirmed, but Labour believes they've taken okay. it. And one of, the other, one of the other interesting constituencies was Richmond Park, Richmond in Surrey, on the Thames, uh, where uh, there was a... a you remember um, Goldsmith resigned to... Well, he stood as Mayor of London and was defeated. He then resigned over the issue of uh, the third runway and London Airport. And Samira... Sami oh, we've got a result coming in. Samira, stay with us for a moment and let's just uh, hear this result from Tooting. We'll be back with you in a second. Are we all here? No? Which the one more to come, Mr. Martin? <clears throat> Good evening. A declaration of the result of the poll for the parliamentary election in the London Borough of Wandsworth, Tooting constituency, oh, held on the Thursday, the 8th of June, 2017. The I, James up. Madden, being the returning officer for the Tooting constituency, hereby give notice that the total number of votes given for each candidate at the election is as follows. Rosena Chantel Alim Khan, Labour Party, 34,000... <laughs> Thirty-four thousand six hundred and ninety-four. Ryan Cosshall, UK Independence Party, three hundred and thirty-nine. Alexander James Glassbrook, Liberal Democrats, three thousand and fifty-seven. <laughs> Esther Obiri Darko. Green Party, 845. <laughs> Daniel Richard Watkins, the Conservative Party candidate, 19,236. So Labour holds it with a, a big increase in uh, their majority. The Conservative vote, well done. This is the seat that Sadiq Khan used to sit in and he became the Mayor of London and Rosina Allen Khan, Allen Khan took the seat uh, at the by-election for Labour. Uh, but the overall picture is a majority of 15,458. That's up 12,000 majority. Very interesting. This is exactly the kind of seat that just a fortnight or three weeks ago the Labour Party was extremely worried about. We were there on a visit relatively early on in the campaign. It's an area that's been changing demographically. On paper, it looked like it should be tending to more towards the Conservatives. The old gentrification. Indeed. But she's a very talented campaigner, somebody very well regarded as the younger generation of Labour MPs coming up. And uh, a thumping win for her there. And also the London effect. Indeed. This, we've been talking all night about the division between the South drifting, moving quite sharply towards Labour, mm -hmm. and the North mm -hmm. going a little bit more mm -hmm. Tory. But, of course, there are a lot of very, very important seats in the South that Labour hasn't really been thinking about hard for a long time and are now picking up one after another. Let's, uh, let's hear from Samira Ahmed. I'm sorry I didn't go to you before, Samira, on uh, Richmond Park. Uh, Zach Goldsmith, I was saying, uh, is trying to take the seat back from the Liberal Democrats who took it at the by-election that he forced when he was against uh, Heathrow. What's happening? Well, it's really interesting what's happening here. Turnout is a big, big factor. So Richmond Park, which, as you say, in the by-election was an amazing win for the Lib Dems. You took it in the kind of post-E referendum a rebellion of the 48%. Um, the turnout then was 53%. Uh, um, they say it's 76% now. And it's very early, but certainly the indications we get from talking to people is I think Zach Goldsmith is thinking that he could win this seat back. But the other seat being counted here at Twickenham Stadium is, of course, Twickenham, which is uh, the Vince Cable seat that he lost 
in a big shock in 2015. The turnout's gone up a little here too, to just under 80%, 79.7%. And we really pick up a strong sense here that they're quietly confident that Vince Cable could win this back. What Lib Dem seem to be hearing on the street is that there was a protest vote element in 2015, an element of some people staying away. People are turning out to vote now because they think it matters. Although Brexit may not be the issue that the Lib Dems thought it was at six months ago. It's more of a general picture about anti-hard Brexit, uh, protect the NHS. But certainly two seats could be changing. Vince Cable could be on course to win back uh, Twickenham and that Goldsmith, now a Conservative again, having stood as an independent um, in that by-election that he called, might be able to take back the seat uh, from the Lib Dems who claimed it as such a triumph only six months ago. And Bermondsey and Old Southwark, uh, Gita Gurumurti is there. Um, that was a seat that Simon Hughes held, or used to hold for the Liberal Democrats, and no doubt because it was very much a Remain constituency would have been uh, arguing that the Liberal Democrat offer of a second referendum would be appealing. But what's the news? Well, it does look as though Labour have held this seat, possibly with an increased majority. Um, some reports even that the majority might have doubled for Neil Coyle of Labour. Now, he has been a prominent critic of Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see what Neil Coyle and others in the moderate part of the Labour Party now do, if there was to be, for example, a minority Labour government. Of course, it's very early days still. Uh, but Simon Hughes had fought this seat very very hard, uh, his team accepting unofficially that they think it's possibly not gone their way tonight. They think it's part of a national swing, uh, part of a bigger youth turnout. They say that there's been a 25% churn in this seat of people, people who perhaps don't recognise or remember uh, Simon Hughes's record. He was here for 32 years as an MP until 2015. Um, I was here just two years ago. There was a, a very uh, big change, a very big uh, shock, of course, when he lost that seat. Neil Coyle, uh, defending a four and a half thousand majority and it looks as though Labour has been successful. They say they've had about a thousand volunteers on the streets and Neil Coyle has in fact just entered the hall here. I should just say also that in this hall just a few hours ago the Book of Condolences was placed. Uh, Theresa May and Sadiq Khan had both signed that. Um, for the London Bridge attack. So a very emotional week here. Paisley and Renfrewshire South. Uh, we were talking about it a moment ago. Mary Black uh, holds it for the SNP, or held it for the SNP at the solution. And here's the, here's the result. She was the youngest MP, it was said, since the Great Reform Act. And um, she was uh, uh, kept by the Labour Party rather under wraps. She wasn't able to, wasn't allowed to go out and take part, SNP rather, wasn't allowed to go out and speak very much on television and radio because I think they thought she was too inexperienced. But uh, she's done well there. Her previous majority of 5,684. And uh, Tom Watson's constituency, and I do hereby declare the that deputy the leader Watson of the Labour Party, for the West Bromwich East constituency. he's held on it, and let's hear what he has to say about Labour's results so far. We've got 34 results in, just to remind you. I'm very proud to have been re-elected as the MP for West Bromwich East, and I'm deeply grateful to those people mm. who have voted for me. I promise that I will do my best to repay the trust you've placed in me and I'll continue to work for all people in our community. And my, con my congratulations and my respect to all of my opponents in this election 
You've all fought a very good campaign, a fair campaign and in the right spirit. Thank you for putting yourselves forward and my very best wishes to you all for the future. We still don't know the final result of this election. It is too early to say, but it looks like The lights of... Oh, he's back. Oh. oh, he's been cut off in his prime. This is awkward, though. He's back, course... but now he's silent, so we but... shan't be able to hear what he says. But this is a huge... We'll catch up with it, but let's join Michelle and we'll try and find out the important thing that uh, Tom Watts was going to be saying about yes, the Labour happily, Party. Yes, happily, we can uh, pick up with Shami Chakrabarti, Shadow and Attorney I'm, thank General. Thank you. I'm happy to fill in for Tom Watson <laughs> on this occasion. What was he going to say? What, he was what does this mean? He was going to say this has been a victory for hope over fear. I hope he was going to say that people try to destroy our democracy in recent weeks. And I hope that we will see a great turnout when we actually do the maths in the morning and people turned up in their droves and they queued up at polling stations in an election that people try to disrupt. That in itself is a victory, regardless of where we go. Of course, you know, I, I, I'm um, feeling optimistic and feeling better, but, but the main thing is this was a victory for democracy over terrorism. But what is, what, what is the key to the gains that Labour has made? I think that Jeremy Corbyn ran a fantastic, positive campaign. I think um, I, I'm new to party politics. You, you, you know, Michelle, from, from years of us talking, that I was a cross-party human rights campaigner for many years. And like so many people, like hundreds of thousands of people in Britain, I joined Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party because of his message of hope over fear and cynicism. And... Goodness me, it seems to have taken. But the question now is what he does with, yeah. the, with the result that it is looking like is going to be delivered. Well, let's see, you know. Let, let, let's see. So on, on the basis of, of, the, of, of the exit poll and the results we're seeing so, so far, Theresa May is not going to get what she hoped for. Now, are there already calls being made, feelers put out to parties that Labour would hope to support a Queen's speech that it would put forward? I... I'm sitting here with you, so goodness knows what calls are being made. I, I, I'm not, you know, making those calls because I'm sitting with you. But, um, but goodness me, um, what a positive signal. And I think that there are a lot of people who will be sitting up at home tonight thinking hope triumphs over fear. A campaign that was about policy and not about being nasty to, to politicians of the other side. But is it, it Labour's hope to form a minority government? It is Labour's hope to form a government. It is always Labour's hope to form a government. And a few weeks ago, we were... You know, the whole point of this snap election that wasn't supposed to happen, the whole point of this snap election was that Theresa May, who was never, let's be clear, like me, she, you know, she wasn't elected to be leader of her party. She wasn't elected to be prime minister. This was going to be the moment for her resounding I mean, mandate. It's rather different to you've just said, obviously, you were new to politics and yeah. she was a, a long-serving cabinet minister. No, no, but what I'm saying is, look, let's be years. clear, I'm not an elected politician. I'm the shadow attorney and I'm an advisor, but I am like millions of people in this country who, who, who want something positive, who wants to get rid of... Poverty and tuition but as fees. As a key so member on. of Jeremy Corbyn's team, I'm, I'm keen to get a sense yeah. from you of, of how a future, whether it is, I mean, a, a future government or minority government for Labour would work, because we are at a point when, where Brexit negotiations are going to start one way or another within within days. Can you can you imagine that that a government led by Labour on the basis of uh, of a result that mirrors this exit poll could? could negotiate with the EU from a position of strength? I think that politics has changed. Whatever happens tonight, politics in this country has changed. And Jeremy's whole style of politics and the whole style of politics that's confounded every one of your panellists down there and everybody that's sat here with you before, the whole style has changed. It's more consensual. It's more about policy and issues and not... A tribal thing almost so so I think hope springs eternal at this moment and you know I just send my solidarity to everybody at home who's sitting up wanting uh, a country for the many and not the few and in particular to the victims and their families 
of these terrorist atrocities that were designed to scare us and were designed to, frankly, probably stop the general election. It happened, and people have come out so far in their droves. And let's, let's see what happens. Shami Chakravarti, thank you. Thank you. Let's just talk about uh, the Labour Party and what they might do uh, in, in, in if this exit poll turns out right or if they do a bit better. Well, for the very first time, we have to start to get our heads around how Labour might deal with Brexit, how a Labour minority government working alongside the SNP might be different in their Brexit negotiations. We haven't really been thinking about this at all for obvious reasons, but a few things are very important. One, there would still be a huge row over the exit bill, the, the amount of money being paid, because every pound that a Labour government sent to Brussels would be a pound they couldn't spend on the NHS or one of their priorities at home, point one. Point two, however, I think Labour would be much more open to a deal over some kind of European court overseeing the rights of EU citizens, an absolutely crucial issue, issue for Michel Barnier, the lead EU negotiator. So it would be easier in that respect. Mm. But, of course, they'd also want to have the SNP involved, and the SNP want to be inside the single market. So I think this would completely open up, reshape and change any negotiations over Brexit, if that happened. Correct me if I'm wrong, but in the 48 billion spending plans and revenue plans, there was no mention of a Brexit fee, was there? There's no Brexit. Mind you, the Conservatives haven't actually totted that up either. Both sides have a large black hole mm -hmm. if they agree a large sum over yeah. Brexit. Well, Who's worth saying? So go ahead, Laura. So, yeah, the black hole, in a sense, sums up really what both parties were trying to do through the election in terms of their Brexit plans, partly because they're not quite sure and also because they were reluctant to go into any detail that would cause them problems later on. Because let's not forget, it's not just about convoluted complexities of Brussels. It's also about huge decisions that will affect the quality of people's lives here in this country. What do we do about immigration? It's absolutely tied to Brexit. What happens to the economy is, of course, absolutely tied to Brexit. Now, where Labour have put forward a different approach to Brexit, they say they would much more concentrate on workers' rights and We've things like that. We've got a declaration yeah. coming, oh, sorry we'll to interrupt you, from Vale of Cluid, then I'll come right. back That's round the table. Right. Let's just hear this. In hospice through a hin, what never a pledlaceae, a vorewid dros bob in imgeisith in our tholiad velaganlin. I, Mohammed Mehmed, being the acting returning officer at the election of a member of parliament for the Vale of Cluid constituency, hereby give notice that the number of votes recorded for each candidate at the said election this was, uh, was as follows. This was a held seat with a majority Davis, of only 237 Michael, and Labour Welsh chasing them hard here. Party candidate, Mgeisith, Clyde, Gaidwaddle, Cymru, Index Scythe Mill, uh, Pedwar De Pedwar, 17,044. Ruane Christopher Sean, Welsh Labour, Clavir Cymru, Index Now Mill, Pedwar Cant, uh, Daideg, you know 3, 19,423. Oh, Williams, William Gwynn, Welsh Liberal Democrats, Democratiaid Rydd Vredol, Chwech Cant a Chwech Deg Chwech, 666. Huge increase in the number of people White, voting. White, David Lee, Clyde Cymru, the Party of Wales, <clears throat> In Mill Pimp, Cant a Pimp Deg In, 1,551. Ruin Dadgan Druihin Vod, Christopher Sean Ruan, Wedi A Ethol in Brodol, an A Lord Senadol Drosdafrin Cluid. Well, I can't translate from the Welsh, but I know what he's saying, which is Chris Ruan Ruan has taken this for Labour. He had it before up until 2015, and he's won it back for Labour from the Conservatives. And the, uh, let's just see the, the change in the vote here 50% for the uh, Labour, 44 for the Conservatives, the change since last time up 12 and up 5 percentage points for the Conservatives, a swing from Conservative to Labour in this Welsh seat of 3.5 per cent or so. Remember, in the context of Wales, when we're thinking about it, where the Tories expected to make gains, of course, Wales voted to leave. It was a Brexit part of the UK. 
Now, what John Curtis's analysis is really interesting tells us at this point, in seats where Leave won less than 55%, there has been a swing of around 4% to Labour. But where you look at those much more strongly Leave seats, where Leave won over 60%, Votes are going the other way. The swing is smaller, it seems 1%, but going towards the Tories. So even it seems it's more complicated than just saying, here's a leave area, they're going to go one way. Here's a remain area, they're going another way. Yet again, we see you know, really, really sort of patchy patterns sort of starting to develop. I want to see if we can recover what Tom Watson, the deputy leader of the Labour Party, said uh, at his count when he held his seat. And I think you remember it froze suddenly in mid-sentence, but I think we can go back to it now, can we? I hope we'll see more Labour victories tonight and more Labour supporters celebrating in the hours to come. The next few hours, maybe the next few days, look very uncertain, but one thing can be sure. Theresa May's authority has been undermined by this election. She is a damaged Prime Minister whose reputation may never recover. People in this country were crying out for something more than what the Tories have given us for the last seven years. They want something to hope for. They've responded to a positive campaign. We don't yet know how this election will turn out, but we know that people vote for hope. Thank you. So there was Tom Watson saying that uh, what we do know from this is Theresa May's authority is undermined. She's a damaged Prime Minister and uh, she'll never recover. But it's it's absolutely extraordinary, isn't it, what this does to the internal dynamics of the Labour Party? Because the Labour Party has always been a coalition of people that felt uh, had very different beliefs. But for much of the past two decades, the Blairites or the Moderates have been sort of in the ascendancy. That Jeremy Corbyn comes along. And I think there are lots and lots of people who feel that tonight might be a really bad moment for the Moderates. Jim Watson of BuzzFeed UK, the political editor of BuzzFeed UK, has just tweeted, one of the stranger ironies tonight is how many vocal anti-Corbyn Labour MPs in marginals could find that their seat saved by uh, Corbyn. It's an amazing thing to think that over 180-odd MPs said they had no confidence in Corbyn. A lot of them are now dependent on Corbyn for their career prospects. And someone that I think has been part of the shift in power within the Labour movement is Owen Jones, the young uh, writer, political writer, socialist writer. He tweeted earlier tonight, here's to Britain's young, you were ridiculed, patronised, demonised even, and you may have changed history whatever happens. And there is a strong sense tonight coming through online, coming through on my phone and all our phones, that young people feel that they have swung the balance of power uh, forever within the Labour Party. We can't, of course, forget what this means for the Tories. Ben De Pere, who's the editor of the Channel 4 News, um, has tweeted earlier, wonder whether or not choosing the evening standard and other jobs over the UK Parliament feels the best, right, uh, best choice right now for George Osborne, uh, which is a mischievous thing for him to say. I should also tell you, David, that um, the odds on uh, Boris Johnson being the next Tory leader have fallen dramatically over the course of the evening. One bookies, one set of bookies has his odds falling from 66 to 1 to 5 to 1. So lots of speculation about where the Tory party's going to. Emily. An extraordinary result. Uh, Justin Greening in Putney, south-west London. It doesn't look it. She's held on to her seat. She's the education secretary, of course. But this is what I want to draw your eye towards. The very close uh, share of the vote between Conservatives and Labour. She sat on a 10,000 majority in this seat. She's now sitting on 1,500. And if I show you what that looks like in terms of a swing, it's a 10% swing from the Conservatives towards Labour. Now, in a safe seat like Putney, a government minister, maybe it was always going to be a tough call for Labour to take this, but they'll start to look at other seats in London, the closer ones, and think maybe they have got a chance if this is a, a London-wide phenomenon that they're seeing. One other one I just want to bring you, which is Cleward South. You had a veil of Cleward a second ago. Now, Cleward South originally showed up in some of our uh, forecasts as being a uh, take for the Conservatives. Labour has held on to it. It's right next door to Vale of Cleward, of course. Labour on 51% share of the vote, the Conservatives 39. And uh, a swing this time also from the Conservatives to Labour, 2.4% swing. So it does seem as if Labour is establishing a bit more of a ground base in Wales and starting to make these quite impressive inroads in London, even if they're not actually changing the colour of those seats yet. Uh, Tim Farron uh, was uh, caught a moment ago leaving his nice? house to go to his count at Westmoreland and Lonsdale and was questioned as he came out of the house. It's here. And then generally 
Not spot on. How do you think it will go tonight? Uh, well, too early to say, isn't it? Um, Are you worried about Nick Clegg's seat? Yeah, any reaction to Nick all, Clegg all, possibly all, losing his seat? All of that we don't know. So uh, we're looking forward to the rest of the evening. All the best. Take care. Uh, that was a fairly non-committal comment. Uh, um, although we, we have been hearing that his own seat, Westmoreland, is, is in jeopardy. Not that it will definitely go, but that he is not having an easy time of it and he may lose out. Also, just in the last few minutes, I've heard that Labour are expected to hold Hartlepool, where the Tories had put on a very strong challenge, part of Theresa May trying to push again into the northeast. Labour also expect to take Hendon, again, another London seat. They also expect to take Stockton South, a Tory seat that would be, if it comes true, taking another seat from yet another government minister. I do think it is just worth saying, though, there are parts of the country where we've hardly heard anything from. The east of England, many of the Midlands marginals. We saw Tom Watson there, but there are big, big chunks of the country where we're yet to get any intel. So Labour at the moment, I'm getting messages from people saying this is astonishing. We could be the largest party, but it is still early is days. Young. It's still, it still might not feel like it already, but the night is still young, the apparently. Feels, <laughs> the night feels very young. We're going to hear from Tom Watson, who we heard a brief uh, sentence or two from a moment ago. Uh, but first, no, no election is complete without the swingometer, and we haven't seen the swingometer yet, so where is the <laughs> swingometer? Jeremy. Come through the face of Big Ben here into the Elizabeth Tower with the smashing of glass. Here I am. Yes, I just got a tweet from somebody saying, where's the swingometer? The answer is, is dear, because we're looking at swing across the whole country, we need a few results to come in. So we're nearly at 50 seats now. We think we can show you what the swing across the UK would be. Obviously, Scotland, a separate story. But this is Conservative Labour. Let's just have a little look here. And here we go. So, Conservative Labour. Crucial thing about the swingometer is that if nobody changes sides between one side and the other, the swing is at 0% and no seats change hands. This is all about people moving between the parties. So we now ask the swingometer what the swing is and in which direction. Here we go. Let's see. And it's fairly modest, isn't it? It's a swing against the Conservatives to Labour of what looks like just under 1%. Now, all of these dots here are constituencies up both sides. And the closer you are to the zero, the more marginal your seat is. As the axle moves here, it moves across the dots and the seats change colour. And you can see that the effect of this swing, if this were to be applied across all the seats in the UK, not just the ones we've had so far, would be nine seats going red from the Conservatives. Nine seats to Labour from the Conservatives. So it's a, a relatively modest swing, but it's interesting in the context of an election which was initially called with the idea that the Conservatives were going to do some kind of stupendous advance. Actually, Labour are more than holding them off. What's happened here? Let's have a look. So you see that both the Conservatives and Labour are up. Labour up 8% and the Conservatives up 7% in the results we've had so far. And the interesting thing here is this. The figure for UKIP has crashed. Look at that, down 12%. So people who were voting UKIP in large numbers just two, two years ago have been dislodged. But the conventional wisdom as we approach this election is that they'd all go into the blue block here. They haven't done. What seems to have happened is that they've been dispersed rather evenly and quite a lot of former UKIP voters have actually gone to Labour, which explains why both these columns have come up. So, yes, the first thought about the election that UKIP were going to go down dramatically was correct. The second thought that they'd all go simply automatically to the Conservatives really, really underplayed the complexities of a night like tonight. As you can see from the figures we've got, we also have the Greens down a touch and the Liberal Democrats down a touch as well. So part of the explanation here is this really big drop. UKIP voters dislodged and going, many of them, interesting, interestingly, to Labour, which has given the Conservatives so many problems. We'll be looking, you mentioned the swingometer and, and seeing it. This is the national swingometer here. We will later on, David, be able to look at different regions and see the differences around the country. Thank you very much. And now we're going to hear if the earpiece fits his ear all right, which I think has just been put in. Tom Watson, sorry, it's rather undignified to have people fiddling with your ear, but can you hear, can you hear me all right? I, I can hear you now. Thank you, David. But I think we're about to get another result from Samuel. Well, I'll, I'll, let me catch up with you uh, before we get that result in. You were one of those people who thought that okay, the... OK, well, step out of the camera, you can get the result. Oh. That was a great uh, shame. Let's get the result then, and then he's been 
moved out of the way. Yeah? Robert Graham, Green Party, 323. Focus, Flow, Liberal Democrats, 333. Hardy, Andrew David, the Conservative Party candidate, 14,329. Well, this is a safe number of Labour seat. So, you've uh, a news from Alistair Campbell. We go back to Tom Watson, who unfortunately um, was taken from us. <laughs> Um, trying to be helpful, first, first he froze, uh, <laughs> and the second time uh, he was very helpfully moving aside so that well, we could see that result. Well, maybe... He was, uh, he was uh, just safe being... Labour seat we didn't want to see, but anyway. Oh. He was just being affable and helpful, but a question for him. Does he agree with Alistair Campbell, who's just told somebody else, as it were, that he doesn't think that Brexit can now go ahead on the original timetable, that Brexit is, yes, has yes. to be delayed? Ah, uh, Tom. Oh. There he was. He's <laughs> here today, gone tomorrow. Maybe he's trying to work out what he's going to say after he thought that Jeremy Corbyn should resign. No, no, Tom, let be fair to him. <laughs> um, um, we, we, we'll have Mr Watson. Tom, thank you very much for coming back. Let me, let me just start. Uh, we heard briefly what you said about Theresa May being finished. I wonder whether it's not you that's finished, because you were the person who said that Jeremy Corbyn was not the right person to lead. You were the person, you know, who, like 80% of the MPs in the House of Commons didn't want him, uh, thought the party was being taken over by the radicals, now, it seems they're doing rather well on that basis. Well, I think it would be very foolish for anyone to want to stand down in the Labour Party tonight after this resort, David. And it seems to me that the people that have lost the most are the media that were trying to distort Jeremy's message. And look, he's cut through that, hasn't he? Um, the, the sort of tabloid press were demonising him all week. And these are early sets of results, but it does seem very promising for Labour. Um, but uh, it, it's, it does it, seem to me, I mean, I, yeah. so, go on, sorry. no, go on. It, it does seem to me I, I've been around, I, I got to about 50 defensive marginal constituencies in this campaign, and in every one, people were saying, you know, this is an unnecessary election. Theresa May told us that she that it didn't need to be a general election because it's not in the national interest, and then she got a little rise in the polls and then decided to act in a party interest. And, it seems to me that she's going to profoundly regret that political opportunism by the end of tonight. And but, but what do you make? Going to land, what but... do you make? What do you make of uh, if if to, we don't know the final result, of course? But clearly, Labour has done better than, as you were saying, people thought it would, and the opinion polls thought it would. What do you make of Labour's success under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, which you have been critical of? Well, he's opened the campaign up and he's, he's, he's won some arguments. You know, this was supposed to be a very narrowly focused election. I don't think I've ever known an election where there were so many issues being discussed. That's partly because of the leadership that Jeremy showed, partly because the electorate just took the issues from politicians and decided they wanted their own election. The health service, defence, security, terror, um, it, transport infrastructure, quality of life, housing, the future for young people, security for pensions. These are all issues in this campaign in a way that we were told this was going to be a referendum on leadership and on Brexit alone. And it seems to me that be careful what you wish for when you have unnecessary and uncalled for general elections. Is Jeremy Corbyn now safe as leader of the Labour Party and will he have the support of those MPs who wanted to get rid of him? Well, I think he was safe whatever the result would have been. He's had stood for two elections and, you know, he, this was an election that was brought upon us early. So I, th I think, uh, you know, I, there were plenty of journalists who were talking about a potentially, potential leadership challenge to Jeremy Corbyn in the next seven days. I've not heard any MP say that. But it seems to me that the shoe is on the other foot now. You know, I could see Boris Johnson sharpening the knives for Theresa May after this result. But let's see what uh, what the final results are by the end of the night. And you're 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 putting your or I won't use the word knife, but your your original objection and the 80% of to of Labour MPs who objected, they're all going to go silent and come behind Corbyn and John McDonnell's plan for the economy and all those things, are they? I, I think if we come out of this election with an increased vote, then 
you know, it, it shows that uh, you can argue that natural resources can be socially owned and the sky doesn't fall in. I think you can argue that there could be greater, a greater role for the state in providing public services. You can argue that you need to give young people the best start in life and, you can, and that you can be bold in government. And that's what our manifesto said. I was very proud of our manifesto. John, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Just very briefly, David, I'm hearing from Labour sources that they expect to take Leeds North West, they expect to take Finchley and Golders Green, they also expect to take Shipley, and I think they may already have done from the Conservatives and uh, the MP, Philip Davies. Just briefly, off the back of Tom Watson there, let's be completely clear, privately, there were plenty of Labour candidates who were discussing not how they would get rid of Jeremy Corbyn in the next week or so, but how they would hope to try to move to do that in the next couple of months or so. That was something that was being discussed. Of course, these results transform that situation. It's completely plain. Very that was something that was on do. their agenda. You've got more results, uh, Emily. This is an absolutely staggering result in Angus uh, in Scotland, uh, which really wasn't on anyone's watch list. It was on the Tory target at 126, but the Conservatives have taken it from the SNP. Kirstine Hare becomes the new MP here on 46% share of the vote. And you can see what's happened here. Big fall, a dramatic fall for the SNP, down 16. Might be time to start asking questions about tactical voting amongst the uh, unionist parties in places where they thought they could overturn the SNP. This was a seat, one of few seats, one of six seats that the SNP actually held before 2015. So it wasn't even a recent gain. That swing... Uh, will be one of the most dramatic, I predict, of the night. 16% from the SNP to the Conservatives. Uh, the drama each time seems to have been in Scotland, so we're going to keep a tight watch on that. Another result to bring you in the northeast of England, Hartlepool, which is a Labour hold on 53% share of the vote, despite uh, a good fight from Carl Jackson for the Conservatives on 34%. But it is that UKIP vote that you really want to look out for here massively down, 17%. Philip Broughton stood for the leadership uh, alongside Paul Nuttall, didn't win it, of course, and now sees his share of that vote massively falling here. So the swing is actually, as you can see, towards Labour, quite a modest one, 1 1.8. Uh, but questions now surfacing from all these northeastern seats about maybe the point of the UKIP vote at all going forwards. One more to show you, Warwickshire North, this is a Conservative hold, and this is somewhere that was on the Labour target list, number 24. And this is showing not only a Conservative hold, but a swing towards the Conservatives. So they have strengthened their hold on this one, a majority of 8,500. This incredibly mixed picture emerging now that they seem to be doing quite well in parts of England, uh, extraordinarily well in those two results we've had in, in Scotland and yet not so well in Wales. Um, we're joined by um, Nigel Farage, who, after all, led uh, the, one of the leaders of the Brexit campaign. Mr Farage, thank you for joining us. You're not standing you. as a MP, of course. What did you make of Paul Nuttall's leadership of UKIP? UKIP doesn't seem to have been doing very well. No, I thought he was strong. I thought he was robust. But I don't think he had time to establish himself with the voters uh, who still don't quite know who he is. So, no, I've got no criticisms of Paul, uh, although uh, the party itself, the people around him, um, I think organisationally pretty weak. What's going to happen to Brexit now? Uh, Theresa May called this election in order to pursue the kind of Brexit that you wanted, and it doesn't look as if she's going to get the kind of majority she was asking for. Well, what a huge error uh, to pick a Remainer uh, to lead a Brexit party in a Brexit election. Um, massive mistake. Uh, I think that uh, if we do get uh, a Corbyn coalition, uh, then Brexit is in some trouble. And if Brexit in so is in some trouble, will you come back into active politics and fight for what was voted for only last summer? I would have absolutely no choice but to do exactly that. Well, that's interesting. We've got to go... I'm sorry, we can't make, be able to come back to you. We've got to go to I, Battersea, James so we've got a result. Returning officer for the Battersea constituency. From Battersea. Here, God, hereby give notice that the total number of votes given for each candidate at the election is as follows. Christopher Austin Francis Coughlin, commonly known as Chris Coughlin, Independent, 1,234. 
Lois Elaine Davis, Green Party, 866. <laughs> Richard Adam Davis, Liberal Democrats, 4,401. Marsha Chantol de Cordova, Labour Party, 25,000. Twenty five thousand two hundred and ninety two. Jane Elizabeth Ellison, the Conservative Party candidate, twenty two thousand eight hundred and seventy six. Daniel Peter Lambert, the Socialist Party of Great Britain, thirty two. And Eugene Power, UK Independence Party, three hundred and fifty seven. And I do hereby declare that Marsha Chantal de Cordova. So, uh, Jane Ellison, Financial Secretary to the Treasury, a former Public Health Minister, uh, is defeated in Battersea. Labour takes Battersea. And the swing in Battersea, let's just see what that is, 46%. And a swing of 10% from Conservative to Labour in an area that's almost 80% in favour of Remain, just under 80% in favour of Remain, whether that's significant or not. I want to go back to Nigel Farage, who we interrupted for that result. Mr Farage, thank you for waiting. The last thing you said was very tantalising. You said you'd have to come back into active politics. That's what you plan, is it? Well, it's not what I plan, it's not what I want. Um, I was, you know, thrilled uh, to lead UKIP, to pressure Cameron into offering a referendum, into working in that referendum campaign and to winning. Um, we triggered Article 50. I thought it was all done. Uh, Mrs May went for the big majority. Uh, she was found out, I think, in this campaign. And what's remarkable about Corbyn's achievement is he's getting Remainers in London voting for him, but he's getting UKIP voters around the rest of the country voting for him too. Now, of course, he's not going to be able to form a government on his own if it, if it works out that way, but if we get a coalition uh, with him and the SNP and whoever else, uh, then we may well be looking down the barrel of a second referendum. Is the whole Brexit uh, campaign, the Brexit decision, is it all in jeopardy now? Is the timetable... Uh, does it mean anything anymore? Well, it's... It, it, I mean, let's see. There's a long way to go. Uh, but I do think this. I think, let's say the other result happens. Let's say May scrapes through with a small majority or forms a minority government, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure that her credibility is going to be very strong in Brussels. So I think, uh, yes, the timetable, whatever happens here, is likely to get pushed back. But uh, how confident are you that there'll still be what's called the hard Brexit that you wanted and that you think you won a year ago? Well, I was always a bit suspicious with, with Mrs May as to whether we get it. I mean, she was asked in the campaign repeatedly Having back Remain, did she now believe in Brexit? And not once did she say yes. She just said she was carrying out the will of the people. Uh, you know, this may prove to be unfinished business. Vicar of Bray, you think she is? Uh, I do, yes. Uh, Vicar's very much daughter, so. Vicar of Bray. <laughs> very much so, yes. And in the end, I think, when Corbyn said that they would end free movement, when Corbyn said that under Labour we would leave, I think he kind of boxed off mm -hmm. Brexit as an issue for UKIP voters, many of whom did not see the party as being relevant in this campaign. And ultimately, I think the shock we're seeing here tonight is all about personality. And, you know, UKIP voters want somebody they think is speaking for them. They want somebody mm -hmm. who is for change. And what Theresa May tried to do was to be the establishment figure. Corbyn, I thought, through the campaign, looked comfortable in his own skin, he actually appeared to be enjoying it, uh, and the Prime Minister came across as insincere and, frankly, robotic. Andrew, Andrew Maher has a question for you. Could I mm. ask you, Nigel Farage, whether you think or, um, those very pro-Brexit, strong Brexit MPs in the Tory party will now try to remove Theresa May as Prime Minister? Uh, yes, and I also think... Uh, actually, Andrew, I think on both sides of the debate within the Conservative Party, the Prime Minister's uh, credibility as leader of that party is fatally damaged. 
All right. Thank you very much, Mr Farage. Let's uh, rejoin Emily, because we've got another result. Another gain for Labour from the Conservatives. Uh, this is their fourth gain of the night. Labour have yet to lose a seat, uh, but it's early days. You can see Stockton South puts Paul Williams in as the new MP for Labour here on 48% share of the vote to the Conservatives on 47. And you can see what has helped that uh, along. As Mr Farage was saying, UKIP down 8%. It seems as if Jeremy Corbyn, or at least Labour, has picked up a lot of that vote because the Conservative share hasn't moved at all. The swing here, you can see, is pretty solid from Conservative to Labour. This was number 47 on the Labour target list. Uh, they were hoping it would be competitive here, but an outside chance, and they've picked it up. Now, what I want to show you, uh, because I've been referring to this at intervals throughout the night so far, is how our exit poll compares to the results in so far. And at one point, it looked as if we might have to recalibrate because uh, the Conservatives were much uh, lower down on the exit poll than they were in real results. Now you can see, based on the results so far, just uh, under 50 results so far, you can actually see what's happened. The exit poll and the results so far are showing much more similar pictures. Now, UKIP down and both 12%, uh, the SNP down 11 here, a bit further in, in real life, and uh, you can see what's happened, more or less, the Conservative and Labour votes uh, sort of evening out and uh, proving the exit poll right so far. This is a result we've just had in the last few moments. Ealing Central and Acton has been held for Labour by Rupa Huck. An important seat, this, the Greens stood aside to help Labour Certainly, she's on a whopping 60% share of the vote now. It was number two on the Conservative target list, but it looks as if Labour's having quite a good night in London so far. Conservatives down eight, Labour up 16%. Uh, they didn't need a very big swing to take this one, but you can see what's happened. It's gone massively towards Labour. A bit like that seat, Putney, that I showed you earlier, where Justin Greening held on. You're still seeing these very big swings to Labour, one in a Labour seat, one in a Tory seat, but the direction of travel certainly favours Labour in London so far tonight. So if the exit poll is proving right, that has the Conservatives short of an overall majority. Boris Johnson, who has a vested interest in all this, of course, the Foreign Secretary, we were talking about whether he, the odds of him becoming uh, Prime Minister have fallen to five to one. Uh, there he is arriving at his counterducts, which... Whether he's being asked questions or not, I do not know, but Everybody it seems that he's contain not. contain themselves until they see the... the hello, how are you? What reaction you? Sorry, there we go. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Do you still want to be leader Thank of your you party, so Boris? Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, quite sensibly, uh, not, not answering any of that. Kirsty Walk, bring us up to date, if you would, on what's going on in Scotland. Well, we are about to get our first Glasgow seat. It looks like Glasgow East will declare soon, and it looks like the SNP have held on by their fingernails, possibly with a majority of less than 100. Glasgow Central, which was a swing uh, two years ago to the SNP of 35%, that too may be in jeopardy. And that's extraordinary because, of course, the council has just lost, the Labour Council just lost to the SNP just a matter of months ago. So it looks like big, big change in Glasgow, swings to Labour. We don't know yet whether or not Glasgow Central will go to Labour, but there's no doubt the SNP majorities are going to be smashed. And after that Angus vote, after that Angus result, there is this tantalising thought that if the exit poll is just maybe a little out, it could be the new Conservative MPs in Scotland which give Theresa May a slender majority. That would be extraordinary. Very much indeed. Well, now we are at ten past two and I have to say, our exit poll, which we gave at 10 o'clock, has not been changed yet. In the result, all the results we've had in, we've had 100 declared. We haven't yet gone from the exit poll to what we call a forecast, which is when the results that come in modify the exit poll. So we're still saying the Conservatives, the largest party, on 314, Labour on 266, the SNP on 34, the Liberal Democrats on 14 and Plaid Cymru on three, and the Greens on one. And that's uh, what we're holding for the moment at just after 10 past two. We're 10 minutes late with our news on the hour because so much is happening here in the election center of the BBC, but let's now have our news. And we join Rita Chakrabarti. 
Hello. With more than 90 seats counted in the general election, Labour have gained three seats, one from the SNP in Scotland and three from the Tories. As David was saying, an exit poll for the BBC, ITV and Sky has predicted that the Tories will be the largest party, but that they won't win a Commons majority. It says they'll have lost 17 seats, while Labour will have made gains. Tom Bateman has the very latest. The nights began with a big projection, the exit poll studied closely by all the politicians, but remember, it's still just a forecast. It has the Conservatives as the largest party, but short of an overall majority. Member of Parliament for the Wrexham Labour have held Wrexham, an area Theresa May visited several times during the campaign. They've held on in Darlington too, where only a marginal swing to the Tories was nothing like the kind of shift they need to fulfil Mrs May's hopes of a big parliamentary majority. There's been a Labour gain in Scotland, where the SNP could be on course to lose a number of seats. And just look at the mood in Hastings, hardly beaming confidence, where the Home Secretary is defending her seat. So I'm just quietly waiting and making, we keep an eye on everybody and everything in the normal way. For some in Labour, it's already a much better night than they'd hoped. Theresa May's authority has been undermined by this election. She is a damaged Prime Minister whose reputation may never recover. The exit poll suggests the Tories would have 314 seats, down 17 on two years ago. This is a projection. I think you made that clear. It's not a result. Uh, these exit polls have been uh, wrong in the past. I think in 2015 they underestimated our uh, vote. I think uh, in a couple of elections before that they overestimated us. It's the real votes that count though and there's the traditional race to see which constituency could declare first. Therefore, declare. But two other seats won by Labour in North East England show the Tories have done better than the exit poll might have suggested. The Festival of Democracy has been on full show. Watch out for some upsets through the night. At least one minister's seat could be in question, and UKIP's vote appears to be collapsing in places. Good evening, Mr Corbyn. How are you feeling? Jeremy Corbyn arrived home in his North London constituency. If the exit poll is correct, a big if, he will have confounded the expectations of even some of his own MPs, while Theresa May's gamble to win big in a snap election will have failed. But the truth, inside those ballot boxes, is still to be fully revealed. Tom Bateman, BBC News. With the news of that exit poll, the pound has been falling against other currencies, including the dollar and the euro. Let's get the latest reaction now from Sharanjeet Lale, who's in Singapore for us. Sharanjeet, tell us what's going on. Well, that's right, Rita. The most immediate reaction in the markets, as you say, has been from the British pound sterling, falling nearly 2% against the US dollar after that exit poll suggested the Conservative Party could lose its parliamentary majority. It had recovered a little bit on some evidence that the exit poll may not have been entirely accurate when we saw those first results uh, come in. But analysts I've been speaking to have been saying that it's likely the pound will continue falling through the day. A hung parliament, of course, being the worst case scenario for the pound, given the political uncertainty it brings, they say, because it complicates uh, Brexit talks even further. And uncertainty is something markets and investors don't like. Having said all that, though, most Asian markets uh, that have opened are higher, but only just. Sharanjeet, many thanks. Well, there'll be more from me throughout the night, of course, but for the time being, let's go back to David Dimbleby in the election studio. Welcome back to our election centre. We're not yet um, doing it, but we are about, I think, to slightly increase, but not by very much, the... Uh, forecast for the Conservative uh, seats. It's still going to be short of an overall majority from what I hear, but we will get those figures in just a moment. Laura, what have you got for us? Well, this seems to be being borne out now in Tory headquarters, so I understand ministers now do not expect to outperform the exit poll. Now, that means privately, as we speak, there is acceptance and discussion of the fact that senior Tories do not now expect to have an overall majority, which means, if, of course, by the morning that remains the same, Theresa May's roll of the dice 
looks set to be one of the biggest political mistakes that we have seen for quite some time. We've a seen beaming Jeremy, George, Corbyn Jeremy Corbyn arriving at his count in Islington. Smiling like a Cheshire cat. I mean, let's not forget, he was elected by Labour members to the astonishment of the Labour political establishment once. Then the Labour establishment tried to get rid of him. He was re-elected twice, and now he looks to have achieved one of the biggest political upsets in many, many years. He has relished this campaign. We've seen day by day he's looked more and more confident. He's looked as if he's enjoyed it more and more. And he has, from the time when he took on the Labour leadership, believed that if given the chance, he could begin to put together a sort of coalition of young people, of former Greens, of former people who had moved away from the Labour Party in the late 2000s, and that might possibly be some way towards getting Labour into power. But, you know, even 24 hours ago, even today, nobody in the Labour Party was predicting this kind of result. All right, both well, so the main parties got their numbers completely so, so, wrong. If all right, poll they got right. their numbers wrong, the polls got it wrong, mm. so if the exit poll is right, so what happens? Uh, in, in your uh, experience, what will happen at Westminster if Theresa May goes back without an overall majority in the House of Commons? Well, I think the idea that the Tories would somehow give up on trying to hold on to power is for the birds. I think if she manages internally to stay on, then she will try to put together a government. The technical process, of course, is that they would put forward a Queen's speech and, and dare the others to vote them down. But Let's hear the very volatile. We'll hear the result from Joe Murray. Kirby, Angus Robertson, Scottish Labour Party, the leader of the 5, SNP at, uh, at Alec, Westminster. He was said to be in some Scottish danger Democrats, here, we shall hear. 1,078. Angus Robertson, Scottish National Party, SNP, 18,478. Douglas Roberts... Douglas Ross, Scottish Conservative and Unionist, 22,000... So the Conservatives take Murray. Angus Robertson, the familiar figure in the House of Commons, asking his two questions on behalf of the SNP, is out of the House. And uh, Douglas Ross is there for the Conservatives. Douglas Ross, Scottish and this is a very significant moment nationally because, of course, the SNP have been the third biggest party in Our Westminster. So this is the equivalent of the Westminster leader of the Lib Dems losing some uh, uh, at a different kind of election. The Tories poured huge resources into this, and it seems to have paid off. So there's the result, a majority for the Conservatives of uh, just over 4,000 taken from the SNP, the share of the vote, 48% for the Conservatives, 39% for the SNP, 11% for Labour. We can see those figures. Well, apparently we can't. <laughs> anyway, I was going to show you the share. Here we are. 48% Conservative, 39 SNP, 11% Labour, 2% Liberal Democrats. The change, Conservative goes up 16%, SNP down 11%. It's a swing from the SNP to the Conservatives of 14%. And Angus Robertson, leader of the SNP in Westminster, out. And the Conservatives take the seat. We've now had 122 declarations in. And so far, Labour uh, up five. Conservatives are down two. Uh, the SNP are down three. That's how we stand at the moment. But we were talking about what's going to happen, and perhaps we should just talk about that. And we've just been rejoined by Peter Kellner, our, I described as our election expert. I mean, everybody around this table ought to be an election Can expert just... by now, but what do, what do you have <laughs> to say? I'll just briefly, on the back of that lorry result, yes. <laughs> the, what SN do you want to do? the SNP are down almost everywhere that we've had a result in Scotland yes. by about 15 or 16 percentage points. They will end up on the current form with about 35% of the vote. They'll be the largest party in votes. They may have the majority of seats. But the, if you add together the votes for the unionist parties in Scotland, yeah. Conservative, Labour, Liberal Democrat, they will be almost... They will outnumber votes for the SNP by almost two to one. And what do you reduce from that? I think this kills uh, in the Scottish independence. I, what do you mean? I you think, think voters were voting I, on the independence I, referendum I, I, too? I, I think the SNP mandate yes. to have a referendum, they still have a majority in the Scottish... or the, a, 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 a near majority in the Scottish Parliament. They'll be the biggest party at Westminster from Scotland. But the votes All right. tell us a story that, that I think independence is They dead. do, okay. and I'm just hearing that Labour are also expecting to take Glasgow northeast. And without question, mm. the metaphorical mm. question on the yeah. ballot paper in Scotland was about whether or not people wanted a second referendum. It was a different question being yeah. asked to in other parts of the country. 
Let's have the result. Oh, we've got a, re we've got a declaration coming from Great Grimsby. Hold on a second, Emily. I'll come to you in a moment, but let's just hear this. That the number of votes cast for each candidate is as follows. Basant, Steve, Liberal Democrat, 954. Gideon, Joe, the Conservative Party candidate, 14,980. Hookham, Mike, UK Independence Party, 1,648. McGilligan Fell, Christina Ann, Independent, 394. On, Melanie, Labour Party, 17,545. So there are the result from Great Grimsby, which was uh, nearly 50th in the Conservative, uh, just over 50th in the Conservative hoped for, and uh, Labour held on to it. Majority of 2,565. Mm -hmm. And let's see what the change and swing was there. 49% uh, for Labour. It was up 1%. Conservative vote up 16%. UKIP vote down 20%. And the swing, Labour to Conservative, just over 3%. And this is another kind of the seats where the Tories' strategy was, they hoped to replicate everywhere, that the UKIP vote they expected was swaying across <coughs> to them. That hasn't happened here. Mm. You know, the numbers showed a huge drop in the UKIP vote, but clearly lots of those voters went back to Labour rather than going across to the Tories. I know we mentioned it briefly earlier, but perhaps it was a strategic mistake for the Tories to go very aggressively after that mm. kind of vote rather than trying uh, to show why, why do you think that is? I mean, you've been travelling around listening mm. to all these, these uh, constituencies. That, why are Labour voters... I think when a, UKIP going home? I think there's a variety of reasons. I think partly it was maybe a misinterpretation of who UKIP voters are. They weren't, weren't all people who were right-wing. I mean, there were plenty of people who were traditional Labour voters. But also, the Tory campaign has been full of missteps. Theresa May U-turning over her social care policy that went straight to cause anxiety among many older voters. We'll have seen in these kinds of seats people who are traditionally, um, you know, small C conservative. Older voters were very worried about this. I think in the last week we also saw the Labour Party really having cut through over police cuts. Of course, the awful terror attacks sort of froze the campaign at two different moments. But the Labour Party allowed to put together two issues, if you like. They were campaigning already very hard on austerity. They put that together with the issue of security. And we heard that on the doorstep, that coming back, people concerned about police cuts. And I think that's probably one of the issues we've seen here that will have cut through, that took the shine off the Tories' early, stage, early stages and that early confidence that people had in Theresa May. I said that we were going to turn our exit poll into a forecast on the basis of... Uh, the results we've had in 137 now. We've still got 500 or so to go. So let's just see here on the uh, facade of the House of Commons what we're now saying. Conservatives on 322, 326 would give them an overall majority. Um, Labour on 261. The Conservatives still the largest party, but there's the four short of the 326 that they would need numbers in 2010. We have a result. I'll come to you in a moment. Uh, but, Emily, let's have your result. We've had another Conservative gain in Scotland. Auckland, South Perthshire. Luke Graham takes it for the Conservatives on 41% share of the vote. And now a fairly handsome majority of 3,359. Uh, this was 128 on the target list. It wasn't within any of our sites, so they've done extraordinarily well. And interesting to see not just the SNP falling here, but also Labour as well. Maybe there has been a tactical vote, a unionist vote towards the Conservatives. They're up 21%. I said earlier, holding myself hostage to fortune, we probably wouldn't see a bigger swing uh, than the one we had in Angus. This one is another 16% swing from the SNP to the Conservatives, uh, which land this one in safe Conservative territory. Tasmin Ahmed Sheikh, who took it from Labour last time round, now in second place. And we're going to uh, bring you one more, uh, very north, the northwest of England. This is Labour's fifth gain of the night, sitting on 54% share of the vote. David Nuttall is pushed out, that rebellious Conservative 
uh, MP is now uh, out and James Frith takes his place. You can see what the change looks like here. Labour only needed a 0.4% swing, but they've done that and more. 13% increase in the share of the vote. And you can see how handsome that is from the Conservative to uh, Labour. One more that's just come in. Labour having a very good night in Scotland, as are the Conservatives, to be fair. A Labour gain from the SNP there in Midlothian on 36% to 34% share of the vote. Owen Thompson out. Danielle Rowley is in. And you can see that drop in the SNP share of the vote. Both those parties up. Lib Dems not making much movement here. And the swing there is also of 11%. We saw those ginormous swings of up to 40% towards the SNP last time round. And it looks as though uh, Labour and the Conservatives are starting to make some waves of their own uh, north of the border in Scotland with these gains back, suggesting uh, that they are trying to push into the long grass any talk of a second independence referendum. Come back to you when we have some more. Thanks very much. Uh, Amal, you've got some more comments from yeah. people. I mean, David, it's, we are in this extraordinary situation where Lord Ashcroft, the former Conservative uh, chairman, uh, has just uh, put out a message saying the Conservative Scots uh, could possibly save the Tories. That would be extraordinary. Unthinkable uh, in recent elections, but that's where we might be. Kevin Maguire, who's uh, on the Daily Mirror, um, has uh, tweeted along a similar theme saying SNP Westminster League leader Angus Robertson is gone. Scotland is saving the Conservatives. And Ruth Davidson, often talked about as a uh, future leader of the Conservatives, leader of the Scottish Conservatives at the moment, uh, has sent a message out saying, fantastic in Moray. Well done, Douglas for Murray, which is Douglas Ross. You will make a superb MP. So many, many Tories feeling that actually what they do in Scotland could be the difference between them being in government and not. And interestingly, um, Tories so far tonight gained three in Scotland. They've lost four in England. Exactly. I just want to say that uh, the new forecast, 322 Conservative seats. David, as you say, still short of a majority. But politically, there's a big difference between the original forecast of 314. Mm -hmm. On those numbers, the Conservatives might well have failed to get a Queen's speech through mm -hmm. Parliament. Mm -hmm. With 322, if that is the final figure, mm -hmm. and it could move either way, then it will be a Conservative Queen's speech. They may need to butter up the Democratic Unionists mm -hmm. in Northern Ireland, but there is not an anti-Tory coalition mm -hmm. of left and centre-left parties and scholars nationalists and so on that could combine to defeat the Tories. So they'd carry... Hu humiliated, but they'd carry on, they, is what they you're saying. But as I say... But, but, but humiliated by this... Humiliated, in... but if, the, if it moves another few seats up, they could have a majority. Another few seats down, they may be out. We're in that area where small differences will be up till, you know, well into the morning because the final few results might determine the politics. I, th I think that's parliament. absolutely right on that forecast. I mean, I think we can be relatively confident that the unionist MPs in Northern Ireland would prop Theresa May up if the numbers are in that kind of zone. The big flaw in that argument, of course, is that her own authority will have yeah. been so damaged from chucking a ball into the roulette wheel and making such that, that, a strategic that's, that's why I error. I conservative yeah. Indeed, All right, it's fine. Conservative OK, thank you very much. We're going to go to Putney and then I want to go and talk in Derby to Margaret Beckett about Labour. But let's go to the Education Secretary, first of all, Justin Greening, in Putney. Uh, well, you only just scraped back in Putney, didn't you? Well, I'm delighted to have been re-elected as the MP for Putney, Roehampton and Southfields. Uh, it's always a tough battle here in London. That's what we've seen tonight. And I think the, the other factor behind this is very much young people really, for the first time in many years, finally choosing to use the vote that they've got in the ballot box. But, yes, I'm delighted to be able to continue to serve my local community. So what is it about the Conservative Party that doesn't appeal to young people? I think Labour um, very much offered young people something that was appealing to them in terms of the obvious policy around tuition fees, the fact that um, it's unaffordable, the IFS said it had a black hole, in a way was not something that particularly uh, necessarily dissuaded them from thinking that that was a policy that they wanted to vote for. But I, I think it's quite early on in the evening and a lot of the seats that declare early now are more urban seats. Uh, I think it's worth pointing out that both Battersea and Putney are the two seats in our country with the very youngest demographic. So we've particularly seen that perhaps coming through in the votes here. And there's a very long way to go 
in this election through the course of the night. If we, uh, uh, we know we've uh, now made a forecast of 322, that's short of a majority for the Tories in the House of Commons. What's the future of uh, the Tory party and of Theresa May and of the Brexit negotiations if that is the final result? Well, I, I don't think at this point it's particularly worthwhile getting into speculation. There are a huge number of results to still come through. As I said at the beginning of this, London is always an incredibly hard-fought uh, political environment. Everybody knows that down here who's been out on the doorstep. Um, I'm just delighted that I've been re-elected to represent my own community. It's one that I've represented for 12 years. Um, I think it's fantastic that I get the chance to continue to do that. Did you expect a majority of 60, 70, 100 for the Conservatives? I think it was very difficult to tell exactly how the election would play out, not least because actually when you look at the polls, they're national polls, but in practice I think we all know that perhaps uh, results have never been more regionally driven and therefore the days that we can really look at a global picture of somehow what's going on across the UK and rely on it to give us any kind of an accurate sense of what's really happening on the ground, I think are gone. And we saw that in some of the polls that were reported in the papers this morning. I've often thought that in 2005, if you'd interviewed a thousand people in my Putney, my constituency of Putney, would you really have seen the swing that I was about to get to first get re-elected? I don't know. But I think what it shows is it's exceptionally hard in these uh, political climates to really see what's going on on the ground. And, and that's what we're seeing tonight. So does it make sense in those circumstances to say I've concluded the only way to guarantee certainty and stability for the years ahead is to hold this election, which I've said over and over again I won't hold. Words of the Prime Minister. I think the, I think the Prime Minister was right to recognise that Britain was in a very different place uh, now than we were in 2015, and it was right to go to the country and to ask them the question about what their views were, what people's views were about the direction that they went wanted for the future. It may be that what we're seeing in this vote is that people are still in a debate about what that future direction should be. But it is very, very early days. So I think it's easy to pick on some results in some parts of the country and to say that they are going to be massively representative. I suspect you'll continue to see some very locally driven results uh, that will on occasion contrast, as we've seen the Conservatives doing very well in Scotland, less well in London, and I think we'll have to see how this plays out across the rest of the night. Justin Green, thank you very much. And as I said, we're joined from Derby now by Margaret Beckett. Good evening, uh, Margaret Beckett. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you were one of the people who gave Jeremy Corbyn your support in the leadership for the Labour Party on the grounds there should be a fair contest and afterwards said you were a complete moron for having done it. Are you still a moron? Yes. Somebody, somebody else said that, but I didn't think it was right to dissent. Um, but yes, I, I agreed that it was a good thing to widen the debate. Uh, and then I realised that it might be thought that I was suggesting that people should vote for someone who as Jeremy was, had no uh, experience at all of the front bench. And so I made haste to say, I think he should be part of the debate. I don't think he should necessarily be the leader. There you go. So what do you make of what's happening? Well, there's no question that the, I think the two things that, that I don't think you can dispute about this election campaign is that Jeremy has performed infinitely better than anybody, probably including Jeremy, ever expected he could, and that Theresa May has performed infinitely worse than anybody expected that she could. Um, and, you know, it's the conventional wisdom, but why is it conventional? Because sometimes it's also wise that British people don't tend to like having an election they didn't have to have. So what is the consequence going to be if we're, we're seeing a, a, a much weakened Prime Minister, a much damaged Conservative Party. Um, at this stage, are you thinking there might be a Jeremy Corbyn Premiership? What I'm, to be honest, David, what I'm principally thinking is I'm wondering, 
fearing, I might say, whether I was prescient when we put our stuff away in the garage tonight and I said to my husband, let's do it carefully because you never know we might need it again soon. I'm sorry, I missed what you said then. Can you say it again? I had another voice in my ear. Can you just repeat it? When we put away our equipment from our car tonight, I said we'd better do it carefully because you never know, we might need it again soon. It was a joke. I Thank hope you. it's still going to be a joke. <laughs> Uh, and, and as far as the, the sort of future of the Labour Party goes, I mean, clearly the, uh, the people you would recognise as on the left of the party, the par part of the party that you don't occupy, uh, are making the running now. And whether it's Jeremy Corbyn or somebody else, do you think this is the new direction Labour's going to go in? Uh, listen, I have always regarded myself as being either soft left or centre left, depending on how you define these terms. And then other people, if I may say so, usually in your profession, have moved the goalposts around me. So it seems to me I've basically stayed more or less where I am nearly all the time, and I propose to stay there. Uh, I don't understand what you're saying. How have we mo moved the goalposts around you? Well, you're, say you're saying, of course, you're not, you're not on the left. Well, yes, actually, I've always thought I was on the left, and I still think I am. Margaret Beckett, thank you very much for joining us. We've got two more results in, Emily, have we? Yeah, I just want to show you this one. Uh, there's so much churn overnight, it seems, that the Conservatives are taking seats uh, in Scotland from the SNP and it seems now from the Lib Dems uh, in England. This one is Southport, where John Pugh stood down uh, and maybe that helped the Conservatives, we don't know, but Damien Moore has now taken this. Not only have they taken it, but they have pushed the Lib Dems into third place here. So they had this seat before. The Lib Dems are now in third place. Conservatives on 39% share of the vote. And I can show you what that change looks like. Uh, gains then for Labour and for the Conservatives uh, at the expense, it seems, of UKIP as well as the Lib Dems. This wasn't a particularly high leave area, so uh, the Lib Dems would have hoped to do well here. And yet, both those parties, parties of leave, we now say, seem to have done better. The swing is 7.6% towards the Conservatives, so a bit of a ray of life, uh, light in England. Can I interrupt you, Emily, here. for a result? Well we'll come back to you. We've got a result coming in from Renfrewshire East. SNP... Uh, uh, SNP held by Francis Oswald. Hi, Lorraine, I'm Macmillan, returning officer for the East Renfrewshire constituency. Declare that the total number of votes given to each candidate was as follows. Paul Masterton, Scottish Conservative and Unionist, 21,496. Bloody hell. That's 21,496. Blair George McDougall, Scottish Labour Party, 14,346. Parliament for That's the East Renfrewshire constituency. The total number of votes cast was 53,805, and the total number of ballot papers rejected was 67. The ballot papers were rejected for the following reasons. For want of the official mark, well, something's zero. a little bit awry with our Voting system here, because you should be able to see the SNP, but the truth is that the Conservatives have leapt two places to zero. top the ballot here. Uh, SNP were on 23,000, the Conservatives with 21,000 have taken the seat. Uh, I'm not quite sure what's happened to our figures. Uh, no doubt we can sort it out in just a moment. Shall we go back to uh, where we were, if we can, Emily? Where were you? In this morning. I'll show you in this morning because it was number one on the um, Plaid Cymru target list. And you can see what's happened here. They haven't gained it. Labour uh, has held it on 42% share of the vote. And Plaid has slipped down there just behind the Conservatives into third place. So when we look at the swing, what might have been on a good night, uh, a swing towards Plaid away from Labour, actually becomes a swing, as you can see, uh, from the Conservatives to Labour, 2.1%. And... We're going to hand back now. I think we've got Renfrewshire East, have we? We might even have Dunbartonshire East. East Dunbartonshire, where John Nicholson... 869. Standing percentage in poll being 78.23%. MP at the moment. Or the, I, the Jerry Cormis, returning officer for the UK parliamentary election in the East Dunbartonshire County constituency, 
hereby give notice that the total number of votes polled for each candidate he at had the a majority election of just over 2,000 two years ago. Callum McNally, Scottish Labour Party, 7,531. <laughs> Sheila Meakin, Conservative and Unionist, 7,563. John Nicholson, Scottish National Party, 15,684. Joe Swinson, Scottish Liberal Democrats, 21,000. Twenty one thousand and twenty three. There were sixty eight rejected. Joe Swinson, ballot former minister in the coalition for the Liberal Democrats, recovers Dumbartonshire East from John Nicholson. There on the right. And Joe Swinson in red will now perhaps just come up and make a speech. We don't know. We'll see. Yes. I mean, the Lib Dems will be absolutely thrilled by that result because she was when part of the coalition seen very much as one of the more talented of their next generation. And for the SNP, John Nicholson, another big name for them, Gom, a prominent member of the SNP front bench in Westminster, somebody who was very often put forward by the party. Um, he, of course, loses Theresa his seat. May arriving at her count at Maidenhead, just with her husband Philip there. Um, she'll have heard all this news. She's safe in her seat in Maidenhead, and anybody will try and question her as she comes to the count? I'm sure they'll try. Whether or not she'll answer anything is a different question. She's looking pretty grim-faced as she arrives. Uh, Philip May, who made an appearance on the campaign trail at the last moment yesterday, smiling for the cameras. Um, the, only new thing we, the only new thing we've discovered about the Prime Minister is that the naughtiest thing she ever did was walk through a wheat, wheat field as a child, which was a revelation. I Running through wheat fields Running was the naughtiness of it, I suppose. Yeah. Maybe walking through would have been fine. But look, I mean, it seems that this is a political disaster for her this night. So back to Jo Swinson, who, who was a, a feisty performer uh, when she was in the House of Commons and could... Be a leader, a potential leader, you were saying. She's of the, talked of, the of that Democrats. sometimes in Lib Dem circles. She has talked of in that way. I mean, now she's back in Westminster, you know, we'll see. But there's another former leader of the Liberal Democrats, uh, Nick Clegg, arriving at his count. As I was saying, Labour sources have told me they expect to take Hallam from Nick Clegg, which He's is He's looking quite, quite uneasy, quite you have scout. to say, doesn't he? He is, moment. looking very uneasy. He had, a good, he had a good campaign, Nick Clegg. A lot of people thought, you know, he, he, he spoke well on... Brexit and all the rest of it, wanting this second referendum. Well, he really I wonder whether he'd be role. relieved, though, perhaps not to remain in the House of Commons, having been leader of a, of a small Liberal Democrat party. Well, it, since 2015, there was speculation about whether or not he would actually stand again. Yeah. I wonder, had this parliament run to 2020, whether he would have stood again. But the early election that was called meant that he did stand again. You suspect... Um, that perhaps he, he will find other things to do. Well, if your information is correct through, that he's but, lost, well, we need just to make sure that it is correct. We do. Labour sources have told me they're confident of, uh, of taking it, but, of course, until we hear it from the returning officer, we can never be quite sure. But certainly his body language would suggest that. We're also hearing the result on a knife edge for Tim Farron, the Lib Dem leader, to potentially a recount in Westmoreland. Glasgow East, uh, held by the SNP. With a majority of 10,000, just over 10,000. Karen Finnegan, Independent, 158. Thank you. The declaration will be made by the High Sheriff of South Yorkshire. Thank and you. Gone back to Sheffield. Sheffield. If they can sort it out. I, Stephen Ingram, being the returning officer at the election held on Thursday, June 2017. Do hereby give notice that the number of votes cast for each candidate at the election is as follows. Nick Clegg, Liberal Democrats, 19,756. Yeah. Jared O'Mara, Labour Party, 21,000.
891. Logan Robin, Green Party, 823. John Gordon Thurley, UK Independence Party, 929. Ian Jeffrey Walker, the Conservative Party candidate, 13,561. Stephen Dominic Winston, Social Democrats Party, 70. Total spoiled papers, 89. And I hereby declare so, that Jared uh, Nick O'Hara Clegg, has, uh, has lost his seat in Sheffield Hall. And it's worth remembering, he looks uh, quite saddened by that, that he was the man responsible for the great experiment in politics and going into the coalition with the Conservatives and paid a terrible price. His party did, and now tonight he's paid the price and does look what you might call almost visibly upset at having lost Sheffield Hallam. He does. He's been the MP there for a long time. Of course, this is the end of what had been a very successful political career. He was the Deputy Prime Minister for five years, of course, then took on those brutal wounds from being part of the coalition. But to lose his seat, rather than being able to curtail his career at a time of his own choosing, is, of course, not what anyone would choose. Of course, all politi political careers end in failure, don't they? But I, but I wonder, too, for the Liberal Democrats, their USP at this election was that promise of a second yeah. referendum. But the most prominent exponent of that, of all, Nick Clegg, has lost his seat. So we will see through the night how that strategy of offering a second referendum has played out in different places. You know, we've just seen Joe Swinson win in Scotland, but it seems to me it's almost like there's a different election taking place in Scotland. Lord, Lord Ashcroft was saying earlier that Scotland may have saved the Conservatives. It looks like Scotland has also saved the Liberal Democrats. They've now lost two seats in England, but they're picking up seats in Scotland. And they expect also to lose Leeds North West, yes. Greg Mulholland. That also we expect that to be a Labour gain yes. too. But again, you know, this two tribes election playing out in extraordinarily different ways in different parts of the country. How many Liberal Democrat seats do we have in so far? Because our scoreboard there is showing just one Liberal Democrat seat, no change. Is that correct? Uh, I think that's right. Net one. Yeah. But they, I hope that's right. But, but, <laughs> but, they, may, but they may well pick up Vince Cable's old seat, Twickenham, maybe one or two others in London, but they're not going to pick up anything in the South West. The seat results we had in from the South West, the Liberal Democrats have gone further backwards, so I don't think they'll pick up anything but there. As we said at the start of the night, the Liberal Democrats would be happy to hold on to what they had mm. and maybe make a couple of gains, but they were not expecting much else. Well, the victor there in Sheffield Hallam, Jared Amara speaking, and uh, we will just hang on, I think, just for a moment to see if we can hear Nick Clegg's uh, speech. But let's just remind you of the figures here in Sheffield. <coughs> the Labour vote, 21,881. Liberal Democrats, 18,756. The Conservatives, 13,561. And the share of the vote, 38%. The Labour, 35% for the Liberal Democrats, 24% for the Conservatives. And the switch since last time, Labour goes up three, uh, Liberal Democrats down five, Conservatives up ten, and the swing from Liberal Democrat to Labour, 4%. And certainly a long speech being made there, but I think he may be just coming to the end. And I hope the defeated Nick Clegg will be the next to speak. And I think it's just worth hanging on for that. I will be on your side. Yes, yeah, you can speak. Uh, say, as long as he's speaking, you can speak. Voters <laughs> tell pollsters they want politicians to put nation before party. Nick Clegg did that massively after the 2010 election. Um, and it looks as if voters don't reward politicians who put nation before party. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I'd just now like to invite Nick Clegg to say a few words. Thank you. Th thank you very much for the... Um, thank you very much for this opportunity to say a few words and uh, I'd obviously like to start by congratulating Jared on his uh, spectacular victory. It's been uh, the greatest privilege of my political life to represent this wonderful constituency of Sheffield Hallam for the last 12 years and I wish Jared Amara all the very best of luck in uh, representing the families and communities 
in uh, Sheffield Hallam with a dedication that they, uh, that they deserve. And I also obviously want to fully endorse what Jared said about uh, you um, as Chief Returning Officer and all of your staff in once again conducting the elections across our great city so, uh, so professionally. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, a huge special thanks from me to Penny Baker, uh, to my uh, agent Andy Sanger, and to yeah. my whole uh, team here who not only supported me as ever so un unflaggingly uh, in this snap general election, but also in the 12 years in which I have served as an MP in Sheffield Hallam, and prior to that, my Liberal Democrat predecessor, Richard Allen, as well. Thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart for everything that you have done. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I, in my time in Parliament, I've never, I've never shirked from uh, political battles. I've never uh, retreated from the political battlefield. I've always sought to stand by the Liberal values I believe in, but I, of course, have encountered this evening something that many people have encountered before tonight and I suspect many people will encounter after tonight which is in politics you live by the sword and you die by the sword um, but I would just like if I may just to say a couple of words uh, about what faces uh, the parliament that is going to be uh, constituted in a few days time uh, in Westminster it is a parliament which in my judgment will not only face the excruciating task of trying to assemble a sensible government uh, for this country will not only need to deal with the agonizing decisions which we face as a country as we navigate our way towards Brexit, but is a parliament that is presiding over a deeply, deeply divided and polarized nation. We saw that in the Brexit referendum uh, last year and we see it here again tonight. Polarized between left and right, between different regions and nations and areas of the country, but most gravely of all, this huge gulf now between young and old. And my only plea would be to all MPs, including Jared from all parties, is this, that we will not pick our way through the very difficult times that our country faces if in the next parliament MPs of all parties simply seek to amplify what divides them. We must try and reach out to each other to try and find common ground if we are to heal those profound divisions. Because if we do not, if we do not, if we do not, it is my judgment that our country will endure unprecedented hardship and difficulty in the years ahead. And whatever party Vincent, you are from. No commonly known as Vince Cable, Liberal Democrats, 34,000. Thirty four thousand nine hundred and sixty nine. Don Catherine Sarah, Labour Party, six thousand one hundred and fourteen. <laughs> Matthias, Dr. Tanya Wynn, commonly known as Dr. Tanya Matthias, Conservative Party, twenty five thousand two hundred and seven. Yeah. Total number of rejected so one ballot goes down, and as one goes down, the other one comes up. Vince Cable, who was defeated at the last election for Twickenham, a Liberal Democrat, Business Secretary in the Coalition, has retaken Twickenham. He will have heard of what's happened to Nick Clegg. He may not have heard what Nick Clegg was saying, a rather moving speech about the future of young people in the political system and the future that the new House of Commons faces and the problems. But anyway, Vince Cable is back, and I suppose... Well, the electorate gives with one hand and takes away with the other, within moments of each other. But just let's also remember a very, very knife-edge result in Westmoreland, where Tim Farron, the current party leader, is facing potential defeat. There's chatter there about a recount. Of course, if that were to happen, lo and behold, prominent Liberal Democrat Vince Cable has just walked back into Westminster. With that a huge majority. All right, let's go... Lucy Manning. Well, hello from Tim Farron's count, where it is pretty much on a knife edge. We have a recount here. It is 
a bundle recount, so they're not going through every single vote, but they're looking at the bundles. There seems to be some votes that haven't been counted. It seems a, a bit of a mess down there, but what it does tell us is that this vote is tight. I was told initially perhaps a few hundred votes in it, and that's Tim Farron, the Liberal Democrat leader who had a majority of nearly 9,000. I think what we're seeing as the night develops is that potentially it's a bit dicey for the Lib Dems, not as good as it looked originally. Uh, Nick Clegg has lost his seat. Um, they've potentially lost in Leeds Northwest. Yes, they've gained Vince Cable's seat and they've got a seat in Scotland. They need to get a few more in Scotland for this to be a better night for Tim Farron. He, of course, needs to hold on to his own seat. But if he doesn't do that well, if the Lib Dems don't do that well tonight, I think there will certainly be questions about his leadership. Thank you very much. Well, we'll come back there when we can. I just, uh, watching Theresa May's face mm -hmm. as she went into her count, I wonder if on the basis of the, these results she might actually voluntarily stand down as leader of the Conservative Party. I think at this stage that's quite a leap. And, I mean, look, she didn't make it public ever, but it was plain she had ambition to take office, to be Prime Minister for quite some time. Now, I think if she ends up at the stage where our forecast is, where with support from the DUP, the Tories look significantly more viable than the other parties trying to put together some kind of progressive alliance or whatever you want to call it, then I think the chances of her somehow just rescinding the opportunity to put together a government are very, very slim. How long she could stay on doing that, though, without making big changes is a different question. And I expect, if the result ends up in this territory by the morning, she'll have to make changes. She'll have to broaden out. Um, and a, we've had a result from Glasgow North East. Let's just Daniel take that. Daniel Donaldson, I... Scottish Liberal Democrats, 637. Anne McLaughlin, Scottish National Party, 13,395. <laughs> Paul Sweeney, Scottish Labour Party, 13,635. Conservative and Unionist Party, 4,106. And I declare that Paul Sweeney is elected to serve in the United Kingdom Parliament as a member for the Glasgow North East constituency. Labour takes Glasgow North East from the SNP. Yeah. And we'll have the figures there in just a moment. So, a Labour gain at the expense of the SNP in northeast Glasgow. And, and now I'm determined to go and join Michelle Hussain, who has an extremely appropriate guest with him, <laughs> considering all we've been talking about the Liberal Democrats. Michelle. David, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm sitting here with Ming Campbell, Lord Campbell, former leader of the Liberal Democrats, and with Sir Eric Pickles, a former chairman of the Conservative Party. Uh, Ming Campbell, let's talk first of mm. all about uh, your thoughts on seeing Nick Clegg lose his seat in that way. With great dignity. Uh, and pointing up in a very sharp way the fact that these elections are producing not the kind of unity which the Prime Minister hoped for, but division, north and south, young and old. Uh, Nick Clegg has served uh, his country and his party with great distinction. He took a bold step in 2010 in the public interest. In fact, I heard it being referred to a moment or two ago and got very little uh, credit for that. Uh, and even after the quite tumultuous events of 2015, he buckled down and, did, as was, and indeed, as was pointed out, spearheaded the campaign in relation to the European Union. Your, your party's in, in, in the position today of having... He's lost his seat. Mm. The seat of your current leader, Tim Farron, is, is looking doubtful. But you have had Vince Cable mm. re-elected, Joe Swinson also um, re-elected. Um, what do you think the future holds? If, if the party's in the position of looking for a new leader, who will it turn to? Well, I'm not going to get into that speculation, but one can, one can point to the fact that um, after I resigned and before Nick Clegg was elected, uh, Vince Cable was the interim leader. So he has some understanding of leadership and what the responsibilities are. But it's very good for the party to have a genuinely heavy hitter uh, back in the parliamentary party, and let's not forget Joe Swinson, one of the most talented of the younger generation of MPs of any party. Back in the House of Commons. And the fact that she's back in the House of Commons is a great advantage too. I worked a lot with uh, Nick Clegg uh, when we were in government. I always found him to be a deeply 
a decent man, and I can remember talking to him a couple of years out before the election, and I mean, he, he kind of recognised that the Liberal Democrats will pay a price for being in coalition. But I think it's to his credit and to the nation's uh, credit that he, he worked hard with us. And, and on your party's uh, fortunes, we know now that ministers are no longer expecting to have an overall majority, and the latest forecast we have uh, sees the Conservatives ending the night on 322 seats, short, short of a majority, which means a deal will need to be done. You said of Theresa May that she's the worst person in the world to do a deal with. But, but finish the... Uh, finish the court, and the court is if you make a reasonable request, uh, then uh, she will generally back us. Now, what that really means, both in terms of Brexit and putting together a, um, a, a government, um, if people come with outlandish uh, ideas, she won't play. She'll always go for the national interest. But if it's a, a reasonable process, uh, then I think we're in for, a, for an interesting few days. What went wrong? <laughs> exactly hmm? What that. went wrong for you? <clears throat> Didn't get enough votes. And we lost seats. That's what went wrong. Why? I think um, that uh, we've seen a big increase in the youth vote. Um, I think uh, that Mr Corbyn managed to get the excitement of that. I think it was on the back, not of idealism, but straightforward pork barrel politics. You know, we'll, uh, we'll pay for your fees and uh, we will write off your debt. That's going to prove to be extraordinarily expensive. Uh, we we'll attempt to do so, and I suspect that maybe we might have another general election. <laughs> and, and well, I'd want to say a word about Scotland, if yeah. I may, because it is quite remarkable. The SNP are losing to Labour, losing to the Lib Dems, and, and of course, lo losing to the Conservatives. Yeah, in fact, uh, both of your parties are uh, you know, being saved yeah. to some extent uh, by and, Scotland. And when you think the dominance which they occupied uh, after 2015, it is quite extraordinary. But there is a reason for it, and of course, that is the fact that people simply do not okay. want a rerun of the independence referendum. Ben Campbell and Sir Eric Pickles, thank you both. Thank you. And uh, we're keeping an eye on Jeremy Corbyn there at his count at Islington, but we have another important result this is and a, a loss. This is a shock it's... result. Uh, it is a gain for, the conserv for Labour from the Conservatives. In Ipswich, in Suffolk, there is no... Uh, other red territory around for miles. This is true blue Tory country, but more than that, it's the seat of Ben Gummer, who just five days ago was rumoured to be uh, geared up to be the new Brexit secretary if there were a reshuffle. Ben Gummer, of course, who's not only a cabinet office minister, but who has been instrumental in writing some of that Conservative manifesto, in planning some of this election campaign. He is now out. Curiously, I was on the campaign trail with Ben Gummer uh, two years ago when he almost expected to lose then. He held on in 2015, but he has now lost to Sandy Martin for Labour. Islington North declaration. It's a very, very safe seat for Jeremy Corbyn. He's been the MP there since 1983. But we'll listen to it and then hope that we'll actually hear from Mr Corbyn. And agree, just very briefly, as we well, wait, at the as election of a Member of Parliament Canterbury, for Islington North on Thursday, the 8th of June, 2017. I, Leslie Seary, being the acting returning officer at the election of a Member of Parliament for the Islington North constituency, held on Thursday the 8th of June 2017, do hereby give notice that the number of votes recorded for each candidate at the said election is as follows. Keith Angus, Liberal Democrats, 4946. <laughs> Suzanne Nundy, known as Suzanne Cameron Blackie, Independent, 41. James Tovey Clark, Conservatives, 6871. Jeremy Bernard Corbyn, Labour Party, Four zero zero eight six. <laughs> Michael Adam Foster, two hundred and eight. 
Keith Graham Fraser, UK Independence Party, 413. <laughs> Nigel George Avril Barrow, known as Nigel Knapp, the official monster raving loony party, 106. <laughs> James William Martin, known as Bill Martin, the Socialist Party GB, 21. Andres Mendoza, the Communist League, 7. Caroline Russell, Green Party, 2229. The total number of ballot papers rejected is as follows. Voting for more candidates than the voter was entitled to, 40. Being unmarked or wholly void for uncertainty, 82. The turnout was 73.6%. And I do hereby declare that the said Jeremy Bernard Corbyn is duly elected to serve as Member of Parliament for the Islington North constituency. very much and I first of all want to thank Leslie Seary and her staff for the way this election has been conducted and I know all the pressures that are put on to the staff to achieve this thank you very much to you and all the staff here tonight and all those that run our democratic services in this borough I also want to particularly thank the police for their work today and the work last night in helping to ensure that the crowds were all safe, but also all the work they did last weekend during the horrors of the attack that took place on London Bridge and the borough. It shows the importance of a fully staffed police service to make sure we're all kept safe at all times. And I do thank the police for their work last weekend and today. It's a an enormous honour to be elected to represent Islington North for the ninth time in Parliament. And I'm very, very honoured and humbled by the size of the vote that has been cast for me tonight as the Labour candidate. And I pledge to represent the people of Islington North in the best way that I possibly can and to continue to learn from them as well as represent them at the same time because I believe representation is as much about listening as about telling other people and so I do thank the people for their support. I also want to say a huge thank you to Islington North Labour Party, to our agent Catherine Sloan and all the other people that have worked so hard in this campaign and unfortunately or maybe from their point of view fortunately I've been out on the road for most of the last six weeks and so they've been holding the fort and working incredibly hard from? and I'm very very grateful to them for all that they've done. What? I'm also very grateful to all of my family and to my wife Laura and to all the people that have worked so hard in our team at Labour Party head office as well as in the constituency office here for achieving this incredible result tonight in Islington and the results that are coming in from all over the country. In terms of Islington, this is the highest turnout at any election in Islington since 1951. It's the largest ever vote received for a winning candidate ever in the history of this borough and I'm very proud of it and very humble and very grateful to the people of Islington for this result. This, this, election was called, this election was called in order to, uh, for the Prime Minister to gain a large majority in order to assert her authority. And uh, the election campaign has gone on for the past six weeks. I've travelled the whole country. I've spoken at events and rallies all over the country. And you know what? Politics has changed. And politics isn't going back into the box where it was before. Because what's happened is people have said they've had quite enough of austerity politics. They've had quite enough of cuts in public expenditure, underfunding our health service, underfunding our schools and our education service, and not giving our young people the chance they deserve in our society. And I'm very, very proud 
of the campaign that my party has run, our manifesto for the many, not the few, and I'm very proud of the results that are coming in all over the country tonight of people voting for hope, voting for hope for the future and turning their backs on austerity. And so, if there is, if there is a message from tonight's result is, is this. The Prime Minister called the election because she wanted a mandate. Well, the mandate she's got is lost Conservative seats, lost votes, lost support and lost confidence. I would have thought that's enough to go, actually, and make way for a government that will be truly representative of all of the people of this country. And so, we await, we await the rest of the results. But I can assure you of this, in the new Parliament, we will do everything we can to ensure that everything we've said in this campaign and everything that's included in our manifesto is put before Parliament so that this country can be a different and, I believe, fundamentally better place. The participation in this election by many who have not participated in elections before shows the determination to do something very differently in this country and take a different stance towards the rest of the world. And I'm very proud of what we've achieved here in Islington. I'm very proud of the campaign our party has waged in this election campaign. And I'm very confident of the future, very confident of the future that we will grow even faster and even further and that we will be able to carry out those pledges in our manifesto to properly fund health, properly fund education, properly fund social care, and give all of our young people yeah. a real chance for a future, free from debt and full of opportunity. To the people of Islington, I say thank you very much indeed. To the people of this country, I say thank you to all those that have given such support and such confidence in the Labour Party, and thank you to all those all over the country who've worked so hard for this day. We will carry on because we believe in a better future for all. Thank you all very much indeed. So Jeremy Corbyn on the left of your screen there, the Prime Minister Theresa May on the right, and he says it's time for her to go and make way for them. Mm -hmm. We haven't yet had the count from Maidenhead, and we will stay with Maidenhead because when we get the count, or at least we'll be there for the count, uh, no doubt uh, Theresa May will have some words to say about the outcome of the election as a whole. Or maybe she'll just stick to thank yeah, the Banks. people of Maidenhead. We well, it would be very interesting to see whether or not she does. She's been criticised in this campaign for not being fulsome, not saying anything, giving very little detail of what she plans to do. And she's not the kind of politician, one of the criticisms that's levelled at her, who is nimble. And I think that's one of the things that's causing us such trouble. We have another gain from We've Emily. We've got lots. This is a fascinating night, and I'm going to take you to Scotland. We've got uh, 15 Labour gains now. Uh, this one from the SNP in East Lothian. Labour on 36% share of the vote. Once again, we're seeing it's turning out to be a tough night for the SNP, down 12. Gains for the Conservatives, pushing Labour, another unionist party, into first place to take it on a swing, not quite as dramatic a swing as we saw in those earlier Tory gains in Scotland, but 8.5%. This is much more than they needed. Uh, this seat was gained in the Scottish Parliament by Labour, so some sense of a direction of travel, but they'll be very pleased to have this. Gordon Brown's old seat of Kirkcaldy, if I can just uh, bring that one up for you now. Uh, we thought was safe SNP. It was taken last time round, but Roger Mullen is out and Leslie Laird uh, takes his place. Very, very tightly fought this one, um, but it was a 23,000 majority under Gordon Brown. The SNP then uh, cut that, but took it on 9,000, and this is a very slim majority, 259, uh, but they got this on more than a 9% swing, 9.7% swing. Two more gains uh, for the Conservatives this time. Aberdeen South has been taken from Callum McCaig uh, of the SNP. This was number 97 on their target list. Let's just have a look and see if we're getting those dramatic swings again. 15%. We've seen the Conservatives uh, in that region, 15 16% now, when they're taking these seats from the SNP. Labour was in second place, uh, but it was thought to be a Tory target, and they've been proved right. And one more, Aaron Carrick, which, again, we thought was safe SNP. 
And you can see what's happened here, that change in the vote. Conservatives on 40% now and the SNP moving backwards down 15%. This was gained from Labour in 2015. So that kind of churn going from Labour to the SNP now to the Conservatives shows that Scotland's really up in the air. And uh, to add to those two gains, Peterborough and Bedford, yes? So Bedford, 17%. But also I'm being told that Labour has... 17% is... Uh, is the biggest swing of the night, I think. That they have taken Canterbury. I, I'm not sure my microphone picked that up. I'm being told that Labour's expecting to win Canterbury in Kent. That's been held by the Conservatives since 1918. Now, if that's officially confirmed, that would be probably the most dramatic example yet of a seat that looks <coughs> impossible for Labour unless we saw significant youth turnout. That big question that we didn't know how the electorate would answer it in seats like that the younger part of the electorate, who traditionally have stayed at home, seems yesterday turned out so, in droves. So we have a Labour gain in Peterborough. Canterbury, we are Bedford expecting. And Canterbury. Indeed. And, and another. Kikordi, we had uh, Emily, Emily had Kikordi in. Yeah, what have the, you got there? Let's have this, that. Uh, well, Bath's always an interesting <coughs> one, isn't it? Chris Patton famously lost here in 1992. And this is uh, an up moment for the Lib Dems on a night which has brought gains and losses for them. Uh, and some pretty sad faces uh, in Sheffield Hallam, certainly, when Nick Clegg lost. But the Lib Dems have gained this one, the seat of Bath from the Conservatives. Uh, they needed a 4.1% swing. <coughs> and if I just show you what's happened here, they've got it on a 9.8% swing to the Lib Dems. I'll be very pleased with that. UKIP got 7% of the vote here, and that has pretty much gone uh, now. You can see they didn't stand here. That's how the seats have been arranged in Bath. I wonder if I can bring you one more. You were just talking about Peterborough. Mm. Another game, this is number 16 on the Labour target list. Very, very tightly fought. Just a percentage point between them. Uh, a majority of 607. UKIP standing down here again, which Tories might have thought would help them retain the seat, but it's gone on a swing towards Labour of 2.7%. So nobody will forget uh, Chris... Patton's face when he was chairman of the Conservative Party, fought the campaign but lost his own seat. And he'll be watching. That was back I, in 1992. Here is Maidenhead, the there is the Prime Minister on the left, and we'll the hear the result held on of Thursday, the Maidenhead the vote. No risk of her losing this seat, but certainly risk to her political future the and the results of the coming in. Look at the array of candidates candidate there. Stay with us while we just hear how each of them has done. Batten, Gerard. Joseph, UK Independence Party, 871. Halamere Yamasak, known as Yemi Halamere, Independent, 16. Harvey, Jonathan David, known as Lord Buckethead, 249. Hill. Hill, Anthony Charles, known as Tony Hill, Liberal Democrats, 6,540. Hope, Allen, known as Howlin' Lord Hope, the official monster raving loony party, 119. Yay! Knight, Andrew, David, Animal Welfare Party, 282. Whoa! May, Theresa May Mary, the Conservative Party candidate, 37,718. <laughs> MacDonald, MacDonald, Patrick Scarfield known as Pat MacDonald, Labour Party, 11,261. <laughs> Reed, Reed, Julian, Michael, Ivor, the Just Political Party, 52. Smith, Bobby, known as Bobby Elmo Smith, 3. Smith, Grant, Jonathan, Independent, 152. 
Victor Edmonds, Christian People's Alliance, 69. Wall, Derek Norman, Green Party, 907. The number of ballot papers rejected was as follows. Want of official mark, zero. Voting for more than more candidates than the voter was entitled to, 19. Writing or mark by which the voter could be identified, three. Being unmarked or wholly void for uncertainty, 86. Rejected in part, zero. Total rejected votes, 108. I hereby declare that Tr Teresa May Teresa Mary, the Conservative Party candidate, has well, been duly elected. Well, that is a, a good elected. example of what um, English I'd democracy like throws up in the seats where the Prime Minister is. You get every Tom, Dick and Harry coming and standing. I reckon they made £5,000 in lost deposits, but here is Theresa May to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much. And first of all, may I, on behalf of myself and all of the candidates, thank the returning officer and all her staff for the hard work that they have put in today in running this election here in the Maidenhead constituency. Can I also thank the police who have had an extra job here tonight in uh, ensuring the security of this event. And th thank you to all those who have once again supported me as the Member of Parliament for Maidenhead. It is a huge honour and a privilege to be elected as the Member of Parliament for this constituency and I pledge that I will continue to work for all my constituents as I have done over the period of time uh, that I have been your Member of Parliament. As I say, it's a huge honour. This is a wonderful constituency and I look forward to continuing to work with you to, to see improvements, further improvements for the life of those who are living here in the Maidenhead constituency. As we look more widely across the country, of course, re uh, returns are still coming in. Uh, we have yet to see the full picture emerging. Votes are still being counted. Uh, but at this time, more than anything else, this country needs a period of stability. And if, as the indications have shown, if this is correct, that the Conservative Party has won the most seats and probably the most votes, uh, then it will be incumbent on us to ensure that we have that period of stability and that is exactly what we will do. I would like to thank all those across the country who have voted for the Conservative Party today. Uh, we, as we ran this campaign, we set out to consider the issues that are the key priorities for the British people. Uh, getting the Brexit deal right, ensuring that we both identify and show how we can address the big challenges facing our country, doing what is in the national interest. That is always what I have tried to do in my time as a, a Member of Parliament. And my resolve to do that is the same this morning as it always has been. As we look ahead and we wait to see what the final results will be, I know that, as I say, the country needs a period of stability and whatever the results are, the Conservative Party will ensure that we fulfil our duty in ensuring that stability so that we can all, as one country, go forward together. Thank you. The curious use of words, the country needs a period of stability, mm -hmm. suggesting that it's not a full parliament she's thinking of. I think that's uh, true. I think, as we were saying half an hour ago, so ministers privately now say clearly they do not expect to outperform the exit poll. I think we saw there a very shaky Theresa May who does not expect to be walking back into Downing Street with a majority. Now, of course, it will only be in the hours to come that we can confirm whether that is not the case. But I think her wording there certainly implied that very heavily. She said, of course, there's still votes to be counted, but if, as we expect, we are the largest party with the largest number of votes, she said that well, very carefully, it will be incumbent upon us to form 
a government. So in the Prime Minister's own words, she chose to mention the formulation that suggests a hung parliament, the largest number of votes and the largest number of seats. But that's only uh, half the story. She inherited a lead of 100 seats over Labour. She'll probably end up with a lead of 50 seats over Labour. She inherited from the last election a 7 percentage point lead over Labour in the popular vote. It looks like we'll end up with a 3 percent Conservative lead in the popular vote. So, yes, she's factually correct. Mm -hmm. The Conservatives are ahead on votes and seats, but by only about half the amount that David Cameron achieved two years ago. And she, written... now, she now yeah. has to contend with the absolute horror of her parliamentary party. So, we're just saying, uh, James Forsyth, who's a political editor of The Spectator, just uh, put up a tweet just before she spoke, saying, do not underestimate the fury in the parliamentary party. They are absolutely spitting. One minister told him off the record. So, uh, Theresa May now has to go and try to find a way, Laura, of convincing a party that she's the right leader if she believes she is. OK, and Tim Farron has retained his seat. Mm. We've just heard this, uh, the leader of the Liberal Democrats. But what has happened uh, over the last hour or so is that we've revised our forecast and revised it down a little bit from the Conservatives' point of view. Uh, Jeremy, you've got those figures. Should we just see those? Let's, let's take a look inside our, our virtual House of Commons here. Actually, revise in the Conservatives' favour very, very slightly. So, we started the night by saying the exit poll had them on 3-1-4. This is what it's saying now. It's tempered by some of the actual results we've had here. We've had about half the constituencies. We've now got them on 3-1-8. It's uh, down 13 seats from the last uh, general election two years ago, but it's uh, up a little bit from the way we started. Of course, crucially, it's not across the line here of 326, which is just above half the number of MPs in the House of Commons. So it does look as if, if the night ends in the way we're expecting, the Conservatives won't have their majority in the House of Commons. Let's look at the other parties as well. Very slight adjustment to the Labour figure, up one. So we now have them on 267. In our exit poll, the SNP on 32, a bad, bad night for them. The Liberal Democrats, notwithstanding the Tim Farron news we just had, doing not as well as we thought at the start of the evening. 11 seats is our exit poll there. And the others, Plaid Cymru with those three seats still, Green with their one seat, and at the end in grey you see the others, the Northern Ireland parties as well. So I can show you the figure. The key figure here is that the Conservatives are short by eight. Now, all kinds of other mathematics start to come in. Sinn Féin MPs, there could well be six by the end of the night. You know, I take 650 MPs, take those six away because they don't attend the House of Commons. So you end up with 644, four, you divide that by two, three, two, two. And the Conservatives are still not quite there, but it makes it just a tiny bit closer. And the other thing is the DUP, we think, may have nine MPs by the end of the night. Now, they're the, the natural allies for the Conservatives in this situation. So if you add the nine to the Conservatives 318, you get 327, and then they cross this crucial line here. But just take a whirl around the House of Commons with me now and have a look. Yes, there's a lot of blues. Theresa May says they end with more seats than anyone, but a strengthened Labour Party a diminished SNP, a few more Lib Dems. It's really going to be very, very complicated politics in here and many more hours of conversation to come. David. Thank you, Jeremy. I should say it did just go up to 322 at one point, so these, this Tory figure, the Conservative figure, is That's moving right. around. That's right. Anyway, it's above where the art was. Um, Eastbourne has been taken by the Liberal Democrats. Uh, Nick Robinson has been taken by Islington, so let's go and join him before he has to go off and do the Today Show. Uh, Nick, good morning. Good morning to you, David. They're just clearing away here. It is extraordinary being here at my local leisure centre, Jeremy Corbyn's local leisure centre, a place where he has come election after election. The result has always been predictable, and just as predictable has been the fact that no one beyond these walls would listen to a single word he said. And yet that figure, the maverick, stood on a stage here and effectively called on the Prime Minister to quit and to make him Prime Minister instead. And suddenly, that doesn't sound absurd at all. Contrast that with the face of Theresa May, the look of a woman defeated, heavily made up, as if she'd been in tears earlier. Her voice 
cracky at times, I thought, declaring that she would provide the stability the country needed, but nothing like what she said she wanted to do, which is to have that big majority, which would deliver the country a strong mandate, a strong negotiating mandate for delivering Brexit. We're so at... Uh, they we're, have I need to interrupt you, Nick, because we've gone to but, Boston and Skegness okay. for the result Philip, from there. Paul Nuttall, leader of UKIP, fighting that seat. Wallman, Matthew Robert, Conservative Party candidate, 27,271. <laughs> the number of ballot papers rejected was as follows. Voting for more candidates than the voter was entitled to, 11. Writing or mark by which the voter could be identified, so three. So a pretty humiliating three defeat for Paul Nuttall, 3,308 3, only, in Boston and Skegness, an area with uh, the highest area of vote leave. Nearly three quarters of Boston and Skegness voted to leave, but uh, not giving him any traction for UKIP. That Matthew Robert Warman is duly elected. So the Conservative holds it. Let's just go back to Nick Robinson, if we can. Nick, we interrupted you for that. Paul Nuttall will be no surprise to you. Did not do very well in Boston and Skegness. Uh, only got 3,000 votes, uh, 3,300. Anyway, just finish the point you were making. I'm sorry to have interrupted you. Well, I was only going to say this, David, that even a few hours ago when I was outside Jeremy Corbyn's house, they were there looking at those results to see, well, you know, just how much will we manage to cut Theresa May's majority. When they arrived here for his count, people were seriously asking questions about whether they might be the largest party Labour, about whether Jeremy Corbyn might, in certain circumstances, be our next Prime Minister. Now, I don't think that there is their central uh, expectation, but I do know that they have left this building to give that proper and serious thought. They know that he is now in play, that the decisions he makes will matter, not just for the future direction of the Labour Party, but the future direction of the country. And just a few weeks ago, that would have seemed completely implausible, not just to most commentators, but to Mr Corbyn himself. He has now been placed in a position of power uh, ahead of perhaps the most difficult political negotiations this country has seen uh, since the Second World War, a position of power he never, ever dreamt of. And, Nick, what do you think? You, you were hearing uh, Theresa May. I didn't really be able to see her. But what do you think she will actually do now? Because clearly she's severely damaged by this result, particularly as she calls an election when she'd said she wouldn't, and then she, you know, she has an election that batters her reputation, both in the course of the campaign and in the result. Where does that leave her in the Tory party and in Parliament? Well, I think there's two answers to that. Where does it leave her in her mind, which is probably doing her duty, in other words, forming a government if, as Laura was pointing out, she has the most seats and the most votes? But the second question is, where does it leave her in the minds of her own cabinet, in the minds of her own party? Will they take the view that she has gambled and lost big time and therefore has to be punished for it? The difficulty with that scenario, of course, is thinking who would replace her? If you, the Tory party were looking for a charismatic figure, for a figure who could give hope to the public at a future election, they would turn to Boris Johnson, no doubt. But if instead the job is not about winning an election, but the job is about doing a deal in Europe about those negotiations, Boris Johnson would be regarded as deeply implausible, not just in Brussels, but by many of his own cabinet colleagues. And that is the place that the Tories now find themselves. Do they focus on the talks in Europe, or do they talk, focus on the possibility of another election sometime soon, which Theresa May looks at... Uh, uh, impossible for her to run in again and if she did she'd surely lose nick robinson thank you very much uh, laura i think it means there is never any lack of ambition on the tory backbenches let's be completely clear about that but exactly as nick points out this is a very curious position that the tories find themselves in they ran on competence they ran on being a safe pair of hands theresa may became prime minister because she was basically the last grown-up left standing after the tory bloodbath over the referendum. But what do they do now? How could they try in another general and, election and to combat that sort of message of hope is, and is energy that Labour managed to put Is across? she in a position to change her government? Is she in a position to get rid of the Chancellor of the Exchequer, which everybody had said at the beginning of the night, that's what she would, wanted to do. He 
he screwed up the budget in her mind? Well, I think it's immediately much harder for her to do anything that she At wants. All. Yes. It's going to be much, much more pressed upon her to take the counsel of other people, and there will be speculation about whether or not she can make it and cling on as the party leader. I would say, though, one senior Tory has just said to me, in terms of asking her, to st can she stay on, the point is, with Brexit looming over everything, it is a pretty bad time to muck about. And I right. think her first instinct will be to try to convey that message and stay on. Let's just have the latest um, gains, Emily, can we? And, John, I'll come to you if you could... Pretty dramatic answer. gains uh, for Labour in a couple of seats here. Warwick and Leamington, uh, which is the kind of seat that you would expect Labour to take if they were winning the election. This is quite a bellwether. Uh, Labour won it under Tony Blair three times. David Cameron won it twice. It has been a Labour gain from the Conservatives, a close share of the vote. But just to put that in perspective, they needed a 6.5% swing, which is quite an ask, and they've done it on 7.6% swing. It is astonishing uh, for them to have taken this. Number 68 on their target list. Canterbury, the same. This has been Conservative since World War I. Put that into perspective. It had a majority of 9,700. Not only that, Julian Brazier, the Conservative MP, has been here as its MP since 1987. What's that? 30 years. Rosie Duffield has just outed him in the seat of Canterbury, uh, in Kent, not where you'd expect uh, a lot of Labour to appear. An extraordinary surge in their share, up 20% here. And uh, you can see the Conservatives' tiny gains, but really that swing, which leaves a majority of 187, has been quite dramatic, 9.3. You can see further down my list a lot of the Lib Dem holds. Tom Brake thought at one stage he might be in danger in this very leave part of south-west London, but the Lib Dems yeah. have held here Go against on. the Conservatives, uh, keeping Tom Brake in there. Uh, he, he once said it could be the hardest election uh, I've ever fought, and it may well have been. You can see uh, what kind of a swing it's been uh, just towards the Conservatives of 2.2. And I'm going to bring you another one. Kingston has been taken by Ed Davey for the Lib Dems. Uh, some of these old faces, Vince Cable, Ed Davey, old as in previous, coming back in. Uh, a 4,124 majority then. Ed Davey will be very pleased to take this, but a, a rather bittersweet night for the Lib Dems, where they're seeing former leader like Nick Clegg lose his seat, but some of uh, the former uh, MPs from last time round gained their seats. So the Lib Dems have been making gains. Tim Farron, we talked about, not only... Well, he has held on in Westmoreland, but that 9,000 majority cut to 777. So a massive swing uh, in this part of the world away from the Lib Dems to the Conservatives, but he's held on here. One more I just want to bring you. Norfolk North, uh, Norman Lamb thought he might be in danger, but he has uh, probably on a personal popular vote outperformed uh, what many were expecting, 48% share of the vote. He stays here. The Greens didn't stand here. That might have helped the Lib Dems. A 0.7% swing towards the Conservatives, but he's done very well to hold on here. And there is one more, I think, if I can just bring you this one. Uh, Keith Ness Sutherland and Easter Ross, John Thurso, as was, uh, he lost that seat for the Lib Dems in 2015. Uh, the SNP came in uh, then, you'll remember, on some of those huge swings. The SNP gained it from third place, but it's now Jamie Stone who replaces the Lib Dem John Thurso, and he takes this seat back for the Lib Dems in Scotland. They're having a pretty good night. All the unionist parties are having a pretty good night against the SNP in Scotland. 36% share of the vote. Let's just have a look at that uh, swing and see what's happened there. Again, pretty sturdy swing towards the Lib Dems from the yes. SNP in Scotland here. So you get this picture. If I just step back, you can see all the Lib Dem gains here. Some of them are holds and some of them have been taken. And those two extraordinary results for Labour in parts of England that you really didn't expect to see uh, turn red tonight. We're joined by Alex Salmond from his constituency, or was his constituency in Gordon. Uh, Mr Salmond, first of all, your own result. Do you think you've held on in Gordon? Well, we'll just have to wait and see, David. I, I think I feel we're some, uh, we're some time away from a result yet. It's uh, a very uh, large rural constituency as well as a, a varied and urban one. So there's uh, ballot boxes have to travel a, a long way in these parts, David. What do you make of the net loss of 14 seats so far from, for the SNP? 
Well, yeah, but that's off the tsunami of, uh, of 2015, David. Uh, I don't think anybody expected that to be repeated. I mean, you know, I'm a, an old-fashioned type of politician. You're an old-fashioned type of interviewer. Uh, I reckon you win elections by winning more seats and more votes than any of the other parties. And it looks like the SNP will have more seats in Scotland than the unionist parties combined. On, on that measure, uh, the SNP will win the election. But on that measure, you call them the unionist parties, and uh, they've made huge inroads into SNP's position. I mean, what were you, 56 in the last House of Commons? Yeah, I think there's two things. One, I think what the opinion polls didn't see in political commentators was a, a late recovery in the Labour Party's fortunes. Ironically, that was based largely on people impressed by Jeremy For Corbyn, many Yes supporters, incidentally, and ironically, again, that has cost the SNP some seats in our, our, our SNP Tory fights. Uh, but, you know, winning most seats, more than any other party, is right, important in politics. I mean, Theresa May would love to be in a position just now that she could say she's going to win a majority of seats across the UK. So, given that the SNP looks like we might well have done it again in Scotland, uh, I think you have to accord the, the SNP some credit, despite losing many fine parliamentary colleagues. And uh, does it make a second independence referendum more or less likely, what's happened in Scotland uh, tonight? Well, I think there will be a second uh, independence referendum. It's a question of timing. Because one of the... Another irony, a third irony in politics is this SNP group, although smaller, will be going into a parliament where it looks like, it looks like at this stage, it's going to be very influential indeed. Uh, and in that influence... Uh, will be used on behalf of Scotland and on behalf of Scottish democracy and to defend the Scottish Parliament. And that's right and proper. If people in Scotland have the right to expect if they elect SNP MPs in large number, then they'll turn out to be influential in the next Parliament. That looks like it's what's going to happen, David. But uh, you don't yet know, of course, what's going to... I hope you can hear me all right. You don't yet, yet know what's going to happen over Brexit. I mean, we know that, you know, you wanted to remain in the EU... Uh, that may still be possible, I suppose, if, if uh, Parliament is in total confusion. Do you think there's a chance of uh, well, I, the SNP getting I mean, a better David, hearing? Let's, let's... Is that what you're saying? Yeah, well, I mean, in a balanced Parliament, we'd be in a position of great influence, and obviously we'd seek to see if there's a progressive alternative to, to Tory rule. But, I mean, let's talk plainly. If there is no Conservative majority, Theresa May will not be Prime Minister uh, within the next, uh, well, 48 hours. You couldn't possibly survive having called an election unnecessarily to win a big majority, fail to do it, and then continue as Prime Minister. I mean, Boris Johnson's already on manoeuvres. Doesn't surprise me, not from what I know about Boris Johnson, and certainly doesn't surprise me given the glaring deficiencies of Theresa May, which have been exposed in the general election campaign. So the SNP will use a position of substantial influence to get the best deal we can for Scotland and to make sure we don't fall off that Brexit cliff edge uh, which Theresa May was uh, careering the country towards. Uh, what do you make of what she said at Maidenhead? I don't know whether you caught it, but she said if we uh, have the largest number of seats and the largest popular vote, our, our responsibility, our duty is to ensure stability. That didn't suggest she was thinking of quitting any time soon. Sounded like bravado to me. Uh, but then, of course, uh, consistency of position over any length of time, even over a matter of hours, has not been one of the hallmarks of Mrs May over recent weeks. I mean, manifesto positions get reversed in an instant. So this uh, declaration that I shall continue regardless of the verdict of the people is it, total nonsense. I mean, it isn't clear, David, across the UK who has won this election. That's certainly true. But it's very, very clear already who has lost the election, and that is the Prime Minister, and she should face the consequences. Alex Salmon, thank you very much. And as we were talking, you can see Nicola Sturgeon there, the leader of the SNP in A Scotland pleasure, at her count. And we're going to go to Twickenham now and join Vince Cable, who took this seat. Uh, Vince Cable, good evening. Congratulations on your victory. Uh, you were saying it was going to be a tough fight and you seem to have pulled it off. Uh, what do you make of the position yep. of the Liberal Democrats now and their role in the new parliament? Well, within the last few minutes, we've heard that we've uh, held Kershalton, won Kingston. I believe Richmond is hanging by a thread. We're, we're down to, I think, three figures. Um, so we're doing well in London. Uh, we're doing extremely well in Scotland. 
uh, Norman Lambs held on in very difficult circumstances, Tim Farron. So we're going to get back at, uh, a, a significant increase in our parliamentary party, though we're still mid-teens. Um, I mean, we've made very clear in terms of the, the big picture that we're not going into coalition or pacts with other parties, that obviously we want to be constructive, um, be an opposition party that gives constructive criticism. I mean, clearly the whole Brexit approach is going to have to be rethought, and we'll obviously contribute to that while respecting the, the basic decision. Um, and, you know, indeed other things, you know, personal care, which became a big issue. I think what, what is now becoming very clear is that parties are going to have to work together rather than shout at each other in this very different kind of political landscape. How, how would you think Brexit can be rethought? I mean, the mantra has been Brexit means Brexit, and that means you can't be in the single market, you can't be in the customs union, uh, you've got to have control over well, immigration. The... You're saying all that can be turned on its head. Well, the whole the phrase Brexit means Brexit was, was always a nonsense. It, it's perfectly possible to pursue a form of Brexit that keeps the single market, or certainly the overwhelming elements of it, uh, which certainly keeps the customs union, keeps a lot of the collaborative arrangements that have been very good for the UK. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's the kind of approach we're going to have to rethink, that the hard UKIP-style Brexit that Theresa May had adopted is it's simply no longer a viable option. But are you saying it's not going to be politically possible for her to pursue that if she doesn't have a majority in the House of Commons? Well, I mean, we don't know the arithmetic, we don't know the detail, but to take an obvious point, uh, the government were proposing to introduce a great repeal bill that would have got rid of a whole lot of regulatory aspects of the European Union around the single market. I, I doubt very much in the, in the current House of Commons that's been elected tonight that that's going to be feasible. They're going to have to compromise. They're going to have to find a way of accommodating many of the concerns of the 48 percent who voted to remain. We're just watching a picture of uh, the Prime Minister returning to London, I think, from Maidenhead. One last thing. Um... Vince Cable, um, what is your reaction to Nick Clegg's defeat in Sheffield? Well, I'm very, I'm very sad for him, and I, I went through a defeat two years ago. It, it's painful, but he will be looked upon by historians as a really major figure. The, I think, with hindsight, the period of coalition government was a period of stability and competent, successful government. He was one of the main architects of that and deserves a lot of credit for it. He'll be a big loss to us and to Parliament because of his expertise and understanding of European issues. So I, I think it is a big loss. Prince Cable, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. We've now had 439 seats in. We've got 211 to go. Uh, Labour have gained 20. The Conservatives are down 9. Liberal Democrats are up 4. Uh, the SNP are down 14, UKIP down 1. Yes, uh, yeah, so, uh, a, a little curious uh, uh, figure. It looks as if the Conservatives are going to settle down at the end of the night with 44% of the votes across Great Britain. 44% was what Tony Blair got in his landslide in 1997. Hold on. 44% was what Margaret Thatcher got in her landslide in 1983. Remember, the Conservative vote is up. So why, is, why are they doing so badly? Because we're back in England, at least, to two-party politics. And when you had two and a bit or three parties, 44% gave you a landslide. When you're back to two-party politics, 44% looks pretty grim. But in terms of the actual Conservative share of the vote, Theresa May can look Tony Blair and Margaret Thatcher in the face and say, I'd match what you did. Yes, though, so, um, I'm trying to think, when, when a party got over 50% in a two-party system, I think only about once... Yes. Since the war, if, uh, right, if that's right. That's right. That's right, yes. But, but the two-party two politics is, is crucifying the Conservatives in terms of their hopes of getting a majority. And but their actual absolute vote isn't that bad. And Let's she's... find out what's happening in Hastings. I'll come to you in a moment. Um, John Hunt is in Hastings. And we hear that... Is, that, is it true, John, there's a recount there in Amber Rudd's seat? Or what was her seat? OK. John, are you with me? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't yeah, think no you're right. John, can you hear me? John, can you hear, hear us from uh, London? I just want to know David, whether there's sorry, a recount. Uh, no. Right, well, I think we can't well, what, hear that. This is, uh, Hastings, David. Yes. Uh, I know it's Hastings. 
uh, what's there going on down there? There is a recount in Hastings. <laughs> Thank David. you. I'm so sorry. It's all right. I know there was a communication problem. <laughs> yeah, there is a full problem. recount here, David. I'm sorry about that. That's all right. <laughs> yeah, there's a full recount. Basically, the votes have come down to the, the difference between votes. We're talking about a few hundred here. Uh, this is the constituency of the Home Secretary, Amber Rudd. She had a majority of over 4,700, and it looks like at best that has been diminished to uh, currently sort of in the, in the hundreds now, um, uh, if, if, if at all. So there is going to be a full recount now. We're looking like there is not going to be a result for another hour or two here in Hastings. OK, well, thank you very much. Just, just on the point we were making, uh, 1955, mm. Conservatives got 49.3%. Of the of the vote, um, I think we can go to Nicola Sturgeon with a bit of luck. Um, the first minister of Scotland. Uh, good morning, good morning, um, um, Nicola Sturgeon. You're good morning, David. currently down. Um, I don't know how many seats. It's just disappeared from my screen at the moment. For some extraordinary reason, it's become zero <laughs> zero. But anyway, how many seats do you reckon you've lost? Put it like that. Uh, well, we're, we're still waiting for the final tally, but what I think we're pretty clear about is that we will have won more seats than all of the other parties combined. So I think the first point I need to make is the SNP uh, has won this election in Scotland. It will be our second best ever result in a Westminster election. That said, yes, we are uh, certainly disappointed. I am disappointed to have a number of losses, not least the loss of Angus Robertson, who's been such an outstanding MP for Murray, but also an exceptional leader of the SNP group in the House of Commons. Uh, so we've won this election, but clearly we've got some uh, reflection to do on the reasons why we've also suffered some losses this evening. Is it, is it right to say you've won the election? Because it's a UK election we're talking about here. I mean, you've got more seats in Scotland. I don't know how the popular vote turned out, but it's pretty damaging for you to have lost seats both to the Conservatives and to the Liberal Democrats and to Labour, who were thought to have been wiped out in Scotland before this election. Yeah. Well, I'm not trying to uh, downplay the losses, but in answer to your question, yes, I do think it's legitimate to say that the SNP has won the election in Scotland. We will have, I think, more seats in Scotland than all of the other parties combined, and we'll have more votes than uh, any other party. So, you know, by any definition, that is a, a winning of the election in Scotland. You know, there's been a number of factors at play in this election. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. There's been a, a late surge to Jeremy Corbyn across the UK, including in Scotland, which wasn't necessarily detected in the polls in Scotland in the same way that it was elsewhere in the UK. Clearly, there is a, a post-Brexit uncertainty and independence is clearly a factor uh, in that. And, you know, I will reflect on all of that in the days to come. But, you know, I think the other thing that has to be said is that tonight is a disaster for Theresa May. She called this election voluntarily. She didn't need to. She thought she could steamroll the opposition and cruise to a landslide victory. And, you know, she's left tonight facing uh, a disastrous election result. Now, we'll need to wait and see how the final results look in terms of what that means for the government of the UK. I certainly hope the SNP can play a part in a, a progressive alternative to a Tory government, but we'll have to wait and see how the final results tally. But what would you like to see happen? I mean, you want both independence and you want to remain in the EU. Uh, both those aims, have they been improved mm. by this result? And if so, how? Well, look, I, you know, I'm going to take time to reflect on this. It's, what, four o'clock in the morning and, like all other politicians, I've not had any sleep in quite some time. So I'm not going to uh, rush to hasty judgments or decisions. But clearly there's thinking for me to do uh, about the SNP result. I'm, you know, I'm not going to let us lose sight of the fact the SNP has won this election in Scotland, but clearly, equally, I'm not going to try and gloss over the fact that we have suffered some uh, losses this evening. Uh, once we know what the final result is tomorrow, I think it's very likely that the SNP will be the third largest party in Westminster, as we were in the last parliament. So we'll want to, if we possibly can, try to be part of a progressive alliance uh, that is an alternative to the Tories, but that will very much depend on how the arithmetic looks when the final results are in. Uh, and when we talk arithmetic, are you slightly chastened when you say we've won this election that you don't have 50% of the popular vote in Scotland, probably something under 40% of the popular vote? It's only the electoral system, which of course you don't have for Holyrood, uh, that allows you to say you're the largest party. <laughs> 
think anybody listening to me right now, David, is, is not going to hear me trying to overplay uh, the SNP results. But equally, I think it's reasonable for me as the SNP leader when we've emerged with more votes than any other party and more seats uh, than all of the other parties combined to point to the fact that the SNP has won the election here. Uh, you know, before 2015, as you will be well aware, the, the largest number of Westminster seats the SNP had ever had was 11. And going into the 2015 election, we had six. We uh, will uh, likely end up with slightly uh, above 30 uh, when the final results are, are counted. So, you know, I, I'm not standing here. I'm, you know, I'm trying to be pretty straight with you. I'm not trying to gloss over some very disappointing losses. Uh, but I think I'm entitled to point to the fact that we have won the election. And clearly, uh, the, the losses are something that I will have to reflect on uh, when we understand and analyse the reasons for that. Nicola Sturgeon, nobody will ever accuse you of being anything other than straight with us. Thank you very much indeed, and thanks for talking to us. Thank you. Let's go to uh, Northern Ireland now, but uh, first of all, uh, shots of the Prime Minister. There we are. He's uh, coming back from Maidenhead and presumably going to Number 10 Downing Street. And uh, the Northern Ireland story is interesting. Um, we have uh, four, four main parties fighting, about six in all, but five in all. But uh, Chris Payne is there in Northern Ireland. Page, Chris Page. Not Chris Buckler, who was, I was expecting to be there. Uh, Chris, just uh, fill us in on what's happened and what you think is going to happen in Northern Ireland. Well, David, it's been an extraordinarily good night for the biggest two parties in Northern Ireland, the Democratic Unionist Party and Sinn Féin. Their vote has surged. It's been a disastrous night for the nationalist SDLP. They went into this election with three seats. They have lost all three. They've lost their entire representation in the House of Commons. Not all the results for Northern Ireland's 18 constituencies are in yet, but on the basis of what we have at the moment, I reckon that the DUP are uh, looking at 10 seats. That would be their best ever uh, result in a Westminster election. Sinn Féin could be on uh, for at least six and probably seven. Then the other seats in Northern Ireland has been won by an independent unionist lady, Sylvia Herman. So uh, the DUP in a strong position, they believe, as regards whatever happens after this election. Their Westminster leader, Nigel Dodds, when he gave his victory speech here uh, for the Belfast North constituency, said the DEP would make their presence felt in the next parliament. He referenced a number of issues, for example, counter-terrorism, security, Brexit, the DUP standing in a strong uh, pro-Brexit platform in this election, uh, but also the future of devolution here in Northern Ireland. The DUP think that it has increased their hand when it comes to negotiations to restore the devolved government that Stormont, which hasn't been operating since January. And they'll be in a, in a very strong position, the DUP, as a Brexit party and with Sinn Féin not taking their seats. Presumably Sinn Féin will still not take their seats in the House of Commons. Yes, they've made that very clear tonight. No matter how tight things get in the House of Commons, they say their candidates stood on an abstentionist ticket. Therefore, they were elected as abstentionists. There's no way Sinn Féin will be taking their seats. With the increase in Sinn Féin's uh, representation so far, they're uh, on six seats. It looks to me like they're likely to take a uh, seventh in Fermanagh South Tyrone, currently held by the Ulster Unionist Party. And Ulster Unionist sources are telling me they are very worried about uh, that seat. Indeed, if they lost that, the Ulster Unionist Party uh, would be wiped out too. They've already lost their, their other seats, South Antrim, to the DUP. So with Sinn Féin not taking their seats in the House of Commons, the SDLP losing uh, all their seats, it means that uh, there, is, uh, there are going to be no longer any nationalist MPs from Northern Ireland sitting in the House of Commons. And it means that the vast, vast majority, 10 uh, out of 11 perhaps MPs from Northern Ireland sitting in the House of Commons, will be pro-Brexit. And you say they're going to play a hard game uh, with uh, presuming that the Prime Minister or well, the Tory party doesn't have an overall majority, they'll be in a very strong position to get what they want. Yes, that's right. Speaking to senior members of the DEP here today, they are emphasising again and again they realise they might be uh, in an important position as regards to the stability of the government, the stability of the country, particularly going into Brexit negotiations, and they will uh, go into any talks, uh, any discussions in that spirit. However, the DEP are well used to negotiations. Politics here in Northern Ireland operates uh, on negotiations uh, a lot of the time. In the last uh, election uh, in 2015, uh, a big part of their uh, their 
their platform uh, as they went into that poll was that they expected there to be a hung parliament and that they'd be best placed if they maximised their representation to get the best deal for Northern Ireland out of that. This time around, they didn't seem to be expecting a hung parliament uh, at all. Didn't make that a big part of their campaign. However, tonight they have realised that, yes, they are in a very strong position. Thank and you very they much. they will be uh, looking to Thank maximise you. whatever gains they can get, Thank especially as regards you. getting the Brexit. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, Thank you very much indeed. Uh, a, a quick word. Well, on. One person who's enjoying this uh, evening slightly more than many of his Conservative comrades, David, is George Osborne, who, uh, as we know, quit Parliament uh, not long ago. He's now editor of the Evening Standard. He said earlier today that the worst thing that she's done, i.e. Theresa May, is in her life, is no longer running through a wheat field. Um, and just in terms of some of the uh, over, overseas reaction, we've got um, a Dutch MEP who said Cameron gambled and lost, uh, May gambled and lost, the Tory party is beginning to look like a casino. This is one of the running themes through the night. And in fact, I don't know if we can bring it up, but we've got the front page of the, uh, the Times, this 3.30 edition, um, which is uh, uh, pretty brutal. Um, May's big gamble fails, um, and I think that's going to be the theme of all the headlines uh, tomorrow evening, is basically... Uh, she took a massive gamble and it's backfired. Emily's got some more results, which I'll come to in a moment, but let's just go to Wales and catch up with Sean Lloyd on what's going on from Cardiff. Sean. Well, all the Cardiff counts have now finished and the results are in and they're all now Labour MPs. Cardiff North has been regained by Labour. It's a huge scalp and really coming into this election it was seen more as a safe Tory seat. What we've seen here in Wales is that Labour have held on to their seats and they've increased their majority and they have taken seats from the Conservatives. They've taken the Vale of Cloyd, they've taken Gower and they've taken Cardiff. Cardiff North. They have exceeded expectations of that exit poll and polls that we were coming into a few weeks ago saying that the Conservatives were going to do very well here and there was still a suggestion of that in the exit poll this evening have not borne out. Labour have defended very well but they haven't just defended, they have made these gains and we've been hearing from people, senior people in Labour here who've been saying it's, it's been down to, to two things. The Welsh Labour brand that they've campaigned so strongly on, but also Jeremy Corbyn as well. So they seem to be coming together with what they're saying in that. And the Conservatives in Wales already saying that they perhaps should have been fighting more on a Welsh Conservative brand. So those are the things that we're hearing at the moment. Now, Plaid Cymru, we're not exactly sure what sort of night it's going to be for them. They've actually been relegated into third place on Ernest Morn. It was a top target seat for them. Labour increased their majority from 229 on Ernest Morn to, to almost 5,000. So, you know, whopping lead for them there. But there is a recount in Caradigion, and we're hearing it's very close between the Liberal Democrats and Plaid Cymru, who may mean that there may not be any more Liberal Democrats in Wales. Of course, it's a recount. Sean, thank you very much indeed for that. We now have a look at how things stand. Uh, go over to New Broadcasting House, BBC's headquarters, uh, and there we have uh, the figures we're showing now, the Conservatives. This is a forecast on 318, Labour on 267, the SNP on 32, Liberal Democrats on 11. Conservatives still largest party, but well short of an overall majority. And that is with... I'm not quite sure exactly how many seats in, but a lot of seats in. We haven't got them all up here at the moment. 484, I think. 484 seats in. Anyway, so let's now, just after 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, have the news. Here is Rita Chakrabarti. Hello. With almost 500 seats declared in the general election, Labour has done far better than many had expected, but the outcome remains uncertain. The Conservatives are on course to be the biggest party, but without an overall majority. Jeremy Corbyn called on Theresa May to resign as Prime Minister, but Mrs May, re-elected in Maidenhead, said the country needed a period of stability and that the Conservative Party would ensure that. Tom Bateman has the latest. She called this election early, a political gamble, the hope that she would transform the Tories' fragile advantage in Parliament with a huge win. But the smiles of the campaign trail have vanished. Forecasts suggest the Conservatives may end up even worse off without even a majority.
If, as the indications have shown, if this is correct, that the Conservative Party has won the most seats and probably the most votes, uh, then it will be incumbent on us to ensure that we have that period of stability, and that is exactly what we will do. And you can see what the Labour leader makes of these results so far, a man whose campaign confounded many expectations, beaming smiles, with Labour on course for a far better night than many thought. The Prime Minister called the election because she wanted a mandate. Well, the mandate she's got is lost Conservative seats, lost votes, lost support and lost confidence. I would have thought that's enough to go, actually, and make way for a government that will be truly representative of all of the people of this country. In Battersea, Labour have ousted a government minister on a swing of 10%. There have been Labour gains elsewhere, in Stockton South from the Conservatives, and in Scotland, Rutherglen from the SNP, senior figures already appear delighted. Theresa May's authority has been undermined by this election. She is a damaged Prime Minister whose reputation may never recover. And just look at the mood in Hastings, hardly beaming confidence, where the Home Secretary is defending her seat. So I'm just quietly waiting and making, we keep an eye on everybody and everything in the normal way. Labour Party. 21,000. It's not just the Tories suffering. In Sheffield, the Lib Dems former leader Nick Clegg has lost his seat. The night began with a big projection, the exit poll, studied closely by all the politicians, but remember it's still just a forecast. It had the Conservatives as the largest party, but short of an overall majority. The Tories would have 314 seats, down 17 on two years ago. It puts Labour on 266 seats, up 34. The SNP would get 34 seats and the Lib Dems 14. It was right to go to the country and to ask them the question about what their views were, what people's views were about the direction that they went, wanted for the future. But there is some encouraging news for the Conservatives in Scotland. They've taken the seat of the SNP's deputy leader, Angus Robertson. The festival of democracy has been on full show, as have the upsets, ministers under threat, senior SNP figures gone, UKIP's vote collapsing in many places. Theresa May has left her constituency count. The election campaign has been an unpredictable journey for her. Already, some Labour opponents are saying tonight should bring the end of the road for her premiership. But remember, there's still a way to go and more votes still to be counted. Tom Bateman, BBC News. Well, the projected result of the vote has seen the pound weaken on the currency markets. Let's get the latest reaction now from Sharanjit Lail, who's in Singapore for us. Sharanjit, tell us more. Well, that's right. As you said, the most immediate reaction on the markets has been from the British pound. Sterling falling nearly 2% against the US dollar after that exit poll suggested the Conservative Party could lose its parliamentary majority. Though The good news, though, is that it continues to hold around the dollar uh, twenty-seven mark against the US dollar. It hasn't fallen any further thus far. And analysts uh, I've been speaking to have been saying that it's likely the pound will continue weak through the day uh, because these early results suggest no clear winner. And given the uh, political uncertainty that brings the Brexit process of course could be complicated further and that is an uncertainty that uh, markets and investors don't like but having said that though most Asian markets at the moment are trading higher we're seeing Japan's Nikkei up almost 1% the Chinese markets are higher uh, Australian and Hong Kong markets fairly flat so there's no clear direction here on how Asia is reacting to those election results. Sharon Jeet and many thanks and now back to David Dimbleby. Welcome back to the Election Centre, indeed welcome back to the House of Commons where we're now forecasting 318 for the Conservatives, short of the overall majority of 326. Labour on 267, the Conservatives the largest party. There are many, many stories to be told tonight about what's happened and Emily has now a list of seats that have changed hands which we haven't yet caught up with. Emily. Labour's having a very good night in England. This is Leeds North West, which Labour has taken from the Lib Dems on 44% share of the vote. They needed 
a 3.4% swing to take this one, and they've doubled that, nearly an eight-point swing towards Labour from the Lib Dems. Greg Mulholland is out here. Let me take you to Lincoln. This is the oldest constituency seat in the entire country, founded in 1263, and it is a Labour gain from the Conservatives. It's been pretty much a bellwether since, what, the October election of 74, but Karen Lee has now replaced Carl McCartney. You can have a look at this... Uh, change overnight which pushes Labour up eight points at the expense of UKIP down 10. They got double the swing here as well. They needed 1.5 and they've got a 3% swing. Weaver Vale, another one, number 11 on the Labour target list and it was a tiny majority of uh, 806 but the, but the Labour Party is on 52 now and if you want to see what that looks like as a swing, nearly 5%. Tony Blair won here for Labour three times but Graham Evans is out now. Mike Amesbury is out. Some good news, however, from the Conservatives in Scotland. And I'm going to show you three seats that they've taken from the SNP. Aberdeenshire West, Stirling and Berwickshire, which borders the one that they already had uh, before this election. And you can see these tremendous swings now away from the SNP towards the Conservatives of 14%, 11% and 11%. Uh, everything's been up in the air, really, since 2015, when the SNP were coming in with some of those humongous swings of over 20 30%. So to take any of these seats back needed really solid swings. And you can see the kind of uh, work that they're doing. One more. I'll just end with this. Edinburgh West which has been gained by the Lib Dems, who are having a mixed night, but certainly a better night in Scotland. Uh, the Lib Dems taking this from the SNP in Edinburgh West then on 34%, a swing there of 5.8%. On the back of these results, what you can say is the one Tory who's having an excellent night is Ruth Davidson. We're joined now by Jacob Rees-Mogg, at least I hope we are. Yes, Mr Rees-Mogg. Uh, I don't know where you are. Are you in Somerset or are you in Bristol? Are you in Taunton? Where are you? I, I'm in Somerset. I'm in, in, in Bath. No, no, I'm in Bath. I'm in Bath University. Ah, I see. Right, good. Well, uh, and you, you held your seat? I, I have, yes. Good. And um, tell us about your view of uh, what's happened. Was the Prime Minister guilty of hubris by running for this election when she said she wasn't going to? And is the result a disaster for the Conservative Party? Uh, no, no, I think neither of those things is true. Uh, I think uh, an election was going to be inevitable, both as a result of the Brexit vote a year ago and of having a new Prime Minister, that a new Prime Minister required uh, a mandate ultimately, and it was merely a question of time. Uh, as for the Conservative Party, we seem to be starting out um, today where we've finished before the last Parliament was dissolved, so there isn't much change, but there's some rotation, and I think that will probably mean that we... Uh, continue to form the government. So it's not a disaster, but it's not as good as it could have been. It's quite strange to say you're back where you were before this election, when you did have a majority of 17 before the election. You now uh, don't have a majority, it seems. Um, well, we haven't had all the seats in yet, but it's not an enormous change. It's within the margin of error at the moment. She said she wanted to guarantee certainty and stability for the years ahead. Does this guarantee certainty and stability for more than a couple of months, perhaps? Well, the British people have decided on the Parliament that they want, and that's their right to do so and to be governed according to their democratic will. And the certainty and security of the British Constitution is, I think, very great uh, over many hundreds of years. And, indeed, the certainty and security of the BBC reporting of it. I, I congratulate you on your tenth successive uh, edition of Election Night. Uh, you may have an 11th in October to come, but time will tell. What do you think, um, leaving that aside uh, for a moment, what do you think uh, the Prime Minister should do about the Brexit negotiations which are due to start, as we know, in 11 days' time? Can it be pursued as though nothing had happened? Uh, well, the Prime Minister is the Prime Minister and is the person who will pursue these negotiations. The very straightforward fact is that we leave the European Union at the end of March 2019 and the negotiations are a prelude to that, but they're not necessary for that. Uh, we leave at the end of March 2019 whether we've had any negotiations or not. That is now part of both our law and of the European treaties. Do you think there'll be opposition in the parliamentary party now? Some people, obviously, I mean, maybe not you because you're 
a loyal, a loyal supporter of the Prime Minister, but there will be people in the Conservative Party who feel this was a terrible error to have this election and that it's done the party terrible damage and that she really should take the blame for it because it was her decision, as we know, walking on the hills of Wales that led you to where you are tonight. Uh, but I think the thing to remember is that George Osborne is no, mem no longer a member of the Parliamentary Party. He stood down from his seat in Tatton, and though he may throw rocks uh, from the Evening Standard, uh, he's not in the House of Commons to cause trouble there. Uh, why do you mention George Osborne in particular? I mean, there are many others in the Tory party. Well, you've You're all... smiling you, you, slightly. You... I think you know what I'm talking about. I, I'm, smiling, I'm smiling because you've already reported his comments earlier this evening and he seemed to want to stir it up a bit. Uh, I think Mrs May will have a good deal of support. She's only been the leader for under a year. She got it without any opposition, an uncontested election with support up and down the country. Uh, I don't think the Conservative Party is so fickle or such a fair-weather friend as it would not continue to uh, back the Prime Minister. There appears to be somebody d d dismantling the set behind you, Mr Rees-Mogg. And I don't want you to suffer the well, humiliation of being alone in it, the open air in some <laughs> godforsaken the, part of Bath. I, I, th I think the, the day thou gavest, Lord, is ended um, is, is pretty much the case here. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Good night. I think one interesting thing, so, David, just yes. briefly, despite <coughs> Jacob Rees-Mogg's avowed loyalty to the Prime Minister, there is a conversation going on among Conservatives right now Go on, tell what us they it, should tell us it. be doing tomorrow. What are they saying? Well, one, for, one, one former minister has said yeah. to me they find it hard to see how she can stay after this result. What, even the for a week? Are, the mean? Flip, well, I think tomorrow will perhaps potentially be a very eventful day. I think it will depend on the final numbers. Does it look like with Northern Irish votes she can quite comfortably be in government? I mean, we're still in this situation, aren't we? where it feels very, very sort of, you know, it's still a very fragile in terms of these precise there, there used to be, there used to be an old be rule. People. There used to be an old rule in the Conservative mm -hmm. Party, not in the Labour mm -hmm. Party, mm -hmm. that senior members would come along and say to you mm -hmm. in Number 10, I'm sorry, your time's up. Indeed, as they did to Margaret Thatcher, well, you remember, that it, was under voting system. As a very ruthless bunch. I mean, Do you think they might say that to her tomorrow? I think it's too early to say that, but the conversations at 4 a.m., there are conversations among the Tory party going on about what to do tomorrow. It is not a question of everybody will automatically file up behind Theresa May and say, well, bad luck, you made a gamble, it didn't quite go as you expected, but we will all absolutely stand behind you. It is going to be more complicated for her than that. Now, I think at a minimum what we'll see are demands about saying that she must widen her circle, she must move away from this very sort of iron grip that she's held, a tiny circle of trust. There may be people calling for her to go. Now, one minister has said to me he's urging everybody to have a good night's sleep and that a solution will be found um, that will not involve having another election. You know, at the end of the day, the Tories are pragmatists. It is not a good moment to change a leader with the Brexit negotiations about to start. But my point is this. We saw a very shaky Theresa May imply very heavily that she will try to put a government together but there are going to be real strains inside the Tory party that are already emerging in conversations tonight about whether or not they should take a different course of action. But, I'm not saying she's going to be out yeah. in the morning, not no, no. going anywhere but, near like but, that, but, but it is not going to be as straightforward as Jacob Rees-Mogg cheerily saying, yes. of course we will all line up behind the Prime Minister. We've got pictures of Jeremy Corbyn arriving back home. We might just have a look at because he's the beneficiary of all this in the Labour Party, but just a, a, a point about Hello, the tight, you. close... Uh, we have a declaration much. coming from Gordon, Alex Sammons. I was just going to ask you about Nick Timothy and the people around her, who's, well, I but I can't because we're going to... We're, oh, there, there goes Mr Corbyn into the house, not having trimmed the hedges. No time to do that. And here's the result from Gordon. David Evans, the Scottish Liberal Democrats, 6,230. <laughs> Kirsten Rose Muat, Scottish Labour Party, 6,340. <laughs> Alex Salmond, Scottish National Party, SNP, 19,000. <laughs> With 
five ballot papers rejected. Total votes of 53,740. I declare that Colin James Clark is duly elected to serve in the UK Parliament as a member of the Gordon So the Conservatives take Gordon and Alex Salmond, former leader of the SNP, loses his seat in the House of Commons. Mm -hmm. We heard from him a moment ago, and here is the victorious it has been Conservative a very candidate. Very exciting night in the North East. Thank you to Jim Savage and Aberdeenshire Council wow. for tonight's count. I would like to start off by paying tribute to Alex Salmon. When did, when did Alex That's Salmon go into the House of Commons? Remember? Ah, I think in 1987 or 92. He's been there I mean, a, he was a, leading, a long time. Leading until until the uh, yeah. referendum on independence. Yeah, I'm like. Uh, may sound uh, corrected. Yes. But, but, but can I just say... Well, yeah, quickly. The, David, the Conservatives came not just from the third place, from a distant third place mm -hmm. two years ago. 11.7%. Under the old rules, they would have lost their deposits two years ago, and now they've won the seat. This is a remarkable result. John. Well, the truth is, those of us who watch Scottish politics perhaps too closely and is mm. good for us have known from the local election results um, in May that, indeed... The SNP's vote was pivoting in Scotland, away from the North East, an area of traditional strength for the SNP, towards West Central Scotland, towards Glasgow, towards the places where the independence vote was highest. And conversely, that the advance in Conservative support, which has been evident in Scotland for at least the last 12 months, was also particularly strong in the North East. Not, and I think one of the interesting things about the North East is that despite the relatively high SNP vote there traditionally, it was not an area that voted in favour of yes. Yes did not do particularly well in the September 2014 referendum. And, of course, Murray in particular, was the, which um, uh, Robertson has lost, was actually the constituency which was the, almost voted for Brexit. Let's, uh, let's just leave Scotland and look at the UK as a whole. What are we heading for, a hung parliament? Um, yes, I mean, I think in truth now, the chances of the Conservative having an overall majority, well, shall we say, they're no more than that. It really is beginning to look highly likely that the Conservatives won't have 326 seats. That said, however, given that the DUP are probably going to have around 10 seats in uh, Northern Ireland, I think some of the talk that we've heard about possibly putting together a progressive alternative, that isn't going to work, it won't have the numbers. And this is going to be an extraordinary election in which nobody is going to be happy with the result. And we have a declaration Scottish. coming from Hoban and St Pan Pancras. <coughs> we have a declaration coming from Plymouth. Let's have Plymouth. Keir Starmer was re-elected, by the way. Bewley, Liberal Democrat, Here's the Plymouth 1, <laughs> Oliver Newton Colville, the Conservative Party candidate, 17,806. <laughs> Richard Michael Ellison, UK Independence Party, UKIP, 1,148. Luke Pollard, Labour and Cooperative Party, 23,808. <laughs> Daniel, Daniel Michael Sheaf, the Green Party, 540. The number of rejected ballot papers was 83. And I therefore declare... So Labour ousts the Conservative uh, from Plymouth, Sutton and Devonport, a seat famously in the past, uh, David Owen had it, Alan Clark for the Conservatives had it, uh, it's been Liberal, it's been Labour, now it's back in Labour's hands. Uh, he was a candidate there in 2015 and uh, the Conservative took it in 2010, so the second time round, and uh, he's taken it. We join now, I hope, uh, Ruth Davidson, the leader of the Scottish Conservative Party. Ruth Davidson, good morning. You're looking extremely cheerful, if I might say so, and no surprise there, perhaps, in view of the results you've had. What do you make of... Uh, well, let's just deal with Scotland, first of all, the inroads in Scotland. Well, it's a historic night for the Scottish Conservatives. We haven't taken multiple seats here for more than 20 years. In fact, the first election I was able to vote in was in 1997, um, when I was in first year at university, and I had to watch the results uh, at a student union that had been hired out by the University Labour Club because I didn't own a telly, uh, and I had to sit and watch every Conservative seat in Scotland fall, surrounded by 200 uh, Labour 
uh, people bellowing about the results. So I've wasted a really long time for us to come back in Scotland, and I'm so proud of my team uh, that have fought so hard in seats right from the borders uh, to the Highlands and back again. Is the... Uh, I can hear there's a lot of noise behind you, but I hope you can hear me. Is the problem for the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom as a whole that Theresa May doesn't have the luster that attaches itself to you in Scotland? <laughs> well, I, I know it's getting uh, late at night, David, but I, I didn't expect such compliments. Uh, I think we can leave my luster uh, somewhere else, if that's all right. I, I mean, we had a really clear message at this campaign, uh, which was about the big issue that's in Scotland right now, and that was the issue of Nicola Sturgeon trying to ram through a second independence referendum in March. Uh, and Theresa May was absolutely right to tell her uh, that it, it not now, you know. Uh, and the people of Scotland were able to give their verdict on that. And you've seen the number of SNP seats that have fallen. Uh, Indyref 2 is dead in Scotland, and Nicola Sturgeon needs to reflect on that. I don't know what you think I was referring to. I was referring to political luster. You may have had a different uh, interpretation <laughs> of it. But, uh, but <laughs> look, looking at what's happened to the Tory party, um, something clearly was very wrong about the decision to call an election, wasn't it? Well, look, we've still got hundreds of results to come in, many of them in rural constituencies where we know uh, that there, are, there is a, a high Conservative vote. So uh, I think it's just a, a little bit premature before we can see the whole picture. Uh, you know, even I, I could hear Professor Curtis down the line there, even uh, his poll didn't quite uh, look at what the Scottish Conservatives were going to do. Uh, so they may not quite have got what the UK Conservatives are going to do. Um, but it does look as if we've scored in the, in the mid-40s, uh, you know, possibly even higher uh, than Tony Blair's landslide election in 1997 in terms of a share of the vote. So there's an awful lot of, of information to unpack from tonight, uh, and I'm not sure that, that at this time in the morning is, is really the time to do it, if I'm honest. Would you like to lead the Conservative Party? <laughs> I already lead the Scottish Conservative Party. I know, I know, I know, I know you do. We know that. I'm asking you whether you'd like to lead the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom. Well, look, if I wanted to be in the United Kingdom Parliament, I would have stood in a United Kingdom constituency at this election. I've got a job to do here. I lead the main opposition uh, in the Scottish Parliament. I've got four years to turn us into a, a credible alternative government for Scotland. We've seen from the result last year when we stopped the SNP having a majority, uh, from the local government results just last month here in Scotland when we more than doubled our results, to the results that are coming in tonight, that we are able to make significant gains and we will be challenging Nicola Sturgeon for the government of Scotland in four years' time. Well, can I just tempt you one more time not to become the leader of the Tory party in the UK as a whole, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but to look at the problem that the Tory party faces at Westminster and how you think that will work out. There's going to be a, a wedge of SNP MPs there. I mean, 33, I think, at the current rate. They're down 19. Uh, and there's clearly going to be, oh, it sounds like there's going to be a hung parliament. Do you think this spells danger for the Tory party as a whole? And even that will perhaps reflect on the Tory party in Scotland in the end. Well, look, I don't think the Labour Party uh, can rely on the SNP. In fact, their history shows that they can't. The SNP helped bring down uh, the Labour government that allowed Margaret Thatcher to become Prime Minister. So, you know, I think there's lots to be unpacked from this evening. But one thing that we have learned from Scotland is that referenda shake up the snow globe of party politics. Um, we've seen that with the Scottish referendum. Uh, the rest of the UK is now seeing that with having an election just after... Uh, a Brexit referendum, and sometimes it takes quite some time for the flakes to fall. So, uh, you know, let's let's take a bit of time, take a bit of space, take a bit of distance uh, to see exactly where we are as a, as a country. We've still got hundreds of seats to be declared, so um, time for analysis is later, I think. Ruth Davidson, thank you very much. You point out we actually have a hundred seats to be declared. Thanks very much for joining us. From our helicopter, we see pictures of. Uh, Reason may actually coming to the Conservative Party headquarters, I think. Yep. She would have been expecting David to be cheered in by staff lined up on the steps to greet her, even if the majority was sort of 40 50, nothing like the sky yeah. high suggestions of the polls at the start. There she is. We should use a drone for these shots now, not a helicopter. It's very out of date to use a helicopter, <laughs> isn't it? You just fly a drone over it. There she is going into the Conservative Party headquarters in Smith Square, right by the House of. Uh, 
right the very different reception. Is that, is that the old Conservative Party? It's Matthew it's Parker Street is slightly Matthew around Parker the corner. One, they right, um, yes. moved out of Smith Square, that that's old right. symbolic building with those famous pictures of Margaret Thatcher hanging out of the window, greeting Waving, hundreds yes. of activists outside. Yes. But the contrast <coughs> to the Tory expectations... Well, what's she going to do that, there tonight at four well, in the morning? She'll have gone to watch the rest of the results come in. Why don't you go back to Downing Street? Well, there's a question. Yeah, there is a question. Inappropriate, well, traditionally, inappropriate though, leaders, to go back. Tra traditionally, though, the leaders would watch in the party headquarters in anticipation of their glorious walk back to Triumph up Downing Street in the morning, when, when, when by which we... point at a 7 or 8 a.m., uh, people like Margaret... me are there waiting for them, but it all feels rather more complicated. Yes. Than Margaret that. Thatcher, when she was Prime Minister after each of her victories, went back to Conservative Central Office. John Major in defeat went back to Conservative Central Office. She's, I think, simply applying tradition. And it's right, okay. because this is a party night. Yes. Government is tomorrow. Um, Parties tonight. Jeremy Vine, let's have a look at the popular vote, the way things have gone uh, tonight, can we, so far? Yes, well, look, why don't we actually take a look at what we call projected national share, which is always a big moment in these elections, where we, we try to give you where you th we think the percentages will be when all the seats are done. We've got 550 in. Let's just flash. If you have a look at the map on the floor, we're flashing the gains. As always, it's always... Um, Maybe less dramatic than it, than it looks when we go through them one at a time, because a lot of seats, of course, stay where they were. But a seat like Canterbury, uh, down here, going to Labour with a 10,000 majority previously, uh, that's extraordinary. The Stroud there, a Labour gain. So some red flashing in England, but all the, uh, a lot of gains in Scotland for the Liberal Democrats and Labour uh, and the Conservatives here, which, which really changes the terrain. And Ross Sky and Lacaba here going Liberal Democrat, the seat that Charles Kennedy used to have. So that's how the map looks. Now let's turn to the percentages. This is how we think the night will end up. We've, we've got enough results now to give you these. So, the Conservatives on 43%. Labour on 40%. The Liberal Democrats, 8%. UKIP on just 2 and the Greens on 2%. And Laura was saying earlier, the interesting thing about this election outside Scotland is the way so many votes have just aggregated around the two main parties. So with this Labour 40%, even though they've lost the election, that's actually higher than one of the percentages that Tony Blair got when he won an election, pretty close to his one of his other uh, elections that he won. So it's a remarkable figure, that 40% for Labour and, as I say, 43 for the Conservatives. Let's have a look on the change from last time. So, the Conservatives are actually up six, even though they've had a reverse in many senses. They are up six on last time, but Labour's increase is more dramatic. They're actually up 10% on the last election result in 2015. And the explanation for you, of course, is here, which is the crash in the UKIP vote, which is so dramatically down. And, of course, it's, it's released a lot of voters into the system who a lot of assumptions have been would just go straight to the Blue Party. But actually, it seems quite a few of them have gone to Jeremy Corbyn's Labour. Uh, Liberal Democrats not really benefiting. They're just up 1% on what was a terrible election result for them last time, although their vote seems to be better focused in this election, which is the crucial thing for them, and that's what normally enables them to get seats. But there we go. So Labour have made a tremendous advance in this election. The Conservatives remain the winner, the winners, but to see the second-place party getting 40% is really remarkable, isn't it? Thank you very much. Yes, and let's go to Broxtow and join Anna Subri. Um, Anna Subri, good morning. Yes, here we are, uh, down the other end of the lens. Um, you, you scraped in, I suppose, in Broxtow. Congratulations. I mean, you were under a 1,000 majority. Can you hear me all right? Well, it wasn't... Yes. What? Well, yes, but... Yes, I can. Good. Remember, of course, David, the first time I got elected here, my majority was 389, so in my terms... Um, a majority of 800 isn't bad, but hey... No, you've always, like you've always lived dangerously, we know that. that. We all thought. You've always lived dangerously. <laughs> but what? I should have got much more. That's the whole point, of course, isn't it? So what do you make of this election, the decision to call it and its consequence? Look, there was a lot of merit in calling it because, quite rightly, Theresa May wanted her own mandate one year in with, if you like, somebody else's mandate, somebody else's manifesto. Um, I think that, that completely made sense. You know my views about strengthening the Brexit hand. That didn't actually resonate with me. I'm afraid we ran a pretty dreadful campaign 
campaign, that's probably me being generous, uh, I can't explain exactly what has happened because, as uh, Jeremy has just uh, identified, you have seen these incredible shares. And here in Broxtow, I put on more votes, but obviously Labour put on more votes as well. We're not quite sure where they came from. But we have won, I am told, in Mansfield, an astonishing result, given that we failed to win in Gedling, failed to win in Nottingham South, and I'm told that there's a recount in Ashfield where the Labour uh, MP had a majority of over 7,000. Now, that, that is quite astonishing and just doesn't make much sense. You said I think that... a lot of it depends, frankly, on the candidate. Yeah. You said and I think you it depends on the campaign you said you, you were, run, you and it depends on being a good, sensible, moderate conservative you like said, me. You said you were being others. generous when you called it a pretty dreadful campaign. Uh, in what sense was it a dreadful campaign? Well, where do you want me to begin? Anywhere you like. I mean, it was a dreadful, it was a dreadful campaign. Um, you, you don't have a, a... Actually, lots of parts of the manifesto are actually extremely good. But if you're going to look at social care, uh, you, you have to put that policy, if, it, if you even have to start to detail a policy, uh, in, a, in a way that actually explains that this is a good thing that you are going to do. When you talk about the changes you're going to make in school lunches, you start with the headline that says children from poorer families will now get two free meals um, a day. You don't start from the basis that some children will lose a free school meal. So all the way along it, those sorts of messaging were appalling. And then, of course, the change of heart on social care, I'm afraid, um, deeply flawed Theresa May. It did not make her look the strong and stable um, prime minister and leader that she had said that she was. That was a very difficult and very serious blow, I think, in so terms of her own credibility and the way that the campaign was being run, which was about her and what she wanted to do, and she, she put her mark absolutely on this campaign. So can she, can she remain Prime Minister? That is a matter for her, David. That sounds like a no to me. It's, it's bad. It's bad? Well, it's, it is a matter for her. She is... You sorry? I didn't say anything. I'm sorry, I didn't... I thought you did. Do forgive me, it's a bit noisy in here. Look, I mean, she's in a very... I think she's in a very difficult place. She's a, a remarkable and she's a very talented woman uh, and she doesn't shy from difficult decisions, but she now has to obviously consider her position. Obviously, we, we haven't had all the results, so we see, need to see where we are. But Theresa did put her mark on this campaign. She takes responsibility, as she always does, and I know she will, for the running of the campaign as well. It was a tightly knit group and it was her group that ran this campaign. Do you have any idea of who might take over? I know where we are, for God's sakes. Do you have any idea of who might take over as leader of the Conservative Party, who would like to see lead it oh, out God, of this morass? Oh, what? that's... Well, I you would, raised the issue, not me. I'm not to get into that what? Uh, conversation. Well, you raised the issue, not me. No, I didn't, actually. I, I talked about her... You asked me the question as whether or not she could stay on, and I said she needs to consider her position. I'm not going any further than saying that. Well, considering your position means you go, doesn't it? It's a dreadful night. I mean, I've lost some excellent and remarkable friends, you know, proper, sound, moderate Conservatives, One Nation Conservatives, who've served their constituents and served in government remarkably well. I mean, dear God, we never thought at the beginning of this evening that we'd, or this day that we'd be in a position where we were actually losing seats, and, and seats which we've held uh, with excellent MPs over some considerable time. This is a very bad moment for the Conservative Party, and we need to take stock, and our leader needs to take stock as well. You have always been an opponent of Brexit and a believer in remaining in the EU. What do you think happens to Brexit now? The, the announcement that we're leaving the EU has been made, but do you expect everything to change now and a, 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 a departure more in the style that you might be able to accept? Uh, to succeed from the hard Brexit? Well, look, I've offer. accepted the result. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think it was a hard Brexit that was an offer, but I, I think what has to be said, one of the things that was really striking in the campaign in Broxtow was that most people, very few people, had not accepted the result. Most people, like me, had, had accepted the result. And obviously a lot of people actually wanted the result. But there was no desire to go back, no desire for a second referendum, no desire to go back on the result um, of almost a year ago. But what people do want is they want a good deal, and they want somebody who's going to get that good deal. 
um, but we are in a very different position now. You know my views, I, and I actually put in my own uh, literature that I believe in the single market, and I will make the case for sing the single market, and I will make the case, the positive case, for the benefits of immigration to this country, and I'm proud to have been elected on that manifesto here in Broxdale. Anna Subri, thank you very much for joining us. Emily, we've got some results in. Yeah, I've started with Halifax because this is the place many people will remember Theresa May launched her manifesto. It should have been an easy gain for the Conservatives on a good night. They only needed a 0.5% swing. It was number five on their target list. And look what's happened. Labour has taken it from a majority of 428 to one of 5,376. They've done astonishingly well in this seat in West Yorkshire, uh, a part of the country that Theresa May and the Conservatives really focused their energy during the campaign. Labour then taking it on a 5.1% swing away from the Conservatives. That was just a hold, but you can see what happens in a place where they've done even better and made it a gain. Colne Valley, also the same part of the world. We thought this was safe... Conservative. It used to be in the old days a three-way marginal with the Lib Dems coming through. Possibly that drop in the Lib Dem vote has really helped Labour, who've taken this on 48% share of the vote. You can see what that looks like as a change. Thelma Walker is the new MP here. She's gained 13% more uh, share of the vote. And this swing here uh, is 5.5%, giving her a majority in this new seat for Labour of 915. One more, uh, which again suggests uh, what we were saying about that pattern for Ruth Davidson in Scotland, who's emerging as the real bright spark of the Conservatives tonight. 48% uh, to 39% uh, Conservative gain in the seat of Banff and Buchan. Why does that ring a bell? Because it was Alex Salmon's seat for 20 years. He held this before he then became leader and, of course, went on to hold the seat of Gordon. But David Duggan now taking it uh, from the SNP here, and I'll just show you that swing, because we've seen all the drama of these swings, haven't we, uh, in the Tory gains from the SNP. I think, I'm pretty sure this is the biggest one we've seen so far tonight. 20% from the SNP to the Conservatives. You can see why Nicola Sturgeon was starting to sound a, a little less sure of that position of independence uh, for Scotland. David. Uh, I think we've got a result coming in from Brighton Kemp Town. We'll keep an eye on it if it comes in. But, Laura, you had something you wanted to say, and then Ian Duncan Smith is waiting up there with Michelle. Yep. We'll go up there. Well, just briefly, okay. after that very clear call, really, from the former minister, Anna Subri, for Theresa May to consider Actually, her... Actually, inter oh, we'll let's resolving. interrupt you for yeah. a candidate at the election of a member of Parliament in the Brighton Kemp Town constituency... Held by the Conservative by Simon follows. Kirby, this, with a challenge from Labour. Dr Hayes, Independent, 212... Simon Kirby, Conservative Party, 18,835. Lloyd Russell Moyle, Labour and Cooperative Party, 28,703. <laughs> Emily Louise Tester, Liberal Democrat, 1,457. The number of ballot papers well, rejected was as follows. Victory for Labour Marks, in Brighton, zero. Kemp Town. The Voting Conservative Simon Kirby defeated by something like a majority of nearly 10,000. 9,868. And that's another minister gone. I mean, we've seen ministers go tonight. But I was just saying, as, uh, before we went to the result, that, that there is clearly turmoil inside the Tory ranks now. We heard Anna Soubry, outspoken former minister, essentially calling for Theresa May to go. Consider her position. We all know that's code for what somebody means when somebody should leave. Another Tory source has just told me that Theresa May is 50-50 to go tomorrow. One source, I stress, but a good source suggesting it is 50-50 for her to go. Another minister has just um, messaged me saying, uh, as William Hague said, the Tory party is absolute monarchy moderated by regicide. That is the territory that we are now in. <laughs> As That's I understand it, the in, yeah, they're the ruthless. I mean, they, if so, the, the thing yeah. with Theresa May is if someone looks like a loser, even though she's on course to be the biggest party, the Tories are ruthless if a leader looks like they can't deliver. There's clearly a lot of turmoil. I'm not making any firm prediction about what she'll do in the morning. She's huddled away with her advisors in CCHQ right now. There's somebody who has suffered that very fate sitting with Michelle up there. <laughs> Michelle. David, uh, yes, Ian Duncan Smith, <coughs> former Conservative leader, is here, as is Aisha Hazarika, former Labour Party advisor. Ian Duncan Smith, should she consider her position? Well, I think it would be a grave error for us, directly after a result, to suddenly go into the turmoil of a leadership election. So I'm absolutely against that. I think we need some stability right now. 
we have to figure out uh, what the final result is, and then can we run a government, can we lead a government, is the critical question to ask. So these things have to be decided. You can't, in the midst of all of that, suddenly say, right, we're going to have a leadership election. That would plunge everything into turmoil. So, no, I'm not in favour of that. But are you, are you saying that she should have, when you're saying a period of time, and then she could step down? No, I'm saying that uh, we need to, first of all, find out what the result is, what the final result, whether or not it's feasible for us uh, to put a government together. We don't know that yet. Uh, you know, we don't know quite what the final result is, and that gives you the numbers. If it's feasible for us to put a government together that can actually at least govern, uh, then that changes the, you know, the, the complexion of what we're dealing with. And then the party has to meet, they have to talk to her and decide whether or not this is what she wants to do. And if she does want to do it, then, frankly, we need that stability at the moment. So I'm, I'm not in favour of launching these kind of off-the-cuff uh, vendettas. I think the truth is we need to stay calm and stable and try and work this through over the next 24 hours. But it can't be business as usual, can it? I mean, people well, must be very I'm not, I'm not, annoyed at the fact you've ended up but, in this Michelle, position. I'm not arguing for business as usual. It's clearly not going to be business as usual. Um, you know, the irony here is this <laughs> result is full of all sorts of peculiar things. You know, our poll rating has gone up. But we've got a worse result. Uh, people like me have had higher vote shares, but we've got a smaller majority. We've lost colleagues uh, around the country. So, of course, there's turmoil going on. <clears throat> but the key point here is, for the next 24 hours, we need stability. And what we don't want is any kind of rush to say, move, change, leave. Let's see what the results are. Let's see whether we can form that government and then we can take it from there. Uh, Aisha Hazarik, on this point about vote share, in 2015, when you were working with the Labour Party, the vote share was just over 30%. Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn's achieved 40%. Look, it's been an extraordinary night. We have to see how the, <coughs> the numbers play out, but it has been an extraordinary night for Labour. I think there were Labour MPs up and down the country thinking, would they survive the night? And, you know, I think Jeremy Corbyn ran the absolute opposite of the Theresa May campaign. It was open, it was full of hope, it was popular, and he was visible. I mean, it's incredible that we are in this situation tonight. Theresa May called this election. She was 20 points ahead in the polls. She made it on leadership. And now she is the one... We are having these conversations about whether she'll still be around in the morning. Would you like to apologise to Jeremy Corbyn? Because in February, you said that the only way that he could save the Labour Party was by stepping down. Yeah, absolutely. I completely got it wrong, yeah, along no, with a lot of, a lot, a, <laughs> along with a lot of people. But I think what <clears throat> he's done brilliantly is offer people hope. And I think this country has been sick of seven years of austerity rule, and they did want a change, and they did want somebody to offer them some hope. And I absolutely credit where credit is due. I mm. hold my hands up to say that I was one of the people that, that got it wrong. I think the Labour manifesto as well, particularly in contrast to the Tory manifesto, which didn't offer anything really, then there was this horrendous shambolic U-turn on the dementia tax. Was it a dreadful campaign, Ian Duncan Smith? That's what Anna Subri called it. Well, it clearly wasn't the greatest campaign that I've ever witnessed. Uh, we all know that. Uh, otherwise, we would be in a different position now, possibly. But um, the key element here is that uh, there will be time for my party to have a careful look through what didn't go right and what went wrong, and there were all sorts of issues. You know, the key element was that uh, Theresa May, uh, having gone into the election, uh, found her position diminished, and that's what not was a great just, thing. Just, for just but I just wanted to yeah. finish on one thing, which is, right now, the Conservative Party, all my colleagues, need to just take a deep breath and not go on the media to talk to the media. They need to keep <laughs> quiet until we've figured out where we are. The oldest rule in the book is, know where your starting point is, then you can okay. start making just decisions. And I would rather Theresa you... May stay... Do Absolutely, you, I want fear, to stay for that reason. Do you fear that, that Brexit may not be delivered, at least not the sort of Brexit you would like? I just want Brexit, uh, and uh, we'll see what that means at the end of the day, but, you know, the Labour Party's already said that they were already signed up to Brexit, the Conservative no, Party signed up to the, Brexit, so... In a, I, I think the Labour know, Party's position has we'll been see. very, very good on Brexit, but it is extraordinary just to think that she started this, com this whole campaign saying, my leadership is going to be strong and stable and she is the one now who is facing leadership challenge, and she has had an absolute stinker of a campaign. Well, you know, it and happens. It really does... It happens. It Nothing is perfect certainly has life, happened. But I do want stability, and I want her to stay there for that very simple reason. Do you want reason. something strong and stable? I just want some stability right now, OK? I'll handle <laughs> the stability. Once I know what the numbers are, the rest is there. But it is important. She's Prime Minister, she remains Prime Minister, and the country has to come first. And do you have full confidence in her? She's watching this now, or anybody else is watching it. I have a very simple solution to this, is... 
you're Prime Minister, you stay put, and then we can sit and figure out where our position is. Ian mm. Duncan-Smith, Aisha Hazarika, thank you. So we're joined now from Streatham by Chuko Muna, one of those who were on Labour side rather critical of uh, the leadership of Jeremy Corbyn, indeed uh, voted him out and stayed. Uh, Mr. Muna, uh, congratulations on your victory, first of all. Uh, your vote went Thank up you, by 12,000 or something. But let's just cut to the chase. What do you make of what's happened? I mean, you, you and many others misjudged Jeremy Corbyn, didn't you? Well, first of all, the Prime Minister held this election for naked party political reasons. It was opportunism writ large. And she wanted a personal mandate to pursue an extreme job-destroying Brexit. And she's been denied that. And I'm absolutely delighted about that. And let's be frank about the reason that she's been denied that. It isn't just that she ran an absolutely terrible campaign and clearly is not up to campaigning, being with people, talking to people about the issues. That was exposed in Technicolor. Whereas Jeremy is absolutely at home, campaigning, talking to people, getting involved in the debate. But I think the reason why many people will have, you know, changed their minds and, you know, have certainly reflected on this campaign is that the reason I uh, voted no confidence last year is because I was angry that we, I felt, could have done more to ensure that we got a Remain vote in that referendum. But the effect of Jeremy running this kind of campaign, positive, optimistic, dynamic, engaging in particular young people, putting forward policies, I mean, we saw very little of that from the Tories. And as Aisha just said, the one big thing that people will remember about the Tory manifesto policies is the dementia tax. But the effect of actually putting forward this agenda has thwarted Theresa May's attempts to pursue a hard Brexit. And I give Jeremy, but the, not just Jeremy, but the entire Labour team full credit for that because it was a solid, good national campaign and we had amazing local operations and local campaigns too. Now, I temper this just by making this observation, which is, of course, the Labour Party was founded 117 years ago by Keir Hardy and others, not only to be the representative of workers in Parliament, but to govern in their interests too. Now, we don't know what's going to happen because we don't know the final numbers um, as to whether Labour will be part of whatever government comes out of this. But definitely, big positive step forward to government today but ultimately, we must get into government in the future to make our values real, to do all, all those right. things that Labour yes. politicians have done in the past. And Votes Chuk for women, national minimum wage, you know it. Yeah, we know it. Uh, Chuka, um, if you were now offered a position back in the shadow cabinet, assuming it's still a shadow cabinet, would you accept it? Well, I've never been asked to serve in the shadow cabinet um, under Jeremy before. But I mean, absolutely clear. Look, I, as I said, I want to get Labour back in um, to government. If we're not going to be part of the government now, who knows? Um, and I will do anything and work in any way to make that happen. And I certainly wouldn't rule out being part of a shadow cabinet if I was asked. It would be, you know, but I don't presume that I will be asked, but I intend to play a very full role um, in this next parliament in making sure that we do what we need to do importantly to deliver on our values and my, I think my guess is my one guess of the is positive thing yeah my guess is that you began this campaign thinking that at the end of it there might be a vacancy for the leadership of the Labour Party and uh, that well let me, dream let me just is now tell you postponed. something let's put it like that well, I, I, wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't describe it as a dream. I tell you one thing I didn't dream of is having the majority that Labour activists have just secured here in Streatham. But I tell you one thing, actually. Um, my wife was here with me earlier, and she asked me at the beginning of the campaign not to make any predictions, because she said, before the last general election, you thought that Labour would probably end up in government. You weren't. Uh, you thought that you were going to win, you know, the Remain side was going to win the EU referendum campaign, and then you assured me we wouldn't see President Donald Trump, and we do. So she said, I'm not going to believe any predictions from you and I don't think you should make any so I have to say at the start of this campaign when I, I think I went on the daily politics one of your BBC programs and I've been on others and people have said do you think Labour will win will Jeremy Corbyn become the Prime Minister I said look anything is possible and that was certainly the view I had at the beginning of this campaign and I think what this illustrates is that look you Chuka, know, we are I'm, seeing I'm a huge amount of we... change in the world all right Chuka thank you very much you've for got lots us. of other people you want to talk to I want to hear the thank result you. from Hastings and see whether Amber Rudd is held on Nick Perry Liberal Democrat 1,885. Michael Sheridan Phillips, UKIP, 1,479. 
Amber Rudd, the Conservative Party candidate, 25,668. Yeah! Nicholas John Wilson, Independent, 412. The total number of ballot papers rejected was 97. The turnout was 70%. Therefore, I give public notice that Amber Rudd is duly elected as the Member of Parliament for the Hastings and Rye constituency. So the Home Secretary holds on to her seat. There was talk that it was going to be difficult for her, but she holds on. And let's just hear what she has to say. The returning officer and all the fantastic counting agents who have done the job twice this evening, we're all very grateful to you for staying so late and doing such a professional job. Thank you. I'd also like to thank my team uh, in the right here who've done such a fantastic job supporting me, working with me, making sure we had a really good turnout on the day. And I'd particularly like to thank also the Labour candidate, Peter Chowney, uh, who I know well and I'm sure will continue in his role as leader of the council. Thank you, Peter, for having, I thought, a good, effective, fair fight out of it. I am deeply honoured to have been re-elected for now for the third time by the residents of Hastings and Rye. This is a fantastic place to live and work and I am going to continue, I hope, to build on the great opportunities and the great regeneration that's being taken place in this area, improving our schools, improving our NHS and getting the infrastructure investment that we need. This is what really matters to me and this is what I hope to continue to deliver for the fantastic constituency of Hastings and Rye. Thank you very much. So, Amber Rudd, with the seagulls behind her early in the morning, um, uh, she, she was generally said to have accepted to have had a very good campaign. She was. To have been formidable in the debates. I just want to ask you this. Is there a possibility that she might be in the line for becoming leader of the Conservative Party? She has been talked about in that position. No Would question about that. Would you see that as a possibility? I think it's... <laughs> having had such a narrow result and having been a big part of a campaign that is being judged to have been a disaster, it looks much harder for her now this morning than it would have done if a couple of weeks ago it said, oh, let's play the game of who follows Theresa May. Amber Rudd would have been very much near the top of the list. She was widely tipped to be Theresa May's next chancellor, in fact, if Theresa May ends up uh, staying on. Um, she's certainly somebody who is considered as potential, uh, a potential leadership candidate in the future. I just wonder, though, the judgment on this campaign and her role in it perhaps makes that less likely. Well, maybe she made it less bad than it would otherwise have been. At least she appeared when the Prime Minister wouldn't appear. I mean, she was the Prime Minister's understudy on plenty of occasions, and she is a formidable character. Remainer, of course, but why be respected inside the party? David, talking about formidable characters, let's just have a look at what um, Nigel Farage has been up to in the last couple of hours, because one of the things that we may remember tonight for is the fact that Nigel Farage has stormed back into the political conversation. In a sense, he never went away, but with Paul Nuttall um, as leader of UKIP having a pretty bad result, Nigel Farage has been very vocal. And he said tonight that Article 50 had been triggered and we were on our way. May has put all of this in jeopardy. Even David Davis is now making Brexit concessions. And there's a very clear mood developing from lots of people who are uh, fervent leavers or hard Brexiteers, if you like, including perhaps Ian Duncan Smith, that they're annoyed at what's happening. Um, so that's Nigel Farage's quote. Uh, Paddy Ashdown is also uh, weighed in on the issue of Brexit. He says, as a former Lib Dem leader, if this election was about Brexit, then we must not conclude that Britain... Sorry, must we not conclude that Britain has rejected Mrs May's hard Brexit? So there are lots of people on either side of the Brexit camp trying to use this result as a way of uh, uh, casting a judgment on that Brexit uh, referendum of 2016. Chris Evans, who's a daily edit, uh, the editor of the Daily Telegraph, uh, is, is also talking about the softening of Brexit. He says the DUP are already outlining terms for a soft Brexit as the price for propping up enfeebled Tories. And how about this? Is an interesting line from the Financial Times as Robert Shrimsley. He says it's almost as if Theresa May looked at Hillary's campaign and said, "Let's do that." <laughs> So, so that's about as cruel as you can That's get, about as cruel. Nice line from, uh, from Robert, uh, Robert Shrimsley. Here's the latest uh, Daily, Mail camp, uh, sorry, Daily Mail front page. This is, I think, a 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. edition. Theresa May, of course, had huge support from most of the British press, David. She, uh, she could count on the Daily Mail. One of her uh, main spin doctors is a former male political editor. I think it's fair to say that the Mail have woken up and they're very disappointed at the result. And they say their fears of Brexit chaos. Uh, Emily, we've got some more results. I'll come to you in a second, Peter, if I may. Yes. 
go all 1997 de-ream on you, but I will just say, look at Enfield Southgate, because this was the were you up for Mort Portillo moment uh, in 1997. And you can see what's happened here. It's been a labour gain from the Conservatives again. Now, in Portillo's day, <coughs> excuse me, there was a 15,000... 15,000 majority. Labour has taken it on a 4,000 majority. Come back to me. Glass <coughs> <Last> water. <laughs> but that's a fascinating seat. I mean, that yes. is the kind of, you know, outer London, not inner London where you have lots of students, lots of sort of very lefty, trendy left. Enfield Southgate is not the home of the trendy Islington left. Enfield Southgate is a sort of, you know, middle Britain seat that almost happens to be in the southeast. And there we see a big Labour gain. And certainly, even a few hours ago, certainly at the beginning of the night, we never would have thought we'd see that kind of swing. Yeah. If I could just pick up here, uh, as Laura was saying kindly... Don't choke to death this time, are you all right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the excitement of the night, shall we say. Or maybe a stray blueberry. Um, but there you go, 9.7% swing from the Conservatives to Labour in this seat, which really was a moment in 1997. And it's hard not to start drawing some of those comparisons. We're looking at places uh, that Blair won for the first time, then Blair went on to win three times for Labour. Some of these are on the chart for the first time since then. And it's an extraordinary thing to think of these different characters, uh, Tony Blair and Jeremy Corbyn, but to see the same kind of places popping up. This is the first one I want to show you. The next one is Keithley. Again, quite far down the Labour target, number 23. And you can see it's a neck-and-neck -neck vote between Labour and the Conservatives, but enough for Labour to gain it from the Conservatives. A big drop in the UKIP vote there again. They needed a 3.1% swing. And you can see what's happened here. They've taken it just on a 3.3% swing. So we're getting some quite interesting ones in. Uh, to be fair, Derbyshire North East has been a gain for the Conservatives tonight. It was 18 on their list. Lee Rowley comes in here, pushing out Natasha Engel, uh, quite a well-known name for Labour, on 49% share of the vote. And you can see uh, a 4.8% swing, this time from Labour to the Conservative, in the seat just outside Chesterfield. So a little bit of play here, but broadly, the kind of seats that we're seeing turn red tonight are ones that very few people would have had on any kind of rational target list uh, at the beginning of the night. They are places that are taking a lot of us by surprise. John Woodcut, uh, Woodcock is the MP returned, Labour MP for Baron Furness. His majority just is squeaking in at 209. A Brownite in the Labour Party, a special advisor to Gordon Brown. And everybody's having their words thrown back at them tonight, Mr Woodcock. Uh, Woodcock, the words I want to throw mm. back at you are, Labour is on course for a historic and catastrophic defeat. So what went right for Labour? Well, right. <laughs> well, David, I have no idea, and I'm not sure that anyone <laughs> who uh, you will have on this programme actually genuinely has an idea either. And if they say that they do, I think they are probably winging it. Because as you, as you say, there have been utterly extraordinary results. Um, there have been places where we ha where Labour has struggled and lost ground. There have been places, like you mentioned Canterbury, uh, where we've popped up with this incredible victory out of seem seemingly out of nowhere. I mean, I think the one thing which... I don't know what is going on in British politics, but I think the one thing which is clear is that this is wide open and, you know, there is a, there is a space and there is a need for a progressive force to take the country forward and out and, and give a more hopeful vision uh, than that which has been fed over this over these last couple of years by the by the Conservative government and that force we have shown overnight can be the Labour Party I am deeply deeply proud unexpectedly I'll have to say I'm but I am deeply proud to be returned as one of its MPs to be part of that fight but can, can you sign up to the kind of policies that Jeremy Corbyn has been uh, uh, promoting when you actually clearly thought they were completely wrong, wrong for the Labour Party, but much more important, wrong for the country? Well, um, the Labour Party has always been a broad church um, and probably, I would say, never broader than it is at the moment. But, well, I mean, one of, the, one of the things which gave me so much heart locally was the way that local party members who were, you know, 
deeply disagreed with what I had said about the, the leader, the stances I had taken. They actually all came together in this campaign um, to get us over the line and to, uh, to keep a Labour MP to keep me here. And that shows, actually, that we, we, can, we can unite. And there is going to be a huge question, of course, for the party as to uh, what direction we take, um, what vision we put forward in the, in the weeks and months ahead. But this result shows that we can do it, that actually there is not the appetite in this country for the, the paucity of vision, uh, the lack of hope, the doing down of our country that we've seen from this Conservative government over the last two years. People want change, they want a difference, and we've got an opportunity to provide that, and that is brilliant. John Booker, thank you very much indeed. It's uh, five past five and it's time for another update on the news. So let's have that with our results at the moment showing our forecast, showing uh, perhaps we're not going to show our forecast. We can show our forecast. We can't show our forecast. I don't know whether we can show our forecast or not. Can we show the forecast, they're asking? I don't know. They haven't got it, OK. Um, we haven't got our forecast, so instead we have <laughs> the news and it's with Louise Minchin. I'm sure you'll have it in a couple of minutes. Uh, very good morning. Hello. Uh, with less than 50 seats still to be declared, the outcome of the general election is still uncertain. Labour has done better than expected. And although the Conservatives look like being the biggest party, they are not likely to get a majority. Jeremy Corbyn has called for Theresa May to resign. The Prime Minister says the country needs stability. The night saw both Alex Salmond and Nick Clegg lose their seats. Our political correspondent Tom Bateman's report contains flash photography. She called this election early, a political gamble. The hope that she would transform the Tories' fragile advantage in Parliament with a huge win. But the smiles of the campaign trail have vanished. Forecasts suggest the Conservatives may end up even worse off without even a majority. If, as the indications have shown, if this is correct, that the Conservative Party has won the most seats and probably the most votes, uh, then it will be incumbent on us to ensure that we have that period of stability, and that is exactly what we will do. And you can see what the Labour leader makes of these results so far, a man whose campaign confounded many expectations, beaming smiles, with Labour on course for a far better night than many thought. The Prime Minister called the election because she wanted a mandate. Well, the mandate she's got is lost Conservative seats, lost votes, lost support and lost confidence. I would have thought that's enough to go, actually. Cordova is duly elected. In Battersea, Labour have ousted a government minister on a swing of 10%. There have been Labour gains elsewhere, in Stockton South from the Conservatives and in Scotland, Rutherglen from the SNP. Labour Party... 21,000. It's not just the Tories suffering. In Sheffield, the Lib Dems' former leader, Nick Clegg, has lost his seat. I, of course, have encountered this evening something that many people have encountered before tonight and I suspect many people will encounter after tonight, which is, in politics, you live by the sword and you die by the sword. The night began with a projection, the exit poll. It had the Conservatives as the largest party, but short of an overall majority. It put the Tories on 314 seats, down 17 on two years ago. Labour would be up 34 seats with 266 MPs. It put the SNP down to 34 MPs, with the Lib Dems on 14. The SNP have lost big names on a disappointing night compared with their Scottish landslide two years ago. Their deputy leader Angus Robertson was ousted by the Conservatives and their former leader Alex Salmond lost his seat too. Now one of Theresa May's own MPs is laying the blame on her. I think she's in a very difficult place. She's a, a remarkable and she's a very talented woman uh, and she doesn't shy from difficult decisions but she now has to obviously consider her position. The festival of democracy has been on full show, as have the upsets. Theresa May has left her constituency count. The election campaign has been an unpredictable journey for her. Already, some Labour opponents are saying tonight should bring the end of the road for her premiership. But remember, there's still a way to go and more votes still to be counted. Tom Bateman, BBC News. 
Well, the pound's position on the currency markets has weakened following early results in the general election. Overnight, sterling suffered one of its biggest falls since January, sinking to a low of almost 2% against the dollar and the euro. A clearer picture of the markets will emerge when trading opens across Europe and the final results of the election come in. Time for a quick catch-up with the weather. Here's Helen Willits. Good morning. This is how we ended the day in Highland Scotland, but for much of Scotland, Northern Ireland, it really was a wet day on Thursday. Now, today, with still the rain in Scotland petering out, with still showers heading their way eastwards, but it is much drier across Northern Ireland. So, as I say, there'll be some sharp showers across the western side of England and Wales initially. They'll become heavier further east this afternoon, as they will when the sun comes out across parts of Scotland. So we're talking again hail and a risk of thunder from those showers, but much drier and brighter with some sunshine further west. It'll feel warmer as well. However, it doesn't last because as we go through the evening hours, more rain comes in off the Atlantic. So a wetter for Northern Ireland as we move into Saturday for Scotland, for many northern and western parts of England and Wales. But the south and the east probably not seeing that much rain. In fact, it'll feel quite muggy and warm. And the rain does clear further north to reveal some sunshine and just a few showers. And eventually that weather front clears from all parts as we go through Saturday night into Sunday. So a little bit grey to start, but for many, a day of sunny spells and showers. So that's a look at the weather. Our time for the very latest. Let's go back to David Dimbleby. Dawn has broken over Westminster and uh, a cruel dawn for the Tory party. After the results that have come in, we've still got 44 to come in. And uh, a lot of talk now from sources within the Tory party about Theresa May's future. We've had the uh, call for her to go, or pretty well called for her to go from Anna Soubry, who's a sort of backbencher, uh, famously outspoken, but people that Laura Kunzberg has been speaking to have been talking about having to do something quite dramatic and fairly swiftly. We'll see what happens. There's another interesting aspect to this uh, election, which is that the votes have gone back to the two main parties, Conservative and Labour. Not since 1970 have both parties had over 12 million people voting for them. The current rate is Labour on 12 million and 100,000, the Conservatives on 12 million, 600,000. So the smaller parties, the other parties, the Liberals down on 2 million, uh, and all the other parties have given way to a two-party vote, which in a way is like that campaign was. There were two very clearly distinct messages being given from the Conservatives on the one hand with Theresa May saying strong and stable and all that and Jeremy Corbyn on the other hand saying there is another way, less austerity, more spending, government should do this and that and the other. So there was a polarisation in the parties and it seems that the voters mm -hmm. have been attracted to that polarisation, clustered to it because they are getting two very clear and distinct messages. Anyway, we'll now just have a look at the parties and how they stand, Jeremy. Can we do that? Yes, well, let's do that. We started many hours ago here in our, our virtual Downing Street and we gave you our exit poll and a lot of people were saying on social media and so on, this can't be right. But actually, our forecast <laughs> with only about 40, 44 seats to go is very close to what we were saying at 5 to 10, having the Conservatives falling short here. 318, we think now. We said 314 at the start. And then let's look at Labour quite a long way back, but exceeding all expectations. That's the point about the Labour performance. They've done better than even they thought, as we've heard from some of the extraordinary interviews we've, we've had on the programme over the last few hours. So, 318 for the Conservatives. You'll see where these tiles, these individual paving stones, which all are individual constituencies, where they're darker blue, we haven't got a result yet. But actually, back here, we've got those... Uh, those results are all, all in. So it's just the darker blue ones. You can see most of them are solid blue. So we really haven't got that many more results to come. The ones we're waiting for, places like Kensington, Richmond Park, Crawley, Dumfries, Winchester, Thirsk, Truro, St Ives and so on, still waiting for them. But really our exit poll stabilised with these results. 318, the Conservatives short of an overall majority. 326 you need because there are 650 MPs in the House of Commons, so you need just over half to be in control. And Theresa May will not be with only her own MPs. She's going to have to find friends in the House of Commons. And one thing's for sure, it won't be the Liberal Democrats this time. 
Have a look with me at the Labour line here. Now, there are, I suppose you could, you could say Labour's result is no better than really Gordon Brown did when he lost the 2010 election. But they've got a handsome share of the vote. Part of that is, is surely rather surprising numbers of UKIP voters going to Labour, which commentators weren't predicting, but also new voters, younger voters. I'm sure we'll find out many of them have been involved in this election. Labour 262 is what we are now forecasting, just down four from what we were saying at 10 p.m. last night. Have a look at the end of the line. So those ones are still waiting for Normanton, that's Yvette Cooper's seat, Hove, Poplar, Wandsbeck, Southampton Test. We've got as Labour may go Conservative, it has been uh, up until now, Hendon, Ilford North. So we're still waiting for those, but most of these lines are solid red, solid blue, so we have the results in. So this is the situation. What a blow for Theresa May to call an election when she was, what, 16 points clear in the polls, thinking about a landslide of 100 and didn't even get an overall majority. It's politically devastating for her, and that's why you just saw Jeremy Corbyn giving the thumbs up to all the reporters. Amazing. David. Jeremy, thank you very much. So, uh, John Curtis, you were, um, <clears throat> how can I put it? Being a bit cautious about your exit poll, uh, not your exit poll, the BBC, Sky, ITV exit poll, I have to say that for copyright reasons, no, I'm told, sure. all the time. Sure. Anyway, this combined exit poll, uh, you were being a little bit cautious about it at the beginning, saying, hmm, maybe it's not quite as bad as that for the Tories. It now looks as if you were pretty well spot on with it. Yeah, well, one always has to be cautious about these things because the truth is one knows the fragility and the truth is that uh, two years ago, we did underestimate the Conservative Tony by 15 seats. It looks as though this time we might be one, two, three or seats, one, two or three seats out, uh, but that's about it. Indeed, you're right. It looks as though our forecast is going to prove remarkably accurate. Maybe, in the end, the most accurate exit poll yet. But we'll wait and see whether that proves to be... Is, is there any possibility of it not being a hung parliament now? Is no, 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 no. It, no way they can get a... No, no, we cannot see any way at all that the Conservatives can get to the 326 mark. And we think it's pretty clear that there is going to be a hung parliament. And that some of the questions that Laura was raising about... Um, uh, Theresa May's uh, future are clearly going to become quite important later today. And I think it's worth, perhaps worth remembering. I mean, actually, the international academic literature says that calling snap elections often doesn't work because voters ask themselves, hang on, what is it that's coming down the, around the corner that they're trying to hide for us? And if you think about the uh, snap elections we've had in the UK in the past, 1970, Howard Wilson suddenly went to the country in June 1970 when he thought the polls had turned around in his favour. He lost. In February 1974, admittedly in rather different circumstances, Edward Heath went to the country very suddenly because of the miners' strike. He lost. Now, very suddenly and unexpectedly indeed, Theresa May has gone to the country. Well, her party's not quite managed to lose but maybe we'll find out that she also has ended up the loser of this election. She should have talked to you before she decided to do it, then. Uh, well, indeed, if she read the international literature on, the, mm -hmm. on why <laughs> fixed-term parliaments acts are sometimes quite good, one of the reasons is that, actually, although being able to call an election when you think it's a good idea might seem like an advantage, if you try to call an election very early in a parliament, it can often rebound on you. Well, now, we know, just on that point, um, Laura, we know that she has a very tight circle mm -hmm. of political advisers, mm -hmm. uh, Fiona Hill and Nick Timothy in mm -hmm. particular, mm -hmm. um, and clearly she must have consulted them. They're the ones who must take the blame for this as well. Well, as, as I she. understand, she currently is in Tory HQ, closeted with the two of them and other people discussing what their next moves ought to be. And I'm already hearing one, another minister has just said to me, I do not think she has to go, but things will have to change. And I think there will be demands, more than calls, but demands from inside the 1922 committee and among ministers that she must change her style of working. She must expand beyond that tiny group of people. You think that would be even enough, if, just well, changing her way of working? Well, I think we'll, we'll have to see, but that's where the discussion is. But is she is capable it? of changing her way of working? I mean, she's <laughs> gone through an election campaign... Mm -hmm. Not apparently, when you, well, even the casual conversations I've had with ministers, they say she doesn't move an inch mm -hmm. without Nick Timothy well, she's and, uh, and Fiona Hill telling she's, her, agreeing with her what to she's do. She's famed for her stubbornness. Yes. She can try to cast that as being resolute, and indeed that's precisely what she tried to do this in, election, in this election, say, boasting that she could be a bloody difficult woman, but actually, if you won't change your mind and you've made the wrong decision, it's not a great call. 
We're joined by, and I'd like you to join in on this uh, because it's all about the politics of Westminster, by Simon Hamilton from the Democratic Unionist Party mm -hmm. in, the Northern Ireland, in Northern Ireland, member of the Northern Ireland Assembly. What do you think now? We've got, uh, I can't remember the figure, I think it's eight, isn't it, for the DUP? Mm -hmm. well, we, we've actually, David, uh, good, good morning. We, we good morning. increased our seats from eight in the last parliament to ten. To ten. What, what's, I mean, you clearly are going to be a very a potentially attractive partner to a Tory Prime Minister who doesn't have an overall majority. What are you going to be asking for? Well, look, uh, it's still... Uh, I know the, the, the seats are, are coming in, the results are coming in thick and fast, and we'll know very soon what the, the final shape of the Parliament is. Um, we, let, let's see what the final result is and uh, what the mathematics is. Um, obviously, the impact of, of Northern Ireland will be in, in... not just in respect of what the Democratic Unionist Party will have, but the, the impact of Sinn Féin, who are an abstentionist party, don't take their seats in Westminster, uh, will have a, an impact on what the, the overall effective working majority in the, in the new parliament will be. Uh, but look, in, in terms of what the DUP um, will look at, we, we, we are, uh, yes, first and foremost, we will be looking for um, to achieve our goals in respect of the best thing, the best deal for Northern Ireland in the new parliament. But also, we're, we're very mindful of our uh, responsibilities in terms of the, the national political scene and this is a, a very difficult time for the United Kingdom there are a lot of challenges particularly in respect of uh, of terrorism and extremism and, and the attack on democracy over the last number uh, of weeks but also the, the challenges and, and opportunities that, that, that Brexit presents and, uh, and the need to get not just a good deal for, for Northern Ireland as uh, the UK as a whole exits the European Union but a good deal for the United Kingdom. So uh, Laura you watch mm -hmm. Westminster very mm -hmm. closely mm -hmm. uh, can you can you interpret for me uh, what the DUP position that, he's, uh, that uh, Mr Hamilton is putting out actually would mean in terms of votes in the House? What kind of pressure will they be able to bring? Well, I think very significant pressure. I mean, we've seen in the last Parliament already the DUP were able to privately call some shots on some issues. But I wonder if there were to be any sort of backsliding on, on, on Brexit, what would you consider to be as something unacceptable. We've already heard, and we'll hear, I'm sure, in the next couple of days, there may be Tory MPs calling for a reconsideration of the idea of staying in the single market. Would that be something that you would consider as acceptable in the Brexit negotiations? Well, look, there, there are particular circumstances uh, in Northern Ireland in respect of Brexit, particularly because we have a, a land border with a uh, with the, the, the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland will be the UK's border uh, with the European Union after Brexit. And, and clearly, the, the, the UK as a whole will be leaving the European Union and, and Northern Ireland will leave as a, as a part of it. But there are particular circumstances shaped by, by our history and our, our geography and our economy uh, that we want to see reflected in any ultimate deal. And, and that's something that we would want to be, to be talking very, very early to a new government about. Is it clear to you that you would only do a kind of vote-by-vote vote understanding, or is there any chance that you might consider, consider something more formal with the Conservatives? Well, let, 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 let's see what uh, happens over the next number of hours. But, but clearly, our, our votes are going to be incredibly important in the new Parliament. You're, you're right to point out that in the last Parliament, whilst our, our votes weren't needed in the way that they may be uh, in the new Parliament, we were able to, on, on a range of different issues, take, take a position which was uh, consistent with our principles and our, our policy and our platform as a party, but also that we're in the best interest of the people of Northern Ireland, and we will continue to do that uh, in the new parliament. Can I, can I ask you a, a simple question? Well, it's not a simple question, but it's a straightforward question. You, you're in favour of leaving the EU. What kind of border do you want with the South? We, we, we want to see a, a frictionless border between... Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. There are a lot of uh, movements on a daily basis between people who are uh, working on both sides of the border, a lot of uh, movements in respect of the economy and trade, whilst uh, the, the rest of the UK remains our biggest external sales market. There is an important market, uh, the south of the border So, sorry well. to interrupt you, but so you think people who worry about that border and think that, for instance, in terms of immigration into the UK, it's, a, it's an open door from, from uh, the Republic into the north, they're, they're wrong. It's not, not, a, well, it's not a problem. Well, the, the common travel area has existed between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland since the, the 1920s. That's something that yes, we want indeed. to see continue. Yes. Um, there has been a lot of talk uh, during this, uh, in the last year, and particularly during the, the election yeah. campaign, about a, the creation of a hard border. That's not something that we want to see. And in fact, no, but we were, sorry to interrupt we were... you again, but we're talking about, I mean, people, Polish workers, Romanian workers coming from the EU who at the moment have open access uh, to the mainland of uh, Britain uh, will surely be able to come into the Republic through Northern Ireland and into Britain so that, you know, I know you've had a common border with, with the South, 
but I mean that's going to allow anyone to come from anywhere in Europe into the mainland of, uh, of Britain, isn't it? Into Great Britain. And clearly that's something that would have to, the detail on how that would work in practice is something that would have to be uh, worked out and negotiated through, through the course of uh, the next number of years as, as we, we run through the Article 50 process. Um, but you know, we, we want to see um, a good deal for Northern Ireland as we, we exit the European Union. We were reassured uh, by what the, the Prime Minister, David Davis, and other leading cabinet members said about their desire not to see a hard border. Uh, that's something that we don't want to see. The, the Dublin government don't want to see that either. Brussels uh, officials and politicians have also said that they don't want to see that. And there's a recognition of the particular circum circumstances of Northern Ireland. And that's something that we want to see in, in dealt with uh, early in the new parliament as we enter okay. the, the, these Hamilton, important negotiations. Mr Hamilton, thank you very much for thank joining, you, it, uh, you. joining us at this early hour. Uh, you mentioned David Davies. I should say at this early hour that we have been trying to get Boris Johnson to talk to us. No. David Davis to talk to us. No. Philip Hammond to talk to us. Went to his count. Come and talk to us. No. So senior figures in the Tory party, stumm, unlike Michelle's guests, who are never stumm. <laughs> Michelle. <laughs> David, we can talk about Labour with the uh, benefit of Alistair Campbell, former Downing Street Director of Communications, and The Guardian journalist Paul Mason. Paul, did you dare to hope for these sorts of gains for Labour? Yes, yes. I knew as soon as we uh, did the left-wing manifesto we could get back to 35%. Um, I'm not sure what the final percentage is going to be, but it looks like we're on 12 million votes for Labour, which is pushing close to what um, the first two Tony Blair uh, results were um, and I think what's done it is the severe deprivation across the areas of Britain that are voting for us and let me say that you know this means 12 million people picked up the Daily Mail and the Sun and read these headlines about Corbyn and Macdonald being Marxist terror supporters and threw them mentally in the bin. So it was for you then the anti-austerity election? Absolutely and you know I was campaigning in Plymouth Plymouth, uh, the home of the Trident submarine refit, it, that's where they refurbish the Trident submarines. It looks like Labour's going to win both Plymouth seats because what is more, even to that military community, home of the Royal Marine Commandos, it is absolutely desperate out there in many working class communities and nobody in politics I mean, seems you're making, to have noticed. But you're making it sound like a win, which of course it is no, not. It, of it's, course the it's the Conservatives who are the largest win. party. Uh, Alistair Campbell, what do you think? Well, I think it's been an extraordinary night, um, and I, I do think uh, an election that Theresa May called to strengthen her position, because she looked at the numbers on Jeremy Corbyn in particular and thought, this is unlosable, uh, and she has lost. She has lost big time, and I don't think she can survive for very long in the position that she's got. I do think as well that, uh, that Jeremy Corbyn's onto something in relation to just how deep the austerity is going, and the public saying they want something, they want something better. I think it's important, as you just mentioned, Michelle, it's important to, to emphasise that uh, she has lost and Labour hasn't, hasn't won. won. Uh, and the country essentially is still saying, we don't really want either of you. But they're doing it at a time when the, the A government mm. has to go into the most difficult, complicated negotiations that any government has had since the war. But it means, for your party, it means, does it not, that the Blairism is firmly, I mean, even more firmly in part of the past, that it is Jeremy Corbyn's wing of the party who are entrenched and will lead it for the foreseeable future. Well, I want and hope that the Labour Party can actually encapsulate and encompass all of that space because you, the only way the Labour Party is ever going to get back into winning and having a Labour Prime Minister is if you have that coalition that has the left but also has the centre ground as well. So I think I don't think I want to get over this whole sort of new old Blair yeah, yeah. Brown da da da. Jeremy Corbyn. I think history has put us in an amazing position. Of course we haven't won, and of course we have to facilitate the, a stable Conservative DUP government forming itself because this country is under attack from terror. But oh, so they... that's interesting. So what Jeremy well, Corbyn no, and Emily Thornberry are signalling about, uh, you know, looking as if they're going to try and form a to, government. To form, we don't know what the final arithmetic is. We must stand ready to form a minority government, put that in place. But in the next 12 hours, 
Amber Rudd has to carry on being Home Secretary. Now, I think you're absolutely right that Labour now needs to learn from this, and I would certainly like to see some of those big hitters from the Brown and Blair era come into the Shadow Cabinet, reset the balance within Labour, re-look, possibly, at, um, at what our offer on, on Brexit is. We, we, we've won this committed to Brexit, OK? That's how you win in places like Lee, Manchester, Bolton, committed to Brexit. But the kind of Brexit now, I think, has to be one that embraces an engagement with Europe. She, her, 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 one of her many, many big mistakes is that since the referendum, she has governed for the 48% with two fingers up to the 52%. And you cannot build a position for the country for such a big decision to be pursuing a policy like that. So I do think that what the hung parliament may throw up I don't know what configuration, but actually there will have to be a much more consensual approach to what Britain's relationship with Europe becomes. Thank you both, Alistair Campbell and Paul Mason. David. Thanks, uh, Michelle. Let's uh, join Yvette Cooper in Wakefield. Uh, Yvette Cooper, thank you for joining us at this early hour of the morning and you're <laughs> safely back in your seat in Normanton, Pontefract and Castleford. Um, you, you were one of those who wanted to lead the Labour Party. What do you make of what's happened and what lessons does it contain for people like you on the, on the right or the centre of Labour? Well, I think it's great that we are winning back constituencies for Labour uh, and we've seen the hard work across the country. I think we applaud the work that Jeremy, Tom, the Shadow Cabinet and Labour candidates and members and activists have been doing right across the country to win back those constituencies. We have also had a small number of losses that obviously is very sad for us because I think people like Natasha Engel have been fantastic MPs in Parliament. But overall, we've seen uh, the, some, uh, some great results results. But of course what it leaves now though is it looks like this is a hung parliament. I think that Theresa May called this as a referendum on herself and she has lost that and I really do not see how she can carry on because I don't see that she has a mandate for the manifesto that she set out. That does mean there's going to be quite complicated in terms of what happens now and we've got to I think keep up the pressure uh, in terms of what we should be doing now because obviously you know, what we, we need is to be standing up for people to, to get a Labour government. And you're now happy with Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, are you, when you weren't before? Well, look, we had leadership elections in the parliament, in the, par in the party. That's how we do things in the Labour Party. Jeremy Corbyn won twice in his, um, uh, those leadership elections. And that's why we had the whole party coming together as part of this campaign, the whole party campaigning across the country. I've been to about 20 constituencies across the country campaigning um, for those Labour candidates. And it's great to see many of them elected now tonight, um, this morning, whatever, whatever time of day it is we are in now. What's happening behind you? Who's being applauded? We'd better know, because we can't see. So, yeah. John Trickett was just making his speech. He has just been re-elected as the MP for Hemsworth. The uh, announcement was made uh, just before you started asking me questions. All right. So just, just, uh, just on this one point of it, um, you're now... You're now you, you were wrong about the leadership of Jeremy Corbyn. It turns out that he's a better leader than anybody else you could have produced. And are you happy now to serve in a shadow cabinet with him, indeed, if he becomes Prime Minister, serve in a, serve in a cabinet with him. You're, you're, you're back on side as far as Corbyn goes. I, I think we've all been working together in this election. That is what we have been doing. We have been fighting for every vote. Every single member of the party, every single Labour candidate has been fighting for that, that vote. And we've been doing so together. And that's been really important. That is why I think we have won support right across the country and a real broad range of support as well. I think um, you would uh, certainly agree it would be very presumptuous of me or of anybody else to talk about what happens next. Uh, that is you know, for the leaders of the party. But the one thing that I think should happen next is Theresa May, I do think, cannot carry on as Prime Minister uh, when she has lost what was really a referendum that she called on herself and we haven't seen the strong and stable uh, claims that she made. You know, actually we've seen the complete opposite happen. We've got these really important Brexit, and Brexit negotiations that are due to start in about 11 days. We cannot 
have this carry on the way that the Conservative government was previously trying to do that. There's going to have to be much more transparency. There's going to have to be much more negotiations and discussions in Parliament itself. There's going to have to be a proper, wide open debate about what kind of Brexit uh, Britain and the British government is going to be pursuing. They can't just do things the old ways now and think that they can get away with it after this election result. Yvette Cooper, thank you very much. We've now got 29 seats still to declare, and we are now able, uh, officially, so to speak, to say that there is going to be, at the end, when everything is in, there is going to be a hung parliament. No surprise there, with the Conservatives as the larger party, 318, or the largest party, I should say, Labour on 262. But remember, the Conservatives need 326. So, far from the guaranteeing certainty and stability for the years ahead, Theresa May called this election, and she's lost a 17, what she had at the close of play, 17 majority, in favour of a hung parliament that has her on 300 and 18 only. Jeremy. Well, yes, we're just <laughs> contemplating that inside our virtual parliament. Remembering 2010, when the Conservatives under David Cameron got 306 seats and they needed friends and they looked to the Liberal Democrats and then you had the coalition. What might happen this time? Here is our coalition builder, our little tablet that we've got here. And let me just show you the numbers that are, as, as we were saying with, with John Curtis earlier, remarkably similar to the numbers we gave you right at the start of the whole night. So 318 Conservative and 262 Labour and then the other parties. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just show you how it would work. If the Conservatives say to the DUP, the Democratic Unionists, look, help us, because they haven't got the crucial 326 seats, how does it work? So we take out, first of all, uh, the... Oh, gosh, now I've got to just... Get this thing. How do you get this to light up again? Help me with the technology here for a second. Uh, it's okay. It doesn't matter if we see you. Um, so while you do that, let me explain. Here are all the parties. Thank you. We put the Conservatives 318 out here. Thank you, Brendan. 318. We're looking for 326. It's actually pretty simple now. So we're going to take the DUP and we've got them down as 10 and we add them to it just so we illustrate that they're three. They're there. They're 328. It's pretty, pretty close, isn't it? And it's very, very painful for Theresa May. But it is that simple thing of saying to the DUP, will you help us? For Theresa May to reach out and ask them, it's maybe not coalition, maybe it's a working arrangement, at least get the Queen's speech through. Of course, that arrangement then involves all kinds of trades having to be made and so on. And Yvette Cooper there saying there's going to be a lot more focused on what is said and done in and around the chamber of the House of Commons. But there we are. It could be done. It's a pretty simple calculation. They got close enough to the line to only need the support of the DUP. Let's just see what this looks like inside the House of Commons. Here we go. So... There we are. We had the Conservatives short, didn't we? 318. You can see the finishing line here. 326 seats needed for an overall majority. They haven't made it. It's a hung parliament. They use the DUP to just go across the line. And then just take a look at the opposition benches as well. So Labour on 262 and the SNP on 35. A bad night for them. The Liberal Democrats recovering a bit. You can see the other parties. We've filled out the Northern Ireland parties for you now. Um, Labour, though, exceeding all expectations in this election. If you have a whirl around the House of Commons, you'll see it is dominated, as before, by blue. But, of course, the crucial thing, the action around this line, this 326 line down here, is the problem for Mrs May, and that is why she's going to need help to pass laws and govern, if indeed she stays in power. David. And if, and if she doesn't stay in power, for those who like a little bit of the history, at uh, 20 to 6 in the morning. Um, she'll <laughs> be the you. shortest you, term Prime Minister since Andrew Bonalore, the Conservative Prime Minister, who served, I think, 209 days from 1922 to 1923. Did, and she has done 330 days. So it's a, a pretty dismal Something record. Around like that. that seems discussion. more. But anyway, it's nothing to be proud of. Nothing to be proud of, certainly. And the absolutely upside down version of what she thought was going to happen. She was expecting to be the first Conservative leader for 30 years to have a proper Conservative majority. You know, don't forget, David Cameron only made coalition in 2010 and then in 2015 had a puny majority. But this is the upside-down version of what Theresa May was anticipating. I'll ask you a thing, though, about that. Yeah. Why, at the beginning of the campaign, mm -hmm. I remember there were a lot of mm -hmm. uh, opinion polls which said that people 
infinitely preferred mm -hmm. her mm -hmm. to Jeremy Corbyn by quite big margins. By even, huge if they margins. Didn't, even if they didn't like mm -hmm. the Conservative Party, mm -hmm. they liked, and people assumed it was her style they liked. They liked her not being flashy. They liked her not doing, not being as flashy as David Cameron, showing his toes off on an Instagram with his <laughs> wife on a holiday. She wasn't that kind of woman. She no. was very private. She went on the one show and she revealed nothing except that he put out the dustbins. And we and, heard... And people like that they sort of rectitude and, and then changed their minds. Well, we heard that on the doorsteps, absolutely. People seemed to say, oh, she's not like those other Tories. She's not a posh boy like he was. People used to say to us things like, oh, she's like your kid's head teacher. Oh, Mrs May's coming in. Everybody stands up a bit straighter, do up your tie. She was calm, she had authority. I think one of the things that really hurt was not just the social care policy and the manifesto that frankly panicked a lot of elderly conservative voters, probably largely due to the presentation, not the actual policy of it. And panicked her. Panicked her, and then she changed her mind. So that idea that she was stable, that she was resolute, that she had authority, was hugely holed by the fact that she did a new turn on her own manifesto within days. That had never happened before. Secondly, I think the issue of police cuts in the wake of the terror attacks came riling up the rails in the closing days of the campaign. And just as you might normally have expected the Conservatives to respond, to the, uh, the electorate to respond much more positively to the Conservatives on security, it's traditionally a plus for them, in reverse, it appears to have gone the, uh, the other way. So again, on the result, but on the sort of reaction of the campaign, it's a topsy-turvy election in that sense. It was weird that the uh, the turnabout on the uh, the care for mm. people in their homes, because it was absolutely clear reading the manifesto mm -hmm. that what she was saying was you can keep your last mm -hmm. hundred thousand pounds, mm -hmm. uh, but you'll pay for your the rest of your care. There was no mention you won't have to pay more than. 75,000. There was no mention of it at all. And yet when they suddenly said, oh, no, we will put that in, so you'll, you can keep 100 and you won't have to pay more than 75 or whatever it was they'd come up with in their commission, she just couldn't bring herself to say it was a change. And I think that it's not... Exactly. I mean, you say the old people may not have been, you know, too worried about it, but it was just the fact that she... Clearly, everybody knew she changed her position. I think one, one thing always, the public are very much more forgiving than Westminster is of the concept of a U-turn. Yes. If you front up to it, you know, in human life, normal psychology, everybody makes mistakes, everybody changes your mind, fine, you put your hands up and you say that's what happened. Theresa May stood there at repeated press conferences, answering question after question, saying, nothing's changed, nothing's changed. Now, we all knew that something's changed. We reported that something had changed. The public completely knew that something had changed, and that undermined her brand of not being like the rest of so, the so, so what is it with this Nick Timothy and Fiona Hill that they, they can, you know, take her on one side and say, don't give way, whatever you do, which is presumably what they were doing? Well, I think also she will have felt that. I mean, I think, you know, they are a... They are a, a core trio who have worked together very tightly for years and years and years. But I think to present her as not being able to make her own mind up is unfair. And in her last couple of years at the Home Office, actually, the two of them had already left and gone on to other things. So I think sometimes, you know, the story is too tempting to imagine there's a politician who's purely having their strings pulled by people behind the scenes. But I think the thing about Theresa May is she's extremely self-contained. She doesn't trust people easily. Now, since the moment she moved into number 10, people have been saying things like, she'll have to broaden her circle. You can run that kind of tight ship if you're in a department. If you're in number 10 with things flying at you from every direction, you have to be nimble. Now, what we saw in this, ca in this campaign, that was the one thing that Theresa May seemed to be not capable of doing, was being nimble. In the next 24 hours, if she's to survive, she's certainly going to need to be nimble. Now, I understand in the last half hour, she's been talking to Tory staff in CCHQ. Apparently, her mood was calm, somber. She didn't directly address the issue of her future. She didn't say, I'm going to stay, we will all carry on together. The implication, of course, of her not mentioning it is that she hasn't made up her mind, which puts All right. the chance Let of resignation on the table. Well, I'll come to you in, in a second, because I know you've got some stuff for us, but I just want to do this. Uh, this is a list of seats still to declare. Just have a look at this. And the Tories have to win all of these bar one. All of these bar one. There's the list. 
Asheville Basin. So the, the little colors are the uh, who, who control them. These are all being counted at the moment. They've taken Devon West there. And they've got to take all of them bar one. If they lose two, it's a hung parliament. So that's why we're forecasting a hung parliament on this basis. Those are the ones that are still to come in. So, Amal, what, what reactions well, have you got? You've got well, some more social not, not media just, not for just, us. Not just on social media, but... Uh, not just social media. I think we just missed the social media. No, no, no. We're texting relentlessly. And, oh, right. uh, okay. I just texted a Tory MP, asked a very simple question. Uh, a former minister, can she survive? And the uh, response... Who was, who that, was that? I'm not going to tell you that, David. Oh, okay, that would be yeah. betraying a source. But the response that came back was very simple and very quick. They doubt it. And we've got to remember, David, of course, as, as Laura's been reporting and discussing, this was an election that was called about a single issue, which was Brexit. Theresa May wanted a uh, mandate uh, to go ahead and negotiate with, um, with conviction. But it's clear, looking at stuff that we are seeing on social media, that the people who back Remain, uh, people who were uh, brandished Ramonas by the tabloid press, uh, are very much emboldened. One of we them have a declaration Ed coming Miliband. from Asheville. Let's go there. I'll come back to you in a moment. The Piero Gloria Labour Party, 21,285. Harper Anthony, commonly known as Tony Harper, the Conservative Party candidate, 20,844. Ranji Aranjit Singh, commonly known as Aran Ranji, Green Party candidate, 398. Turner Gale, Ashfield Independence, putting people before politics, 4,612. <laughs> Young, Young Raymond, commonly known as Ray Young, UK Independence Party, UKIP, 1,885. The number of ballot papers rejected was as follows. The once an official mark He's there since 2010, uh, a former political, uh, political correspondent for, for television, and um, one once described as Tony Blair's favourite broadcaster, has held on to Ashfield. And uh, the previous majority was 8,000 or so, and this majority is uh, down to... I can't see what the figure is. Down the hundreds, anyway, 400 or so, yes. But anyway, Ashfield has been held. Ashfield in Nottinghamshire. Good. So just... Yeah, I was just saying, the, the Remainers, uh, dubbed Ramonas, people like Ed Miliband, uh, were meant to be vanquished by this election. The idea that Therese May had was that by getting a big mandate, she'd be able to uh, scupper their ambitions. But actually, these guys are massively, massively happy about this result. Ed Miliband has put out a message in the last few hours, uh, last hour or so, saying, we know Theresa May can't now negotiate Brexit for Britain because she told us losing majority would destroy her authority and it has. So pretty brutal stuff uh, from Ed Miliband. And there are lots of other people who are, uh, if you like, famous, uh, almost celebrity uh, opponents of Brexit. Simon Sharma, the historian, is one of them. He's just put out a message saying, hard Brexit is dead, May is on life support, democracy alive and kicking, a great thing. What we've got to remember, I think, is that we're going to have a very complex set of battles inside the Conservative Party and inside the House of Commons over the next few days and weeks. But that's not the only battle. Because the other European countries, the other 27 members of the European Union, will be looking at this result. I think they agreed with Theresa May's analysis. Had she had a big increase in her majority, she'd have had a stronger bargaining position. Mm. Now it's much weaker. Mm -hmm. So I think it's whoever is running the government over the next few weeks and months mm -hmm. is going to find it much harder to get any form of deal out of the other 27 Indeed, members of the EU. But if their mandate is weaker here, and the Tory party is still mm. the largest party, and whether it's Theresa May or anywhere else, the biggest... Uh, the, the strongest contingent in the, in, the, in the Conservative Party are the Eurosceptics. Yes. So then, right. with a weaker mandate, they're potentially more likely to be able to push her around right. and before, therefore a harder Brexit is in further, theory back on the table. Right. Let's, you know, let's it's hear, very complicated. Let's hear from a Tory party, a man who contended until he dropped out for the um, Conservative Party leadership, Stephen Crabb, who's held his Welsh seat in Difford by um, only 300, just over 300, down from, well, down from 5,000 5, or so. Uh, Mr. Crabb, thank you for joining us. Now, uh, tell us what you think of the state of affairs for your party and which direction it should now go in. 
Well, I've not been able to follow fully the unfolding results during the course of the night or what the current state of the arithmetic is of what the new, of what the new parliament will be. But clearly, something has gone awry here. We set out on this election campaign wanting to provide the country with more stability, more unity ahead of the Brexit negotiations. And we're emerging with a situation in parliament where there's more divisions uh, and, and, as I say, less stability. So we clearly need to take stock of what's gone on and think about what these big overarching challenges are with the Brexit negotiations, but probably take some time to rethink what is the correct approach in the, in the, in the national interest. Can the Prime Minister hang on? Well, absolutely she can. And as I said, I don't know what the, the current state of affairs are with the uh, number of seats being won. But if she is the leader of the largest party, then I think there's a duty upon her as Prime Minister to seek to form uh, a, a viable government. And uh, the last thing that we should be doing right now, while the, the election results are still coming in, is calling for more political turbulence and knee-jerk decisions and, and reactions. No, we need to be calm about this. Uh, Theresa May clearly is, 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 understands the, the, serious of, the seriousness of the situation. But what we need to avoid is, is any hasty decisions being made that add to the instability and the turbulence. All right, well, leave aside the leadership for a moment. In terms of policy, you're a, you're a staunch Remainer, I think is correct to say. You were a Remainer. You, you don't want to see uh, Britain leave the EU in, you know, in difficult circumstances and uh, go into the World Trade Organization and possibly suffer in that way. Do you think this election will have a salutary effect on the decisions that are made about Brexit from your point of view as a Remainer? Well, let's be clear. I voted for Remain, but I completely understood the result of the referendum last year and recognised the need to strike a, a pragmatic and realistic Brexit position. Uh, now, for me, it, I think it is important that we avoid falling back on this um, you know, quite hard-edged Brexit, relying on World Trade Organization rules. And I think, yes, you know, one of the messages from the results tonight will be that the government needs to seek a, a, kind of a very balanced, pragmatic approach, strike that deal with the European Union if we can. And ideally, what we need to be thinking about, given that it's unlikely there's going to be one party with an overall majority, we need to be trying to forge as much cross-party consensus on this as possible. Stephen Crabb, thank you very much. And while you were talking, we were watching Zach Goldsmith down at Richmond Park, where there appear to have been one or two, uh, two recounts, I think. He's looking very chirpy. That's him, the blonde fellow in the background there, um, who's fighting the Conservative cause against the Liberal Democrats who took over his seat in a by-election. But uh, let's hear from our reporter down there, if we can. We can't. So now we'll leave, uh, we'll leave him there, mulling over whatever it is that's happened, and go to North East Fife, difficult to interpret people's faces. Uh, we've now lost North East Fife as well. We seem to have lost everywhere just for the moment. But um, I'm sure everyone will come back in time and find us here. Um, all right, so we've got a hung parliament, we mm -hmm. think. We've mm -hmm. got, we went through those seats, there are mm -hmm. 20 to go now, mm -hmm. and Tories are on 306, mm -hmm. and we're saying they're going to end up at 318, 318, 318 at the moment, yes. yeah, the latest update. Yes. Is it time to remind ourselves what happens in a hung parliament? It is, I'm sure it is. <laughs> Nothing better. The technical rules. So the question, who governs is in, and is in charge while it's resolved? Well, the incumbent prime minister is still in office, just as they have been. Um, she will get whatever happens with the Tory party, the government in power gets the first chance to form a government. Yes. If they can't do that, and they try to put something forward to the Commons and it falls, then the prime minister has to resign. Now, we may not get to that territory, all these conversations going on inside You're the You're going Tory to have party. to leave your lecture. I have to just leave my rules. Yes, oh, dear. leave your rules. I know you've had oh, them dear. carefully prepared. And we I go know. to Southampton <laughs> Test, <laughs> where uh, Labour held Southampton All Test, majority of 3,800. Party candidate, 16,006. <laughs> if Labour holds this one, it's a hung parliament. Morell, independent, 680. <laughs> Andrew Douglas Pope, Southampton Independence, 816. Alan Patrick Vincent Whitehead, Labour Party, 27,500. <laughs>
<laughs> well, I think that's it. He's increased his majority, so it is a hung parliament. Uh, they had to take that one, the Tories, if they were to avoid, if they had any chance of reaching 326. They now don't. We forecast a hung parliament. It now is a hung parliament. Well, this is the moment officially where we can say Theresa May's gamble no, has one, absolutely two, spectacularly backfired. The she has the lost the majority that she inherited from David followers. Cameron. She herself now is in a and vulnerable Bell, political position at a time when the country, whoever's in charge, faces the most complicated political task in decades. Astonishing. You can go back, I think, to reading your rules. <laughs> so, so let's just take it bit by bit. So the Prime Minister is still entitled. She does, does she go to the palace? No. There's been an election. Does she go to the palace? No. She is Prime Minister. She doesn't have to go and... I think she will still go to the palace. There well, still have to be the formal request after a general election. To, to be Prime... OK. So then she goes back to the House of Commons. A vote of confidence or what? Well, that would be up, as I understand it, that would be up to the 1922 committee if somebody forced a vote of no confidence. But what would but you the, do as Prime Minister? What will she do? She's the, got to show the, she's got Parliament the, behind her. The first move would be to put forward what she plans to do. Parliament is set at its state opening to have them on the 19th of June, so she would try to put forward a Queen's speech. And then, essentially, you dare the other parties to vote you down. Now, it may not be in my senses that things are moving so fast that we might not even get there. But technically, the largest party is entitled to put forward a Queen's speech and see what the other parties make of it. Now, on these numbers, it may be that if Theresa May makes it through the Tory grinder up <coughs> until that point, that the DUP coming on board, that her Queen's speech would go through and then she could carry on. I mean, fatally, you know, very much damaged, but still in charge and still with the technical wheels of government, in theory, going to, but going it, to move. It, yes, but when, uh, it, it's too straightforward just to say she's got to, get, she's got to get it through Parliament because the other parties, the opposition parties, might not want to force uh, another election, for instance, now, or indeed to try and form another government. So they can hold back, they can abstain, there are all sorts of ways. They can do all sorts of things. To keep her there. Indeed. And while the rules are, of course, in her own juice absolute for a bit. letter, she's already hoist herself on her own patar. Oh, there we are. Two rule out these metaphors. Ten to you know, six. Five to six. Exactly. But Streaming from us. I think the point is that the rules are there and they are relevant and they, and they do create the backdrop of all of this. But the political mood is far more important. You know, where there's a will, there's a way. If the party allows her to stay and she thinks she wants to, and she thinks that she's up for it, and she wants to carry on when she's so damaged, then maybe she can. But somebody in 11 days' time has to go and start talking to Mr Barnier about, about, about leaving. Mm -hmm. So who does that? I mean... Well, if Theresa May stays on, you would assume that it would be David Davis if he doesn't get moved to some other kind of job. David but it's going to be quite an astonishing thing where whoever it is turns up opposite opposing the, uh, the other 27 countries around the table. Emily has more results for us, so let's keep track of these results. We know it's now a hung parliament, but let's see the ones that have come in, Emily, can we? Well, I'm just wondering if we're starting to feel the pace of the shy remainder in some of these results. This is Chipping Barnet in London, uh, the North London suburbs, showing although that Theresa Villiers has uh, kept the seat, look at this swing, again, away from her towards Labour, of 6.9%, I think slightly more than that. Same sort of direction as the one we saw with Justin Greening in Putney. Yeah. Uh, they're holding on here. Uh, Dumfriesia is one of the ones that's uh, been held for the Conservatives here. And you can see uh, Conservatives on 49% share of the vote. Uh, an 8.9% move towards the uh, Conservatives, away from the SNP. It does start to look like, at this point, uh, a rejection of independence, whether you're talking about that Scottish referendum or maybe a start of the, uh, the, the shy Remain vote in England. Look at this, a Conservative gain from the SNP. We've seen some extraordinary swings here in Scotland, some of 20%. This isn't as big, but it's still pretty hefty, an 11-point swing towards the Conservatives, uh, away from the SNP. So these are some of the ones that are coming through now. Uh, even when you see the holds, the hold, for example, the one you were talking about, Southampton Itchin, let's have a look at that change. The UKIP vote, once again, very, very deeply down. Labour making those gains which hold uh, the seat for the Conservatives here. So we're starting to see, certainly in Scotland, 
that real rejection, I think, of independence with all the parties taking away from the SNP. Will we start to interpret the same sort of movement in some of the gains that Labour's making from the Conservatives? So, Emily, I mean, it could be that this election result, one of the effects will be to give hope to the 48% who voted Remain in the referendum last summer, that they'll think, well, the... now there is something to play for again. Well, you've heard the Remainers tonight say, you know, this was the 48% that felt forgotten. Everyone was talking about the left behinds being the Brexiteers, the people that went for Brexit. Perhaps over the course of this year, the Remainers are the ones that have felt that their voice have been ignored and it is starting to come through in this sort of election. Interestingly, but yes, David, that, this is the, uh, the voice of the shy Remainers, but they haven't decamped en masse to the Lib Dems. It was, of course, the Lib Dem strategy to really relentlessly target that 48% in the hope that they would all come over to the, uh, the yellow uh, uh, column, really but that's not happened. Well, uh, mathematically now, I don't know why we say mathematically, because it's all numbers anyway, isn't it? The, uh, the 326 seats in the new House that the Tories needed, if they would have a majority, even a, a, a minuscule majority, it is now impossible. So, it is a hung parliament. So, the Conservatives have 309 seats, Labour 258. There's no way the Conservatives can go to 326. That is how it is at the moment with those declared. Of course, the other parties were not showing there, the SNP and the Northern Irish parties and Plaid Cymru. And the Green, I don't think we've even mentioned whether the Green um, won in Brighton. I think we're still waiting for, the, waiting for that Green result to come through. Um, Caroline Lucas in Brighton. So that's how things are, though. It is a hung parliament, and that's the story. And it's taken us from 10 o'clock, uh, when it was quite astonishing to get the exit poll, to now, just before 6 o'clock, to be absolutely certain that that's how things are. Peter. Um, David, in the light of the refer referendum a year ago, there, were, there was Scotland doing one thing, London doing one thing, and the rest of England and Wales. It's like that. Tonight, um, these are three quite different operations. In Scotland, a massive swing from SNP to Conservative, essentially. In London, a huge swing to Labour, especially in the Tory marginals. The rest of England and Wales, a small swing to Labour. So I think, once again, the shadow of Brexit and the referendum is, is, is telling in these, in these results. It goes to one thing. A while ago, Southgate, amazing, gone back to Labour. But, you know, the th remarkable thing about that, it was actually in line with all the other Conservative marginals in London. The surprising thing about Southgate is it was not a surprise in terms of what was happening in London tonight. Uh, it's six o'clock, and some of you will have had your alarm clocks just uh, ring in your ears and wake you up, having wisely not stayed up for the whole night to watch this thing through. Uh, but we'll be wanting to know what's happened. And uh, the news is, from the BBC election centre, that it is a hung parliament. That Theresa May, having gone there to get the, what she called a certainty and stability for the years ahead, has totally failed. Uh, she had a majority of 17 when this election was called a few weeks back. She now doesn't have a majority at all. So from her point of view, it's a total disaster. It was a call she made and it, it fell flat. That's how things are and we are for the next uh, hour and then for the rest of the day indeed discussing the ramifications of this because of course there are all sorts of ramifications whether she stays in office what happens on policy 11 days from now we have to start discussing with the eu the terms of brexit so that's uh, if you're yawning and about to do your morning exercises that's the news for you and let's join michelle David, up here on uh, the balcony perch with me are two people whose job it is to take messages like this and decipher them into newsprint and onto the airways as well. Daniel Finkenside of The Guardian and Andrew Ronsley of The Observer. Let's start with that point that they touched on a, a moment ago. Do you think, Andrew, this was the voice of the shy Remainer coming back? Well, I said a bit earlier in the evening, I did think there was an element of the angry Remainer who had been rather ignored for most of the campaign, expressing itself in some of the results. But there's a lot to this result, but the big headline is this is the most stunning reversal of fortunes. I mean, I take you back just a month ago, at the time of the local elections, it now appears to be the Jurassic era, Labour was absolutely hammered at those elections, and many of its own MPs were talking about it having a worse result than the 1983 general election. 
fast forward to now, I mean, stunningly better result for Labour and Jeremy Corbyn than most expected, including me, I'm the first to admit, and most of his MPs. Now, some of that down, obviously, to the dreadful Conservative campaign, but credit where it's due, Labour has obviously run a very, very effective campaign, confounding so many expectations. I mean, until one minute to ten last night, there were many Labour MPs waiting to come out and anticipating a dreadful drubbing, and some of them who've actually appeared on this programme over the course of the evening, preparing perhaps to launch leadership campaigns. Well, all that's for the birds now. <laughs> Daddy, can I yes. apologise? I think I said The Guardian a moment ago, obviously <laughs> I meant The Times. The Times. Um, what do you think this was about? Well, I think we're all going to concentrate on Theresa May falling short in her gamble, but we shouldn't miss what is really the big driver of this, which is that Jeremy Corbyn did vastly better than people had expected, yeah. than they had analysed. His idea, the Corbynite idea was, you know, Ed Miliband didn't energise people beyond the ordinary people who vote in elections. We can do that with a new message. And everybody uh, outside of their group thought that was an eccentric theory, it wouldn't happen, and they were right and we were wrong. And that is one of the big drivers of the election. So people thought Labour would get 30% and it got above 40 per cent, and no-one saw that coming. And that, I think, is a bigger feature of the election. Now, why would that happen? Well, one of the reasons is obviously Remain uh, versus Leave. Another reason, though, is that when David Cameron had the election in 2015, real income growth was going up, and Theresa May has held an election where real income growth is going down. Everything in political science tells you that if you make... You've got to make the election about something else. She tried to make it about... Um, the Brexit negotiations, but it ended up being a lot about austerity. And I'd add a bit to that austerity, and I think one of the things we've seen... I mean, not, we have to stress, with a, an election-winning number of voters for, for Labour. I mean, the Conservatives still got a slightly bigger share of the vote and more seats. But I think, obviously, Mr Corbyn and his team were right. They seem to have been proved correct in latching on to the idea that after seven years, a lot of the public is heartily sick of austerity. And even if it didn't perhaps buy or think plausible the whole Labour programme, yeah, it did at least sound to them hopeful. I mean, it is important to say Labour did... Not much could have been done then. That's by, true. Look, we are, we are dealing with expectations. One of the things that is also worth noting is Labour did not actually win the election. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and, <laughs> and, and, it sort of must be. And, like it and I think, yes, moment. of course it does. And, and, of, and so the, the really interesting question is, is there a way of taking the excitement that Jeremy Corbyn brought, brings to the campaign and linking it with a feeling that they could actually govern, which would then produce the extra votes that would allow them to actually win a majority yeah. themselves. Because, because it is important not to be carried away by expectations and think Labour won the election. In fact, in circumstances where you know, the economy was going backwards, where there was a Remain feeling, of course they fell short. So we need to analyse that too. Yeah. What are you hearing from within the party about well, Theresa May's future? You know, I, actually at this point, because everyone's busy, I'm not particularly hearing one, one way or another, but obviously if you have fight an election and you do it because you want a mandate and you don't get the mandate, that obviously puts your position in question. The problem for the Conservative Party is... There's no majority in the Conservative Party that would then command a majority on Brexit in the Commons, where the Commons and in the Lords, actually, where the Commons and Lords would go on Brexit and where the Conservative Party would go is different. And so it's difficult to win the leadership on a platform which may allow you to govern... I think the there's also the personal factor with the, Mrs May. I'm not going to claim I can read her mind, but I've watched other... Prime Ministers go through this sort of thing. I mean, David Cameron had it with the referendum. He'd said pre the referendum result he wouldn't resign as Prime Minister. He woke up that morning, he realised what a demolition of his authority it was and that he couldn't really carry on plausibly in those circumstances. And she will obviously be considering the people closest to her, no doubt most of all her yeah, husband. Yeah. Actually, even if my party, enough of them, want me to carry on, would it be worth it? I mean, can I, having tried to sell, sell myself in this way and been rejected by the people, um, do I want to try and go on hand to mouth, knowing that a lot of my party are absolutely furious with me, having to cut day by day deals with the Ulster? Not a very attractive prospect. I wonder about that, yes. Thank you both, Andrew Rawnsley and Daniel Finkenstein. Let's now just turn for a moment to the Green Party. Now, the Green Party has, in effect, only one candidate with a chance of winning. She's already at the dissolution, an MP. It is, of course, Caroline Lucas, co-leader of the Greens in Brighton Pavilion. It is just worth thinking for a moment, though, for those people who voted Green, that if she does get in, and we'll just get her results in a moment, over half a million people voted Green, 
So she represents half a million of the electorate. 13 million over 30 million voted Conservative and get 310 seats. Uh, 12 and a half vote Labour and get 258. Uh, 2 million or so the Liberals and they get uh, Liberal Democrats and they get 12. Under half a million and the SNP get 34. And over half a million and the Greens get one. Just uh, worth reflecting on. And let's go and get the result from Brighton Pavilion and see whether she did actually right, win Ford, to represent those people. Give notice that the number of votes for each candidate at the election of a member of Parliament in the Brighton Pavilion constituency are as follows. Ian Verdun Buchanan, UK Independence Party, 630. Solomon Curtis, Labour Party, 15,450. <laughs> Caroline Lucas, Green Party, 30,149. Yeah! Emma Warman, Conservative nice Party, 11,082. Nick Yeomans, Independent, 376. The number of ballot papers rejected was as follows. Want of official mark, zero. Voting for more than one permitted number, 18. Mark identifying voter, three. Unmarked or uncertain, 133. The total number of rejected votes was 154. The turnout was 76.62%. And I hear so Caroline I Lucas has Caroline increased her majority. She's up by 6,722 6, 6, at nearly 15,000, a majority of nearly 15,000. Here she is, the co-leader of the Green Thank Party. Thank you so much. Thank you to Jeff Raw, the returning officer, and all his amazing staff tonight. Thank you to the other candidates. Thank you to my really amazing campaign team and the legion of volunteers who did so much in this campaign going well, well beyond the call of duty. And I want to say a huge thank you, particularly to Matt Trainey, to Gabriel Davies, to Rob Shepard, my campaign manager, to Steve Harris, my agent, and just to all of you. You've just been so truly fantastic. Thank you so, so much. Thank you to my amazing family, as ever, who are always with me on every step of the way. And most of all, thank you to the wonderful people of Brighton Pavilion, whom it has been such an honor and privilege to serve. Thank you for putting your faith in me again. So Caroline Lucas the campaign, the Green Party winning her run. seat uh, in Brighton United Pavilion, winning, winning that seat back again. At this point, ten past six, uh, time I think for some news. Uh, the dawn has broken on a fine day and my goodness, down there in those few square miles around Westminster, the people who are coming back there now, the people in Downing Street, the people at Tory party head office, at the Labour Party offices, Yak, 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 trying to decide what on earth to do <laughs> as a result. And of course, all our BBC yak, yak, yakers are going down there too, <laughs> including, I'm afraid to say, Laura Kunzberg is going to leave us in a moment shortly, to go down there yes, and stand shortly. outside number 10 and tell not, us what's going not on. Not quite yet, but shortly, because shortly. at some point, Theresa May will come out. expect her to come out. At yes. some point, or arrive back, or I'm not quite sure where she, if she's back in there already or if she's still at Conservative Central Office, but it's on mornings like this that back entrances to official buildings come into their own. And we've not yet <laughs> seen Theresa May at the Conservative Central Office. Do you remember Margaret Thatcher used to wave, yeah. wave from the window? Well, would you come out and wave well, from well, the window? Well, that, the well, well John Major so. in defeat was yes. televised making a live speech to the staff, a very gracious speech, when he was lost in 97. Um, it's normal for to go back to the Central Office. It's not normal for them to go completely hidden away. Mm. Westminster Abbey, um, the... East End there, and the Union flag flying over the House of Lords. Sumptuous view, early June morning here in London. So, let us now not be deflected any further by the beauty of this scene of London in the dawn, and let us instead have the news. The latest news now, with Louise Minchin. Hello, good morning. Uh, Theresa May's decision to call a snap general election has backfired and there will be a hung parliament. With only a handful of seats left to declare, the Conservatives have lost their majority. Labour has done better than expected and Jeremy Corbyn has called for Theresa May to resign. The Prime Minister says the country needs stability. The night saw both Alex Salmond and Nick Clegg lose their seats. Our political correspondent Tom Bateman's report contains flash photography. 
She called this election early, a political gamble, the hope that she would transform the Tories' fragile advantage in Parliament with a huge win. But the smiles of the campaign trail have vanished. Forecasts suggest the Conservatives may end up even worse off without even a majority. If, as the indications have shown, if this is correct, that the Conservative Party has won the most seats and probably the most votes, uh, then it will be incumbent on us to ensure that we have that period of stability, and that is exactly what we will do. And you can see what the Labour leader makes of these results so far, a man whose campaign confounded many expectations, beaming smiles, with Labour on course for a far better night than many thought. The Prime Minister called the election because she wanted a mandate. Well, the mandate she's got is lost Conservative seats, lost votes, lost support and lost confidence. I would have thought that's enough to go, actually. Cordova is duly elected. In Battersea, Labour have ousted a government minister on a swing of 10%. There have been Labour gains elsewhere, in Stockton South from the Conservatives and in Scotland, Rutherglen from the SNP. And just look what the mood was like during the count in Hastings. The Home Secretary, Amber Rudd, only just scraped home by 346 votes. Labour Party, 21,000. It's not just the Tories suffering. In Sheffield, the Lib Dems' former leader, Nick Clegg, has lost his seat. I, of course, have encountered this evening something that many people have encountered before tonight and I suspect many people will encounter after tonight, which is, in politics, you live by the sword and you die by the sword. The nights began with a projection, the exit poll. This morning, with most seats counted, the BBC forecast has the Conservatives as the largest party, but short of an overall majority. Labour are on course to increase their number of seats by around 30. The SNP have lost big names on a disappointing night compared with their Scottish landslide two years ago. Their deputy leader, Angus Robertson, was ousted by the Conservatives and their former leader, Alex Salmond, lost his seat too. Now, one of Theresa May's own MPs is laying the blame on her. I think she's in a very difficult place. She's a, a remarkable and she's a very talented woman uh, and she doesn't shy from difficult decisions, but she now has to obviously consider her position. The festival of democracy has been on full show, as have the upsets. Now, an unpredictable journey for Theresa May as dawn breaks on renewed political uncertainty. As she arrives at her party HQ, she knows there are those saying this result should bring the end of the road for her premiership. The seating arrangement in this place has changed significantly, all because Theresa May asked you to decide. Now she has the answer. Tom Bateman, BBC News. The pound has fallen sharply as traders react to the results of the general election. Overnight, sterling suffered one of its biggest falls since January, sinking at one point to a low of almost 2% against the dollar and the euro. A clearer picture of the markets will continue to emerge when trading opens across Europe. In other news, detectives investigating the terror attack at London Bridge, in which eight people died, have made another arrest. A 29-year-old man was detained in East London, bringing the total number of people in custody to five. Twelve others who were arrested on Sunday were later released without charge. Another man arrested on suspicion of drugs and firearms offences has been bailed. The Trump administration has denied allegations made by the sacked director of the FBI, James Comey, that the president tried to impede an investigation into Russian interference in last year's presidential election. Mr Trump's lawyer said Mr Comey's testimony finally confirmed publicly that the president was not under investigation as part of any probe into alleged Russian Bombs political meddling. He's also called for Mr Comey to be prosecuted for leaking his notes to the press. Mr Comey has now admitted that he is one of these leakers. Today, Mr Comey admitted that he unilaterally and surreptitiously made unauthorized disclosures to the press of privileged communications with the president. Back to election news in just a couple of moments after an update on the weather from Matt Taylor. Good morning.
Good morning, Louise. Thank you very much. Well, overall, a sunny story for most of you today, though it will be a bit cloudy and damp in northern Scotland. But if you are heading out, grab a brolly just in case. There will be some showers in the forecast, mainly across western England and Wales at the moment. You can see the persistent rain in northern Scotland, even that will fizzle. But the showers do move eastwards through the day and into the afternoon across some central and eastern parts. They could become heavy. The odd rumble of thunder, some hail mixed in. But some good gaps between the showers. Many will spend the afternoon, particularly in the west, dry. And with a bit more sunshine than yesterday, it'll probably feel just a touch warmer. Temperatures could hit 22, 23 in the southeast corner. Tonight's temperatures will hold up because clouds spilling in once again, bringing rain through the night in Northern Ireland and then into parts of Scotland, Northern England and Wales for the start of Saturday. Northern Ireland brightens up for Saturday. Scotland rain on and off through the morning, a little bit drier into the afternoon. Driest, brightest of, of all will be across parts of the Midlands, East Anglia and South East. And quite a humid day tomorrow. could hit around 23 to 25 degrees. As for Sunday, driest again in the southeast corner, sunshine and showers. Further north and west, and it will feel a little bit cooler compared with Saturday. Back to you, Louise. Oh, thanks very much, Matt. Uh, time now to hand you back to David Dimbleby. Welcome back to the BBC's Election Centre. Where is the Prime Minister and what is she up to? Ben Wright is outside Tory party headquarters and can explain everything. Ben, good morning. Uh, good morning, David. Well, we believe she's now in number 10, having spent quite a long time here at Tory HQ, mulling over what to do next, thinking about her options. She did talk to Tory staffers just before she left, just briefly. Uh, I understand that she said things will change, uh, things will be different, but the Tories will continue to be a party that works for everyone. I'm told there was no mention by the Prime Minister about her own intentions, whether she'll stay or go. Um, the source in there told me that her mood was down, sombre, but calm. Uh, and then I'm told that she has left here and gone to Downing Street. There are a trickle of Tory party staffers trudging out, looking pretty desolate. They thought this would be a morning of jubilation and celebration. I was with uh, the Tory battle bus as it went around the country this week, visiting Labour held seats with big Labour majorities that they thought would all be turning blue this morning. None of them were expecting what we've seen unfold. Uh, things will change, meaning, well, Laura Kunzberg here has been talking about things, you know, that she would have to change the way she does things. Could that be what she meant, or do you think she meant things will change, you may not have me around anymore? I think it's more likely to be the former. She will be well aware that as this campaign has progressed, there has been a growing uh, degree of frustration, anger, I think, within... Uh, the Tory party ranks, the parliamentary conservative ranks, about how she runs the show, how this campaign was conducted. I think there is real anger, not just about social care and how that policy was sort of unravelled within a couple of days and had to be amended, but also the offerings on uh, pension of benefits, on the triple lock on pensions, on the repeated mantra that all Britain needed was strong and stable leadership, a campaign built entirely around Theresa May. There was a lot of disquiet, particularly in the last couple of weeks, about how this whole campaign uh, had been run and what it said about the way that Theresa May runs her inner circle. So I think there have already been demands within the party for that to change. And I think uh, had she won this election comfortably and carried on uh, in the months and years ahead as Prime Minister, I think she would have been forced to make some changes on that front. That may be what she was referring to when she said that. But Ben, you, uh, you say you're on the campaign bus. And I know there was a lot of talk about, for instance, Jeremy Corbyn would go and speak to 1,000, 2,000 people, and she would go, it was always being described in the newspapers, as go into an empty factory where 12 workers were brought back to listen to her. Is it, was it actually like that? Is that how it felt on the bus, that she wasn't making any real eye contact with people, wasn't arguing her case, was keeping away from the crowds? Not entirely fair. I mean, I went to some of these factory visits where often the workers in these uh, places of work and factories were given no clue as to who was about to turn up. They were just told a VIP was about to make an appearance. And then they were all quite stunned to see the Prime Minister standing in front of them. Uh, she then did stand there for perhaps up to half an hour, taking any questions that they wanted to ask. Now, it's always a bit odd when you're in, a, in your workplace setting, quizzing the Prime Minister with, with no notice. But there was a degree of interaction. What there wasn't, though, was any of the sort of the colour and carnival and the mass rallies that we saw from Jeremy Corbyn. The Tory campaign was entirely different. Uh, on the whole, 
Theresa May made the same short speech to 100, perhaps 200 Tory activists who'd been bussed into a venue uh, to hold up placards handed to them by Tory party staffers with the messages on that we're now very familiar with. It was often quite hard to find a sort of a pulse on this Tory campaign. It was not exciting, it was not very fun, it was just a robotically driven, rammed home message uh, that didn't change really throughout the campaign. Uh, you know, but I think they will feel that it did the job in terms of getting the message onto the onto the television screens. That was, that's what the campaign was about. And it was only in the last couple of days it had some sort of feel of a, of a general election campaign. It had a pace. There were several visits a day. Uh, there were rallies that I thought Theresa May became more animated at than ones she'd done earlier in the campaign. But no, it, it felt a strange campaign uh, inside the bubble of it. Ben, thanks very much. Laura. And, uh, just in picking up on what Ben was saying, inevitably the blame game inside Tory headquarters has already started. This campaign was like the last two general election campaigns being run by Linton Crosby, the Australian supposed polling maestro. Now, sources inside uh, Tory HQ are saying to me that Crosby's team did not understand Theresa May. They didn't get her, they didn't understand her. They walked in with their prepared attack lines about the coalition of chaos and strong and stable. And when what was described to me as the sensible people who knew Theresa May asked for changes in speeches, told Crosby that the strong and stable slogan had become a joke, all those suggestions were basically pushed out. Now, of course, Everybody is now trying to rewrite history and say, though, of course, I was always saying it was going to be a disaster. But interesting, as Ben was saying, it seems the public have rejected that much more controlled kind of campaigning, very similar to what David Cameron did. I mean, Theresa May didn't play it any different to David Cameron did under Linton Crosby's operation. But interesting that, that it seems clearly that model did not fit for her. She's a very different kind of politician, and that kind of campaign just didn't work. OK. Um, Kamal, just... Very briefly, and I'll come back to you for the wider implications, Sterling, what's actually happened as a result of so this? So, Sterling... Can you afford to go on holiday anymore if you're going... <laughs> Just about, David. I'm sure Just... you'll be able to afford it. I mean, I'm we were here... I'm not going on holiday myself. We, we were I, here... Uh, on... I, I was asking on behalf of the viewers. <laughs> you may have another... We were here, we were here on, on, on Brexit night, David, and the market has once again shown its unerring ability to misjudge election outcomes. So, the market was positioned for a Theresa May majority, a pretty solid one. That didn't happen. And from the moment of the exit poll at 10 p.m. last night, the sterling has been weak. It's fallen by up to 2%. It's slightly rallied as some of that noise around the type of Brexit deal we may have may soften. But if we think about where the economy is, when politics hits the uncertainty button, the economy keeps going. The challenges in the economy, real incomes are still falling, growth has slowed. And now the uncertainty around the direction of travel for the government on tackling these big economic issues has only increased, overlaid on the Brexit issue and how the government is going to negotiate with Europe in this tight time frame. And that is going to mean a weaker sterling, investors being more nervous about the UK at the same time as in the Eurozone, for example, growth has increased. Some of the election risk in the Netherlands, in France has reduced. And America, growth is coming back. And so for investors, they've got options where they put their money. Global capital is global capital. And I think that will be the worry for investors in the UK and for businesses in the UK about we have this period of uncertainty overlaid on Brexit that is only going to cause the UK economy more problems. And those deep-seated problems like real incomes falling will not be tackled by the government because the government will not be clear on what its polit political um, uh, approach will be. Well, now, let's have a look at these seats. Thank you, Kamal. The, the updated prediction now... Remember, the Conservatives needed 326 to have a simple majority. They're on 319. They're 12 short. And uh, Labour's on 260. But we haven't, Emily, looked at for some time, and for people who've just got up and want to see it, some of the key constituencies that told this story tonight. Can we do that? It's been a night of the big beasts with some pretty poignant losses. And one of those uh, was in Sheffield Hallam. Nick Clegg uh, saying that he'd never shirked from fighting political battles and that he'd stood up in the national interest to form that coalition with the Conservatives. 
Uh, but here you see what happened, uh, possibly as a result of that, or possibly as a result of Labour strengthening here. Jared O'Mara has taken the seat from Nick Clegg, pushing him out on a majority of 2,000. It was on the Labour target list, uh, but there was quite a forlorn and stark moment watching Nick Clegg realise that his political future, at least in terms of his constituency MP work, had ended tonight. So this is what happened in Sheffield Hallam, a 4% swing to Labour from the Lib Dems. We also saw Angus Robertson, uh, who was always on that list, the SNP leader in Westminster, often called, uh, I suppose you would say in the old days, uh, the voice of real opposition to the Conservatives. In the days when the SNP weren't taking Labour very seriously, he's lost his seat, been replaced by Douglas Ross for the Conservatives. Gordon, uh, a real beast here, a real big beast, I should say. Alex Salmond loses this seat. He took it from the Lib Dems, and now the Conservatives have taken it from the SNP. So you've seen uh, a loss of some big figures here. I just want to take you back and show you what else has happened. A better news, in Twickenham, Vince Cable is back for the Lib Dems. We've lost one leader, Nick Clegg, but possibly Vince Cable coming in there again. Hastings and Rye, Amber Rudd, the Home Secretary, just holding on here after two recounts in which we thought she looked quite vulnerable. And Brighton Pavilion... Uh, possibly one of the results of the night. Caroline Lucas has increased her majority. She's virtually doubled it. She's now at nearly 7,000. She started at 1,000. It went to 8,000 last time. She's now sitting on a majority of 14,689. An astonishing personal performance for a very popular uh, Green leader as well as party uh, MP. David. We have a declaration coming from North East Fife at uh, half past follows. six in the morning. Rosalind Erica Garton, Scottish Labour Party, 4,026. <laughs> Stephen Patrick Gethins, Scottish National Party, 13,743. Tony McClinsky, Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party, 10,088. <laughs> Janet Elizabeth Riches, Scottish Liberal Democrats, 13,741. Oh, what? It's too late. Mike Scott Hayward, Independent Sovereign Democratic Britain, 224. The total number of ballot papers allocated were 41,822. So the SNP, Stephen Gethins, Gethins, holds to on to Fife North East by two votes. 13,743, 13,741 for the Liberal Democrats, who very nearly Can took I the seat. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and um, your members of staff and others for your extraordinary efforts tonight and what has been... Um, quite an extraordinary evening, so thank you to you. Can I thank Elizabeth, um, Tony and Rosalind for, I think, a well-fought campaign and, and, and thank you for, 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 for the campaign that we fought. Um, it's been a close one, I think it's fair to say. <laughs> Can I also thank um, all of the volunteers who are here from, first of all, my extraordinary team, thank you. Um, Second of all, to volunteers from every political party who make democracy work and have been trudging around in the pouring rain today, you have my thanks as well. And finally, presiding officer, on a personal note, my wife had a baby halfway through this election um, and she's been an absolute hero. So thank you and thanks all very right, much. All we'll, right, we'll leave uh, North East Fife uh, with a reminder that the last... Um, election as close as that was Mark Oaten's in Winchester way back and he had a majority of two and I think there was there was a legal challenge and the election was refought uh, and he then won it by, by a landslide. Um, Barry, Barry Gardner now, the Shadow International Trade Secretary, um, joins us from Brent North. Mr Gardner, good morning. Good morning. So, what do you make of all this? Well, it's been an extraordinary night. I think uh, if you look back seven weeks to what was being predicted in the broadsheets, uh, the Prime Minister expected a 
floodgate, a tsunami. She was looking at 120 to 150 seat majority. And she said she needed this in order to be able to negotiate in Europe uh, a good Brexit deal for the UK. Um, we're now in a situation which is far less about which party is up and down. It's much more about the fact that in a week's time we will be starting these negotiations and she has gambled everything for party advantage and she's lost. But it's not her that's lost, it's not her party that's lost, it's Britain that's lost. Because she will go into that negotiation and she will be considered a laughing stock by those with whom she has to negotiate. And that means that we are weaker as a result of her incompetence and indeed her arrogance. Have you uh, spoken to Jeremy Corbyn, your party leader, or John McDonnell? No, uh, not, not since all our uh, election results were known. No, I haven't. And uh, did, you didn't expect this to happen, did you? You're taken by surprise, like many other Labour Party people. Sorry, I, I was working to win this election. I said you didn't expect it to happen. Uh, well, I didn't take anything for granted. And I, I have to say I didn't have an expectation because there are real storms sweeping across British politics. Brexit was one of them. Um, but, of course, this was a general election which uh, proved to be very difficult for the Conservatives in terms of their own uh, chicanery and manoeuvring on their manifesto, um, but also that was blighted by the the appalling events of Manchester and London Bridge. So I, I think there were very different swirling it, it measures that meant this was a very difficult election to predict. So what I concentrated on was the manifesto that we had, the clarity of our policies, my belief that they were the right actions to take to help people in this country who really needed a change of government uh, and needed a fairer society. And I'm deeply, deeply disappointed that we didn't manage to achieve a Labour victory so that we could put those policies into effect. And do you, do you think, uh, are you, put it this way, are you concerned now, you talked about the worry about Brexit talk starting again in 11 days. Um, do you think the Prime Minister will have to go? Or do you expect to f still be on the opposition benches facing a Prime Minister who's supported by maybe the Northern Ireland parties? What do you think the future in Parliament is? Look, I, I think probably there are only two people who really know the answer to that, and, and that is Theresa May and her husband. Um, she is in the driving seat in this, but of course she has lost the confidence of her party. That is very, very clear. Um, and it really is a matter of what she can broker within the Conservative Party. Mm -hmm. But this is a time when she should be focusing on what she can broker in Europe. And that's why it's so deeply damaging to our nation. It, the, you know, politics is not a game between the political parties. It's ultimately supposed to be about the benefit of the British people. And she has put that all in jeopardy by this, uh, and she's lost. Barry Gardner, thank you very much for joining us. Well, David, Barry Gardner started that interview by describing it as an extraordinary night. And I've pulled out three tweets here which tell the story of the night succinctly, I think, in three uh, remarkable stories. The first is from Fraser Nelson, who's the editor of The Spectator. And he said uh, a few hours ago, if Corbyn does take Labour to 40%, which he uh, seems to have achieved, he'll have done more to increase his party's vote share than anyone since Attlee in 1945. So story one is the astonishing uh, Labour triumph, which has taken many, many people by surprise. The second uh, tweet is from Mark Wallace, who's a Conservative blogger, and he says, this is an off-the-record quote, defeated Tory MP says to him, we basically ran the Remain campaign. It was just about doom and disaster if you vote the other way. So there's all the recriminations that Laura's been reporting on about how inside Tory CCHQ, they're thinking about where on earth this went wrong. And here's uh, the final tweet I've pulled out, which I think is possibly the more panoramic uh, major story of this evening, which we're going to be talking about for weeks, months and possibly years ahead. Harry Leslie Smith, who's a, a Labour activist, a 94-year-old Labour activist, served in the Second World War, very trenchant online. He says, tonight Britain's young, and I suppose this morning, Britain's young have shown they can become the greatest generation of the 21st century. You have my respect. This has been an election about a generation game, about young people coming out and swinging partly towards uh, Jeremy Corbyn and therefore taking many of us by surprise. Thanks. Well, um, we know that the Prime Minister has gone back from Tory party headquarters to number 10 Downing Street. 
and uh, Jeremy Vine is standing outside. Jeremy. <laughs> yes, the virtual equivalent. Maybe her car will suddenly draw up. But just thinking that people are waking up and they're wondering what we've all been through with this extraordinary result, let's just take you through it hour by hour, shall we? So up until 2 a.m., these were the first handful of seats, about 40-odd seats that we had in. And you can see, for example, that seats that Labour thought were maybe on the edge of being marginal or taken by the Conservatives, Hartlepool, uh, Vale of Cluid and so on, stayed Labour. So Labour were defending their territory. The Conservatives, meanwhile, interestingly, took Angus in Scotland, which on paper it looked like they had no prospect of doing whatsoever. Now, 3 a.m., let's go and see what, what we knew by then. More seats come on. By this stage, if you look at the Labour line, they've taken Sheffield Hallam, so Nick Clegg at that point is out of the House of Commons. Uh, Glasgow North East goes Labour, so that's an interesting result because, again, it's action in Scotland. And Ipswich goes from blue to red, again for Labour from the Conservatives, and very, very interesting indeed. Meanwhile, yes, the Conservatives are hanging on to what they've got. They've got Cleethorpes, for example, but they would expect to hang on to those kinds of seats. What are they doing that's actually moving them forwards? Answer, nothing outside Scotland really at all. We move to 4 a.m. Let's have a look at the seats now. So what, what do we have on the Labour side at 4 a.m., for example? At the end, you can see Batley and Spen came in, the seat that Joe Cox, the late Joe Cox, that was her constituency, that came back as Labour. And in London, Labour were posting really quite high percentages in places like Vauxhall and Brent and Hammersmith and Dagenham, just under, underpinning this idea that in Remain seats, and particularly seats with lots of young voters, Labour were doing very well indeed. Scotland was constantly offsetting the bad news for the Conservatives in the meantime. So here you see Aberdeenshire West, Stirling, Berwickshire, all going to the Conservatives in Scotland, quite against any predictions that have been made. OK, 5 a.m. now we're at. We're nearly there. And let's have a look. I move forwards now. You can see the Conservatives now get the result of Hastings. And that's Amber Rudd, the Home Secretary's constituency. That was very, very close. She would not have been expecting to be in the kind of really nip and tuck fight she was in in Hastings. But that was the case with quite a few Conservative seats. Meanwhile, OK, Labour are behind, but doing much better than anyone expected. They take Enfield Southgate off the Conservatives, and we mention that particularly because the whole election history with that seat, with Michael Portillo being kicked out of there by Tony Blair's party in 1997. 10% swing for Labour in that seat. By 6 a.m. we had... Let's bring on the rest that we had by 6 o'clock. Let's see what they are. So the Conservatives are ahead, but we knew by this stage they weren't going to make the finishing line of 326. They were taking Southampton Itchin and Chipping Barnet and Devon West and Croydon South. But a lot of those seats were their safe seats. They would never have expected to be in trouble in them. Meanwhile, we go back to the Labour line. Let's see where we were for Labour at this point. I just have a look at the end here. And you can see Southampton Test and Ashfield, Gloria de Piero's seat, Ilford South, Ilford North, Hove. Hove had been assumed to be pretty marginal, but Labour took it, uh, held it. So, what a situation. We are very, very near the line now, but we're not near enough for the Conservatives. Look at the end here. These seats on the end, they're not yet in. We haven't yet got every seat. Where they're dark blue for the Conservatives or dark red for Labour, we don't know the final result. Truro, Cornwall South East, Crewe, St Austell, St Ives, Cornwall North, Kensington. But the thing we do know is that the Conservatives cannot, cannot underline, make this 326 line here. 326 is just over half the total number of MPs in the House of Parliament. They can't do it and therefore it's been a terrible, terrible mistake for Theresa May to throw away the majority that was won by David Cameron in 2015. And yes, Labour have come second, but they've done far better than almost anyone expected. David, that's the story. Amazing. Jeremy, thank you very much indeed. Now, Laura Kunzberg, our political editor, has been sitting here since 10 o'clock last night and you have to go down to Downing Street yes. so before you because to wait for Theresa May if she comes out to speak do we know when she's speaking by the we way we don't now? we thought it might be 10 o'clock we were told it's not 10 o'clock so I'm gonna go oh. just in case it's much sooner than that so just uh, in case it is much sooner than that anyway you do have to go just yes. summarize for us how you think things stand now and the way you think politics will develop at Westminster over the next few days Unquestionably, a total political disaster for Theresa May. This is on her. It was her decision to do it. 
a huge success for Jeremy Corbyn, not the largest party, but he has massively outperformed expectations. He has achieved far more than he himself thought. This is the third time, the hat trick, if you like. He won the Labour leadership against expectation. He then won again, fending off the majority of his MPs who told him publicly he wasn't up to the job. And here he performs better than Labour in 2015, better than Labour in 2010. A huge success for him. For us, for the public, we know the Tories are the largest party. Of course, they are therefore going to try to form the government. They've got the right to do so. And they are, for them, tantalisingly close to actually getting a majority. And they would have a sort of workable majority because we know the Northern Irish Unionist MPs will come alongside them. What we do not know at 6.43 is whether or not it will be Theresa May is, who is the person who tries to form that government. It may be her. She may be forced to stay on as a sort of caretaker. She may be forced to do some kind of deal behind the scenes about standing down later on. She may decide to quit after this humiliation, or she may right now be privately forced to do so. So we know the result. We do not know for sure who our Prime Minister is going to be. And uh, just tell us a bit about uh... Jeremy Corbyn uh, and his character, because he must be tough as old boots to have gone through that campaign, having been monstered by the press on, you know, big scale, uh, having uh, his own, 80% of his own MPs Absolutely. against him. What kind of person is it that has been on the back benches, invisible, mm -hmm. really, all his career, mm -hmm. only known for voting against everything mm -hmm. that was A protester, put indeed. A protester. Well, the one thing we've always known about Jeremy Corbyn is he thrives on campaigning. That's what he is. He's been a protester and a campaigner. He's used to being on the outside. He was a political outsider. The gamble for the Labour Party was whether an outsider could ever have enough of an appeal to the floating voter, the person in the middle. But watching him over the last couple of years, even though he's had brickbats thrown at him by his own party, you see he's drawn energy from the campaigning that he's had to do. And day by day in this campaign, it was almost like, you know, he was sort of plugging in a charger to the crowd to get his energy to keep him going. That's what we've seen here. The how protester will, turned campaigner who but, well, has been good, reinforced uh, how, by all how, of that. How will he take to success? And that's a whole different... Well, it, but, but he's had success in his own way, but it was fascinating. Even, even on the last day of campaigning at one of his rallies, he said, it's not just about electing MPs. Now, by normal convention, you say, it's only about electing MPs. That's the point. But for him and his supporters, what seemed for most people in the Labour Party to be a crackpot view to start with, to say it's not about winning, they would say it's about a movement, it's not just about winning. But actually, that formula has got the Labour Party further along the line than its last couple of leaders. Quite something, it's an amazing achievement, but still, they are clearly, they're not the largest party. And there's no question, if we look at the gaps in the numbers, it's going to be the Tory party that's going to try to form the government. So while Labour, you know, have had an extremely good night, it's not the situation that somehow he's actually been able to, you know, overthrow that. But, you know, once again, just as in 2015, just as in the referendum, the great British public have thrillingly, audaciously, boldly reminded the political establishment that they are the one who, ones who call the shots. That's why these nights are so exciting. Laura Kunzberg, thank you very much, and you better... Pleasure. I'm going to go down to I'll number to 10. You. But sure. I'm going to go down to number 10 in the meantime, or at least I'm not, but we're going to go down there and join John Pina, who's waiting for you to arrive. Uh, John, good morning to you. Um, I suppose the obvious question is, do you, first of all, have any news about what the Prime Minister is going to do? Uh, and secondly, what are your sort of reflections on the campaign? Well, the, the news about that, David, is that there is no news. It's anyone's guess whether or not the Prime Minister will choose this moment after that most pyrrhic of election victories, which has left such scars on her authority and reputation, enduring scars on her party, whether she'll take that as a cue to quit the stage. Listening to her earlier on today, talking about the need for, uh, for continuing stability, that didn't sound like a call for the removal van to pitch up here in number 10 immediately. But we'll find out when she makes that statement. I was in contact by, by text with a senior figure in the Tory machine just a few moments ago, asked would Theresa May be soldiering on? And the answer was, no idea. And I think he was speaking for an awful lot of people when he said that. You'll have heard Anna Subri earlier on 
suggesting, not too subtly, that maybe Theresa May should fall on her sword. There's another big figure in the party uh, who was saying, uh, uh, when Rees Mogg, uh, Jacob Rees Mogg, who was saying, we need that stability, she needs to stick around. And then another member of the 1922 committee, the sort of tribal elders of the Tory party, his position was that this is the, the, the wrong time to go with the Brexit negotiations just a few days away. So we'll wait to see. We'll have that statement before too long, um, I imagine. If Theresa May sticks around, then we will, I'm quite sure, see a significant change in Theresa May's way of running the party, of running the government. Not just because she'll see that's necessary, but because I think the party around her will be pretty much insisting that that's what happens. And that will take a number of different forms, uh, I think, if that's what happens. You'll see the Prime Minister being pressed to listen much more carefully to the party at large, to her Conservative MPs, to the, the tribal elders of the, the 1922 committee. In Whitehall, around here, there are very senior civil servants who say privately that they want to see their departments, their voices, not just heard, but heeded in Number 10 Downing Street. We know very well how to reason me. It relies very, very closely on a very, very small circle of close senior advisers. Many people feel excluded from all of that. And you'll see MPs, you'll see senior civil servants in a more deferential uh, sort of way, looking for that circle to be widened, to that, for that listening to be made uh, rather more attentive and, the, the, and what's being said to be, uh, to be responded to. All that then is for the for the future. Meanwhile, today we'll hear from the Prime Minister a little later on, having absorbed what has happened uh, overnight, telling us whether she's going to, to carry on. And meanwhile, elsewhere in the political sphere, the Labour Party, of course, will be considering its future, which now looks so very different. We've had a, a realignment of British politics overnight, and that's not overstating it. John, thank you very much indeed. That was a great help to us, and we'll no doubt during the morning be back at number 10. Uh, when, the, when the Prime Minister comes out to speak, uh, we expect her to. Um, Emily, can we look at a, a sort of summary of how things yep. stand? I imagine if you were a normal person, David. Imagine if you stayed up to watch the exit poll at 10 o'clock and then you thought, I know, I'll go to bed and I'll wake up in the morning and see what's actually happened. That exit poll that John Curtis brought us suggested the Conservatives would be on about 314 seats. Labour would be on 266 seats. It is impossible for you to imagine the kind of turmoil that all of us in the studio have been through, wondering just how accurate that would be and whether we were putting ourselves on the line with some of the results we were forecasting and the figures we were jumping at. Well, look, at this time in the morning, which is coming up to 7 o'clock, these are the seats that are in, and they are nearly all counted, 643 out of 650. The Conservatives then sitting on 313. They have lost 12. Those are net losses. Labour sitting on 260. They have made gains of 29 so far, with just uh, 6 or 7 in to be declared. The SNP on 35, we predicted they'd be down uh, by 22. They've lost 21. The Lib Dems, we said, would be on 12. They have made those gains of exactly four. And you can see the DUP and Sinn Féin. What I do want to do, though, is just show you what that looks like as a percentage share of the vote. Suddenly, it all becomes an extraordinary story and a very stark one when you tell it in terms of these sort of, as we've been looking at them, poll numbers. The Conservatives sitting on this real poll now are 43% to Labour's 41%, just two percentage points between them. The SNP on only 3%, even though they still have all those seats in Scotland. Obviously, they don't stand elsewhere, so their vote is shared out very efficiently. And the Greens, only one point behind them, even though they just have that one seat, Caroline Lucas' seat of Brighton Pavilion. But this is the moment that is quite a triumph for uh, the sophologists and for our exit pollsters. This is what we brought you at the beginning of the night. We suggested that Labour could be 11 points up, the Conservatives could be four points up, we suggested UKIP could be 11 points down, the SNP could be 11 points down as well, and the Greens would also be showing a, a fall of about 3%. That's what we gave you. We held our breath. We tried not to tremble when we showed you the results on air. And these are the results, with nearly all of them counted in, and you can see just how similar those patterns are. Labour up 10%, not quite 11. Conservatives up 6%, just a little bit more. And UKIP and the SNP pretty much in line. So this is the moment at which you probably want to turn to John Curtis with a big pat on the back. Well, John Curtis is 
standing there, look, beaming with pleasure, hearing that. Do you, does the exit poll deserve a pat on the back? It sounds pretty magical to me. Well, I hope you found it useful and that it helped to inform <laughs> your coverage during the course of the night, David. I mean, the crucial thing about the exit poll at the end of the day, to be honest, is not necessarily whether it's right or wrong, but it gives people a guide as to what the early results might be. Now, you will remember that actually, very early in the night, it wasn't clear that the exit poll was right, because most of the results came in from the northeast, particularly Newcastle and Sunderland. And in truth, the exit poll overestimated how Labour would do in that part of the world. But the truth is, while that was going on, we were hearing all sorts of uh, uh, commentary about what was going on in seats further south, particularly crucial marginal seats. And to be honest, it was fairly clear to us early on that actually we at least had got the broad picture right. Um, and therefore, hopefully, it means that the programme started off on the right leg and continue after. But I have to say, David, of course, it's not just me. I have a wonderful set of colleagues here who've done an awful lot of computer programming, an awful lot of hard work, not just tonight, but all the way through mm. the election campaign. And, of course, the interviewers from GFK and Ipsos Mori, who stood outside polling stations, in some cases in inclement weather, and collected the data. And, frankly, we could not have got this right, but for the fact that they collected data that proved, for the most part, to be highly accurate. So you're just the front man. Um, I hope I can. <laughs> no, I know you. I not. hope I contribute something to the analysis, and I think just, my colleagues would probably agree I do. You're, you're just the but public. With, but, but without their support, <laughs> I would not be able you're to do this. You're just the public face. Sky. I have to say it again. Sky, ITV, BBC's yep, poll. Yeah, it's a wholly collaborative oh, yeah. The reason it's a, a, a cooperative poll is because we used to get it. You know, everybody would have a different poll, and everybody would blame the other lot for getting it wrong. But anyway, it's now like that. But, John, thank you very much. And You're if welcome. I could, congratulations on it. But let's join Michelle for a moment, up in the gods there. David, right. uh, I'm sitting here with David Lammy, MP, uh, Labour MP for Tottenham, comfortably re-elected earlier on. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Now, you've been a prominent Remain campaigner. You're one of those MPs who voted against the triggering of Article 50. I want to ask what you think tonight means for the Brexit process. George Osborne has said hard Brexit is now in the bin. I think George Osborne's right. I mean, Theresa May had committed to leaving the single market. She'd committed to leaving the customs union. She asked the country to back her, give her a bigger majority. That now lies in tatters. There has to be now a different course. And I might say that MPs like Ken Clark like Anna Soubry, MPs that do not want to hard Brexit are emboldened within her party with such a small uh, minority government that effectively she has to form. And, uh, I mean, it's interesting because you voted against article, uh, triggering Article 50. Jeremy Corbyn, your leader, obviously took a very different position. In the end, his approach, perhaps, perhaps that was one of the keys to holding together the disparate groups of Labour voters and delivering this result? Well, my view remains largely the view of London, and you have seen a massive Remain position here in London where Labour have done well. But, of course, across the country, it looks like Jeremy got it right. His assessment was that, look, we have to have a Brexit, but broadly, it has to be a soft Brexit. And that has chimed in the country. And that's why those predictions that we would lose the north of England, that white working-class Britain had deserted Labour, this morning were proved wrong. Jeremy and the Labour Party have kept those seats in Yorkshire, the North East and the North West. Against your expectations? Actually, my view was always that the expectation that those UKIP voters would go solely to the Conservatives was an overstatement. I know why colleagues feared it, but actually we've seen a third of those voters come over to Labour. David Lammy, thank you very much. Thank you. David. Thanks very much, Michelle. Well, now, I'm joined here by... Uh, the world's constitutional expert, Peter Hennessy, who's arrived, I see, with a book called The Cabinet Manual. Peter, just describe to us, is the process now of continuing the governance of Britain complex or is it a relatively straightforward matter? There is a drill and it's in, it's in this Cabinet Manual. I, never, I rarely leave home without it. <laughs> uh, but it is quite complicated and raw politics always can make a difference to the prescribed drills. And after a night of multiple political convulsions, I fear for Mrs May it's going to be a day of raw, brutal politics. My old friend John Ramsden, the historian of the Conservative Party, once described the Tory leadership as autocracy tempered by assassination. And the big question is, will she be assassinated at her own hand, by other people's hands, sooner or later? 
So it's going to be the most extraordinary day. But for the last two general elections, we've had a drill laid out. We never had it before. It was always back of an envelope constitution when you and I first used to do these programmes. But there is a drill for it in here for prime ministers resigning on behalf either individually or on behalf of their own government. And also... What about is, not resigning? Or not resigning. With the, with the minority government? Yes. Is there a drill for that? There's several drills. They're all in here. Several drills? Several drills for it in several possibilities, whether you do a deal, whether you have a supply and confidence and so on, or whether you just try and soldier it out as the largest single party. But I think she'll go and call upon the Queen if she follows Ted Heath's pattern on the 1st of March 74, which was another great surprise. He went to see the Queen to explain what he was going to try and do over the weekend by way of doing deals with the Liberals and maybe one or two people from Northern Ireland. So I think that, that precedent will probably be followed, but who knows? Thank you very much. Well, now, um, we're coming up to 7 o'clock and there's a shift change coming now. Um, let me just work it out. Uh, Jeremy Vine is staying, yes? I'm here. Uh, Peter Hennessy, you're staying here. I hope so. Michelle, your work is done and you're going home. Um, Emily? Staying. You're staying right through the day. Long haul. Emily, um, are you staying or going? Oh, no, going? You're going. And you're going, are you? Not home, I'm going back to... I'm yeah, going yeah. Casting yeah. House. You're exactly. going back to Morris House. We've got jobs to do, <laughs> David. <laughs> OK. We've <laughs> got a day uh, job. All right. <laughs> but we've, we've been through the night from uh, whenever it was we came on air, I'm just before to. 10 o'clock. Um, we've, we've been through the most fascinating night, to tell the truth. I don't think any of us expected when we sat down here, when I got the exit poll in that secret room out the back there, and we looked at it absolutely aghast. We couldn't believe it. In fact, it's a document that I'll put on eBay one day and make a fortune from, because it was just exactly... Uh, no, nothing had prepared us for it. And uh, politics is always surprising. Politics is exciting. And one of the complaints uh, often, uh, particularly among young people, is they find it boring. This, this election showed that young people can be energised by politics. That's really what Jeremy Corbyn managed to do. He managed to get people really involved and intrigued by it and seeing a different way of doing politics, uh, not just the same old way. And I said earlier on that the other fascinating thing is that we've reverted effectively to a two-party system, an absolute binary choice between the Tory party and the Labour party. The other parties have fallen aside and for the first time since 1970 we have uh, a vote for 13 and a half million Tory, 12, nearly 13 million for Labour. So the bulk of voters, and we obviously have still to find out, you know, who those voters were, what the young did, what the old did, what people in the towns and the cities did, what universities did, all that stuff. But nevertheless, what we've done is to move back towards two-party politics. All to play for now, because, of course, Theresa May, as we've been saying, must be under extreme pressure, uh, having originally called this election to guarantee certainty and stability for the years ahead. Our coverage goes on here on BBC One throughout the day. There will be all kinds of developments, and Hugh Edwards will be back in the chair here to take us through the afternoon and, no doubt, till this evening as we work out the ramifications of what's happened. But now, just coming up to 7 o'clock, from me, David Dimbleby, here's the news, and here's Louise Minchin. Hello, good morning. Theresa May's decision to call a snap election has backed